so hi guys so this is advanced accounting marathon uh, well before this we already uploaded paper one accounting marathon by same Satya Raju sir and you have seen what kind of massive response that the marathon has got in fact many students uh, started thinking it is something like regular course but not see uh, you know though our marathons will give you a lot of clarity for an in-depth knowledge for scoring I can say above 90 marks in accounts our regular course is the best choice but then marathons are done marathons are made not for uh, you know like freshers but for those who already finished or took coaching of the subject and they were about to give examinations in the coming months for the marathons it's like a revision it's like a rapid revision fine so this is advanced accounting marathon close to 20 hours in this video you can find approximately 11 to 12 hours of marathon about 10 hours Remain, remaining hours we will be uploading as part two video this is just part one of uh, you know two parts of advanced accounting marathon which is being handled by our faculties rest of faculty satyaraju sir so sir will be covering approximately 80 marks syllabus see you you will be getting 120 marks actually right total syllabus is 120 so uh, chapters that will cover approximately 80 marks of the weightage so those chapters will be explained by satya sir at a revision level and believe me you are going to really understand accounts in a complete different way might be you are in an assumption that i know accounts very well but after watching this entire 11 hours or the next part definitely you will realize there are so many new points that are yet to be learned in the subject of advanced accounts so why late happily enjoy continue watching and before before going further sir has used some running notes and material sir has used some running notes and material while while you know recording this marathon where you can find that running notes so uh, download this application race stuff for ca and cma in the play store in that there is an option called main menu inside that study material option will be there inside that ca inter so in that you will find group 2 paper 5 advanced accounting main material solution book as well as running notes used by satya so so you can download the resources and get yourself ready and then start watching this marathon and for your information we are the only institute from south india for the first time launching all eight subjects revision classes at free of cost on youtube all eight subjects were available suppose if you take group one related already paper one uploaded paper two b other loss uploaded paper three uploaded paper four gst is uploaded income tax is also uploaded almost all subjects of group one uploaded all subjects of group 2 is also uploaded sir where can, where can we find at a single place all these videos same you are watching this video right in my news uh, in my youtube channel see ram harsha inside that there is a playlist called ca inter marathon may 2022 inside that playlist all eight subjects marathon were pulled together so you can happily watch there believe me you're going to you're going to experience a next level clarity in the subject of advanced account and not only this accounts even the other subjects of our Sresta marathons you are going to learn completely the subject in a new dimension that's it happy learning continue watching the class by Satya sir bye bye have a nice time all the best hello soldiers welcome to advanced accounting marathon myself is Satya Raju Koluru practicing chartered accountant out of my profession faculty for accounting and advanced accounting as well as faculty for financial reporting at CA final level without wasting much time let us directly entering into the topic but before directly entering into the topic let me discuss two important issues one is sir which resources we are going to follow for the entire marathon only two resources one is my power notes, another one is my main material. This is my main material, this is my power notes. Sir, where we can get it, these two resources? Don't worry, in the description, I will provide a link. You can directly click that link, you can download such material. One more, sir, this marathon is useful to whom? This is useful exclusively for the students who already completed their regular course. I mean, this they can use it as a pure revision. This may not be suitable for the persons who first time they are watching their lectures. 
or they are not yet completed the regular course, it may not be suitable. The reason is we are trying to cover the major topics in a very short span. So a lot of issues we are going to discuss. And one more, sir, is it marathon try to cover all the entire 100% syllabus? No, it will try to cover as much as possible. And students where really feel difficult, a lot of technicalities are involved and certain gaps are there. I am taking such topics here. Uh, I can put like this, definitely I will try to cover in between 60 to 75 percentage of the syllabus. That's not a small thing, guys. 60 to 75 percentage of the syllabus means you should need to calculate such 60 to 75 percentage on 120 marks, not on 100 marks, because the paper will be given for 120 marks right in the examination. So the total they are giving six questions, six into 20, which is equal to 120 marks. Out of the six questions, question number one is compulsory, which is for 20 marks. From the remaining five questions, that is from question number two to question number six, from the remaining five questions, you can write any of the four questions. That is here 20 plus four multiply with 20, total it will be for 100 marks. But the syllabus, which is designed for 120 marks. Am I right? So that's why you can calculate such 60 to 70 percentage on the 120, it may be the approximately 80 marks. That means 80 percentage of your questions you need to attempt and try to cover through this marathon. Okay, fine. Sir, first let me check with the blueprint given as per the ICAI. Why I'm discussing this blueprint? The questions, sir, which chapters have the more weightage, which chapters have the less weightage? Most of the students just regularly they are making text to me. I'm going to explain such a way it is through the blueprint. Sir, this blueprint is not given by me, not given by any private organization. This blueprint is actually released by the ICAI Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Uh, like this, you can get the blueprint for each and every subject. There, if you want, you can download such a blueprint document with the BOS Knowledge Portal. A separate link is there from where you can easily download it. Okay. Come to coming to our advanced accounting, the entire syllabus is broadly categorized into four categories. Category one, two, three, four. Total four categories are there. Number one, application of accounting standards. So here I told you question number one is compulsory, right? The question should be came from this category only. Sir. This application of accounting standards will try to cover total 13 accounting standards. In group one, you may come across very few accounting standards, like I think so seven to eight accounting standards you may come across. But here in group two, the syllabus of accounting standards is huge. Sir, what are the different types of accounting standards covered here, sir? AS4, 5, 7, 9, 14, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 24, 26, 29. Out of 13 accounting standards, I will try to cover seven accounting standards, seven accounting standards, where six I will cover directly and the seventh accounting standards I will try to cover indirectly with another chapter. Sir, which accounting standards you are trying to cover, sir? Four I will cover, five, seven, nine, then 20, 22. Here four plus two, six. And AS 14, I'll try to cover along with the chapter amalgamation. That's why I told total seven accounting standards. Exclusive coverage will be there with respect to these seven accounting standards. If time permits for me, then I'll try to cover others. Otherwise, I'll simply ignore. Next, come to category two. Category two is with respect to company accounts. Here, there again, two subcategories are there, category A and category B. Category a is related to special aspects of the company accounts. That is like employee stock option plan and buyback of equity shares and equity shares with referential rights. Actually, as per the ICAA, th those are two different topics. But for our discussion, in general, we are going to discuss buyback and equity shares with referential rights as a single topic. 
because equity shares with referential rights is very small topic. Okay, these are related to special aspects. And the other issues are amalgamation, internal reconstruction, liquidation of companies. So uh, the name, the name of the topic is actually reconstruction and liquidation. This is the name of the topic as per our ICA material reconstruction and liquidation, which is the topic. So this is with respect to, to category B. So out of category A and category B, which topics you are trying to cover, sir? Sir, I will not cover category A. I will try to cover each and every topic of category B here because the topic ESOP and buyback are much more easy. So any student can easily understand such topics. So that is the reason first, I don't want to take up the category A, but amalgamation, internal reconstruction, liquidation of companies are little bit technical. We are trying to cover each and every issue under category B. Next coming to category three, there are two topics exist. One is banking company and another one is non-banking finance companies. Sir, both the chapters are format based chapters and certain uh, prudential regulations are the provisions with respect to the banking regulation act will be there. Those two chapters are completely depending upon such acts. Sir, whether we will try to cover such issues, sir. No, I didn't touch anything related to category three for the time being, because one more much more important category is there, which is category four, which is related to consolidated financial statements and partnership accounts, where we will give our entire focus on such chapters. And one more thing, sir, why are you ignoring such topics, sir? Now, if I tell you the percentage of the marks, then you can clearly understand why I'm not touching that immaterial topics first, why I'm touching the other topics. You can easily understand. Sir, application of accounting standards will try to cover 20 to 26 percentage. It's 20 to 26 percentage of the marks means, you know one thing, it will be approximately 25 to 30 marks will coming from accounting standards. Company accounts total will try to cover 35 to 40 marks. 35 to 40 marks. Banking company will try to, banking and NBFC will try to cover 15 to 20 marks. And the last category, consolidated finance statements and partnership accounts will try to cover 30 to 35 marks. Now, out of which I will take up more than 50 percentage, like 60 to 70 percentage of accounting standards, 60 to 70 percentage of accounting standards. Here also, Category B is very bigger category, well, very big while well, compared to category A. Here also we will try to cover 75 to 80 percent as approximately I can put in category number two. Category number three, I completely ignoring the reason is which only for 15 to 20 marks, I didn't touch at all. Category four completely I will take up. So total, if you check here approximately 30 marks, here approximately uh, 25 marks, 35 plus 25, that is 60, 60 plus here approximately 20 marks, 80. That's what I promised to you. 80 percentage of your portion, 80 percentage of marks you need to be attempted. I'm trying to going to cover through this marathon. Okay. So this is the plan of action. Uh, I clearly intimated my plan at the beginning of the session itself. That's it guys. Now, let me directly entering into the topic with the main accounting standard, which is with accounting standard 20 guys. So first, so then how, how you will try to cover the order of the topics as well. I will tell you here. First, I will try to cover the accounting standards total. I told you now seven accounting standards. I'm going to try to cover six. I will first try to cover and the other accounting standard amalgamation will directly start with the chapter amalgamation followed by internal reconstruction, followed by liquidation of companies. Then uh, I'll start with partnership accounts, then close the topic with consolidated financial statements. This is the order we are going to follow for the entire marathon. So first, out of all the accounting standards, we will start with our marathon is 20. Let me directly open accounting standard 20 earnings per share. Sir, before, before entering directly into accounting standard 20, first let us have a discussion with respect to, to structure of an accounting standard. 
how we are going to learn any accounting standard topic. The accounting standard topic or the accounting standard itself is drafted by the accounting standard board of ICAA in this particular uh, procedure. That means first they are started with objective. Objective means the reason for introduction of this standard, why this accounting standard is introduced or from this accounting standard, what they want to tell to the industry. Definitions, different technical terms used in such in accounting standard to appreciate the entire accounting standard in proper way, we need to understand the definitions of such technical terms they used. Scope, another name for the scope is applicability. Is this accounting standard is applicable to all type of industries? Is this part of the accounting standard is applicable to uh, any situations? Or is this accounting standard is non-applicable in any particular circumstances? All such things we are going to discuss through scope paragraph. Then these are the aspects of the accounting standards. Aspects of the accounting standard means that any accounting standard you can take, at least it should try to cover out of the below aspects, at least it will try to cover one aspect. It may try to cover regarding the measurement, recognition, presentation, disclosure. I'll give certain examples. For example, measurement concept is there, right? Sir, measurement, the AS20 itself is one of the objectives to try to cover the measurement aspect at which value the earning per share should be measured. Or you may already come across the group one accounting standard like AS2 inventory valuation is based on the measurement concept. Recognition, AS9 revenue recognition standard is there. When you are going to recognize the revenue into your books of accounts. In case of AS7 construction of contracts, in case the books of the contractor, when he should need to recognize the revenue from such contract that is with respect to the recognition aspect presentation how you should need to be presented a specific aspect into the financial statements again as 20 will also going to discuss about the presentation aspect how the earning price per share is going to be presented is it okay guys uh, maybe the provisions contingent liabilities contingent assets how it should be going to be presented in the financials so some one of the aspect of accounting standard is presentation as well disclosures Sir, as per the different accounting standards, we are going to disclose some other information in the notes to accounts. Various accounting standards are there. AS26, that is intangible assets. Uh, what are the disclosure you should need to provide as per AS26? Or maybe AS18 related party disclosures is there. What are the disclosures we are going to provide as per AS18? I mean, out of the below aspects, maybe all the aspects may be covered by each and every accounting standard or at least it should be covered by one accounting standard. That is depending upon standard to standard, one accounting standard may try to cover more than one aspect or certain accounting standards will cover at least one aspect. Do you understand? This is the structure of the accounting standard. Now, coming to AS20, what is the objective of accounting standard 20? The title of AS20 is, you know, earnings per share. Earnings per share. To put it simply, the title itself clearly tells to us how much earnings we can attributable to each and every equity share. Here, share means equity share. For each and every equity shareholder, how much earnings he is enjoying in his point of view. That is the meaning of the title. Am I right? Now, what is the objective of introduction of this standard, sir? There are three primary objectives, sir. There are three primary objectives. One is determination and presentation of eps determination means measurement i told you now how to measure this eps that is one of the objective and a presentation after measuring such eps where i should need to present these are the two major objectives one is measurement another one is presentation of eps related to basic eps related to diluted eps what is the meaning of basic EPS? What is the meaning of diluted EPS? We are going to try to cover with the below provisions. Okay, for the time being, I'm not discussing anything related to basic and diluted EPS. So simply the objective is measurement as well as presentation. I will give a small hint here, guys, regarding the presentation EPF, presentation of EPS, where we are going to present such EPS in the financial statements, sir, in the statement of profit and loss account. On the face of the statement of P&L, as a last line item, we are going to present both basic and diluted EPS in the financial statements. EPS was not going to be presented in the balance sheet. 
APS is going to be presented in the statement of PNL. Uh, in group one, finance statements of companies chapter, you may already come across the format of schedule three with respect to, to statement of PNL, where you can see clearly the EPS presentation under the last line item. If you want, I'll show here just a moment, which is the statement of profit and loss, of loss as per the schedule three. If you check here as a last final, final line item here, earnings per equity share, both basic and diluted, we are going to be presented. So the same issue is also discussed here as well. That is the first objective. And the second objective is, the objective of S20 is also for the purpose of inter and intra form comparison, inter and intra form comparison. Sir, what is the meaning of inter and intra form comparison? For example, my company is a ROS limited, I calculated my EPS for the current year, which is three rupees per share. Another company is there, which is X limited. Another company is there, which is X limited. They calculated their EPS, which is four rupees per share. Inter comparison means my company EPS is going to be compared with another company EPS within the same industry. Now, which company is performing in that better manner in such industry? X limited is performing in the better manner while compared with the Razu limited. That is for intra inter comparison, this EPS is highly useful. Next, what is the meaning of intra comparison, sir? Intra comparison means my company current year information is going to compare with my company previous year information. Sir, previous year EPS is two rupees per share for Raj limited and the current year EPS is three rupees per share. Now, while compared with the previous year, current year EPS is enhanced like anything. So, which is a positive note for the company point of view, or which is a positive note in equity shareholders point of view as well. Such inter and intra form comparison is possible through presentation of EPS in the financial statements only. And one more important objective I'm revealing here, concentrate. EPS is highly useful in deriving MPS. In calculation of market price per share, EPS plays a vital role. How, sir? Do you know the PE ratio? You might listen to the PE ratio in your financial management topic. PE ratio or this is also multi call it as PE multiple. PE multiple. P here P stands for market price per share. E stands for earnings price per share. MPS divided by EPS is nothing but PE multiple. For example, if the PE multiple came it as five, what is the meaning of that you know? What is the meaning of that? No. For example, if MPS is 500 rupees and earnings price per share, which is 100 rupees, then PE ratio will commit as a five. PE multiple will commit as a five. What is the meaning of that, sir? Now, the market price will be five times of their earnings. The market price of that particular share will be five times of their earnings. That is the meaning of PE multiple. Now, if you make the cross multiplication PE ratio into EPS, if you know the earning price per share and if you know the PE multiple, then if you can cross multiply one by one, then automatically you can derive the market price per share. So one of the method of calculation of market price per share is by using EPS in multiplication with the PE ratio, you can easily derive market price. Do you understand? So total three objectives are there. One is determination and presentation of EPS. And another one is inter and intra form comparison. And another one is for the purpose of calculation of MPS, EPS plays vital role. This is with respect to objective. Next, <laughs> sir, definition. Actually, in this accounting standard, we are trying to cover the definition after explaining the scope. So that's why first let me explain the scope. After that, I will explain uh, things related to definition. Now come to the scope. Come to the scope. Sir, Basic EPS here, the standard is of the standard objective is presentation and determination of two different EPS. Na. One is basic EPS and diluted EPS. Na. Presentation of basic EPS is mandate for all entities, all entities. But presentation of diluted, that is measurement and presentation of diluted EPS is mandatory only for non-SMC and level one. Non-SMC means in case of companies 
at the time of applicability of accounting standards for the purpose of applicability of accounting standards companies are divided into two types one is non smc another one is smc non smc means big companies smc means small and medium sized companies level 1 enterprises other than corporate entities total four levels are there level 1 level 2 level 3 level 4 so earlier these are only three levels are there right now they are broadly categorized into four levels level 1 is the bigger enterprises level 2 level 3 level 4 are msme medium and small and medium small and micro enterprises level 1 is a big enterprises this is other than corporate that is non corporate entities that means diluted eps presentation is only applicable with respect to uh, non smc as well as level 1 entities only for the remaining all enterprises no need to present the diluted eps they can simply measure the basic eps as well as they can simply present such basic eps in their statement of pnl next sir definition here the definition and measurement are both are same because if i reveal the measurement automatically i am going to define earning earnings per share itself so that's why i am directly start with measurement measurement first which measurement we are try to cover sir basic eps we are try to measure sir basic eps is equal to i mean simply earnings available to each and every equity shareholder earnings available to each and every equity shareholder is nothing but the total earnings available to equity shareholders e a e s h the full form is earnings available or attributable to equity shareholder once you find out the earnings available to equity shareholders it should be multiplied with it sh sorry it should be divided with number of equity shares number of equity shares but what are such number is it i i can consider the number at the beginning i mean we are going to calculate eps as on the date of the uh, financial reporting date i mean uh, as on the last date of the financial reporting period in general we are going to calculate the eps as on 31st march now can i consider the number of equity shares existing as on 31st march or can i consider the number of equity shares at the beginning or can i consider the on an average i should need to consider the average number of equity shares such average is also weighted average weighted average number of equity shares which is nothing but weighs so the formula for basic eps is equal to earnings available to equity shareholders divided by weighted average number of equity shares now out of the entire as 20 paragraphs you know each and every accounting standard is going to divide into different paragraphs out of the entire a paragraphs related to numerator that is earnings available to equity shareholders only two paragraphs are going to discuss remaining all paragraphs are going to discuss about denominator factor that is with respect to weighted average number of equity shares only first let me discuss what is the meaning of earnings available to equity shareholders please come below all of you earnings available to equity shareholders sir in point of view of equity shareholders how much earnings are available that is the meaning of earnings available to equity shareholders that means current year we are getting certain profit out of such profit first you should need to make payment to the taxation authority then you will get profit after tax from profit after tax you should need to make payment for preference dividend sir out of the profits if you are making transfer certain amount for general reserve out of the profits if you are transferring certain amounts for the purpose of declaration of dividend for the equity shareholders all are again belongs to the equity shareholders funds only am i right so that's why related to preference shareholders how much we are going to make a payment you should need to the reduced while getting the earnings available to equity shareholders that's why from profit after tax you should need to reduce preference dividend preference dividend sir whenever you are paying the dividend dividend distribution tax is applicable but here two scenarios are there as per the recent amendment which is the recent amendment guys please all of you concentrate what what is that recent amendment sir earlier situation before making before coming to the amendment i am telling you there is one section in the income tax act 1961 which is section 115o which is exclusively discussed about dividend distribution tax whenever a company declared 
and distributed such dividend among the equity shareholders on behalf of the equity shareholders the company itself reduced the dividend distribution tax and paid the remaining amount now such dividend distribution tax is ultimately paid by the company to the government this is for the purpose of administrating issue on behalf of collecting money from the each and every equity shareholder it is better to collect tax by the government directly from the company as like tds that is the intention of insertion of the provision with respect to ddt that's why the dividend was already taxed in the hands of the company that's why at the time of receipt of dividend in the hands of the shareholder which is exempted under section 10 sub section 34 which is not the current scenario which is the earlier scenario that means earlier at the time of paying dividend by the company to the shareholder it was already taxable in the hands of the company under the section 115 as per the dividend distribution tax rules ddt so in the hands of the shareholder or in the hands of the investor which is exempted under section 1034 but as per the recent amendment that is as per finance act 2021 yes which is as per finance act 2021 ddt was abolished by the central government actually ddt was abolished now there is a no concept of dividend distribution tax if the dividend is not taxed in the hands of the company then at the time of receipt of such dividend by the shareholder from the company it was taxable in the hands of the shareholders or the investors that's why 1034 exemption is not available right now because such ddt concept is not applicable that's why which is taxable in the hands of the investor that is the current scenario that means in the present scenario dividend distribution tax is not applicable but why still i am telling in examination problem if dividend distribution tax is given then you should need to calculate dividend distribution tax on preference dividend as well to know the earnings available to equity shareholders if such dividend distribution tax itself is not given in the examination problem you can simply ignore from profit after tax you can simply reduce the preference dividend then you will get the earnings available to equity shareholders but to be frankly speaking right now dividend distribution tax concept is not at all in applicable mode the entire dividend which is received by the shareholder or the investor is taxable in his hands only section 1034 exemption is not applicable after amendment okay next sir one more doubt you are telling that we can directly consider the profit after tax can i consider the abnormal profits here abnormal profits means one major fire accident occurred the loss was the loss is uh, 5 lakhs but i get the claim with respect to uh, that fire accident i got in and around 10 lakhs now which is a abnormal gain or maybe abnormal losses maybe abnormal losses certain theft happened sir certain loss i got can i consider such all abnormal items in calculation of such profit after tax yes you can absolutely consider along with the normal items you can absolutely consider the abnormal items as well that is every income and expenditure including abnormal items also you can try to consider in such profit after tax next sir can i consider extraordinary items do you know the difference between extraordinary items and ordinary items we are try to cover through accounting standard 5 guys extraordinary activities are those activities which are clearly distinct from the ordinary activities yes at this point of time i can tell you only that part only to put it simply extraordinary activities means which in generally not occurred in the normal course of business activities which can be directly identifiable maybe floods came huge loss occurred maybe the pandemic situation was there huge loss occurred maybe certain properties are attached by the government yes which is an extraordinary activity maybe we received certain government grants but due to non violation of such conditions uh, sorry but due to violation of such conditions we need to refund such government grant which is also an extraordinary item sir in detail discussion will be there in accounting standard 5 so for the time being i am telling you sir can i consider the extraordinary items in calculation of such profit after tax absolutely and one more important issue the third important issue i am going to discuss with respect to earnings available to equity shareholders sir if the preference shares are the non cumulative preference shares whenever 
dividend is declared by the company with respect to, to such non cumulative preference shares then only i need to reduce then only i need to reduce the preference dividend to get the earnings available to equity shareholders but if the e but if the preference shares are the cumulative preference shares but if the preference shares are the cumulative preference shares irrespective of the declaration whether the company declared in the particular year or not you can reduce the preference dividend for for the purpose of calculation of earnings available to equity shareholders one more time i'm repeating sir when actually there is necessary to reduce the preference dividend in evaluation of earnings available to equity shareholders if the preference dividend is declared if the company is not declared then the entire profits are available for equity shareholders only that's why it is clearly given that if the preference shares are the non cumulative preference shares non cumulative preference shares means if a particular year company is unable to declare the dividend then preference shareholders will not get any dividend in the future that's why if the company declared the dividend then only we need to reduce the preference dividend in a valuation of earnings available to equity shareholders that's why it is clearly given that if declare we can reduce in a valuation of earnings available to equity shareholders but if such preference shares are cumulative preference shares cumulative preference shares means if the company is having insufficient profits that's why company is unable to declare in the current year then the year in which the company is having the sufficient profits should need to compensate along with that year dividend along with that year dividend and the previous year dividends as well that is nothing but cumulative preference shares so that's why it is clearly given that in case of cumulative preference shares irrespective of the declaration of the dividend that means in the current year company attained the losses but still you can reduce the preference dividend but still you can reduce the preference dividend in calculation of earnings available to equity shareholders i'll give a small example here let us assume in the year 2021 we are getting a losses now in calculation of eps while evaluation of earnings available to equity shareholders you can reduce the preference dividend you can evaluate earnings available to equity shareholders then you can calculate eps now coming to the year 21 22 company is getting profits now if the company is getting profits company should need to pay the preference dividend both for the year 2021 previous year as well as 21 22 but now at the time of evaluation of eps in the year 21 22 for calculation of earnings available to equity shareholders i should need to reduce 21 22 dividend only the reason is 2021 dividend i already reduced at the in the year 2021 sir declaration of the dividend is completely irrelevant in case of cumulative preference shares whether you declared or not i don't mind sir i mean in the current year that current year dividend for the purpose of calculation of earnings available to equity shareholders i will reduce whether you declared or not that's why i clearly told that irrespective of the declaration in case of cumulative preference shares we can reduce the preference dividend but if the preference shares are the non cumulative preference shares the company declared then only i can reduce okay so total three important issues we discussed in calculation of earnings available to equity shareholders the first important issue from profit after tax we can reduce preference dividend and if ddt is applicable then we can reduce otherwise you can simply ignore then you will get earnings available to equity shareholders sir in such profit after tax can i consider abnormal items absolutely can i consider extraordinary items absolutely with respect to the preference dividend if the existing preference shares are non cumulative preference shares if preference dividend declared then only we can reduce if the existing preference shares are the cumulative preference shares whether the company is declared the preference dividend or not you can reduce the preference dividend for evaluation of earnings available to equity shareholders that's it guys now come to weights weighted average number of equity shares weighted average number of equity shares now sir in the intro of this accounting standard i told you average number of equity shares means we are not considering the equity shares at the beginning we are not considering the equity shares at the ending on on average how many number of equity shares we are going to continue such name is nothing but weighted average number of equity shares such number is nothing but weighted average number of equity shares now about the weight 
what what, what component you can provide it as a weight sarcio i am going to explain things related to weight through different cases totally here i am going to take three cases guys case number 1 case number 2 case number 3 please concentrate according to cases only i developed the illustration sir i am in the year 2021 the financial year is 2021 please all of you uh, consider my highlighted highlighted one only as on 14 2020 at the beginning of the year we are having 1 lakh equity shares we are having 1 lakh equity shares sir this information is not irrelevant for the time being something paid up value something i given na that is not relevant for the time being but relevant face value is 10 rupees just let us assume for the case number 1 face value is 10 rupees and the all the equity shares are fully paid up case number 1 all equity shares are fully paid up let us assume this so that's why paid up value is irrelevant for me at the beginning 14 2020 i have 1 lakh equity shares and 110 2020 after 6 months the company issued 50000 equity shares and come to the last one as on 31st march 2021 the total number of equity shares outstanding are 150000 sir what about this 40000 buyback sir for case number 1 there is no buyback for case number 1 there is no buyback let us assume now all of you please concentrate only total two components are there beginning 1 lakh after 6 months i issued 50000 at the ending i have 150000 equity shares now i need to calculate weighted average number of equity shares here the weight is period value weight weight is period value weight how i should need to cali- adopt the period value weight sir at the beginning how many number of equity shares you have <coughs> excuse me at the beginning how many number of equity shares you have 1 lakh such 1 lakh equity shares are there throughout the 12 months right are there throughout the 12 months because beginning 1 lakh at the ending of 1 lakh 50000 such 1 lakh is there that's why the entire 1 lakh equity shares out of the 12 months they are outstanding for the entire 12 months that's why the weight i am assigning here is 12 by 12 now coming to the 50000 equity shares are not outstanding entire 12 months out of the 12 months they are outstanding for 6 months only that's why for 50000 equity shares i am assigning only 6 months that is 6 by 12 is the weight now i calculated weight average number of equity shares i got 1 lakh 25000 this is method number 1 in another method also the same weighted average number of equity shares you can calculate that is at the beginning 1 lakh up to the date of next issue how many number of months outstanding 6 months that is 1 lakh into 6 by 12 plus after issue of 50000 equity shares the number of equity shares will become 1 lakh plus 50000 which is 1 lakh 50000 now 1 lakh 50000 these 1 lakh 50000 equity shares are outstanding for another 6 months period that's why here i multiplied with 6 by 12 here also i multiplied with 6 by 12 but here only 1 lakh here 1 lakh 50000 i got the same number of equity shares in any method you can adopt for the purpose of calculation of weighted average number of equity shares either you can follow the method number 1 or method number 2 that is up to you i'll add one more component here what is that as on 11 2021 company made a buyback of equity shares to the extent of 40000 shares then how to calculate the weighted average number of equity shares please all of you concentrate here let us adopt method number 2 after adding this buyback beginning we have 1 lakh equity share from 14 2020 to 110 2026 months 1 lakh into 6 by 12 plus after issue of 50000 equity shares the number of equity shares will become 1 lakh 50000 so 1 lakh 50000 into up to the date of buyback how many number of months are there from 1st october to 1st january 3 months so 1 lakh 50000 into 3 by 12 is the next component once buyback happen once buyback happen 1 lakh 50 minus 40 it will become 1 lakh 10000 these 1 lakh 10000 equity shares are outstanding only for the remaining 3 months so that's why 1 lakh 10000 into 3 by 12 so then we are getting 1 lakh 15000 i mean whenever buyback is exist then you need to reduce whenever issue is there you need to add the number of equity shares for that purpose only i added here and the last case guys please all of you concentrate here i am complicating the little bit now 
for case number one and case number two, our assumption is all the equity shares are fully paid up, right? Now, I am giving the newly issued equity shares at partly paid up. The face value is 10 rupees and the paid up value is only 5 rupees. But the existing equity shares paid up value is 10 rupees and the buyback is also 10 rupees. Only the new, newly issued equity shares are partly paid up out of 10 rupees face value, only 5 rupees is paid up value. Then how to calculate the weighted average number of equity shares. Now my question is, if you want to try to consider this entire 50,000 equity shares in calculation of gains, they are also getting the equal earnings as like 1 lakh equity shareholders. But that is not justifiable basis because 1 lakh equity shareholder are paid fully, but these 50,000 equity shares are only paid partly. You know, in dividend calculation, I mean, for the purpose of payment of dividend itself, we are paying dividend on the basis of paid up value. That's why at the time of attributing, at, at the time of attributing earnings as well, we should attribute the entire earnings available to equity shareholders among the equity shareholders by considering the paid up value as well. Apart from the period value weight, you should try to consider the paid up value weight as well. That means here weight means total two components. One is period weight, another one is paid up value weight. I mean, out of this 50,000 equity shares, I should try to consider 25,000 only because 50,000 50, into five by 10 means, which is nothing but 25,000. You can tell that 50,000 partly paid up equity shares are 25,000 fully paid up equity shares. 50,000 partly paid up equity shares as equal to the 25,000 fully paid up equity shares. So to consider that paid up value weight, now the measurement of the measurement of wins will look like this. Now, please allow me to concentrate. Initially, we have 1 lakh equity shares are there. 1 lakh period value weight. Sir, period value. Oh, so first, first let me work out the paid, paid up value weight. Sir, face value is 10 rupees and the paid up value is also 10 rupees. That's a paid up value weight is 10 by 10. Next, come to come to period value weight. From 1 for 2020 to 110 2020, how many number of months are there? Six months into 6 by 12. Am I right? Plus, next, you are issuing 50,000 equity shares, right? Now, total number of equity shares are 1,50,000. But out of that, 1 lakh equity shares are fully paid up. 1 lakh into 10 by 10 and the 50,000 equity shares are partly paid up. 50,000 into 5 by 10. We should need to work out like this because 1 lakh are fully paid up and 50,000 are partly paid up. Now, from the date of issue to the next date of buyback, how many number of months are there? 3 months. That's why here 3 by 12, here 3 by 12. Period value weight same from the beginning to the I mean, uh, from that particular date to the next issue or next buyback, how many number of months you should need to consider. Next, after completion of the buyback, let us assume this buyback happened from the uh, opening outstanding number of equity shares. Now, 1 lakh minus 40,000, these equity shares will become 60,000. These are fully paid up into 10 by 10. Remaining number of months, how many number of months after buyback? Into 3 by 12. Now, these 50,000 equity shares are partly paid up. Remaining number of months are 3 by 12. This is the computation of fans. Sir, what you are trying to telling from these different cases, sir? I will try to tell you only one thing. Vance is equal to equity shares outstanding into period value weight into paid up value weight. Period value weight into paid up value weight. Here, period value weight is equal to outstanding months divided by 12 months. In the current year 12 months, how many number of months such shares are outstanding? which is nothing but period value weight. Paid up value weight is nothing but paid up value divided by face value. Paid up value divided by face value. Wherever you see paid up value divided by face value, paid up value divided by face value, paid up value divided by face value is the formula for paid up value weight. Sir, uh, to understand the better manner the paid up value weight, here, I took another small illustration. This illustration is with respect to the paid up value weight, guys. Please allow me to concentrate. Because so many people uh, may wrongly understand the paid up value weight component. So for that, to explain in the better manner, just I'm developing a small illustration. Let us assume the face value of the share is 100 rupees. 
and the issue price of that particular share is 130 out of which 100 is the face value 30 rupees is the premium now amount collected from each and every shareholder is 70 rupees let us assume how much amount collected 70 rupees out of which 40 rupees is face value and the 30 rupees premium is there now in generally premium is collected along with allotment so that's where that 40 rupees is towards face value and 30 rupees is towards premium now my question is now my question is what is the paid up value weight here sir sir is it paid up value weight is 70 by 100 you thought because paid up value is 70 and the face value is 100 that is wrong that is not the paid up value i clearly already established here here 70 by 100 is not the paid up value that is wrong paid up value means out of the face value how much they paid out of 100 how much they paid 40 only they paid that's why paid up value weight means 40 by 100 that's why i clearly told you paid up value weight is nothing but paid up value towards face value divided by face value paid up value towards face value is 40 the total paid up value is 70 but out of such 70 towards premium is 30 towards face value is 40 i should only consider the paid up value towards face value divided by face value that is the correct calculation of the paid up value weight do you understand sir uh, the calculation or the measurement part of the calculation or measurement part of earnings available to equity shareholders over and a weighted average number of equity shares over the crux of ea esh and wins i clearly established so still the discussion is not at over we will try to consider certain other provisions in calculation of wins i already told you regarding the numerator only uh, two paragraphs they discussed but regarding the denominator much more paragraphs are there so now what is the next paragraph or the next issue with respect to weighted average number of equity shares sir effective date what is the meaning of effective date when such equity shares we can assume it to be effective in calculation of wins i mean in calculation of the period period value weight outstanding number of months divided by 12 months is the formula na? from which date such equity shares are coming into effect i can assume for that purpose effective date concept is inserted so based on the concept of effective date we can easily calculate number of months outstanding in the current financial year from which we can get the period value weight from which we can get the wins from which we can easily calculate the eps do you understand so that means the effective date concept is highly interrelated to calculation of number of outstanding months for that particular equity shares now if the equity shares are issued for cash then when we can assume such equity shares are coming into effective in our company from the date as on which cash is receivable not from the date on which cash is received from the date on which cash is receivable in case of convertible debentures the effective date is date of conversion in case of equity shares are issued as a part payment of loan repayment of the loan date on which interest ceases to accrue because once you paid the loan once you repaid the loan then no party can recognize the interest in their books of accounts if you already repaid the loan we are not recognizing interest as an expenditure and the other party is also not recognizing the interest as an income that means the date as on which interest is ceases to accrue interest doesn't accrue any further such date you can consider as an effective date of equity shares next repayment to the creditors sir one supplier supplied certain raw material as a payment to such supplier you are going to issue your equity shares then what is the effective date of such equity shares date of settlement date of settlement to the creditors is the effective date sir in purchase of assets if you issued the equity shares what is the effective date sir date as on which such asset is recognized into your books of accounts is the effective date of equity shares in consideration of services maybe a chartered accountant provided certain consultancy services to you as a consultancy charges your company is going to issue the equity shares then what is the effective date of such equity shares date on which such services rendered date on which the services rendered next in case of amalgamation you know hope you already uh, entered in the regular course just you were watching as a revision process you already know the basic meaning of the amalgamation so in case of amalgamation what happened one company is going to absorb another company our two companies are put together it is evolving as a new company anything may happen it is like a pure absorption or amalgamation anything may happen 
now in case of amalgamation the purchasing company is going to pay the purchase consideration to the selling company now such purchase consideration is paid in the form of equity shares then what is the effective date of such equity shares for example two companies are there a limited and b limited sir a limited is a selling company b limited is a purchasing company now b limited is absorbing the a limited now b limited will pay purchase consideration to the equity shareholders of a limited in the form of equity shares now what is the effective date of such equity shares that is depending upon the type of amalgamation if the amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of purchase then the effective date is date of acquisition if the amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of merger then the effective date is beginning of the current reporting period sir what is the meaning of purchase what is the meaning of merger so uh, here i can't tell you in detail discussion will be there in the near future we are try to cover the topic amalgamation definitely in the marathon session so i'll clearly tell you what is the meaning of amalgamation in the nature of purchase what is the meaning of amalgamation in the nature of merger but it is purchase method the effective date you can try to consider as the date of acquisition if it is a merger method the effective date is beginning of the current reporting period beginning of the current reporting period that means for purchase date of amalgamation is relevant in case of merger amalgamation in the nature of merger date of amalgamation is relevant we can consider whenever you are issued such equity shares as a purchase consideration to the selling company we should consider that those are effective from the first day of the current reporting period itself do you understand so total sir how can i easily remember the effective date concept sir you should not consider you should not consider issue of equity share side you can consider the other side for example equity shares are issued for cash don't consider the date of issue of equity shares consider the date on which cash is receivable in case of convertible debenture date of conversion in case of repayment of loan think in point of view of loan when the interest ceases to accrue repayment of creditors think in point of view of the creditors when the actual settlement happened to the creditors in case of purchase of asset think in point of view of asset when the asset is recognized into books of accounts in consideration of services think in point of view of services when the data is on which the services are rendered do you understand if you think in the other angle side that itself is the effective date of issue of equity shares this is the concept of effective date guys <laughs> please consider all of you still two more topics we need to uh, consider with respect to eps sir the calculation of gains as well as calculation of earnings available to equity shareholders is over nothing is great i told you the entire crux of the concept next we are going to discuss uh, two different types of eps when eps is calculated in case of bonus shares eps is how to uh, how to measure in case of right shares so basic eps we already calculated the formula for basic eps is very much easy which is earnings available to equity shareholders by gains now still we are in the calculation of basic eps at a two different situations in case bonus shares exist how to calculate this basic eps in case right shares exist how to calculate this basic eps we are try to cover right guys first let us calculate basic eps in case of bonus shares please all of you come here calculation of eps in case of bonus shares let me explain the concept with a small illustration in the year 2021 financial year earnings available to equity shareholders are 10 lakhs gains weighted average number of equity shares are 1 lakh directly given then eps is how much guys earnings available to equity shareholders divided by gains which is 10 lakhs divided by 1 lakh which is 10 rupees per share fine now come to the year 2122 in 2122 earnings available to equity shareholders are 12 lakhs and equity shares at the beginning equity shares at the beginning were 1 lakh because the last year uh, equity shares are 1 lakh the same equity shares are there at the beginning now the issue is as on 14 2021 that means in the current year beginning itself company issued the bonus shares in the ratio of 1 is to 2 what is the meaning of in the uh, what is the meaning of 1 is to 2 for every two existing equity shares they will get one bonus share that means number of bonus shares are 50000 that is 1 lakh into 1 by 2 is nothing but 50000 bonus shares am i right now let me calculate eps now 
let me calculate eps after issue of bonus shares as on 31st march 2022 earnings are 12 lakhs divided by weighted average number of equity shares sir beginning 1 lakh are there at the same number of shares 50000 are also there at the beginning so total 1 lakh plus 50000 1 lakh 50000 so period value weight into 12 by 12 so the total number of veins are also equal to the 1 lakh 50000 now eps is how much guys 12 lakhs divided by 1 lakh 50000 eps is how much 8 rupees per share i got now if you compare in case of intra firm comparison na in case of intra firm comparison intra firm means your company eps of the current year your company eps of the current year you can compare with the previous year now the current year eps is 8 rupees and the previous year eps is 10 rupees what you feel what you feel you can simply conclude that current year performance is dropped while compared with the previous year performance do you think that is it true because current year we earned the earnings of 12 lakhs but in the previous year we earned the earnings of only 10 lakhs to be frankly speaking the current year earnings are are the current year performance is enhanced while compared with the previous year because earnings are increased from 10 lakhs to 12 lakhs there is increase in earnings the performance is increased but while comparing the eps the conclusion may be the wrong it is clearly shown that the eps was decreased while compared with the previous year eps you know why it happened like that due to this bonus shares due to this bonus shares due to the bonus shares there is increase in the denominator there is increase in the denominator so obviously if there is increase in the denominator the fraction value got decreased even though there is increase in the earnings due to increase more increase in the veins there is decrease in the eps that means it is not correct to compare the current year eps with the previous year eps directly whenever bonus shares are exist we should need to compare the current year eps with previous year adjusted eps previous year adjusted eps you should need to revamp the previous year eps which is known as adjusted eps how i need to revamp the previous year eps that is you can consider the previous year earnings sir how to calculate the previous year eps previous year earnings divided by previous year wins that is previous year earnings 10 lakhs divided by previous year wins plus if at all bonus shares are exist in the previous year itself what are the total number of equity shares what are the total number of equity shares if at all such bonus shares are there in the previous year itself what will be the total number of weighted average number of, what is the total number of equity shares you can find out that is if the same bonus shares are exist in the previous year then the total number of shares in the previous year are 1 lakh plus 50000 total 1 lakh 50000 then you are getting the eps at the rate of 6.67 now you can compare 8 rupees of equity share with 6.67 rupees of the equity share now there is a clear cut enhancement of the performance in the current year will compared with the previous year the main objective of presentation of the eps is comparison of the financial statements of our company with another company or with the current year with the previous financial year if such comparison itself give the wrong conclusions then presentation of eps is meaningless that's why we are adjusting the previous year eps on the assumption that if such bonus shares are exist in the previous year itself what will be the eps of the previous year such adjusted eps you can compare with the previous uh, uh, such adjusted eps you can compare with the current year eps in the current year if bonus shares are there then you will get the correct conclusion whether the real performance of the current year is enhanced or decreased you can easily identify so the conclusion is whenever bonus shares are there whenever bonus shares are there you should need to calculate for the current reporting period along with the basic eps you should also need to present the adjusted basic eps basic eps you can easy you can calculate in the normal mode adjusted basic eps is nothing but the previous year earnings divided by pre previous year earnings divided by previous year wins plus bonus shares 
that is nothing but current year wins previous year wins plus bonus shares is nothing but current year wins that is previous year earnings divided by current year wins then you will get the adjusted eps so the formula also same i given here so adjusted eps is equal to previous year earnings divided by previous year wins plus bonus shares which is nothing but which is nothing but current year wins one more important point here i want to tell you sir in case of bonus issue what will be the effective date of bonus shares sir whenever such bonus shares can be issued not at the beginning whenever such bonus shares issued in the current reporting period the effective date of the bonus shares will be first day of the previous reporting period beginning of the previous reporting period not of the current as well beginning of the previous reporting period the effective date of the bonus shares will be first day of the previous reporting period that is the reason why in calculation of adjusted eps we consider the wins as 150000 because in calculation of adjusted eps we may assume that bonus shares existence will be there from the first day of the previous reporting period that is the reason why i told you the wins will be 1 lakh plus 50000 directly previous year wins plus bonus shares you can directly consider in calculation of adjusted eps you may ask a question Sir, why you are considering the effective date of the bonus shares will be the first day of the previous reporting period? The reason is, what is the meaning of bonus shares? You can tell me. Capitalization of profits. Capitalization of profits. Yes, bonus shares means capitalization of profits. Capitalization of profits means simply you are transferring funds from reserves to the share capital. That means reserves will be there in the previous year itself. Na? Your reserves will be there in the previous year itself. Now you are considering the reserves into the share capital. That means the existence of reserves will be there in the previous year itself. That's why the effective date of the bonus shares will be beginning of the previous year reporting period only because the bonus shares is nothing but conversion of reserves and surplus into the equity share capital. So here in the effective date calculation, you can add one more thing, which is nothing but bonus shares. The effective date of the bonus shares will be first day of the first day of the previous reporting period and one more thing in cash whenever bonus shares are there in a particular financial year along with the basic eps you should need to calculate the adjusted eps as well adjusted eps is equal to previous year earnings divided by previous year wins plus bonus shares is it okay to all of you this is the concept of calculation of eps whenever bonus shares exist next very very important topic regularly they are testing problems from this topic please all of you put concentration here calculation of basic eps whenever right shares exist calculation of basic eps whenever right shares exist i'll try to explain the entire topic with a small illustration please all of you concentrate here sir we are in the year 2021 in the year 2021, earnings available to equity shareholders are 5 lakhs. How much, guys? Earnings available to equity shareholders? Let us assume which is 5 lakhs. Now, at the beginning of 2020, that is as an 14 2020, 1 lakh equity shares are there. How many number of equity shares are there? 1 lakh. All these are uh, illusionary figures, just I am giving. Face value is 10 rupees. In the outside market, market price is 100 rupees. Now, as on 17 2020 as on 17 2020 company is going to issue right shares so right shares the terms are the terms are it's, it's not said to be two is to one it's, it's said to be one is to two so, sorry wrongly written it is one is to two what is the meaning of one is to two for every two equity shares company is going to issue one right share two is to means two is to one means uh, for every one share, they will get the two shares. But here, the term is one is to two. One is to two means one by two. For every two equity shares, company is going to issue one right share. Total one lakh equity shares are there. For every two shares, one share means we are going to issue 50,000 right shares. Now, if this is the information, if nothing is available, then how we are in generally calculate the EPS? Can you please tell me, guys, all of you, how we are in generally calculate the EPS? First, we know the earnings available to equity shareholders. Let us calculate the wins. Wins at the beginning, 1 lakh equity shares are there, right? 1 lakh into. Next, up to the date of issue of right shares, only 1 lakh equity shares are there. 
that's why the period value weight is 14 2022 17 2020 uh, three months that is 3 by 12 plus after issue of right shares the number of shares will become 1 lakh plus 50000 which is 1 lakh 50000 So the remaining number of months in the in that financial year after issue of right shares, how many number of months? That is one seven twenty twenty two thirty first March means total nine months are there. That is nine by twelve. This is the normal calculation of wins. Do you agree? Whenever right shares are there or not exist, whenever the further shares are issued, this is the calculation of wins. Am I right? There is no special issue. We are also going to calculate the wins in the same manner. That is. Number of equity shares at the beginning multiplied with number of months before issue of right shares divided by twelve plus number of equity shares are exist after right shares into number of months after right issue divided by twelve months. That is the same formula, same formula. Just here I put it in the figures where I spell out in the words. That is the only difference. Okay, fine. But my question is, is it In right shares, any bonus shares are there? I mean, in these right shares, any bonus element is there? Any bonus element is there? Why you are asking that question, sir? Because whenever bonus shares are there, the effective date of the bonus shares will be first date of the previous reporting period itself. First, my question is: in these fifty thousand right shares, any bonus shares are there? First, sir, if you want to know any bonus shares are exist in such right shares, first you should know at which price these right share is issued to the public. Seventy five rupees. In general, right share is issued at less than the current market price. The current market price is hundred rupees, but the issue price is seventy five rupees. Now, is it any bonus shares are there, sir? Is there any bonus shares are there in the right shares? Now, please allow me to concentrate. How we can find out? Bonus shares included on the right shares. I will tell you, sir. That ten dollar is not necessary for the purpose of calculation of wins, but still, in logically to explain all such things, I'll try to provide all such information. First, sir, bonus shares included in the right shares. How I need to check, sir? For example, right now, how much amount you are collecting from the right shareholders? I am collecting amount fifty thousand equity shares. I am going to issue. From each and every right shareholder, I am going to collect seventy five rupees. Total, how much amount, guys? Which is fifty thousand into seventy five, which is thirty seven lakh fifty thousand. You are going to collect thirty seven lakh fifty thousand rupees from the right shareholders. If the same amount, if you collect from other than the right shareholder, how many number of shares you would issue? Right now, you are collected such amount from the right shareholder. That's why you issued fifty thousand shares. I do agree, but if the same amount if you collected from the outside party other than right shareholder, how many number of equity shares you may would issue, sir? If I issue the if I collect the same amount from the outside party, I may issue each and every share for the hundred. That means number of shares I can issue to the outside shareholders are thirty seven lakh fifty thousand divided by hundred, which is equal to thirty seven thousand five hundred. That means, for right shareholder, you are issuing fifty thousand equity shares. But if he is not a right shareholder, he is other than a right shareholder, then you can only issue thirty-seven thousand five hundred shares. That means excess how many shares you are issuing to the right right holders? Twelve thousand five hundred shares are excess you are issuing to the right shareholders. Out of these fifty thousand shares, twelve thousand five hundred shares are bonus shares. Do you agree? That means. In the right shares, certain bonus shares are also there. In the right shares, certain bonus shares are also there. That's why the effective date of the bonus shares will be first day of the previous reporting period itself. Now, out of this one lakh, out of this one lakh, I need to include bonus shares. I need to include bonus shares because. Even though right shares are issued as on one seven twenty twenty, out of these fifty thousand, twelve thousand five hundred shares are bonus shares, na. Now this one lakh plus bonus shares, I can assume that those are outstanding from the first day of the current reporting period itself, because the effective date of the bonus shares itself we already seen that beginning of the previous year reporting period itself. 
sir bonus shares are exist in the previous reporting period itself means in the current year anyway such bonus shares are exist that's why in considering in considering the uh, veins veins calculation apart from the number of equity shares at the outstanding at the beginning you can also include the bonus shares then you can multiply the period value weight plus 1 lakh plus total right shares sir then can i include the bonus shares here as well no already included no worry 1 lakh 50000 means 1 lakh at the beginning and 50000 right shares now in such 50000 right shares already 12500 bonus shares are there so that's why 1 lakh 50000 into 9 by 12 that means the formula is very much easy whenever right shares are there the formula is number of equity shares at the beginning plus bonus shares included in the right shares multiplied with number of months number of months up to the issue of right shares divided by 12 plus number of shares after issue of the right shares multiplied with number of months after issue of right shares divided by 12 that is the formula for calculation of veins whenever right shares are there now i am revealing the same thing here please concentrate come down come down what is the formula for eps what is the formula for eps whenever right shares exist this is same earnings available to equity shareholders divided by divided by number of shares outstanding at the beginning into bonus element into bonus element or plus bonus shares you can write anything sir because number of shares at the beginning plus bonus shares or number of shares at the beginning into bonus element sir what is this bonus element sir you can directly add the bonus shares now okay for the time being you can consider it as plus bonus shares included in the right shares so number of shares at the beginning plus bonus shares included in the right shares plus number of shares after right issue number of shares after right issue how many 150000 here how much guys 150000 that is 150000 multiplied with number of months after issue of rights divided by 12 now the total formula for veins number of shares outstanding at the beginning plus bonus shares into number of months before issue of right shares divided by 12 which is simply which is simply 1 lakh plus bonus shares into 3 by 12 plus number of shares after rights issue into number of months after issue of rights divided by 12 which is 1 lakh 50000 into 9 by 12 so the same computational figures what i put i spell in the form of words this is the formula for eps when right shares are exist the simple logic is whenever right shares are exist there is certain bonus shares under such right shares along with the shares outstanding at the beginning you should also try to consider the bonus shares included under such right shares also that point if you remember then you can easily appreciate the entire concept of eps when right shares are exist in the next question next question please allow me concentrate sir on behalf of adding the bonus shares here you multiplied the bonus element right you can add the bonus shares but why you multiplied the bonus element sir i will reveal that answer please concentrate all of you please concentrate all of you the difference between bonus element and bonus shares i will tell you okay sir what i told here here i told you in the right shares 37500 bonus shares are there i told you am i right for example if i tell the same thing like this Now, on behalf of expressing in terms of number of shares, now the number of bonus shares are 12,500. If I express it in terms of fraction, which is known as bonus element. For example, here bonus element is, sir, bonus shares are 12,500 shares and the existing shares are 37,500 under right shares, 37,500 plus 12,500, which is 50,000 shares. That means out of 50,000 shares, the bonus, share, the bonus shares are 12,500 which is how much, which is 0.25, which is 0.25, am I right? How it is in generally expressed, which is expressed as 1.25. I mean, for every one, every one right share, 0.25 bonus share is there. That is the meaning of uh, this 1.25. Just give a second. Uh, I'll, I'll take another illustration for better understanding. Here itself it is there. Please all of you come below, come down. 
sir bonus element 1.05 what is the meaning of 1.05 sir what is the meaning of 1.05 for every one right share 0.05 bonus share is there that is the meaning 1.05 here i told you now simple just for logically I, I i told you sir 1.25 means for every one right share 0.25 bonus share is there here for every one every one right share 0.05 bonus share is there that is the meaning of bonus element that means if you directly multiply with that 1.05 here two components are there 1 plus 0.05 this is the existing share this is the bonus share that's why you can work out number of shares outstanding at the beginning plus bonus shares or in another way number of shares outstanding at the beginning into such bonus element which is 1.05 automatically you will get opening number of shares plus bonus shares you can add the bonus shares or you can directly multiply the bonus element now the next question is how to calculate this bonus element sir how to how to calculate this bonus element please allow you concentrate for this purpose i will try to discuss the calculation of bonus element completely in different direction not in this manner not in this manner so just for the purpose of uh, knowing the things in the layman approach just i told you how to calculate the number of bonus shares but you should not add the bonus shares directly in this formula you should always multiply the bonus element only then automatically you will get number of shares at the beginning plus bonus shares now how to calculate this bonus element i want to reveal please concentrate sir whenever a company is announced right shares whenever a company is made an announcement that our company is going to issue the right shares as on so and so date then the company shares are increasing like anything you know because for example we are in the financial year 2021 sir we are in the financial year 2021 company announced as on 1 4 2020 what is that company is going to issue the right shares as on 1 7 2020 then every person is willing to buy your company shares your company shares are increasing like anything your company shares are increasing like anything the reason is the shareholder who got the shares are who holds such shares as on 1 7 2020 he will definitely get certain right shares at less than market price that's where the demand is used. That's where the market price is increased like anything. Such an equity share before issue of right shares is known as come right share, which is not a right share. The existing share, the existing share before issue of right shares is known as come right share. Why it is known as come right share? Because if I hold such come right share, then I got certain right shares as on the cutoff date. Am I right? once the right shares are issued as on that cutoff date the existing equity shares will become the x right shares now the company market price is start decreasing do you know the reason because once the right share is issued nobody is interested to willing to buy because no one will get the right shares further am i right now the bonus element is nothing but after issue of right shares how much price before issue of right shares how much price the fraction itself is the bonus element the fraction itself is the bonus element included in that right share that is come right share price divided by x right share price is nothing but bonus element sir certain bonus amount included in such right share now how much bonus element sir the bonus element is nothing but before issue of the right shares what is the market price use market price now divided by after issue of the right shares what is the market price the the division itself is the bonus element if you divide if you will get which is 1.05 then the meaning of this 1.05 is nothing but sir out of this 0.05 is the bonus element i mean sir if one lakh shares are there out of which 0.05 5000 shares are bonus shares that is the meaning that's why you can directly multiply with this bonus element on behalf of adding the bonus share that's where the formula is earnings available to equity shareholders divided by number of shares outstanding at the beginning into bonus element into number of months before issue of right shares divided by 12 plus number of shares after rights issue into number of months after issue of rights divided by 12 don't buy hot it which is a simple calculation of wins as like in the normal way the only difference is 
at the beginning of the equity shares we are also including the bonus shares on behalf of adding the bonus shares i am multiplying the bonus element remaining there is no change in the formula now how to calculate this bonus element the calculation of bonus element is nothing but come right share price divided by x right share price come right share price is in generally given in the problem then how to calculate the x right share price is the another issue x right share price is nothing but after issue of the right shares what is the price of the existing share is nothing but x right share price now let us come to the calculation of x right share price which is also known as theoretical x right share price t stands for theoretical theoretical x right share price sir why it is called as theoretical x right share price which is not a real real right price because after issue of the rights how much is the price in real time scenario is different which is the real x, x right share price but here we are going to calculate in the theoretical mode on the paper mode that's why which is known as theoretical x right share price how much sir which is very simple guys theoretical x right share price is nothing but before issue of the right shares how many number of shares you have let us assume before issue of the shares how many number of shares we have in in my example uh the number of shares were 1 lakh right that is 1 lakh into how many number of shares we have 1 lakh sir each and every equity share before issue of right shares how much 100 fine plus how many number of right shares issued 50000 right shares are issued how much amount you collected from each and every right share sir i collected uh, 75 rupees this is the value of the existing shares guys existing 1 lakh value is 100 from the right shares you collected 75 rupees each which is the proceeds from the right shares divided by total number of shares after right issue 1 lakh plus 50000 which is 1 lakh 50000 which is nothing but theoretical x right share price so the formula for theoretical x right share price is number of shares before right issue into market price plus proceeds from right issue divided by total number of shares after right issue now how to calculate the eps step number one first to calculate the tarp after that calculate the bonus element then you can calculate the veins then you can simply calculate the eps first you should need to calculate the tarp how to calculate the tarp existing before issue of right shares how many number of shares are there multiply with the market price of each share plus proceeds from the right share divided by total number of shares after right issue then you will get theoretical x right price they already given market price before the right issue market price before the right issue is nothing but come right share price which is nothing but come right share price come right share price divided by x right share price you will get the bonus element then in calculation of the veins because we can assume that bonus shares are exist at the beginning of the previous reporting period itself so number of shares outstanding at the beginning you can multiply with the bonus element into number of months before issue of right shares divided by 12 plus number of shares after rights issue sir why you are not multiplying the bonus element in the second component sir you know already in the right shares bonus shares are there na in such 50000 already 12000 final bonus shares are there na that's why once you added the right shares means automatically you included the bonus shares as well again don't multiply one more time with the bonus element then the wrong calculation may occur so number of shares after right shares after right issue means automatically bonus element included in the right issue also included into number of months after issue of rights divided by 12 then you will be automatically get eps we can try to do one problem which is very much important concept regularly they are asking whenever they test question from as 20 uh, they are directly picking the problem from on based on this topic only so let me take up one problem for the discussion and that is better idea uh, as 20 right Yes, please consider here. This is the problem. Problem number four. Net profit for the year 2011, which is given at 11 lakhs. Uh, net profit for the year 2012, which is given at 15 lakhs. Number of shares outstanding prior to rights issue, 5 lakhs. Before issue of the right shares, number of shares are 5 lakhs. Right share issue price is 15 rupees. Last day to exercise the rights is 1st March 2012 right issue is one new share for each five outstanding that is one lakh new shares because existing shares are five lakh shares 
1 by 5 means 1 by 5 into 5 lakhs number of right shares are 1 lakh fair value of one equity share immediately prior to the exercise of the rights on 1st march 2012 will be 21 rupees compute basic eps <coughs> total here two different years are there sir one is 2011 another one is 2012 please all of you come to uh, my solution here which is there total here two different years are there you can easily calculate 2011 eps 2011 eps is how much which is quite easy earnings are 11 lakhs divided by wins number of shares outstanding prior to right shares means in the previous year also we have same 5 lakh shares in 2011 there are no right shares exist that's why in 2011 eps is how much guys 11 lakhs divided by 5 lakhs means which is 2.2 rupees per share which is eps per 2011 if you concentrate the same thing is given 2011 eps is 2.2 rupees per share which is 2011 eps now come back coming to the year 2012 right now in the year 2012 right shares are issued right so whenever right shares are issued then bonus element under right shares concept will be applicable now in calculation of wins first i should multiply with the bonus element with the beginning number of equity shares for the purpose of calculation of bonus element i required come right share price and x right share price come right share price means before issue of the right shares i have the share price 21 after issue of the right shares i should need to work out the theoretical x right share price i mean the first step is calculation of the tariff how to calculate the tariff first number of equity shares at the beginning at the beginning 5 lakh equity shares are there sir each share price is 21 rupees that is 5 lakh into 21 terp calculation terp calculation 5 lakh into 21 that is the value of the existing equity shares plus proceeds from the right shares how many number of right shares issued 1 lakh each right share is issued at which price 15 rupees 1 lakh into 15 1 lakh into 15 which is proceeds from right shares divided by total shares after issue of right shares 5 lakhs plus 1 lakh which is 6 lakhs then the terp is become 20 rupees then calculation of the bonus element come right share price that is 21 divided by x right share price x right share price is 20 rupees so then the bonus element we will get it as 1.05 so right what is the meaning of 1.05 we already explained for each and every one share 0 0.05 bonus share is there that is the meaning of bonus element that means if you mean if you automatically multiply with 1.05 means you are including your bonus share existing one share plus 0 0.05 bonus share so you can directly multiply 1.05 with the beginning of the shares so that's why in calculation of basic eps earnings are 15 lakhs it is clearly given in the problem itself earnings how much guys for the year 2012 which is 15 lakhs okay divided by number of shares at the beginning which is 5 lakhs multiply with the bonus element into number of months before issue of right shares because right shares are issued as on 1st march 2012 in the year 2012 before issue of the right shares number of months outstanding are 2 months that is 2 by 12 plus number of shares after issue of right shares that is 5 lakhs plus number of right shares how much guys 1 lakh 5 lakh plus 1 lakh is equal to 6 lakhs multiplied with number of months after issue of right shares divided by 12 months then you are getting 2.55 rupees per share now please all of you concentrate in the year 2011 the eps is 2.2 per share right now in the year 2012 the eps is 2.55 per share you know that right can you compare 2012 eps directly with 2011 eps do you thought it is correct no whenever bonus shares exist apply the previous concept guys whenever bonus shares exist at the time of comparing the current year eps with the previous year eps the comparison may completely go into the wrong direction you can compare the current year eps with previous year adjusted eps that means previous year eps you can be restate that is previous year earnings divided by previous year wins plus bonus shares that is previous year earnings are 11 lakhs divided by previous year wins 5 lakhs 
into bonus element if you automatically multiply with the bonus element you can add the bonus shares itself the bonus element is 1.05 that is 11 lakhs divided by 5 lakhs into 1.05 which is 2.09 which is known as adjusted eps that means whenever right shares are there along with the calculation of the normal basic eps you should also calculate adjusted eps you can compare current year basic eps with adjusted eps but you cannot compare the current year eps with the previous year eps because bonus shares are there in right shares bonus shares are there along with calculation of the basic eps you should also need to work out adjusted eps for the purpose of intra firm comparison you can compare the current year basic eps with previous year adjusted eps which is nothing but adjusted eps to be reported in the current year that's why if you observe 2011 normal basic eps i calculated 2012 normal basic eps also i calculated for the year 2012 i also calculated adjusted eps you can compare 2012 basic eps with 2012 adjusted eps you cannot compare 2012 basic eps with 2011 basic eps that is the concept of right shares hope everything is clear i uh, i almost spend more time uh, that as per my plan actually I, i want to provide very less guidance here but more than that hope i explain okay just leave it now come to the concept of dilutive eps guys till now we discussed multiple issues related to the basic eps now i am going to discuss about dilutive eps first what is the meaning of dilution what is the meaning of dilution sir dilution means decrease it's not increase decrease decrease in basic eps decrease in basic eps dilutive eps means decrease in basic eps due to dilutive potential equity shares due to dilutive potential equity shares first here two different terms are there dilutive and potential equity shares first question is what is the meaning of potential equity shares actually in accounting standard we are going to learn definition as well na but i didn't explain anywhere definition separately but now i am going to explain the definition of potential equity shares what is the meaning of potential equity shares potential equity share is a financial instrument where the holder of the contract is entitled or may entitle certain equity shares in the future potential equity shares are the financial instruments where the holder of the contract entitles or may entitle certain equity shares in the future if i give certain examples you can easily appreciate the concept of potential equity shares for example convertible debentures are there convertible debenture is a contract in between the holder as well as company holder of that contract as the company where such convertible debenture holder have an option to convert such debentures into the equity shares in the near future then now such convertible debentures are the classic examples for the potential equity shares convertible debenture is a holder of that contract entitles or may entitle in equity shares may entitle equity shares in future do you understand in the same way convertible preference shares is also a classic example for potential equity share that means from these from these contracts the holder of such contract may entitle certain equity shares in the future but not right now dilutive eps we are going to be calculated in future sense i mean in the current year we already calculated basic eps but in future in the worst scenario what will be uh, how much sorry uh, in the in the future in the worst scenario how much decrease in the basic eps is ultimately known from dilutive eps because we are not only <coughs> taking the decisions in the current year information basis we are not only taking the decisions based on the current year information but also taking the decisions based upon the futuristic information as well in future in the worst scenario how much decrease there will be exist in the basic eps is ultimately known through the concept of dilutive eps now <coughs> one more example is there which is very much important bonus element included in options bonus element included in options separate discussion will be there just for the time being you can just remember the uh <coughs> remember the name which is bonus element included in the options so total three major examples are given here convertible debentures convertible preference shares bonus element included in the options dilutive potential equity shares are the financial instruments 
of holder of that contract entitled or may entitle the equity shares. Why you are calculating the dilute EPS? The reason I already told you in future in the worst scenario, how much decrease there in the basic EPS is ultimately known through the dilute EPS, which is based on the futuristic information. Now, the question is how to calculate the dilute EPS. Now, first you already considered the basic earnings here in calculation of basic EPS, basic earnings divided by basic wins you already have you already have right now due to this potential equity share if there is dilute if there is a dilution in the basic eps then such potential equity shares are known as dilutive potential equity shares because maybe considering this potential equity shares there may be decrease in the basic eps or there may be increase in the basic eps if there is a decrease, then only you should try to consider it as a dilute VPS. But if there is an increase in there, then there is no dilute VPS. Basic EPS itself is a dilute VPS. Do you understand what I'm telling? After considering these potential equity shares, which ultimately lead dilution in the EPS, then such potential equity shares are known as dilute potential equity shares. That's why in calculation of dilute VPS, we should only use the dilute potential equity shares, not all the potential equity shares. While adding these potential equity shares, rather than decrease in EPS, if there is increase in EPS, then how you can tell these potential equity shares as a dilute potential equity shares? That's why in calculation of dilute VPS, I should only try to consider the dilute potential equity shares only. That means while compared with the basic EPS, if there is a decrease in the dilute EPS, then I can set to be that EPS as a dilute EPS. But rather than decrease, while compared with basic EPS, the dilute EPS is more than I cannot treat it as a dilute EPS. The dilute EPS itself is basic EPS. Okay, fine. Now, the next issue is, first, for example, if convertible debentures are there, then how to calculate dilute EPS? Let us have a look. If convertible preference shares are there, then how to calculate dilute VPS? Let us have a look. If bonus element included in the options are there, then how to calculate dilute VPS? Let us have a look. Total three issues we are going to consider. Calculation of dilute VPS in case of convertible ventures, in case of convertible preference shares, in case of bonus element included in the option. Now, first, <laughs> we started our journey with the calculation of basic EPS. Let us assume basic earnings are 10 lakhs, basic wins are 1 lakh, basic EPS is 10 rupees per share. Now, we have 10 percentage convertible debentures. The number of debentures are 1000, face value is 100, and the amount of 10 percentage convertible debentures are 1 lakh. The amount of 10 percentage convertible debentures are 1 lakh. Now, the issue is every one debenture, if I'm going to convert in the future, I will get 10 equity shares at the time of conversion. At the time of conversion, I will get 10 equity shares. Now, all of you, please concentrate. First, let me calculate the veins for the purpose of dilute VPS. Already we know the basic veins are 1 lakh, which are basic veins 1 lakh. Plus, if I will convert the debentures into the equity shares in future, I will get total for each debenture, I can get 10 equity share. That is 1000 into 10, I will get 10,000 equity shares. So, veins to be considered for the purpose of calculation of basic e for dilute VPS are 1 lakh plus 10,000, total 1 lakh 10,000. This is denominator part. This is denominator part. So, then what about numerator part? What about the numerator part? You know the basic earnings how much? 10 lakhs. Now, all of you please concentrate. Due to conversion of debentures into the equity shares, is there any savings or is there any increase in profit? Yes, there is increase in profit with respect to interest. Because earlier debentures are there means interest expense is there. Right now, after conversion of debentures into equity shares, no need to make payment to the interest to the debenture holders. To that extent, there is savings in interest now. That's why savings in interest I need to add. How much interest saved, sir? 1 lakh into 10 percent is, which is 10,000. But one thing, guys, if earlier interest expense is there, there is savings in tax will be there. Do you understand? Interest expenditure is an allowable expenditure for the purpose of income tax. That means to the extent of 10,000, we are allowing as an expenditure for the purpose of calculation of taxable income. But right now, the 10,000 is missing now. 
that's why we are not having savings in tax because there is no interest expense there is no savings in tax that's why we are going to calculate <coughs> savings in interest after tax interest is saved that is 10000 but we are not saving the tax on such interest which is 10000 into 30 percentage tax rate year gain i reduced 3000 that's why for this basic earnings i should need to add savings in interest after tax then i will get earnings in calculation of the dilutive eps then if i calculate the dilutive eps 10 lakh 7000 divided by 1 lakh 10000 i got 9.15 per share if you check the basic eps is 10 rupees and the dilutive eps is 9.15 rupees 15 rupees per share then i can consider this 10 percentage convertible debentures as dilutive potential equity shares but if i will get for example 11.2 rupees then I cannot tell that these convertible debentures are the dilutive potential equity shares. Then at that point of time, dilutive EPS will also become 10 rupees only. That point actually I emphasized in the earlier discussion. Okay, let me take the second issue. Let us assume convertible preference shares are there. Then earnings of it will become guys, basic earnings you can consider. Now, if the preference shares are converted into equity shares, then to that extent, no need to make payment to the preference shareholders in the form of preference dividend. That's why savings in preference dividend I can add. Savings in preference dividend I can add. If there is no preference dividend, no need to pay the dividend distribution tax on preference dividend. Right now, DDD is not applicable. I already told you. If at all given, you can consider. Otherwise, you can simply ignore. That's why if convertible preference shares are converted into the equity shares, then there is a savings in preference dividend and savings in dividend distribution tax will be there. I should need to add these savings to the basic earnings divided by this is related to the numerator part denominator part you know as usual that is basic veins plus if i convert each and every preference share then how many number of equity shares i will get i should need to know then i add the potential equity shares then i will get dilutive eps in case of potential sorry dilutive eps in case of convertible preference shares are exist next important issue is bonus element included in options now all of you please concentrate this is very much important concept if they not tested problem from right shares in calculation of basic eps they might tested calculation of dilutive eps from bonus element included under option that much of important you know the concept of esop right employee stock option plan their separate chapter is there but in marathon we are not right to consider that in case of employee stock option plan what will happen guys we are providing certain options to the employees by that option, such employee may subscribe certain number of equity shares in future if they complied the conditions reviewed by the company. Such equity shares are offered to the employee at less than market price in the future. That is nothing but option, right? That is nothing but option. So options means simply you can, you can consider in your mind which is employee stock option plan only. If we are announcing options to the employees under ESOP, then the employees, now you can treat like as a shareholder, they will get certain number of equity shares in the future. Potential equity share is a holder of the contract. Now the employee is holding that employee stock option as a contract in between the company and the employee, the contract is there. Now employees may entitle, employees entitles or may entitle certain equity shares in the future. That's why option is a potential equity share. And the option is a dilutive potential equity shares as well. I will tell you why. Due to the option, certain bonus element included in that option. Due to the option, certain bonus shares are included in that options. I will give you one example. As like the right shares, I'll give an example here. Please concentrate. Now, in my organization for employees, I issued 1 lakh options. 1 lakh options. So total, I issued one lakh options to my employees at the rate of 75 rupees per each share. Sir, but the market price is 100 rupees. But the market price is 100 rupees. Now, how many number of bonus shares included in that option, sir? How many number of bonus shares included in that option you need to calculate? As like earlier, I told you, right, in calculation of basic EPS, whenever right shares are there, under right shares, how many bonus shares are there? How you, how you calculate it? If the same number of shares are issued to the outside public how many number of shares you may would issue 1 lakh into 75 i am getting 
one lakh into seventy five. I am getting means. I am getting total seventy five lakhs worth. If the total seventy five lakh worth I am collected from the outsider, then how many number of equity shares I I may would issue? I can divide it with hundred rupees. I may would issue seventy five thousand equity shares. But for employee stock option employees, I am issuing one lakh options. How much excess number of shares I am going to issue through ESOP? Twenty five thousand equity shares. Such twenty five thousand equity shares are nothing but bonus element included in under the option. This is method number one. Therefore, bonus element include the option is nothing but one lakh minus seventy five thousand, which is nothing but twenty five thousand. The same bonus shares included in the option you can calculate it in another method as well. Bonus shares included in the option is equal to number of options into market price minus market price minus issue price divided by market price. Also, you are getting twenty five thousand equity shares. The formula is number of options into Market price minus issue price divided by market price. At that time, also you are getting the number of bonus shares included in the options are twenty five thousand. Sir, any method you can use, that is up to you. But method number one is conceptual. Method number two is formula based. That is up to you. Sir, if I know the bonus shares included in the option, then what should I need to do, sir? You need to calculate the dilute VPS. Your issue is you need to calculate the dilute VPS. How to calculate the dilute VPS? Here it is. There, EPS is equal to what EPS? Dilutive EPS is equal to basic earnings. Under the numerator, you can consider the basic earnings. Sir, due to this bonus element included in option, there is no increase in earnings, sir, in future. What you are doing here? In future, you are converting options into the shares. But out of the options, one lakh options, seventy-five thousand equity shares, you are getting money as well, na? You are getting money. You are converting into equity shares. Such equity shares are not potential equity shares. Only additional shares are you are issuing at twenty-five thousand equity shares. You are issuing at free of cost, na? Due to which there is increase in equity shares without increase of any further resource to the company. Those are only the potential equity shares. What is the meaning of potential equity shares? Potential equity shares is nothing but holder of the contract will entitle or may entitle equity shares at free of cost. Now here. At free of cost, how many number of shares they are getting? Twenty-five thousand equity shares. Even though they are getting one lakh equity shares out of that seventy-five thousand equity shares, they are paying the money. So that's why we should only consider the twenty-five thousand equity shares in the veins. That's why basic veins plus I will only consider bonus element included in the option. But due to conversion of option into the equity share with respect to to these twenty-five thousand equity shares, there is no increase or there is no decrease in the earnings. That's why the same basic earnings I need to consider in the numerator. But in the denominator, basic gains plus bonus element included in the options I need to consider. Definitely, it will leads to a dilute EPS only. You know the reason? Denominator portion is more I am adding while compared with the numerator part. That's why among all the Instruments, which is the most dilutive instruments, the most dilutive instrument is bonus element included in the option only. Among the convertible debenture and convertible preference shares and bonus element included in the option, which is the more dilutive instrument, sir. Bonus element included in the option only, the more dilutive instrument, because due to the bonus element included in the option, there is no increase in the numerator. There is only increase in the denominator. So that's why out of the all the instruments, only bonus element included in the option is the more dilutive instrument. Next, sir, can I, if more than one instrument is there in my organization, then how to calculate dilute EPS? That is not form part of your syllabus, but still I am providing an outline. If more than one instrument is there, then you should not calculate dilute EPS by considering all the instrument at the same time. No, you should not do like that. What you should do, you should add one by one instrument. You should add one by one instrument. Then you should calculate the dilute EPS. Then which instrument I should need add first, sir? Then which instrument you should need add first, sir? For that particular procedure will be there. I don't want to cover such things in the marathon, but I entirely covered in my regular course. Uh, if you want, if you are enthusiastic to learn all such things, then you can watch my regular uh, videos as well. Okay. So, but that is out of the syllabus. But in the examination, they are only giving only one instrument. If convertible debentures are there, then how to calculate dilute EPS? You seen. If convertible preference shares are there, how to calculate the dilute EPS? You seen. If bonus element included in options are there, how to calculate the EPS? You seen. I will close this AS twenty with one problem based on the bonus element included in the option, which is quite important. Uh, that's why I want to add that problem as well. Just a second.
Mm. Where it is there? Yeah. So please, all of you, come to problem number six here, guys. Net profit for the year two thousand eleven given at twelve lakhs. Weighted average number of equity shares outstanding during the year five lakhs given. Fair value of one equity share during the year two thousand eleven given at twenty rupees. Weighted average number of equity shares under option during the year two thousand eleven are one lakh shares. Exercise price for the shares under option during the year two thousand eleven is fifteen rupees. Compute basic and diluted EPS. So basic EPS very much easy, you know. Basic EPS is equal to basic earnings how much, which is twelve lakhs divided by basic wins. Weighted average number of equity shares directly given, which are five lakhs. So twelve lakhs divided by five lakhs, how much, guys? Which is two point four rupees per share. Now, if you consider here, average fair value of one equity share during the year two thousand eleven. What is the meaning of this, sir? If an equity share is issued to the outside party, we are going to issue at twenty rupees. But under employee stock option plan, each and every equity share we are issuing at fifteen rupees. How many number of shares we are issuing under the options? One lakh equity shares we are issuing under options. Out of this one lakh equity shares, I need to first calculate bonus shares included in the option. How I should need to calculate the bonus shares? One lakh into fifteen rupees I am going to collect from the employees, which is fifteen lakhs. The same fifteen lakhs I am collected from the outside party. I am going to issue each and every share at twenty rupees. Then, how many number of shares I would issue to the outsiders, which is fifteen lakhs divided by twenty rupees? I am getting seventy-five thousand equity shares. That means for employees, I am issuing one lakh equity shares, but as an outsiders, we only issue seventy-five thousand shares. That means twenty-five thousand shares are bonus shares. Now I can calculate dilutive EPS. Dilutive EPS is equal to basic earnings divided by. 12 lakhs divided by basic wins 5 lakhs plus bonus element included under the option which is 25000 now 12 lakhs divided by 5 lakh 25000 which is 2.28 per share 2.28 per share this is the calculation of basic as well as diluted eps when options exist this is the closure closure of s20 guys still literally lot more issues i i intentionally ignored but those are not relevant for examination point of view covered a to z except those uh, things which might which might try to cover in your ca final syllabus okay so our, we will continue our journey with another accounting standard in another video lecture let us start with the next accounting standard guys which is as4 contingencies And events occurring after balance sheet date. Basically, before introduction of AS twenty nine, the entire content related to contingencies also dealt by AS four only. But after introduction of AS twenty nine, the scenario of AS four is completely changed. I mean, now the entire things related to contingencies. Is dealing with AS twenty nine, sir. But still, why the title was not changed? The reason is very less less portion with respect to the meaning of contingencies is still discussed by AS four only. That is the reason why uh, still the title is continue as contingencies and events occurring after balance sheet date. Here the main theme is we are going to learn. the concept of events occurring after balance sheet date even though the main theme is events occurring after balance sheet date still we are going to learn the meaning of contingency okay sir what exactly contingency is contingency is a condition or situation the outcome of such condition or situation may be either loss or gain such a loss or gain will be known occurrence or non occurrence of one or more future uncertain events which are not wholly within the control of the enterprise that is the exact definition of contingency sir if i explain like this then you may not appreciate anything let me give one simple example for better understanding the situation is like this 
what is that sir one party or a company filed a suit on our company what is the issue on the allegation that we are manufacturing certain products by making by making theft of the other company patents or the manufacturing process is as like same as the other company manufacturing procedure that is the allegation made by the other company then as on the balance sheet date the situation is the situation is like this the party only filed a suit which is in the court of law now this is the situation or condition existing as on balance sheet date the outcome may arise either as a loss or gain if we lose the case if the other party defeated in the court of law then the other party can claim the damages from us that's why the which ultimately results the outcome of that condition or situation ultimately results either loss or gain which will be known either occurrence or non occurrence of future uncertain events occurrence of future uncertain event means if we ultimately win that case in the court of law then we may arise then then we may not arise any loss but if the court decision is against our interest then there may be a chance of getting loss so that is occurrence or non occurrence a future uncertain event which is a future event the court decree is a future uncertain event which is not wholly within the control of my enterprise can you influence the court decision no because ultimately the judge will provide the judgment based on the evidences available at that particular point of time it is the matter of justice so court will not provide any decree in with biasness am i right so that's why the occurrence or non occurrence of future uncertain events which are not wholly within the control of enterprise now such a condition or situation exist as on balance sheet date is known as contingency to put it simply contingency means what happened nobody knows that is the dictionary meaning of contingency am i right now for that situation of contingency what we can provide in our books of accounts to be frankly speaking the entire discussion we are going to made in very deeper mode in as 29 but still we are not covering as 29 through this marathon but just the outlines i will tell you if the contingency situation is ultimately impacting as a contingency loss then you need to check the probability concept if it is more probable then we can create a provision if it is less probable if it is a less probable then we may create a contingent liability sir the contingency ultimately arises the contingency loss and the probability is very much high sir occurring the damages the probability is very much high then you can create a provision no the contingency may arise a loss but the probability is less there are very less chances are there to claim damages by the other party then you may create a contingent liability no 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 the situation is outrightly gives contingency gain then which is treated as a contingent asset which is treated as a contingent asset but such contingent asset we may not recorded in the financial statements as per the concept of prudence now the ultimate outcome of contingency concept what exactly we are learning from the concept of contingency sir contingency means uncertainty which is a condition or situation the outcome which ultimately may leads to the loss or gain it will be known occurrence or non occurrence of future uncertain events which are not wholly within the control of the enterprise which is the definition of the contingency due to such contingency contingency loss may arise or contingency gain may arise if the contingency loss may arise then you can check the concept of probability 
if it is more probable then we can create a provision if it is a less probable then we can create a contingent liability provision is recorded in the financial statement you know uh, the profit and loss account data to provision account is the general entry provision in generally shown under the short term provisions under the current liabilities in presentation of the financial statements as per schedule 3 but coming to the contingency gain contingency gain sorry uh, I'm, I'm so sorry Pro coming to the contingent liability that is less probability factor which is shown as footnote to the financial statement which is shown as footnote to the financial statement but which is not presented in the financial statements that too if that amount is material if you feel that that amount is material then only you can show it under footnote to the financial statements then come to the contingency gain which outrightly not recorded in the financial statements due to the concept of prudence but if you feel if it is material then you may shown in the board of directors report this these are the accounting presentation issues with respect to provision contingency contingent liability and contingent asset okay just leave it but sir for this topic do you explaining the standard as4 no not at all the entire as4 focus is with respect to events occurring after balance sheet date now please all of you come to the concept events occurring after balance sheet date events occurring after balance sheet date <laughs> what about this sir what about this all is friends before explaining things related to events occurring after balance sheet date first you should know the compliance part in generally occurring in case of a company once if you appreciate the compliance part you can easily understand the concept of events occurring after balance sheet date first let me explain the compliance part in generally for each and every year as a normal course of business the company need to follow as per the company sec 2013 let us have a look first sir let us assume the financial year is related to 2020-21 so now which is a financial year or an accounting period the reporting period will be 31st march 2021 do you think that the financial statements are make it ready as on the last date of the financial year practically it is not possible because the company is engaged with their operating activities so nobody knows all the components of the financials has on 31st march 2021 but definitely the financial statements are prepared up to that particular date but such financial statements are in generally prepared after taking a gap of 10 to 15 days after finalizing of closing stock and certain events adjustments like depreciation okay certain all other things they need to adjust and all the entries also they need to pass then let us assume the financial statements are ready as on 15th april 2021 sir in a company whose responsibility to prepare the financial statements it is ultimately the responsibility of the board of directors board of directors will delegate that responsibility to finance department who is the head of cfo chief finance officer let us assume cfo is come with the financials as on 15th april 2021 it is the responsibility of the board of directors that's why board of directors will also approve such financial statements approval means they will make it sign on such financial statements because as per the company act 2013 if any fraud or error occurred in such financial statements who are the primary suspects the primary suspects will be the board of directors so that is the reason why after preparation of such financial statements by the finance department such finance statement should be ultimately approved by the board of directors board of directors will conduct a board meeting at that particular point of time how it is going once the financial statements are make it ready board of directors will assemble they will conduct a board meeting then they will discuss about the financial statements then what are the decisions necessarily taken they will uh, discuss then ultimately they will approve such financial statements along with that they will also issue the board of directors report in such board of directors report only they will discuss what are our responsibilities actually okay uh, that is follow up of accounting standards preparation of financial statements at the accrual basis all such things they actually uh, make it presented under the board of directors report as well now 
once the financial statements are approved by the board of directors by conducting a board meeting then such financial statements are ultimately go to the auditor for the purpose of issue of audit report you know ultimately each and every company whether it may be private limited or public limited small company or a dormant company or a one person company whatever the case may be it should be it should be such company should be conduct the audit statutory audit it should be audited by a practicing chartered accountant then the auditor will issue the audit report now the issue is financials plus audit report plus board of directors report combinedly we will put it as which is known as annual report which is known as annual report along with such annual report we will attach a notice as an invitation to the general meeting as invitation to the general meeting to invite the shareholders for the purpose of conducting a general meeting now annual report consisting of financial statements audit report and board of directors report and certain all other explanatory information which is required is going to be discussed in the general meeting along with that invitation to the shareholders to attend such general meeting for this only as per the statutory regulation is that 21 clear days should be required to send that notice to the shareholders okay after sending such annual report and invitation to the uh, shareholder then company will going to conduct a general meeting on that specific date then in the general meeting what the company is going to discuss they will discuss two different matters one is uh, general business matters another one is special business matters general business matters are with respect to declaration of the dividend appointment of auditor for the next forthcoming year and the appointment of board of directors and the laying of books of accounts total four activities in generally going to be made in the general meeting that is declaration of the dividend appointment of auditor appointment of board of directors and laying of the books of accounts L i mean declaration of the dividend means with respect to, to dividend concept dividend is in generally proposed by the board of directors in the board meeting so the board meeting was conducted as on 15th april 2021 right at before issuing of the board of directors report itself after making a detailed discussion board of directors will propose the dividend because who know the ultimate affairs of the business entity board of directors only the dividend decision making process is also uh, in the hands of the board of directors as per the statutory regulation but they cannot declare they cannot declare just they can propose who ultimately declares such dividends are ante that dividend may be declared by the shareholders in the general meeting the declared dividend may be less than the proposed dividend by the board of directors but it should not be greater than the dividend which is proposed by the board of directors you know how beautifully designed the vesting powers laying lying with the board of directors as well as shareholders with respect to the dividend you can easily appreciate here okay that is different story just leave it sir if any special matters along with that annual report and notice certain explanatory notes they will attach sir which type of business we are going to discuss in the general meeting sir are we opening any new offices or are we entering into any new business activities or is there any major changes or is there any way of conducting the business activities itself is going to change in the near future what are the different proposals with which we are coming such all explanatory statements they actually attach on such business matters also uh, shareholders are going to discuss in the general meeting which are known as special business activities that is different story put aside now after completion of this general meeting still still the complaint spot is not at over after completion of this general meeting within 30 days the company should file aoc4 within 60 days the company should file either mgt7 or mgt 7a depending upon the type of the company if the company is a one person and the small company and the dormant company then they can file mgt 7a otherwise they will file mgt 7 what about this sir aoc4 is with respect to financial statements sir ultimately the financial statements which are prepared by the company is available to public at large how such financial statements are available to public at large 
such company should file such financials with mca ministry of corporate affairs through a particular form which is aoc4 form mgt7 or 7a form is known as annual return where the shareholders information how, how much percentage they are holding certain all other particulars are in generally entered in mgt7 or 7a so these two forms after filing of these two forms then the compliance of that particular financial year 2021 is set to be over do you understand how the lengthy procedure is in general adopted by a company in complying the provisions of companies act 2013 this is basically in generally happening in any company after completion of a particular financial year with respect to compliance okay just take it back all such concept now coming to the concept events occurring after balance sheet date sir now what is the meaning of event occurring after the balance sheet date? Here, event includes transaction as well. Event includes transaction as well. Any event or transaction occurred after balance sheet date, after balance sheet date, but before approval of financial statements by board of directors. Here, in compliance system, in generally, financial statements are approved by board of directors after, after preparation of financial statements. Am I right? That is up to the date, up to the date, if any event or transaction occurred, such an event is known as event occurring after balance sheet date. Simply event occurring after balance sheet date means any event or transaction occurred after balance sheet date, but before approval of such financial statements by board of directors is known as event occurring after balance sheet date. Sir, what is the object of this standard, sir? Why this standard is inserted? You know, right, in each and every standard, as like we already completed AS20, we already seen the objective. Then what is the objective of AS20, sir? It's quite simple. It's quite simple. Event occurring after balance sheet date is broadly categorized into two events, adjusting event, non-adjusting event, adjusting event, and non-adjusting event. What is the meaning of adjusting event? What is the meaning of non-adjusting event? Before knowing that, if the event is the adjusting event, it should need to be adjusted in the current year financials, that is in the year 2020. If the event is a non-adjusting event, if it is significant, then it should be disclosed in the board of directors report. Here I'm not discussing when an event is said to be adjusting event, when an event is said to be non-adjusting event. First, I am first, first, my entire discussion is with respect to. If the event is adjusting event, what you should need to do? If the event is the adjusting event, you should need to be adjusted in the current year financials. If the event is the non-adjusting event and if it is significant and it should be disclosed in the board of directors report. I mean, if the event is the adjusting event, it should need to be reported in the current year financials. If the event is the non-adjusting event and if it is significant, we are not recorded in the current year financials, but we are going to disclose in the board of directors report. That is the accounting treatment with respect to AS4. Now the question is, when an event is said to be adjusting event, when an event is said to be non-adjusting event. Come here. When an event is adjusting event, when an event is non-adjusting event. First, whether the event should be adjusting or non-adjusting, first it should be event occurring after balance sheet date. You know already when an event is said to be event occurring after balance sheet date. It should occur after balance sheet date, but before approval of financial statements by board of directors. After that, such an event to qualify as an adjusting event, which provide further evidence to conditions or situations existing as on balance sheet date. Which provide further evidence to conditions or situations existing as on balance sheet date. If I tell like this, you may not appreciate anything. Let me explain the same with a small example. Please allow me to concentrate. Sir, what happened? We are in the financial year 2021. As on Feb 5th, as on Feb 5th of 2021, our entity made a credit sale to a particular party at the rate of 10 lakhs. At the rate of 10 lakhs. Now, March 25th of 2021, what happened? The premises of our debtor, the premises of our debtor completely destroyed by a fire accident. Destroyed due to the fire accident. The premises of our debtor 
destroyed due to the fire accident as on March 25th. Now, what happened? As on April 15th, our debtor became insolvent. As on April 15th, our debtor became insolvent. Board of Directors will approve the financial statements as on April 30th. And now the issue is, please allow me concentrate. Now the issue is, as on April 15th, our debtor became insolvent. As on April 15th, our debtor became insolvent. In generally, if any party became insolvent, we are unable to recover amount from the other party. Now, what is the impact due to the insolvency of our debtor? We are unable to recover amount from such debtor. Then you need to create bad debt or you need to create provision for debtors. Am I right? That is the issue. But if the same insolvent C position is occurred before the financial statements, then straight away I'm going to record it as an insolvency loss, which I can simply treat it as bad debt. There is a no dilemma situation arises at that particular scenario. But right now, the thing is, now he became insolvent, which is a transaction or which is an event occurred after the balance sheet date, but before approval of financial statements by board of directors, but before, but before approval of financial statements by board of directors, then such event or transaction is said to be event occurring after balance sheet date, which is an event occurring after balance sheet date. After that, you need to check whether such event is an adjusting event or non-adjusting event. When an event is said to be adjusting event, an event is said to be adjusting event, which you provide further evidence to condition or situation exist as on balance sheet date. First of all, come to the balance sheet date. As on balance sheet date, what is the condition or situation? The condition or situation is the debtor's premises was completely destroyed due to the fire accident. Destroyed due to the fire accident as on March 25th. That means as on the balance sheet date, the situation or condition is the premises of our debtor destroyed due to fire accident for which there is a further evidence. There is a further evidence which you provide further evidence, sir, for insolvency, for insolvency is a further evidence. Sorry, the insolvent, the becoming insolvency itself is a further evidence to condition or situation exist as on balance sheet date. What is the condition or situation? He may become the insolvent due to the occurrence of the fire accident. For such, the evidence is getting insolvency petition from the court. Getting insolvent petition from the court, he became insolvent, which is acting as a further evidence to condition or situation as on balance sheet date. Then such an event, you can adjust it in the current year financials. I mean, in the current year financials itself, you can create it as a bad debt or you can create it as a PBD. Now the entire amount of 10 lakhs, you can represent it under provision for bad debts. Do you understand? Sir, for example, if there is no condition or situation as on balance sheet date, there is no condition or situation as on balance sheet date, which are indicative of conditions that arose subsequent to the balance sheet date. Sir, a transaction or event occurred after balance sheet date, but before approval of financial statements by board of directors. But there is no conditions or situation existing on balance sheet date. That is nothing but which is indicative of the event occurred now. The event is the, or the transaction is the indicative of conditions that arose subsequent to the balance sheet date, then which is treated as non-adjusting event. Sir, in the same example, when it became a non-adjusting event, I don't want to take another example. For the same example, when it became a non-adjusting event, let us assume the fire accident was occurred not as on March 25th. The fire accident is occurred as on April 5th. The fire accident is occurred as on April 5th. And April 15th, he became insolvent. That is the only change. That is the only change. Then can you please, all of you tell me, as on balance sheet date, is there any condition or situation? No. The condition or situation arose the subsequent to the balance sheet date because April 5th means the condition is there after the balance sheet date. That means there is no condition or situation exists as on balance sheet date. At that particular circumstance, we can treat it as a non-adjusting event. Or simply, 
when an event is said to be non adjusting event when an event is said to be adjusting event first let us take let us take the discussion of adjusting event which provide further evidence to conditions or situations existing as on balance sheet date then such event we can treat it as a adjusting event you know when the event is the adjusting event it should need to be reported in the current year financial statements when an event is said to be non adjusting event which is indicative of conditions or situations that arose subsequent to the balance sheet date which is known as non adjusting event if it is the non adjusting event if it is material then we are going to disclose in the board of directors report in case of a company sir if it is other than company we are showing under the approving authorities report who is the approving authority if it is the company board of directors that is other than the company if it is a partnership firm then you may represent under the approving authorities report that is that management committee report what are the, what are the thing is we can call as per that particular institution type in that approving authority report you may disclose okay let it be sir to complete all the problems to complete all the problems then what can i need to check sir please all of you come to the last page of my power notes with respect to s4 to tackle the situation the standard provisions how our thought process should be first what you should need to check whether such event or transaction is after balance sheet date but before approval of such financial statements by board of directors or not yes sir that is fit then the event is said to be event occurring after the balance sheet date then that event is said to be event occurring after the balance sheet date okay next sir whether such event is adjusting event or non adjusting event how i will know if there is any further evidence to conditions or situations exist as on balance sheet date because that party became insolvent there is a condition or situation exist as on before balance sheet date or as on balance sheet date that is nothing but for accident was occurred in the premises of our data which is a condition or situation exist and the further evidence is becoming insolvency will be treated as adjusting event and the effect should be adjusted in the current year financials and the second situation is which is indicative of conditions arose after the balance sheet date now the for accident was not occurred as on march 25th the for accident is occurred as on april 5th then there is no condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date there is no condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date which is indicative of conditions arose after the balance sheet date which is treated as non adjusting event and it should be disclosed in the approving authority reports if the amount is material do you understand that standard thought process you should need to be adopted whenever you are tackling a problem okay still the provisions is not at power very few provisions are there the standard is very small uh, standard guys now please all of you come to uh, the main standard content okay now hope you understand when an event is said to be event occurring after balance sheet date as well as when you can treat it as adjusting event when you can treat it as non adjusting event if the event is adjusting event what is the accounting treatment if the event is non adjusting event what is the accounting treatment you know now let us see certain exceptions and the first and foremost important only one exception is there only one exception is that the important exception is going concern assumption in appropriate what is the meaning of exception sir even though there is no condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date still you can treat it as a adjusting event that is nothing but exception exception means it is against to the provisions Uh, it is against to the general provisions that is nothing but exception even though there is no conditions or situation existing as on balance sheet date still i should need to be adjust in the current year financials let me take up an illustration sir we are in the financial year 2021 now as on 31st march 2021 there is no condition or situation as on april 15th major fire accident was occurred in the premises of my customer he is only one customer our entity is having only one customer we are providing raw material to that party our business itself is providing raw material to the company so for in that company major fire accident occurred major fire accident means entirely destroyed that company premises and the manufacturing process entirely destroyed sir if we are not having that customer our business is also going to close there is no option to continue our business operation 
the going concern assumption itself is inappropriate we are unable to continue our business activities in the near future due to occurring of this transaction as on april 30th that party became insolvent as on may 15th financial statements are approved by the board of directors now the first and foremost issue is becoming insolvency is a event occurring after the balance sheet date before it occurred after balance sheet date but before approval of financial statement for board of directors now in general course if you think is it adjusting event or non adjusting event there is no conditions or situations exist as on balance sheet date or is indicative of condition arose after the balance sheet date because the condition is occurring of the major fire accident which was occurred as on april 15th that's why in the general course we can simply thought it as it is a non adjusting event but the thing is due to occurrence of the transaction or event is it your going concern will impact yes sir if you feel like that even though there is no condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date still you can treat it as adjusting event adjusting event means for the year 2021 the financial statement should need to be prepared on realization basis liquidation basis i mean sir fixed assets at what value i can adopt at the rate of realizable value at the rate of realizable value closing stock at what price i should need to record at the rate of nrv value do you understand so even though there is no conditions or situations exist as on balance sheet date still you are treating like as an adjusting event this is the only one exception so insolvency loss in 2021 should need to be insolvency loss arisen due to such insolvent debtor should need to be reported in 2021 and prepare the financial statements on the liquidation basis even though there is no conditions or situations exist as on balance sheet date or even though conditions or situations arose after the balance sheet date because the going concern assumption itself is inappropriate do you understand the exception guys next come below the dividend situation i already explained this uh, this is uh, i mean i can tell you uh, like ancillary thing so just for knowing information sir dividend proposed dividend in generally proposed in the board of direct proposed by the board of directors in the board meeting this is after balance sheet date but before approval of approval by the board of directors even though this transaction is occurred before approval by the finance statement by board of directors still in generally it is not reported in the financial statements it is in generally dis disclosed under the notes to accounts the proposed dividend is just disclosed under the notes to accounts proposed dividend never adjusted in the financial statements straight away the information is given no need to check whether it is adjusting event or non adjusting event even though it is the it is an event occurred after balance sheet date even though it is an event occurred after balance sheet date no need to check whether it is adjusting event or non adjusting event it is always a non adjusting event i mean not adjusted in the current year financials it is simply just disclosed under the notes to accounts this is a special accounting treatment we are giving for the proposed dividend coming to the declared dividend sir declared dividend you know in generally dividend is declared in the general meeting by the shareholders it is the liability in that year in which it is declared in which year it is declared it is the liability of that particular year sir where it is shown sir where it is shown sir declared dividend that is shown under current liabilities if it is not paid at the time of preparation of balance sheet under other current liabilities that is dividend payable is there na dividend payable is shown under other current liabilities now even though proposed dividend is an event occurring after balance sheet date we may not check it is a non adjusting or adjusting event it is always a non adjusting event simply we are disclosing under the notes to account special accounting treatment if the dividend is the declared dividend it should be shown as a liability of the particular year in which the dividend is declared which is shown under current liabilities under other current liabilities under the name dividend payable so those are the uh, important issues we can simply discuss in accounting standard 4 guys sir but even though the provisions of as 4 are is not, is not lengthy it's it's very much easy provisions but unless otherwise if you are facing certain practical issues you may not appreciate uh, the application part of such provisions so that is the reason 
I'm going to take up certain problems in the marathon session itself. Please allow me to concentrate. So one by one illustration, let me discuss. I don't want to give any problem. I will explain the illustration with the answer itself. I will first, I will explain the situation. Then you can start your thought process in your mind. What is the situation, sir? Sir, we made a credit sales in a particular financial year. That is before 31st March itself. Now, certain checks we are collected from our debtors after 31st March. The checks we are collected from our customers after 31st March. But in the check, the date bearing is either 31st March or before. Our entity collected certain checks from the customers bearing the date either 31st March or before after 31st March. But such checks are collected, but before approval of finance statement for board of directors. Now the question is, such checks, can we adjust or can we treat as checks in hand? Can we treat such checks as checks in hand for the financial year? That is the question. What he is indirectly asking you, can I consider such checks as an adjusting event? And can I decrease the debtor's balance? That is checks in hand account debtor to debtor's account. Can I pass that journal entry for the current financial year? That is the question. Now, you should start with the provisions. First, checks collected from the customers after balance sheet date. Is it even occurring after balance sheet date? If such checks are received by the entity after balance sheet date, but before approval of finance statements by board of directors, then which is then which is event occurring after balance sheet date. Now, is such event occurring after balance sheet date is an adjusting event or non-adjusting event you need to check. Is there any condition or situation exist as on balance sheet date? Do you receive such checks before the balance sheet date or as on balance sheet date? Then there is a condition. You are not receiving such checks as on balance sheet date. You are receiving such checks after balance sheet date. Maybe that the, the check contains 31st March or before the date. The issue is, the condition is, do you receive such checks before 31st March? No. Maybe the check contains March 25th. Maybe the check contains March 20th date. But the thing is, if the check is in your control, before 31st March, is there any condition or situation? No. If there is no condition or situation, or the conditions are, are the, which is the indicative of the conditions or situations arose after the balance sheet date, which is treated as non-adjusting event. Which is treated as non-adjusting event. Then the checks collected after the balance sheet date, but the checks bearing 31st March are before the 31st March, we cannot adjust it in the current year financials if the entity passes the entry checks in hand to the data account, which is violation or against the provisions of accounting standard four. The same thing here I explained, conclusion, no need to report in the current year financials and no need to disclose in the board of directors report because it, it is immaterial. I told you if the amount is the material, then only it is it need to be disclosed in the board of directors report, even though if it is a non-adjusting event. So accounting treatment is not at par with AS4. And one more thing, guys, one more thing. How you can tell, sir, checks are not within the control of your enterprise. When an as when the check is said to be asset of the organization, when a check is said to be asset of the organization, if the other party issued the check and the check is received in my premises, maybe other party issued the check. But still, it was not in your premises means, can I treat the check as an asset? No, because to qualify a particular item as an asset, it should qualify the definition of asset as well. Asset is a resource which is controlled by the enterprise having the capability of generation of future economic benefits. But asset is a resource controlled by your enterprise. The controlling power itself is not in my hand because if the other party can stop the check, then I may not receive the amount. Even though the check contains the date as the 31st March or before the date. That's why the check is in, not in my control till the check is received my premises. 
So that's why the controllability is not in my hands. Asset is a resource controlled by the entity accurate due to some past events, which have the capability to generate some economic cash flows or economic benefits. The controlling power is not in my hands, not in organization hands. That's why such checks collected after the balance sheet date are not in my control. That's why I cannot treat it as a set as well. So in two dimension, actually, they given the answer. One is as per AS4, another one as per the definition of asset as well, which is the uh, complete answer. There is a difference between correct answer and complete answer. You know, the correct answer is if you write the provisions of AS4 with this, then the answer is over. But the, when the answer is complete, uh, if you provide the uh, answer, if, if you if you provide or if you support the answer with the definition of asset as well, then only it will become the complete answer. Then you may have a doubt that, sir, in the examination, for which answer they will provide, they will award the marks for the correct answer or the complete answer. They will award the full marks for complete answer. Even you might wrote the correct answer as per the provision, but you didn't complete the entire answer. So only the, for the complete answer, only they will award the good marks. So this is a classic example for difference between the correct answer and complete answer as well. Next, sir, in the same scenario, I will add one more thing. For example, our checks were collected by our agents before 31st March itself. Our agents, sir, collection of the checks we are assigning to one other party. One other party will collect checks on behalf of us. Our agents collected the checks before 31st March, but such checks are received by the organization after 31st March. Then what will be your answer, sir? Then there is a condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date. Because once the checks were collected by our agents means, in case of principal agency relationship, the principal is responsible for the agent's agent action. Once the agent collected means the principal is also collected. Even though the, the such checks are physically not received within the premises, our agents already capture such checks on their hands and the controllability is within our hands. So that's why at that point of time, there is a condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date. Then you can treat such checks or checks in hand and you can credit the debtor's account and you can show it as under asset in the balance sheet by treating it as an adjusting event. This is the ultimate conclusion of the first illustration. Next, let me explain the second scenario. This is very beautiful scenario. Please all of you concentrate. What happened first, I will explain. We are in the financial year 2010-11. In 2010-11, cashier theft cash in the month of John 2011. But that fact is not known to the management till May 2011. In May 2011, actually the theft was detected. In May 2011, the theft was detected. You know, loss occurred due to theft is the abnormal loss. Now, my question is, such abnormal loss is going to be recorded in the financial year 1011 or such abnormal loss is going to be recorded in the financial year 1112. Now, the question is first. Is it even occurring after balance sheet date? Yes, sir. The detection of theft occurred after balance sheet date, but before approval of financial statements by board of directors, sir. Then which is an event occurring after balance sheet date without having any second thought. Now, sir, is there any condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date regarding the, this theft? Yes. Cashier made a theft in the month of John itself. Sir, but the condition or situation not known to you, na? not necessary. Not necessary. Is there any conditional situation or not? Yes, conditional situation already exists in the month of John itself. But knowing such condition or situation as on balance sheet date is necessary, sir? Not required. Is there or not? Yes. Is it necessary to know that condition or situation exists as on balance sheet date? No. The same answer I wrote here. Condition or situation exists as on balance sheet date? The answer is yes, but not known but not known. Yes, it is there, but not known, not relevant for me. Knowing of such condition or situation as on balance sheet date, is it relevant? No, but condition or situation exists. Yes. Is there any further evidence? Yes, the theft was detected. There is a further evidence. Yes, that's why which is an adjusting event, abnormal loss of 5 lakhs due to the theft reported in the year 2010-11 itself, which is one more classic, classic illustration just now we completed. So what we realized from this illustration, guys, knowing of that condition or situation is not relevant. Existence of, existence of such condition or situation is only the relevant to treat it as an adjusting event. Come to the next illustration. What is this, sir? 
sir in 2011 uh, maybe we made certain sales now as on 20th may 2012 a major warehouse a major warehouse of our customer is damaged due to the fire accident now the date of approval of financial statements is 30th 6 2012 even though there is no condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date which is a major warehouse if the going concern is inappropriate then you can treat it as a adjusting event and you can create the entire loss in the year 2011 12 itself loss of 30 lakh should be adjusted in the financial year 11 12 but if you are treating still the going concern assumption is appropriate that depends sir still if the major warehouse is uh, uh, destroyed still there is a chance of continuing your business operation sir then which is disclosed in the board of directors report if the amount is material that is simply if the going concern assumption is inappropriate then you may treat it as an adjusting event if the going concern assumption is appropriate you are you are still it is continuing as non adjusting event that we already discussed through illustration next uh, this part also i already given problem number 4 i already explained so which i taken this is important issue please concentrate what is this i am going to explain sir the issue is for the year 2010 11 as on 31st march 2011 the situation is we made a certain negotiation with the other company for the purpose of acquisition that is putting the investments in the other company which is nothing but acquisition of another company which i made a negotiation the price is still not at fixed the bargaining procedure is going on now as on april 11th we bought that company we made a acquisition in another company now the issue is can i adjust can i adjust that investment in the year 2010 11 or in the year 11 12 first of all is that acquisition of another company is occurred before approval of financial statements by board of directors yes sir absolutely which is event occurring after balance sheet date is there any condition or situation existing as on balance sheet date sir negotiation is there sir but for you i am revealing negotiations we cannot treat it as a conditions or situations negotiations we cannot treat it as a conditions or situations condition or a situation is a concrete thing should need to be happen is it if you made the negotiation that means that th that means you are buying that product no if you already entering into the agreement then which provides a condition or situation for buying that product negotiation we cannot consider as a condition or situation why first i told you negotiations are there you may feel that such negotiations are conditions or situation so conditions or situations as on balance sheet date negotiations you cannot consider as a conditions or situations that's why there are no conditions or situations that's why which is a non adjusting given if you feel that if the amount is material then you can be disclosed in the board of directors report that's it guys uh, next uh, come to uh, another issue this this issue also we discussed i don't want to take up one more time that's it guys so the important issues also i discussed so what are the conclusions we made from such issues sir from the first one from the checks 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 issue what we made even though the checks bearing the date before 31st march if such checks are not received by our enterprise there is no condition of situation in another case theft happened in the year but which is not known to you condition or situation exist not knowing to you which is irrelevant exist or not is only the relevant to decide the event is an adjusting given next sir going concern assumption is inappropriate even though if it is non adjusting event you need to be adjusted in the current year financial statements the catch up points are major warehouse major things are occurring so like that they are providing in the problems with this S four is absolutely completed, guys. <laughs> Most awaited standard and confusing standard to all of the students is S twenty two accounting for taxes on income. So the chapter title is S twenty two accounting for taxes on income. Taxes on income is nothing but income tax. so this standard is with respect to 
accounting for income tax. Before directly proceeding with the standard, first, just I want to give a very good introduction with respect to S22. So the reason is, this is not as like the normal standard. So the reason or the objective to understand this, it will take some time. To understand the reason or objective itself, it will take some time. So that's why first before proceeding with the main content, let me give uh, introduction issue. Sir, you know, coming to income tax part, there is a separate act called Income Tax Act 1961 is there. We will calculate tax based on the taxable income, not based on the accounting income. Accounting income means income calculated as per financial accounting is nothing but accounting income. Income calculated as per Income Tax Act 1961 is known as taxable income. Each and every SSC in India should need to adopt the provisions of Income Tax 1961 to calculate tax on taxable income. Am I right? But what is the meaning of income as per financial accounting, which is nothing but profit or loss as per statement of PNL, which is net profit before tax. Now the issue is, now the issue is, can I calculate tax on financial in accounting income or can I calculate tax on taxable income as per Income Tax Act 1961 is the question. For example, if you tell your answer that, sir, I will follow Income Tax Act 1961, then I will calculate the tax, which is a real tax I'm going to book as per the financial accounting. If your argument is like this, then immediate question will be, if you are not taking the income as per the financial accounting books of accounts, you are not following the concept of matching. Then the immediate argument is, you are not following the matching concept. Because if you take the financial accounting books, one rule is there in financial accounting. Whatever the expenditure you are going to book in the statement of BNDL, the relevant income you should need to offer. But in the statement of PNL, the income you are offering is net profit before tax, but the tax you are offering is based on the taxable income. Is it true? Then do you following the concept of matching? No. Then to follow the matching concept, to follow the matching concept, I need to book tax in financial accounting based on accounting income. There is no doubt about it. To follow the concept of matching, I need to calculate the income as per accounting records. I will book tax on such accounting records. Now, the tax which is going to be booked on accounting income is technically known as tax expense. Is technically known as tax expense. In statement of PNL, you should need to book tax expense. If you want, I'll show the statement of PNL here, which is uh, tax expense, where it is there, here it is exist. The name itself is tax expense. Such tax expense, you need to calculate based on the accounting income. There is no doubt about it. The next question is, sir, why actually tax calculated on financial accounting income and tax calculated on the taxable income will differ? If both are same, then any income you can consider, right? But why tax calculated as on financial accounting and tax calculated based on the taxation records will differ? The differences may be due to various reasons. The differences may be due to various reasons. I'll give one reason here. Please allow me to concentrate here. I'll give one reason here. Let me take the example of depreciation. Sir, I purchased a missionary for 50 lakhs. For the taxation purpose, I can claim the entire 100% depreciation in year one itself. There are certain sections are there. Maybe you are utilizing such missionary for research purpose. Then you can claim the 100% depreciation in year one itself. But for financial accounting, let us assume I followed the SLM basis. I'm going to claim the depreciation over a period of five years. Then. If you check depreciation for accounting as well as taxation records separately, 
for year number one depreciation with respect to tax is 50 lakhs and with respect to accounting is only 10 lakhs for the remaining all the four years accounting records depreciation will be 10 lakhs per annum but for the taxation records depreciation is nil because you already claimed the entire depreciation in year in year number one itself now if you check the accept this component let us assume accept this component remaining taxable income and accounting income is both are same just let us assume now due to this component of difference in depreciation will definitely arise there is a difference in accounting income and taxable income now how much difference is there in year number one the difference will be 40 lakhs in year number one the difference will be 40 lakhs what is the impact you are claiming the less depreciation as per accounting means more accounting income is less than more accounting income while compared with the taxable income that is accounting income is greater than the taxable income am i right in year two in year two what is happening you know still the difference is continuing the difference is 10 lakhs year three difference is 10 lakhs year four difference is 10 lakhs year five is difference is 10 lakhs what happened you know the difference is accounting income less than taxable income from year two onwards from year to onwards accounting income is less than the taxable income really what happened sir the timing difference which is arised in year number one which is accounting income is more than the taxable income is reversal in the future periods in the reversal in the four future years that is accounting income is less than the taxable income the 40 lakhs difference which was arised in year number one is going to be nullified year by year after completion of the fifth year the entire difference is nullified if you consider the entire five years as a single period let us for the time being you can consider the entire five years as a single time period what is the total depreciation considered as per the accounting records 50 lakhs what is the total depreciation you claimed for the taxation record 50 lakhs there is no difference in between accounting income and taxable income if you consider the entire year as uh, entire period uh, sorry if you consider the total number of years as a single period but if you consider a single year then there may be a chance of arising the difference between accounting income and taxable income if that is the case then the difference is said to be timing difference if that is the case the difference is said to be timing difference sir why you are explaining all such things sir it's a very simple reason we already concluded that in our statement of pnl to satisfy the concept of matching i need to book the tax expense based on accounting income which is based on accounting income now this accounting income we are going to present that means the tax expense we are going to present in two different components the tax expense which is based on the accounting income we are going to make it present into two different components one is tax on taxable income current tax which is tax on timing difference which is deferred tax the component is tax expense only guys the component is tax expense only just a moment <laughs> So the component is tax expense only the tax expense how we are going to present i'm representing here concentrate the tax expense is tax on accounting income the same tax on accounting income are going to represent under current tax and default tax what is this current tax sir current tax is tax on taxable income defer tax is tax on timing difference now concentrate here for example if you come to the first year if you come to the first year or let me take another example please allow me concentrate here the example is here only please concentrate sir so as per the financial accounting the income net profit before tax is 10 lakhs but as per the taxable income the in as per the taxation records the taxable income is 8 lakhs now first if you go to a tax expense as per the as 22 based on the concept of matching the tax expense is based on tax on accounting income right so tax on accounting income means accounting income is 10 lakhs let us assume the tax rate is 30 percentage 10 lakhs into 30 percentage which is nothing but 3 lakhs is the total tax expense there is no doubt about it so tax expense will be 3 lakhs absolutely 
now such a 3 lakhs tax expense is going to be divided into two different components one is current tax another one is tax on timing difference what is this current tax tax on taxable income sir here i decided taxable income as 8 lakhs right now 8 lakhs into 30 percentage which is 2.4 lakhs plus maybe you got the difference now in between this 10 lakhs as well as 8 lakhs you got certain difference if that difference is the timing difference then you need to add tax on such timing difference as a deferred tax so the difference itself is 10 lakhs minus 8 lakhs which is 3 lakhs the difference is 3 lakhs 3 lakhs into 30 percentage which is nothing but uh, how much guys so difference is 2 lakhs right so 2 lakhs into 30 percentage the difference is 60000 so the total tax is itself is 3 lakhs i mean uh, what is the a concept involving inside that sir it's quite simple what i am doing i am booking tax on accounting income only in overall but how the tax on accounting income i am going to book which is tax on taxable income along with it i am adjusting the difference in between the taxable income and accounting income one more time repeating in overall i am booking tax on accounting income to satisfy the matching concept but how such tax expense which is tax on accounting income how i am going to book which is tax on taxable income which is current tax as i am adjusting the tax on timing difference as a deferred tax do you understand next now please all of you concentrate the conclusions are in our financial accounting books i need to book the tax expense based on the accounting income but such tax on accounting income i am going to represent in the two different components one is tax based on taxable income with adjustment of tax on the difference of income in between accounting and taxable incomes and that difference should be timing difference when the difference is said to be timing difference maybe for a particular accounting year there may be difference in between accounting income and taxable income but if you check the overall period there is no difference between accounting income and taxable income then the difference is said to be timing difference or you can put it in another way you can put it in another way difference arised in one accounting period and a capable of reversal in one or more subsequent future periods then the difference is said to be timing difference if you check here the difference is arised in one accounting period and which is capable of reversal in one or more future periods then the difference is said to be timing difference is it okay all of you now sir as per your discussion in the statement of p and l in the statement of p and l i need to book tax expense sir the tax expense you told which is the combination of current to tax and a deferred tax which is the combination of current tax and deferred tax tax expense is nothing but tax on accounting income that's okay fine now the scenarios are like this what is that the first scenario please all of you concentrate for the current year accounting income is greater than taxable income that is accounting income what i told in the earlier example 10 lakhs and the taxable income is 8 lakhs now you got the difference of 2 lakhs right the difference of 2 lakhs uh, let us assume for the purpose of depreciation the difference may going to reversal in future periods then the difference is the timing difference am i right now first how i need to book tax on taxable income which is current tax 8 lakhs into uh, 30 percentage which is 2.4 lakhs plus deferred tax deferred tax is the difference in tax in between accounting income and taxable income due to the timing due to simple timing now the 2 lakhs into 30 percentage which is 0.6 lakhs which is 3 lakhs you are going to represent like this in the statement of pnl now the timing difference which is arised in the first year is known as year of origination how much timing difference arised 2 lakhs timing difference is arised am i right such a timing difference is going to be reversal in the future periods then only the timing difference is known as sorry if the difference is going to be capable of reversal in the future periods then only the difference is known as timing difference let us assume the difference is going to be reversal in year two year three year four year five how much sir 
fifty thousand reversal in year two, another fifty thousand reversal in year three, fifty k, fifty k. Like this, it is going to be reversal. Let us assume. Now, in the year of origin, accounting income is greater than taxable income. Then, for this timing difference, I need to create deferred tax, deferred tax liability. Sir, why it is known as liability? I know, I understand one thing, which is a deferred tax because which is occurred due to the difference, which is occurred due to the difference in between accounting income and taxable income, which is difference in tax. Now, on such two lakhs, thirty percent is I need to create a. Uh, one second. On the thirty percent is that is sixty thousand. I need to create deferred tax. I know that. Then why again you are talking the word deferred tax liability? Why you are treating it as a liability? It's it's a very simple reason. You are telling that as per the taxation records, the liability is only two point four lakhs. But as for the accounting perspective, the liability will be three lakhs. That means still in accounting perspective, still sixty thousand need to be reported as a liability. Then only the total accounting will become two lakhs. As per the taxation records, you are telling that the liability will be only two point four lakhs. But as per the accounting, you are telling that three lakhs means excess liability you need to be reported as a difference to the extent of sixty thousand. That's why which is treated as deferred tax liability in the year of origination, which is known as DTL origination. So then future periods, which is known as DTL. Reversal. The deferred tax liability, which was arised in year number one, due to excess of accounting income over taxable income, is capable of reversal in future periods in the name of DTL reversal. DTL reversal. Sir, now what are the general entries you are going to pass both for this current tax as well as deferred tax? Please allow me to concentrate here. Accounting treatment for current tax. Which is tax on taxable income. The entry is current to tax account debtor, current to tax account debtor to provision for tax, current to tax account debtor to provision for tax. This is the accounting treatment. I'll I'll already shown with my power notes. Just a moment. We can save some time here. Now, what is the general entries you can pass, sir? In the year of origin related to deferred tax. With respect to to defer tax liability, when defer tax liability will come, if accounting income is greater than taxable income, then defer tax liability will come. As per accounting, we need to report more. That's why the difference you should need to be adopted as a liability, which is a defer tax liability. Am I right? But before explaining the general entries for defer tax liability, first I'm explaining the entries for current tax. Right? What is the entry for current tax? Current tax account debtor to provision for tax is the general entry. Expense to liability, sir. If you want to report any liability, the entry is P and L to liability. That is expense to liability. The same entry you recorded current tax to provision for tax. Current tax will be charged to the profit and loss account. So profit and loss account that are to current tax. So the net entry is actually P and L to provision for tax is the net entry. By the combination of these two entries, the net entry is P and L to provision for tax. Now. Where this provision for tax you are going to shown, sir. Under current liabilities, under short term provisions, you will shown in the Schedule Three balance sheet. Is it okay, guys? All of you. Then come to the accounting treatment for this deferred tax. In the first issue, in the situation of DTL deferred tax liability, when accounting income is greater than taxable income in the year of origination, again the entry is same. Expense to liability. Expense is deferred tax to liability. Deferred tax liability. Sir, this deferred tax liability where we are going to show, sir, it is shown under non-current liabilities. So you may come across this deferred tax liability and the deferred tax assets in the balance sheet schedule three format, where the deferred tax liability we are showing under the non-current liabilities. The first head is the long-term borrowings. After the deferred tax liability only we will represent. Now this deferred tax should be closed and transferred to the profit and loss account. Then in the year of reversals. This is in the year of origination. This is in the year of origination. But in the year of reversal, now the originated amount of two lakhs is going to be reversal now. Now in the year of reversal, the entry should need to be reversed. That is DTL to defer tax. Entry DTL to defer tax. Defer tax account data to profit and loss account. 
This is with respect to, to defer tax liability accounting treatment. Now, if you check the statement of PNL, please allow me concentrate. If you check the statement of PNL, I started with profit before tax. Only which components I am going to discuss. Concentrate on such components. Remaining, you can simply left. Profit before tax, I will start. Less tax expense, which is tax on accounting income, which is a combination of current tax, which is tax on taxable income. Sir, why you added current tax, sir? What is the entry for current tax? Current tax to provision for tax. P and L to current tax. Then in P and L, you should need to add it as an expenditure as current tax. So under that, the first component is current tax. Next, defer tax liability. If it is the origination. Why I added the deferred tax originated amount, sir? What is the entry for deferred tax here? Deferred tax to deferred tax liability, P and L to deferred tax. Under P and L debited means we are added to the expense, which is deferred tax liability origination. Then in the reversal period, what will happen? Deferred tax is credited under P and L. There is decrease in expenditure. That's why I need to reduce the deferred tax liability reversal expense. This is with respect to DTL. Then when DTA will arise, sir, sir, in the same scenario, if you can imagine the opposite version, that is, if the accounting income is less than the taxable income, if accounting is income is less than the taxable income, let us assume the taxable income will be ten uh, lakhs and the accounting income will be eight lakhs. Now I need to book tax as per accounting income, but tax on taxable income ten lakhs into thirty percent is three lakhs is the current tax. Three lakhs is the current tax, but tax on accounting income is only the two point four lakhs. Then two point four lakh is equal to three lakhs minus deferred tax here, minus deferred tax here. Now the deferred tax is treated as deferred tax asset DTA. The deferred tax is treated as deferred tax asset when the accounting income is less than the taxable income, sir. Why you are representing it is under deferred tax asset, sir? It's quite simple. You are telling that tax on taxable income is three lakhs, but as per the accounting income, I need to report the two point four lakhs. The excess of tax you already reported as per the taxable income, right? The excess what you paid in the form of tax, I represented in the form of asset, which is the difference in between taxation records and accounting records, which is nothing but the difference of tax asset, which is DTA. So that's why if DTA origination, what is the general entry I need to pass? If is the DTA origination, the entry is deferred tax asset account data to deferred tax account because if it is a liability, expense to liability. If it is asset, asset to income, asset to income. If it is a liability, expense to asset. You know the basic accounting equation approach. Increase in expenditure should be debited. Increase in liability should be created. Here, increase in asset should be debited. Increase in income should be credited. Here, the deferred tax component is the credit aspect, which is an income. So, deferred tax account data to profit and loss account. Now, in the year of reversal, what is the entry? Entry should need to be reversed, na? Defer tax to DTA, defer tax to DTA, and P and L to defer tax. Now, all of you, please concentrate, sir. In the year of origination, defer tax is credited to the P and L. Credited to the P and L means you need to be reduced from expense. That is the reason why in statement of P and L, the defer tax asset origination should be reduced, and in the reversal period. The opposite sign you need to be adopted, which is the presentation in statement of P and L as well as balance sheet. In balance sheet, how it is presented? Deferred tax liability is presented under non-current liabilities, and a deferred tax asset is presented under non-current assets. But one thing here I am revealing: you are not representing both DTL and DTA at the same time. Either you represent net DTA. Or net DTL only. For example, for a particular component, you DTL is erased. For another component, DTA is erased. Now DTL is knock off with DTA. Then you are representing only net DTA or DTL only after considering the reversal items as well. Only either deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. Only one thing is shown under balance sheet. 
and a provision for tax with respect to, to current tax where it is shown which is shown under short term provisions but which is shown under either non current asset or non current liability depending upon whether it is dta or dtl okay so this is the story guys the next question coming into my mind is sir you are telling that you are telling that you are telling that accounting that is tax on accounting income is equal to tax on taxable income plus tax on plus or minus just it is an adjustment tax on timing difference right this this equation given by me right tell me guys this equation given by me now tax on accounting income is nothing but i told you which is current ta sorry tax expense tax on accounting income is nothing but tax expense right is equal to tax on taxable income which is current tax tax on taxable income is current tax why i wrote plus or minus which is tax on timing difference such timing difference may be origination or the reversal such timing difference may be dt a or dtl if the timing difference is with respect to, to dtl and the origination period it should be added if the timing difference is with respect to be reversal and which is dtl it should be reduced and which is dta origination period which is reduced which is dta with respect to, to reversal period it should be added so it's might confusing you don't remember with respect to the reversal period you can simply remember with respect to, to the origination period in reversal period you can simply adopt the opposite sign but how your thought process need to be adopted here if accounting income is more than the taxable income you need to report much more tax based on the accounting that's why which is ta deferred tax liability but if the accounting income is less than the taxable income you already paid more tax as per the taxation records the excess amount you paid as per the taxation records we may adopt it as a deferred tax asset like this your thought process need to be adopted in identifying dta or dtl in the year of origination if you can able to identify in the year of origination in the year of reversal you can simply put the opposite sign the next question coming into my mind is sir you are telling that the difference between accounting income and taxable income is due to the timing difference then only we need to create the deferred tax if the difference is if the difference is the pure timing difference if the difference is pure timing difference then what you told you can create deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability if the difference is timing difference you know the accounting treatment which may be a dta or dtl sir but if the difference is not the timing difference which is a permanent difference sir the difference is permanent in nature which will not capable of reversal in one or more subsequent future periods the difference is occurred in the current year which will never capable of reversal that means permanently it is different then what should i need to do sir you can simply ignore for the permanent difference as 22 doesn't applicable so once the accounting income and taxable income coming to takes place then first you need to start your thought process like this the difference is it timing difference or permanent difference it is a permanent difference ignore if it is a timing difference then you need to check accounting income is greater than taxable income then create dtl no accounting income is less than taxable income then create dta this is in the year of origination if it is capable of reversal in future periods then it will become dta reversal in this case it will become dtl reversal in reversal what happen in reversal accounting income is less than taxable income in this scenario here reversal means accounting income is greater than taxable income here it is accounting income less than taxable income here accounting income is greater than taxable income in case of reversal periods now in the statement of pnl how i need to be presented you know in the statement of pnl we will start with tax expense yes we will start with tax expense tax expense is nothing but tax on accounting income 
but it is represents two components one is tax on taxable income which is current tax which is tax on taxable income then if it is if it is dtl origination then you can add dtl originated related expense sir if it is dtl reversal then you may reduce the dtl reversal sir if it is related to dta origination you may reduce the dta origination if it is dta reversal then you may add to the dta reversal then after adjusting all such deferred tax components then you will get the total of tax expense now in the balance sheet what is the treatment in the balance sheet with respect to this current tax you may represent it under as a provision for tax provision for tax you may represent it under short term provisions under current liabilities then what about this deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability either you may represent dta or dtl which is on net basis if it is dta net you may represent under non current assets if it is dtl under a uh, net basis you may represent under non current liabilities this is the treatment we can done then which differences are timing differences which differences are permanent differences that is your duty i will give certain examples for permanent differences for better understanding please concentrate here certain examples for permanent differences fines and penalties sir fine is there as per income tax act fine or penalty is not allowed as under pnl but as per the financial accounting we are treated as an expenditure agriculture income is exempted in taxable records but which is treated as an income for financial accounting which never sir if you consider under accounting income but if you are not considered under taxable income means which is a permanent difference which will never capable of reversal in the future periods expenses which are disallowed forever as per the income tax act example section 40a of the income tax act i mean if any cash expenditure paid in excess of 10000 per day per transaction then at that particular circumstance that expenditure is straight away disallowed as per the income tax act but for financial accounting whether it is paid in the form of cash or whether it is paid in the form of any other way that is irrelevant for me i will treat it as an expenditure only which are permanently disallowed as per the income tax but uh, which is allowed as per the tax Uh, accounting records that means as per the accounting income is less but as per the taxation records the income is more which is not disallowed na then which is a permanent difference income taxes paid sir taxes paid by your entity which is allowed which is allowed as per the accounting but which is not allowed as per the taxation records that's why accounting income is less than the taxable income which create permanent difference donations not covered under section 80z i explained through my power notes this one this is important please concentrate here what will happen i am explaining here for example raj limited is there raj limited do donated certain amount that is 10 lakhs to a trust the trust is which is not registered under section 12aa of the income tax and if a trust is not registered under section 12aa of the income tax then whatever the amount donated to that particular trust will not be allowed as a deduction to that company will not be allowed as a deduction to that particular ssc if that particular trust is covered under section 12a of the income tax act then if you made any donation to that particular trust then the income tax as per the income tax act 1961 it will be allowed as a deduction under section 80z now the trust is not registered under section 12aa that's why if you provide any donation to that particular trust then which is not allowed a deduction for that particular ssc so due to this what happens sir if you made a donation for financial accounting which is treated as an expenditure but for income tax which is not allowed as an expenditure because atg deduction is not allowed because if the trust is not registered under section 12aa now the difference is arrived which is 10 lakhs which is a permanent difference which never capable of reversal in the subsequent period but if you see my example of depreciation here which difference is arrived in a particular accounting period but which is capable of reversal in subsequent periods which is a timing difference but which are a permanent difference hope you understand certain examples for permanent difference sir in the same way i'll try to give certain examples for timing difference as well please concentrate examples for timing difference most of the cases it will come sir section 43b 
what is the meaning of section 43 b as per income tax act 1961 these expenses are allowed on actual payment basis if you paid as per income tax they are allowed but for our financial accounting we are allowing expenditure based on the accrual not on cash basis for example taxes duties says are there they will be allowed as per the income tax other than income tax out of this tax income tax is anyway not allowed other than income tax taxes any taxes gst duty says okay for such all things allowed as an expenditure as per the income tax on cash basis but as per, as per our financial accounting we are not following the cash basis we are following the accrual basis bonus paid to the employees if it is really paid to the employees then only allowed as an expenditure as per income tax but in the accrual year old itself it is allowed as per the uh, financial accounting records contribution to pf superannuation funds any amount pay any amount uh, 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 related to the indian railways payable to the indian railways indian railways that is as per the accrual concept we are already allowing as an expenditure but on the actual payment basis only uh, for income tax act we are going to allow then what happened you know here i gave an example please concentrate Sir, for financial accounting, in the year of accrual itself, I erased. But for the taxation, you are not paid, let us assume, in the year 2021. That's when not allowed. Now, there is a difference between accounting income and taxable income, which is capable of reversal in the next accounting period. Because in taxation records, uh, the expenditure is allowed in the year of payment. Now, in 21-22, payment was made. But in the financial accounting, not based on the cash system, we already allowed in the last year. Now, here the accounting income is less than the taxable income the same is capable of reversal here which is accounting income is greater than the taxable income if accounting income is less than the taxable income what happened you know here dta is erased the dta is capable of reversal in the next accounting period which is dta reversal like this you need to check which is a pure example for the timing difference Next, one more example here given, certain expenses like preliminary expenses, amalgamation expenses, they can be allowed as per the taxation records for over a period of number of years, but as per the accounting records, we are treating as a in, in the year of occurrence itself. So let us take the example of preliminary expenses as per section 35D of Income Tax Act 1961, it is allowed over a period of five years, but as per the accounting records, it is allowed in the year number one itself which is again pure timing difference because in year number one accounting income is less than again the taxable income and which is capable of reversal in one or more subsequent future period of four years then in the over the four period years accounting income is greater than the taxable income which is dta reversal okay so the same example i continued here in the year number one which is a dta origination in the remaining four years which is dta reversal next uh, come to uh, point number three, maybe due to the depreciation amount. As per the accounting, depreciation is something, but as per the uh, uh, taxation, depreciation amount is something. The depreciation difference may arise due to rate of depreciation because for accounting purpose, we will follow the Schedule T of the Companies Act uh, 2013 depreciation rate, but as per the taxation, the rate of depreciation is quite different, which is offered in uh, section 32 of income tax act 1961 and the method of depreciation is also quite different in most of the times taxation we are following the wdv method but for the financial accounting we might follow the different methods like slm and number of units of productions and emission hours and such all other methods are applicable maybe in accounting the depreciation may be provided on individual asset basis but for the taxation the depreciation is based on block of assets concept which may also the one of the reason for getting the difference of depreciation in between accounting and taxation and one more thing uses for the accounting purpose we may provide the overall uses but for the taxation special circumstances are there special circumstances means for the research purpose if you are a uh, you say use that asset you may get year number one itself but for the accounting based upon the um, period of uses you may provide it do you understand these all factors are may cause for getting the different depreciation from accounting to taxation and one more guys uh, which is the last example for this marathon i mean in between the accounting and the taxation difference which related to the timing difference for this which is the last example okay sir as per section 33 ab or 33 aba what is there as per income tax act 1961 if you made deposit 
under certain T boards, or if you may deposit for scheme under uh, re restoration of certain activities, then as per the Income Tax Act, such donation will be allowed as an expenditure. So deposits made under scheme of T board. If you made such deposit, then it will be allowed as an expenditure under Section 33 AB. Now, in the year of deposit, what will happen? Let us have a look. Let us assume 2010 level is there. Now we are making deposit in 2010 level as per the taxation, which is allowed as an expenditure, but which is not allowed as an expenditure in financial accounting. So deposit is an investment in case of financial accounting. But once you made the deposit is allowed as an expenditure. So in 2010 level, what is the scenario? Accounting income is greater than the taxable income in the year of origination due to which DTL will be created in the year of origination. Now, as per the financial accounting, if such deposit is used for incurrence of any expenditure, in the actual year of expenditure, it is allowed as an expenditure. So in the year 11-12 for financial accounting, if you really incur out of such deposits any expenses, then you may treat it as an expenditure. But in taxation records, we are not allowed because we already allowed such deposit as an allowable expenditure in the year of deposit in the taxation, which is not an allowable expenditure. Now the accounting income is greater than taxable income, which is DTL origination is going to be reversal in the future period, which is accounting income is less than the taxable income. So which is a pure uh, timing difference, guys. So different examples also discussed by me with respect to timing difference and permanent difference. And the next question is with respect to recognition with respect to recognition. When I should need to recognize such deferred tax asset or such deferred tax liability? Please concentrate. Sir, deferred tax liability, for recognition of deferred tax liability, no certainty is necessary. You can simply recognize the deferred tax liability in the year of origination itself. But for the purpose of recognition of deferred tax asset, for the purpose of recognition of deferred tax asset, reasonable certainty should need to exist reasonable certainty should need to exist sir why for deferred tax liability reasonable certainty doesn't required but for why deferred tax asset reasonable certainty is necessary what is the journal entry for recording the deferred tax asset guys what is the journal entry for recognition of deferred tax asset in the books of accounts entry is deferred tax asset account data to deferred tax asset deferred tax account that is asset to income account then income to pnl deferred tax to pnl account that is the entry for deferred tax asset guys i already explained the general entry for deferred tax asset here the same entry we passed deferred tax asset account that are to deferred tax account deferred tax account deferred tax to pnl account am i right now the same entry repeated here nothing is great the same entry repeated here now the issue is due to recognition of deferred tax asset, there is increase in profits. There is increase in profits. Do you agree? But as per the prudence concept, you can anticipate all future losses, but not profits. I mean, whenever a particular component is causing for increase in profits, if certainty is there, then you can recognize. Unless otherwise certainty, unless otherwise there is no certainty, then you should not recognize such particular component into the statement of P and L. That is the meaning of concept of prudence. But you are thinking that due to excess of taxable income, due to excess of taxable income over accounting income, in the year of origination, you recognize a deferred tax asset. You recognize the deferred tax asset. Do you think that in future, there is a scope of accounting income is greater than taxable income? The DTA recognized by you in the current year is capable of reversal in the future periods. If the DTA origination is accounting income is less than taxable income, then DTA reversal means accounting income is greater than taxable income. If you have a reasonable certainty that accounting income is greater than taxable income in the future periods, then in the current year, you can recognize the deferred tax asset. That is the meaning of reasonable certainty. I clearly explained the same thing, guys, here. To recognize the DTA, reasonable certainty of realization of that asset should need to be exist. When reasonable certainty should exist, 
in the year of origination if accounting income is less than taxable income then in future periods is there any certainty is there for getting accounting income is greater than taxable income yes sir certainty is there then you can recognize the dta in the current year i don't know sir in future years whether accounting income is greater than taxable income or not i don't know then your recognition of dta should be postponed up to which time period i can postpone the recognition of the dta up to the period for which the certainty come to exist up to the period for which the certainty come to exist for example in the current year there is no certainty you postpone for recognition of dta to the next year in the next year certainty comes in the next year certainty came then what should you need to do sir then you can recognize the dta and one more thing i am telling you here you recognize in the current year the dta on the assumption that in the future in the future years there is a chance of getting accounting income is greater than taxable income but in the next year you realized that there is no chance there is no certainty there is no certainty that accounting income is greater than the taxable income then what can i do sir already recognized a dta you should need to be cancelled you should need to be cancelled now the overall glimpse is here just i want to provide before uh, go to the next issue please concentrate what is that i am in the concept of recognition i am in the concept of recognition sir regarding the recognition of defer tax liability defer tax liability no certainty required no certainty required as just as like that you can recognize that is by passing the entry defer tax to dtl you can simply make it transfer the defer tax p and l to defer tax because it doesn't increase the profit the creation of dtl doesn't impact increase in profit it rather than it creates decrease in profits am i right so now but coming to defer tax as set based on the concept of prudence if reasonable certainty if reasonable certainty regarding accounting income is greater than taxable income in future periods will be exist then you can create a dta if there is no certainty then then if there is no certainty then what you should need to do then you should postpone the recognition you can postpone the recognition into means there is no certainty okay for example created in the current year but in future years future years no certainty no certainty because in the current year on the assumption that certainty will be there then you created but in future year you realized that there is no certainty then what you should need to do you should cancel already recognized dta that's it guys next one more important point i am going to discuss this create a lot of difference here please all of you concentrate uh, this is very much pretty this is very much pretty uh, special item as well sir as per the accounting books in the year 2010 11 you are having a loss of 2 lakhs let us assume as per the taxation records for the 2010 11 also the income is same accounting income is same as like taxable income that is the point i am emphasizing here now by seeing these things do you think that if accounting income and taxable income both are same then there is no need of creation of any defer tax absolutely absolutely there is no need of creation of defer tax but if you are thinking like that then you may in the wrong direction now let me uh, travel some more distance then you can understand in the year 2011 12 let us assume what happened as per the accounting records i am getting the income 1 lakh but as per the taxation records also i am getting the same income in the taxation records also i am getting the same income now what will happen here 1 lakh here 1 lakh right but as per the carry forward provisions you know in the previous years if you are ending with losses you can carry forward such loss to the current year as well now out of such 2 lakhs you can carry forward the 1 lakh loss now the taxation income will be nil but accounting there are no provisions of carry forward as like income tax 
Now in the year 2011-12, what happened? Accounting income is greater than taxable income. Do we think that this is year of origination? No, this is year of reversal. Why you know? This difference is arised, one lakh and nil. The difference is arised due to carry forward of losses. Actually, in which year the loss is arised? In the previous year, which is the origination. That means the loss occurred year is, the loss arised year is, the loss originated year is 2010-11, which is the origination. Now, in reversal period, if accounting income is greater than taxable income, then in the origination period, accounting income is less than taxable income. In the origination, if accounting income is less than taxable income, which will be classic example for deferred tax asset origination. In origination, if it's DTA, in the reversal, which is DTA reversal. Now the same thing I explained here as well, if you observe. That means whenever carry forward of losses exist, even though there is no difference between accounting income and taxation income, but due to such carry forward of losses and an absorber depreciation also, the same thing is also applicable in case of an absorber depreciation. In future years, there may be a getting chance of difference between accounting income and taxable income, which is the reversal period. Even though literally there is no difference between accounting income and taxable income, you should need to create deferred tax asset in the era of origination. But one thing is sure, guys, when you can create deferred tax asset of origination, whenever you want to recognize the DTA into books of accounts, reasonable certainty is required, right? But here, not the reasonable certainty, virtual certainty supported by collaborative evidence is required. Virtual certainty supported by collaborative evidence is required. What is the sir, reasonable certainty is enough now to recognize the DTA? Why he is talking about this virtual certainty supported by collaborative evidence? What is the meaning of virtual certainty? A concrete evidence should be required for which purpose in future periods, definitely in future periods, definitely accounting income is greater than the taxable income. If you have such concrete evidence, then in the current year, you can recognize the DTA. Even in the case where accounting income and taxable income both are same in point of losses. Why, sir? Why evidence you are asking? In all other circumstances, reasonable certainty is more than enough, you told. The reason I will tell you. For example, you are assuming that in the current year 2010-11, accounting records 2 lakhs loss, taxation records also you are getting 2 lakhs loss. Let us assume in the next year, the taxable income is again loss. Then can you carry forward unabsorbed losses or can you carry forward unabsorbed depreciation? No. That means in future, if there is a probability to occur certain taxable income, then only I can carry forward the loss which was arised in the current year to the next year. Then I will make it nullify. Then there is a chance of occurring difference between accounting income and taxable income in the future years. That means there is a virtual certainty supported by collaborative evidence is required for future taxable income will be evolved. Sir, in future, definitely certain taxable income will be evolved due to which the carry forward losses, I can nullify that. Then in the future years, there is a difference between accounting income and taxable income, which is cause for DTA reversal. That's why in the era of origination, I can create a DTA origination. For which purpose I required a collaborative evidence in future, the taxable income will be evolved for which virtual certainty supported by collaborative evidence is there. Then I can recognize the DTA in the era of origination. Now I will add one more point here to the recognition concept of the DTA in generally to recognize the DTA reasonable certainty is more than enough, but whenever, but whenever carry forward of losses and unabsorbed depreciation is there, to recognize the DTA, virtual certainty, virtual certainty supported by collaborative evidence or concrete evidence. Collaborative means concrete evidence for evolving future taxable income will exist. Then only I can recognize the DTA or origination. Next, sir, what is the meaning of collaborative evidence here? Collaborative evidence that on your hand, any certain projects are there? Yes, sir, I have certain projects due to which I will get certain income in future. 
so my taxable income will going to arise or certain agreements are there sir the government should need to give uh, that project to me certain agreement was already entered which shown as a collaborative evidence just as an imaginary factor sir i will get certain profit in the future sir can i recognize the dt origination in case of carry forward and unabsorbed losses no if you have the evidence then only you can recognize that is the point sir why he is uh, telling all such different different issues with respect to dta sir because due to recognition of the dta your current year profits are going to high guys that is the main reason okay this is with respect to recognition now all of you please come to measurement issue guys measurement measurement means at which value i can measure both current tax and deferred tax sir measurement with respect to current tax is different and deferred tax is different current tax you know in generally how it is going to be measured you know i will tell you the practical uh, measurement of the current tax let us assume let us assume uh, I'll, i'll come here let us assume you know the financial year currently already started this video i am recording as on like uh, april 12th i think so april 12th 2022 i am recording so uh, today is april 12th 2022 right now what happened you know already in the month of february 2022 the current finance minister nirmala sitaraman ji already submitted her budget in the parliament okay this budget is with respect to finance act 2022 you know the act was already passed in uh, both the houses and it was already completed the assent of uh, rashtrapati as well it already take the assent of president of india as well now it became an act which is a finance act 2022 recently finance act 2022 was already enacted now the thing why i am discussing all such things in finance act 2022 they are going to provide tax rates information for the previous year 2223 previous year 2223 they will provide the tax rates for the previous year 2223 based on that we will plan our entire earnings we will pay the tax in the assessment year 2324 that means that means to measure the current tax tax rates applicable to the relevant years we need to check now tax rate applicable for the relevant assessment year 23 24 is finance act 2022 now measurement with respect to current tax is nothing but tax rates applicable to the relevant assessment year you need to check to measure the current tax for example if you are measuring the current tax for the financial year 22 23 or the assessment year 23 24 you should need to adopt the tax rates under the finance act 2022 for example if you want to calculate the current tax for a particular financial year 23 24 which is the financial year not the assessment year then assessment year will become 24 25 then which finance act i need to consider sir then i need to consider finance act 2023 so based on the tax rate applicable to that finance act i need to consider in evaluation of the current tax there is the point he mentioned here tax rates applicable to the relevant assessment year i need to consider the same example i explained in the power notes as well for the assessment year 22 23 finance act 2021 is applicable that is for the financial year 2021 21 22 finance act 2021 is applicable hope you understand this am i right one thing is sure guys for the year which you are calculating the current tax the relevant finance act rates are applicable that's it now coming to the deferred tax the provisions are little bit peculiar here for the purpose of measurement of deferred tax you can use enacted enacted means already act passed or substantively enacted substantively enacted means the act had to be passed the act the finance act had to be passed rates of the period in which it is going to be reversal oh my god indirectly he is telling that for the purpose of calculation of deferred tax reversal period rate should need to be used yes reversal period needs rates should need to be used yes sir let me take one example i am in the financial year 2021 22 the timing difference arised in the year 21 22 is 1 lakh 
which is capable of reversal in 20 to 23, 23, 24. Now I am in the year 21, 22, right? In the year 21, 22, you know, in the month of February 2022, they are going to pass the Finance Act 2022, which is relevant for rate for 20 to 23. The Finance Act relevant rate for in the year 21, 22 is 20 to 23 rate. I mean, even though you are as at 31st March 2022, you know already rate for 20 to 23. Do you agree? Which is known as substantively enacted rate. Because as on 31st March 2022, maybe the act still is under the progress. Maybe it doesn't complete the assent of the president. But you can use because 20 to 23 rate, you already know through Finance Act 2022. Reversal period rate 20 to 23, you know, right? You can use that. Sir, but I don't know the 23, 24 rate, sir. But I don't know the 23, 24 road, sir. Then what can I do, sir? You can use still 20 to 23 rate because in India, one year ahead only you can know the tax rate but in the european countries you know the five years head tax rate itself like a how the planning commission is developed in india in the same way the fiscal policy is also going to be developed in the foreign countries do you understand that means what are the tax rates i can know for the reversal periods the oldest i mean i mean uh, not the oldest what are the tax rates known for the reversal period the tax rates you can be used for the remaining reversal periods as well, even though you don't know the tax rates for the, all the reversal periods. Now, in the current scenario, I know in the year of 21-22 at the time of measurement of deferred tax, I know only the tax rate of the reversal with respect to 22-23 only. I don't know the reversal period of 23-24. Then the same tax rate of 22-23, I can use it for 23-24 as well. That is the reason why he drafted the provisions like enacted or substantively enacted. Enacted means already act passed. Substantively enacted means at to be passed. Any rates of the period in which it is going to be reversal. For example, you know both 22, 23 rates, 23, 24 rates ahead itself. Then you can apply to measure 22, 23 defer tax. You can apply that, that rates. For defer tax with respect to 23, 24, you can apply that rates. That is the essence of Defer tax issue, guys. Is it okay? Next, come to presentation and disclosure. Don't worry, guys. I will club all such things in a consolidated manner with, within quick five minutes. I am going to explain through a small mind map at the end of the standard. Presentation. I already explained something related to presentation. If it is a current tax in profit and loss, it is treated as an expenditure. In where? Where it should need to be report. I already shown which is tax expense, current tax. You need to represent under statement of PNL in balance sheet which is shown under the current liabilities under short term provisions. Is it right? <laughs> which is under provision for tax, I need to be represent. Next, coming to the defer tax in the statement of PNL, if it is the origination period, it should be debited. It should be added. Defer tax liability origination added. Sir, if it is defer tax liability reversal period, it should be minus. Coming to defer tax asset origination period, the defer tax should need to be minus if it is deferred tax as a reversal period then i need to add the same thing we already shown the presentation in the statement of pnl here clearly <laughs> here clearly this is a presentation of deferred tax next coming to balance sheet issue in balance sheet dtl is shown under non current liability dta is shown under non current assets but in balance sheet, we are going to show under net basis that is net DTA or net DTL. Okay, that's it. Next, two more important concepts are there to finish the accounting standard 22. Guys, <laughs> here I am in the marathon. Don't expect each and every item in, in detailed way. If you already listen to my regular courses in the regular lectures, you will get each and every content in very deeper mode in, in detailed way as well. Here, I will only take the conclusions. If I took the conclusions itself, it will take that much of time period. We are in the process of revision. So that's why I will give more concentration on the things to tell in the revised way are the conclusions only. Okay. So to get a deeper knowledge, to cover much more issues, you can simply watch my regular 
lectures okay but definitely these are highly useful for the persons who are in the process of revision after watching the regular courses who are going to appear in the examination in the forthcoming examination no doubt about it okay come to the tax holiday period what is the meaning of tax holiday period so to tell uh, in very a uh, simple manner tax holiday period means the period for which no need to make any payment of tax to the government that is nothing but tax holiday period in income tax act 1961 it will give privileges to certain types of entities who are covered under these sections entities covered under section 10a and 10b and entities covered under section 80 ia and ib sir which type of entities are covered under 10a and 10b if their business presence will be there under such special economic zones in general which are backward areas just like that a government announced such backward areas under such if those persons who started their business activities under says they will get certain tax exemptions tech box tech box okay it it's always look like says only the tech box as well now the export to turnover is completely exempted over a period of 10 years the export to turnover from the manufacturer the out of the goods manufactured if they have any turnover out of their exports there is no need to make payment of income tax as per income tax act 1961 then which are fully exempted then such entities are said to be under tax holiday period now coming to the entity to under 80 ia and 80 ib those entities under infrastructure sector certain other sectors also covered i basically here i wrote the infrastructure sector i mean dams construction roads construction canals the infrastructure sectors for which out of the <coughs> gross total income they are made certain investments under ata ia and ib na they will get deductions from gross total income they will get certain deductions under chapter 6a under section 80 ia and ib so whenever you are getting a deduction under chapter 6a then your gross total income is decreased to the tax extent again in that case there is no need to make payment of tax by such type of enterprises now the question is what is the impact of as 22 to such type of entities who are running under the tax holiday period there are two important provisions are there so first let me read such provisions the impact of as 22 for those entities these provisions are not applicable to all type of entities those entities which are covered under the tax holiday period what is the impact of as 22 timing difference originate in tax holiday period and a capable of reversal in tax holiday period no need to no need to recognize any deferred tax no deferred tax is recognized tax timing difference arises in tax holiday period and a capable of reversal in tax holiday period no need to recognize any deferred tax but timing difference originate in the tax holiday period but reversal going to occur after the tax holiday period for such timing difference you need to create a deferred tax in the year of origination itself maybe you understand the provisions but you may not know the reason i'll simply explain the reason sir for those timing difference which arise in the tax holiday period which are capable of reversal in the tax holiday period no need to pay any tax because anyway it the enterprise is under tax holiday period the enterprise is there under the tax holiday period if the enterprise is there under the tax holiday period the tax on such taxable income is anyway nil if you try to compare the accounting income with taxable income you are always getting a difference don't take that difference because the difference is not at all the timing difference the difference is occurred due to the tax holiday period the difference is occurred due to the tax holiday period the difference is not the timing difference at that point of time you cannot check whether the difference is the timing difference or the permanent difference the difference was occurred due to the tax holiday period do you understand that's why the difference should not considered at all within the purview of as 22 then which difference can i consider difference arises in tax holiday period but capable of reversal in after tax holiday period for that purpose you can create a deferred tax in the year of origination itself so remaining all in the normal cases in which year you are going to recognize the ddr ddl in the year of origination itself in the same way you can create i'll explain the same thing with a small illustration please all of you concentrate what happened so the company rasu limited is there which is running under the tax holiday period for a period of 5 years here two scenarios totally i am taking first scenario first scenario is in black color and the second scenario is in red color first you can only concentrate on the black color issue 
sir in the year number 1 timing difference is directly given which is 50 lakhs just he is given in the bracket the timing difference is accounting income is greater than taxable income now out of this 50 lakhs which is capable of reversal in which is capable of reversal in total uh, remaining 10 years so year 2 5 year 3 5 5 lakhs 5 lakhs like that it is capable of reversal in the future periods now up to the tax holiday period up to the tax holiday period total how much is capable of reversal out of this 50 lakhs total 20 lakhs it is capable of reversal timing difference arises during the tax holiday period and a capable of reversal during the tax holiday period no need to create any defer tax remaining amount is 30 lakhs right on the remaining amount 30 lakhs you can create a defer tax which is 30 lakhs into 30 percentage which is 9 lakhs that is the application of the provision let me take the second scenario in the year 1 timing difference is 10 lakhs in year 2 timing difference is 40 lakhs till now there is no reversal occurred but the reversal is going to occur from year 3 onwards during the reversal period the total amount of timing difference is going to be reversal was 15 lakhs now my question is out of this 15 lakhs in year number 1 10 lakhs arise na that one first reversed you should need to be assume fifo method fifo method means first in first out first arise at 10 lakhs out of this 15 lakhs that 10 lakhs was going to be reversal timing difference arised in tax holiday period and a capable of reversal during the tax holiday period no need to recognize any defer tax but out of this 40 lakhs only 5 lakhs was out of this 40 lakhs only 5 lakhs was reversal what about remaining 35 lakhs for the remaining 35 lakhs you need to create a defer tax that is 35 lakhs into 30 percentage 10.5 lakh you need to create a defer tax that is the impact of provisions guys sir to put it simply to put it simply timing difference originate in the tax holiday period and capable of reversal during the tax holiday period no need to report or no need to recognize any defer tax but the timing difference originate in the tax holiday period but capable of reversal after the tax holiday period for which you need to create a defer tax in the year of origination and the last special item in as 22 guys which is impact of as 22 in case of mat under section 115 gb first before directly explaining the impact of as 22 first let me explain the provisions of mat because for ca inter syllabus which is completely new to you but for a ca final student he already know the things related to mat sir the mat full form is minimum alternate tax what is the provisions of this mat is all about sir as per section 115 jb of income tax act 1961 as per section 115 jb of income tax act 1961 mat calculated based on book profit is greater than tax calculated on taxable income by applying the normal provisions of income tax act 1961 then that company should pay mat to the income tax authorities this mat is only applicable for companies this mat is only applicable for companies it doesn't applicable to any other type of ssc if mat calculated on the book profit the book profit is in generally calculated based on section 115 jc section 115 jc if the book profit calculated on section 115 jc on such book profit you are applying the mat rate then you will get the mat mat is equal to book profit under section 115 jc into mat rate then you will get mat if the mat calculated as per section 115 jb is greater than tax on taxable income then such company should pay mat to the tax authorities in that particular year you may feel that sir which is completely injustice you are already calculating tax on taxable income right he is earning the taxable income but that why that ssc is going to pay the higher amount of tax to the government that's why government is telling that sir we are not having the sufficient funds in our hands just we require the money as early as possible we are not making injustice to you the excess amount you paid right over the tax on taxable income the excess amount of mat you paid over the tax on taxable income we will be allowed it as a mat credit 
you will be allowed it as a mat credit such a mat credit you can be carry forward for 15 years sir how you can utilize the mat credit for example in the future years in any particular year if the tax on taxable income is less than the mat then you should need to pay the tax na at that particular scenario you can use this mat credit that means in the next year at the time of making payment of tax simply you cannot utilize the mat credit but in the next year if tax on taxable income is less than the mat then you should pay the tax as per the normal provisions of income tax act at that particular point of time you can utilize this mat credit that mat credit will be useful at the time of payment of self assessment tax the year in which mat is less than tax on taxable income one more time the conclusions i am drawn here please concentrate so the mass the mat concept is only applicable in point of view of companies mat is calculated based on section 115 jb how we are going to calculate mat for mat we are not calculating on taxable income mat is calculating on book profits under section 115 jc how we are going to calculate the book profits all such things you are going to learn in your ca final income tax act 1961 in paper number 7 dt actually the on such book profits under section 115 jc you should apply the mat rate currently i think so the mat rate is running at 15% like that then you will get the mat once you calculated the mat it should be compared with the tax on taxable income if mat is greater than the tax on taxable income then the such company should need to pay mat on behalf of tax on taxable income to the government but the excess of mat paid over the tax on taxable income government will be allowed as mat credit and if you are unable to utilize such mat credit within certain number of years then not a problem it will be carry forward for 15 years then in which year i can utilize such mat credit sir the year in which the tax on taxable income is less than the mat on behalf of paying the tax to the government you can knock it off the mat credit the remaining amount only you can pay it to the government that is the provisions behind the insertion of section 115 jb which is nothing but mat now the issue is not related to this provisions this provisions actually don't know that's why first i explained the provisions of income tax act 1961 but my issue is what is the impact of as 22 for that provisions what is the impact of as 22 with respect to, to the mat now i know one thing right what is that what we know current tax is tax on taxable income in general cases if mat is not applicable current tax is tax on taxable income but if mat is applicable current tax is mat the year in which mat is paid by the company for that year current tax is nothing but mat because current tax is tax on taxable income but for deferred tax mat provisions are not applicable for the purpose of calculation of deferred tax mat provisions are not at all applicable only for the purpose of calculation or only for the purpose of measurement of the current tax mat provisions are applicable because current tax is the component based on the taxable income but deferred tax is the component based on the timing difference do you understand so that's why for the purpose of measurement of deferred tax mat provision should not apply in the normal course only we will calculate the deferred tax now let us check with small illustration to understand such provisions in better manner <laughs> let us assume in the financial year 2010-11 accounting income is 30 lakhs taxable income is 10 lakhs tax rate is 30 percentage book profit under section 115 jc is 50 lakhs mat rate is 15 percentage first let us calculate mat all of you quickly first all of you ca calculate the mat so mat under section 115 jb 50 lakhs into 15 percentage which is 7 lakh 50 thousand which is 7 lakh 50 thousand also calculate tax on taxable income taxable income is 10 lakhs tax rate is 30 percentage 10 lakhs into 30 percentage which is 3 lakhs now mat is greater than tax on taxable income therefore current tax is equal to mat is equal to 7 lakh 50 thousand no doubt about it then what about deferred tax sir deferred tax is the timing difference for deferred tax calculation you should not apply the provisions of mat right now deferred tax is the timing difference which is the accounting income and taxable income the deferred tax is the timing difference in between accounting income and taxable income which is 30 lakhs minus 10 lakhs which is 20 lakhs 20 lakhs into you should apply the normal tax rate only 20 lakhs into 30 percentage which is how much guys 6 lakhs so deferred tax is nothing but 6 lakhs you can calculate deferred tax in this manner or if you want you can calculate like this as well tax expense is equal to current tax plus deferred tax therefore deferred tax is equal to tax expense minus current tax sir why you current tax you taken here 3 lakhs sir 
concentrate defer tax is equal to tax expense 9 lakhs minus 3 lakhs why you consider 3 lakhs sir defer tax is nothing but mat na sorry current tax is nothing but mat na but for the purpose of calculation of defer tax we should not apply the provisions of mat i told you right you can calculate defer tax in this method which is method number 1 or you can calculate defer tax in this method in the equation you know tax expense equal to current tax plus defer tax here defer tax is equal to tax expense minus current tax tax expense is nothing but tax on accounting income accounting income is 30 lakhs 30 lakhs into 30 percentage which is 9 lakhs minus current tax current tax is tax on taxable income you should not take tax with respect to, to mat here because we are in the calculation of deferred tax in calculation of deferred tax uh, in calculation of deferred tax mat provision should not be applicable where current tax is nothing but tax on taxable income only 10 lakhs into 30 percentage only 6 lakhs in this method we are we are all getting the 6 lakhs as deferred tax in this method also we are getting the deferred tax 6 lakhs now presentation of tax expense whenever mat is there now tax expense is equal to current tax which is mat 7 lakh 50 thousand plus deferred tax which we are getting 6 lakhs now this mat is again we can split into tax on taxable income and excess of tax paid over the excess of mat paid over the tax which is mat credit tell me guys tax on taxable income is tax on taxable income is here 10 lakhs into 30 percentage which is 3 lakhs but the mat is 7 lakh 50 thousand this 7 lakh 50 thousand is divided into two types one is 3 lakhs plus excess paid how much 4.5 lakh which is mat credit so 4.5 is mat credit and 3 lakhs is tax on taxable income so the total you are going to represent like this 3 lakhs plus 4 lakh 50 thousand plus 6 lakhs 3 lakhs is tax on taxable income 4 lakh 50 thousand is mat credit and 6 lakhs is deferred tax this is the presentation of tax expense whenever mat is applicable tax on taxable income plus mat credit plus deferred tax like this you need to represent then what are the conclusions here sir Sir, in case whenever MAT is applicable, current tax equal to MAT, but for the, for the purpose of calculation of different tax, you should not apply the provisions of the MAT. How you should need to be presented to the tax expense? Tax expense equal to tax on taxable income plus excess of MAT paid over the tax, which is MAT credit plus deferred tax. That's it. Now, I told you, I promised you at the end of the standard, I'll give a quick mind map. This is very a peculiar standard and a little bit technical. Sir, the objective of insertion of accounting standard 22 is to providing the taxes on income, to providing the taxes on income. Different definitions actually we've seen. Okay, I'm explaining one by one scope. I don't want to see definition accounting income. What I told, what is the meaning of accounting income? That is net profit before tax. Taxable income. Taxable income is nothing but income calculated as per Income Tax Act 1961. Current tax, tax on taxable income. Defer tax, tax on timing difference. What is the meaning of timing difference? Timing difference is the difference in between accounting income and taxable income originated in one accounting period and a capable of reversal in subsequent accounting periods. Permanent difference originated in one accounting period and a not reversal in subsequent period, which is ignored for the purpose of calculation of deferred tax. Am I right, guys? Tax expenses, current tax plus or minus deferred tax. Next, recognition of the DTA. Not related to DTL, only DTA. By applying the prudence concept, reasonable certainty regarding realization of DTA should exist as on the balance sheet date. But in case of carry forward and unabsorbed process, Virtual certainty supported by convincing evidence with respect to the future taxable income is necessary to recognize the DTA in that particular circumstances. Even though the taxable loss and the accounting loss both are same, you should need to recognize the DTA in that particular circumstances. We've seen already one illustration. Next, unrecognized DTA should be reviewed at each balance sheet. I already told you that. I mean, in the current year, if there is no certainty, then in the next year, you should need to be reviewed. Certainty is there, you can recognize. Coming to the measurement issue, current tax, we are going to measure it rates at which pay the tax is payable to the government. That is for the relevant finance act applicable to that assessment year, you need to check. But the deferred tax is going to be measured at enacted or substantively enacted rates of the period in which such timing difference is going to be reversal. That means simply the reversal period rate should be useful. You can also use substantively enacted rates as well. So presentation, I already told you certain special issues, two special issues we discussed here. Impact of AS22 in case of tax holiday period. Sir, timing difference arises in the tax holiday period. Capable of reversal during the tax holiday period. No deferred tax will be recognized. 
timing difference originated in the tax holiday period, but reversal after the tax holiday period, deferred tax should be recognized in the year of origination. Impact of AS22 in case of MAT, current tax is equal to MAT, but for the purpose of calculation of deferred tax, you can use the regular tax rates. MAT rate should not be used. Presentation of tax expense equal to tax on taxable income, but MAT credit plus deferred tax. That's it, guys. This is the concept of AS22. Our next standard is AS5, net profit or loss for period, prior period items and change in accounting policies. The title of AS5 is Two Lengthy Friends. Sir, what is the objective of this standard? Why this standard is introduced? What are the different issues we are going to see in this standard? First, let me give a quick glance. Oh. We can check with that power notes. Just a sec. Yeah. What is the objective? So the objective of AS5 is presenting as well as disclosing, presenting as well as disclosing items in profit and loss account. I mean, we may present various items in statement of profit and loss account as per schedule three part two. You know that, right? But out of that items, how we need to present? Because the ultimate objective of preparation of the financials itself is to provide the valuable information to the stakeholders of the company. By seeing such financials, the stakeholders of company should able to take the right decisions. For that purpose, the information, what we are giving in a proper manner, then only based on that information, the investors can take the right decisions. With that context, AS5 is introduced. How you should going to present each and every item in the statement of PNL will provide the guidance through AS5. Now, the items the items in statement of PNL were broadly categorized into two types. Actually, the items in statement of PNL are broadly categorized into two types. Those are ordinary activities. Those are ordinary activities and extraordinary activities. Only two types. The items in statement of PNL are broadly classified into two different types. One is ordinary activities. Another one is extraordinary activities. What is the meaning of ordinary activity? What is the meaning of extraordinary activities, sir? Ordinary activities are normal business activities only and which are furtherance and incidental to the business activities as well. I mean, sir, salaries paid, rental expenditure incurred, purchases made, sales made. Whatever the activity you will perform with respect to, to your business in a normal course, as well as incidental to such business. Maybe incidental to such business, you need to incur certain advertising expenditure, sir. Incidental to such business, you may require certain transportation expenses, sir. Sir, incidental to such business, you may incur certain audit expenses, sir. Such all things are form part of ordinary activities only. For ordinary activities, no need to provide a separate disclosure in the statement of profit and loss account. Simply, you can disclose in the as usual manner. No need to put the heading, these are ordinary activities. So that's why no separate disclosure is required in the statement of PNL with respect to ordinary activities. Then what about extraordinary activities, sir? What about extraordinary activities? Extraordinary activities are distinct, which are clearly distinct from the ordinary activities, which can be clearly differentiate from the ordinary activities. By seeing itself, we can easily identify that these are not ordinary activities. And the occurrence is irregular. Extraordinary activities are income or expenditure related to the current year, which are clearly distinct from ordinary activities. And the occurrence of such items are irregular. Sir, can you please give certain examples? First of all, if the particular activity is an extraordinary activity, what I should need to do? while presenting such particular item in the statement of PNL, it should be separately disclosed in the statement of PNL. 
separate disclosure you should need to provide in the statement of profit and loss account sir can you please give certain examples for extraordinary activities why not attachment of the property for example if you took a some loan and that loan is not repayable by you then the banking company will attach that property you cannot resell that property to any other party uh, unless otherwise if you take the assent of the banker that is nothing but attachment of the property refund of the government grant sir you took the government grant you took the government grant but at the time of at the time of initiation of such government grant by the government it leaves certain conditions we are unable to fulfill such conditions that is the reason we are making refund of such government grant such a refund of government grant is also a classic example for extraordinary activity and i will tell you these you already know which related to the abnormal activities like loss arranged in case of earthquake loss arranged in case of natural calamities like floods maybe loss arranged due to the pandemic situations like covid 19 all such things are coming under again extraordinary activities if you observe the extraordinary activities are not at all related to your business activity which quite in common which are not irregular sorry which are uh, which are completely regular which are not regular so such type of activities are come under extraordinary activities by seeing such activity itself we can easily identify that which is not an ordinary activity then receipt of government grant in compensation of expenses i mean in the last year uh, in certain hilly, hilly areas maybe uh, the cyclones came so due to which the entire crops of that particular uh, parties are they lost then at that particular point of time in compensation as an ex gratia so government releases certain grants so which is receipt of government grant in compensation of expenses so such things are also coming under the categorization of extraordinary activities so attachment of the property refund of government grant receipt of government grant in compensation of expenses earthquakes loss arranged due to earthquakes and natural calamities or the pandemic situations are coming under the extraordinary activities now if you observe for ordinary activities no separate disclosure should be required but for extraordinary activities separate disclosure should be required in the statement of pnl that means if any extraordinary activity takes place in the particular financial year then the enterprise should need to disclose separately such extraordinary activities from ordinary activities why sir what is the reason for example in the current year the operating profit is let us assume 1 crore but due to earthquake we lost everything the loss is approximately 3 crores let us assume now the profit of 1 crore is completely eroded by the loss of 3 crores and the net loss became 2 crores if any person will see ultimately net profit before tax then it is shown as 2 crores right then it is shown as 2 crores then the stakeholder should thought that sir our company is not performing well our company is not performing well they may take the wrong decisions but rather than that if you provide the information like this sir profit from ordinary activities this much and a profit from extraordinary or loss from extraordinary separately then they can clearly identify that our company is performing well but in the current year due to certain extraordinary activities our company may turn up into the loss situation that is the reason why uh, the uh, accounting standard 5 is separately introduced i told you clearly which is presenting and disclosing items with respect to statement of pnl hope you understand now the clear cut objective of as 5 next sir one more item is there which is exceptional items exceptional item is also is an ordinary activity guys which is not an extraordinary activity exceptional item is also ordinary but due to but due to such a size nature or incidence of such transactions a separate disclosure should required in the statement of pnl exceptional items are ordinary activities but due to such a size nature or the incidence of the transaction separate disclosure should be required in the statement of pnl i'll give certain examples here concentrate sir in the current year i sold a particular ppe i sold one building so that building was purchased a long back 10 years back which was purchased at 10 lakhs which right now sold at 10 crores then i get huge profit in the current year sir such a huge size 
may be the nature may be the incidence of such transaction which is ordinary only sir if any party is having the ppe if they may sold out for any reasons which is ordinary activities only which are incidental to business only those are ordinary only but due to such a size nature or incidence of the transaction we should need to provide a separate disclosure so various examples are there let me explain one by one example written down value of the inventory and a reversal of such written down value of the inventory and a reversal of such sir what it is sir what it is please concentrate all of you sir uh just a moment yes sir let us assume as on 31st march of a particular year uh, the value of the inventory cost is at 1 lakh let us assume and the nrv nrv is at 80000 nrv is at 80000 now as per the accounting principle of as2 inventory should be valued at cost or nrv whichever is lower that is 80000 to value the stock at 80000 you need to reduce 20000 right written down value of inventory what is the entry you should need to pass here profit and loss account data to inventory account 20000 you need to reduce from the cost then only inventory showing at 80000 now how much amount you debited to the statement of pnl to the text in 20000 due to written down value of the inventory such a written down value of the inventory in the statement of pnl you should show under exceptional item that is the meaning of exceptional items and a reversal of such and a reversal of such when you would reverse such written down value for example the same stock is continued in the next year as well just for the time being i am telling you the same stock is going to continue in the next year as well uh, in the next year the stock was not sold out let us assume now in the next year what happened the nrv value the nrv value is 1.5 lakh net realizable value right now in the outside the market value is 1.5 lakh but what is the original cost cost is 1 lakh the same stock i am talking about the same stock 1.5 lakh or 1 lakh whichever is lower then the inventory should be shown at 1 lakh right the inventory should be shown at 1 lakh that is cost to price earlier the inventory was earlier the inventory was carried at 80000 from 80000 to 1 lakh means you should need to make reversal of such written down that means in the previous year written down we already shown in the statement of pnl and a reversal of such in the next year also we are going to shown in the statement of pnl by passing the entry inventory to pnl right now pnl is credited to the extent of 20000 now reversal of such written down should also going to show under exceptional item next provision for restructuring expenses and reversal of such what is the meaning of restructuring the way of conducting the business itself is different in future maybe earlier which is completely man based right now we are uh, running towards mechanization or the manufacturing process itself may quite different the nature of technology we are using in future it is different then which is nothing but restructuring expenses then any expenditure we are going to incur in future for the purpose of restructuring you can create a provision as per accounting standard 29 that one such a provision what is at the time of creation of such provision the entry is pnl account data to provision for restructuring expenses then where i should need to show due to such a huge size and nature of the transaction separate disclosure should be required and a reversal of all such provisions any provisions reversal of any provisions sir you created one provision but the actual expenditure is less than the provision created then the excess of provision you created you may reversal it such all reversal of provisions are chart again credited to the pnl under the exceptional items category this one i already explained disposal of assets and a disposal of long term investments if you sold out any particular ppe if you sold out any long term investment if you derived any profit or loss such profit or loss again transfer to the statement of pnl under the category of exceptional item litigation settlement litigation settlement maybe certain disputes are there maybe the land disputes or maybe any other disputes such litigation settlements we are paying certain amount it should be charged to the statement of profit and loss account so under the exceptional item category legislative amendments having retrospective effect legislative amendments having retrospective effect maybe our company is a 
chemical manufacturing company, let us assume. So due to manufacturing of the chemicals, the nearby surroundings, the entire uh, environment itself is damaged, let us assume. Due to the legislative amendments having the retrospective effect, I need to recover the entire environment as like in the previous mode. For that, I need to incur certain damages or I need to incur certain restoration expenses. I need to charge such expenditure into the statement of PNL under the category of exceptional item. I mean, if you check here, exceptional items are ordinary activities only, but due to such a size, nature, or incidence, a separate disclosure should be given in the statement of PNL. For ordinary activities, no separate disclosure, but for extraordinary activities, separate disclosure should be required. Even though exceptional items are also ordinary activities, but due to such a size, nature, or incidence, separate disclosure should be required. So all examples also given by me. If you check the statement of PNL guys here, just a moment, not there. One second, I'll open the statement of PNL. In schedule three, if I open, this is the statement of PNL. Now, what is the application part of AS5? We can see here, concentrate. Sir, if you check profit before exceptional and extraordinary items and a tax represented, that means what are all the items you shown here? What are all the items you shown here? These are ordinary activities. I told you for ordinary activities, no separate disclosure should be required. Then profit before exceptional items, extraordinary items because for exceptional items separate disclosure should be required then you will get profit before extraordinary items and tax and for extraordinary items also separate disclosure should be required so for exceptional items we separately disclose in the statement of pnl and extraordinary items also we are going to disclose separately in the statement of pnl but for ordinary activities there is no separate head simply we just shown as like that am i right okay come back guys so this standard is introduced, this standard is introduced not only for presentation and disclosure of ordinary and extraordinary and exceptional, this standard is also introduced to explain the items with respect to, to prior period items as well. Sir, what is the meaning of prior period items, sir? What is the meaning of prior period items? Prior period item is an expenditure or income recognized in the current year due to error or omission occurred in preceding financial years. Maybe a particular error or omission occurred in the previous financial year. At that particular point of time, that error or omission was not detected. Not detected. That error or omission was detected in the current year. Then what I can do, at least I need to adjust in the current year. Under which head I need to adjust? Under the head of prior period items. One thing you need to remember at the time of adjustment of prior period items in the current year, it should definitely occur due to error or omission. It should definitely occur due to error or omission. I'll give a classic example here. Sir, for example, a cash theft was happened in the year 2021 by a cashier. But such cash theft was identified in the year 21-22. Now, you know, you know one thing. If that item is, if that item is event occurring after balance sheet date, then you need to adjust in the year 2021 itself. Tell me guys, we already seen uh, in the last accounting standard AS4 at the time of discussing events occurring after balance sheet date, cash, the actual theft was occurred in 2021, but such theft was identified in the year 21-22 that theft was identified in the year 21-22. That means before approval of financial statements by board of directors, if it is identified, then which is an event occurring after balance sheet date, then it should need to be adjusted in the year 2021. Then in the year 2021, it is not a prior period item. In the year 2021, it is not a prior period item. Do you know that? Because 2021 abnormal loss, 2021 abnormal loss, we are recorded in the year 2021. That is not a prior period item. But let us assume the cash theft occurred in 2021, 
was identified in 21-22, not before approval of financial statements by board of directors, after approval of financial statements by board of directors, then which is non-adjusting event for the year 2021, which is non-adjusting event for the year 2021. Then in which year it need to be adjusted? Then in the year 21-22, it need to be adjusted. Then in the year 21-22, as which item it should need to be adjusted, sir? It should need to be adjusted as prior period item. Then the next question coming into my mind is, sir, prior period items, is it separate disclosure necessary, sir? Yes, absolutely. The prior period item should be separately disclosed. Do you know why? It is not at all related to the current year expense. It is not at all related to the current year income, but still we are recording in the current year statement of profit and loss account. The users of the financial statements can easily differentiate that these items impact. We are considered in the current year, even though those items are not related to the current year, which was occurred in error or omission related to the previous financial years. And where it should need to be disclosed, sir? Is it disclosed under ordinary or is it disclosed under extraordinary or is it disclosed under exceptional? I mean, if the virginal expense or income is related to ordinary, such prior period item is also related to the ordinary. If the virginal expense or income is related to extraordinary, then prior period item is also related to the extraordinary. For example, earthquake occurred in the previous year, but the loss estimated due to earthquake was wrong in the last year, which was actually estimated at 2 CR, but the actual expenditure is 2.2 CR. Now the previous estimate is 2 CR, right? Now the excess of amount is 20 lakhs is there. Such excess of amount you need to be adjusted in the current year under which head, which is a prior period item because the expenditure recognized in the current year due to error or omission made in the previous financial year. Then under which head I need to disclose the day under extraordinary activities because the virginal expenditure is related to extraordinary activity. So disclose it separately after after current year information in the statement of profit and loss account. After current year information in the statement of PNL account. I mean, in the statement of PNL, for example, if it is related to ordinary, let me come to the schedule three. If it is related to the ordinary, first you, you can show the ordinary related to the current year information. After that, separately give the heading, prior period items. Then you can provide the information. If it is related to extraordinary, first to provide the current year information, then give separate heading the prior period items. If it is related to exceptional items, first related to the current year information you can show, then prior period items information you can give. Do you understand? Okay. And the next issue is, still two more objectives are there for introduction of AS5. What are such two more objectives, sir? If any change in accounting estimate if any change in accounting policy is there, how it should need to be disclosed in the statement of, uh, how it should need to be disclosed in the financials is another objective of introduction of AS5. AS5 is totally introduced with an objective of presentation and disclosures related to the five aspects. One is ordinary, which includes ordinary as well as ordinary, but exceptional. Another one is extraordinary. Another one is prior period items. And another one is change in accounting estimate and change in accounting policy. First of all, before discussing things related to change in accounting estimate, you should need to know one thing. What is the meaning of accounting estimate? What is the meaning of accounting estimate? Sir, accounting estimate is the concept completely based on judgment. In the business, we may not represent each and every item in the actual manner. Certain items, certain items required estimates. What is the meaning of estimate, sir? Estimate is not the actual amount, which is calculated based on certain assumptions, which may be calculated by experts. Sir, can you give certain examples of estimates we are generally using in our business, sir? Provision, whatever the provision you are creating as per the concept of prudence is completely estimate. Sir, depreciation, sir. Depreciation expenditure booked in the statement of PNL on the PPE, property, plant and equipment is an estimate. Do you agree? Sir, what is the formula for depreciation under SLM method? cost, virginal cost minus estimated residual value divided by estimated useful life, estimated useful life, provisions, 
estimated useful life of the PPE, residual value of the PPE, all are estimates. Sir, if the useful life is estimate, if the residual value of the PPE is estimate, then depreciation itself is an estimate. Inventory obsolescence. Sir, how much inventory is completely obsolescent, a complete obsolescence amount, sir? Due to change in technology, how much inventory is not useful, sir? That is also estimate. All these are estimates. So many different estimates we are using on the regular course of business. Now, what is the accounting treatment for such accounting estimate? For such accounting estimate, by making the lot of efforts, by making a proper judgment, we will derive a figure. We will derive a figure. Maybe based on the past experience, maybe after taking the opinion of the experts, or maybe, uh, I mean, <laughs> the trend, or maybe the industry impact, whatever the case maybe we will take a certain base based on that we will make a certain accounting estimate we will make a certain accounting estimate but the issue is if at any point of time if there is any change occurred in such accounting estimate what is the accounting treatment if any such change occurred in such accounting estimate what is the accounting treatment the accounting treatment should be provided prospectively prospectively or i can put in another way please concentrate Whatever the estimate you made, that accounting estimate should be reviewed from period to period. That accounting estimate should be reviewed from period to period. For example, guys, sir, I created a provision for warranty expenses, provision for warranty expenses for 10 lakhs based on my past experience. Based on my past experience, I created for the current year 10 lakhs. Now in the next year, what happened? the actual expenses were incurred at the rate of 15 lakhs. The actual expenses incurred at the rate of 15 lakhs. Sir, I created a provision for 10 lakhs in the last year, but the actual expenses incurred in the current year was 15 lakhs. Why, sir? Maybe certain manufacturing defects are identified by us or uh, due to which the major warranty expenditure is going to incur by the enterprise. Then what I will do? For the next year, still I am going to create a provision only for 10 lakhs? No. Now the actual expenditure in the current year become 15 lakhs. On the basis of this, the available information, I may create a provision for the next year at the rate of 15 lakhs. Then what I can need to do? Then I need to create p and account data to provision for warranty expenses 15 lakhs I need to create. That means what I did based on the prospective information, that is for the future, based on the future, I am providing the accounting treatment. That is nothing but prospective accounting. I'll give another example, guys. I can give another example. Sir, let me take uh, an example of the PPE. Just I'm rubbing this. Please concentrate. I will take another example of PPE. Uh, what about the PPE, sir? Sir, initially, a property plant and equipment estimated a useful life I taken at five years. And the residual value is, let us assume, nil residual value estimated residual value is nil so the cost of the ppe is one lakh now the depreciation for first two years let us assume based on this on slm basis uh, that is one lakh divided by five years into two years for two years depreciation how much guys Forty thousand. Forty thousand. do you agree Forty thousand is depreciation for the first two years now, after the second year, what we realized, the remaining estimated useful life is not three years. Based on this information, the remaining estimated useful life will be three years, right? But based on the available information, the remaining estimated useful life will be for six years. Not for the three years, the remaining useful life will be six years. Then how to provide the depreciation, sir? So then depreciation for third year is nothing but 60,000 divided by for the remaining estimated useful life are how many years, guys? Which are six years. That equal to uh, 10,000 per annum. That means already provided depreciation, we are not at all touching. Based on the futuristic information, based on the future figures, just we are making adjustment. We are not touching about the past information. That is the meaning of the prospective accounting. Prospective accounting means you can adjust in the future, but not in the past. If there is any change in accounting estimate. And one more thing is clearly given. If it can be quantified in the current year financial statements, 
then it should need to be adjusted in the current year financial statements sir if it is if it is related to the future financial statements then you should need to be adjusted in the future financial statements not in the current year financial statements i gave the two examples so that is provision for warranty expenses i created a provision for warranty in the current year itself because it impacted the current year financial statement itself if it will impact the future financial statements the depreciation if there is change in estimated useful life it doesn't impact in the current year but it is going to impact in the future that is the future financial statements it is going to impact that means if there is any change in that accounting estimate the estimate the change the change should be reviewed to the new figures and the accounting treatment should need to be provided prospectively in the futuristic way but already recognized expenditure with respect to to that accounting estimate we doesn't we doesn't disturb do you understand next come here change in accounting policy first do you know the meaning of accounting policy first what is the meaning of accounting policy accounting policy is an accounting principle it is an accounting principle are methods adopted to are methods adopted to follow such accounting principles in preparation in preparation and presentation of financial statements is known as accounting policy so simply accounting policy is an accounting principle and the methods adopted to follow such accounting principles in the presentation and the preparation of the financial statements sir can you give certain examples for accounting policies sir why not do you know the principle of as to right as to inventory valuation principle is accounting principle is it should be valid at cost or nrv whichever is lower which is an accounting principle as well as an accounting policy because accounting policy includes accounting principle so inventory valuation principle it should be valid at cost or nrv whichever is lower is a accounting principle as well as accounting policy to follow such accounting principle i may follow fifo method or i may follow a weighted average method or i may follow lifo method or i may follow any other method as well such all methods are purely accounting policies those are not accounting principles to put it simply please concentrate uh, let me come to mt1 note just a moment right sir if you take a big universe this is accounting policy this is an accounting policy if you take a small universe then you can treat that which is an accounting principle which is an accounting principle what is the meaning of this sir every accounting principle is an accounting policy but certain accounting policies may not accounting principles the same logic just now i proved as per as to inventory valuation inventory is valued at inventory is valued at cost or nrv whichever is lower which is an accounting principle which is an accounting principle you know each and every accounting principle is policy as well that's why it is also called as accounting policy it is also known as accounting policy but to follow such accounting principle i may adopt fifo method or i may adopt specific identification method yes that is also one of the method or i may adopt weighted average method now these methods are pure policies these methods are pure policies these methods are not principles policies may differ from one entity to another entity but principles doesn't differ from entity to the another entity that is the difference between principle and policy and each and every principle is also known as policy but each and every policy may not be a principle hope you understand first the meaning of accounting policy before discussing about change in accounting policy next question coming into my mind is first first of all can i change an accounting policy from one method to another method i am not talking about principle i am talking about pure methods can i change from one accounting policy to another accounting policy you know the concept of consistency 
you know the concept of consistency as per the concept of consistency in generally same accounting policy should be followed from time to time same accounting policy should be followed from time to time but certain exceptions are there what are such exceptions sir if any statute prescribes if any statute prescribes sir in the companies act it is clearly given that for the inventory all the entities should need to follow fifo method only for example if i followed previously weighted average method then i need to convert it to fifo method so if any statute prescribes then i can change if any accounting standard prescribes then i can change sir it is not appropriate to follow the old accounting policy if you change to the new accounting policy it is appropriate then appropriate presentation and preparation of the financials to adopt the new new accounting policy then you can then you can adopt the new accounting policy if in these three circumstances you can change one accounting policy to another accounting policy but unless otherwise unless otherwise these three circumstances is not coming into the picture you cannot change an accounting policy you cannot change an accounting policy okay fine sir then at the time of change in accounting policy what is the accounting treatment we need to provide sir at the time of change in accounting policy the accounting treatment is retrospective accounting treatment what it means retrospective accounting treatment please concentrate at the time of change in accounting policy the accounting treatment is retrospective accounting treatment sir earlier at the time of change in accounting estimate we decided to follow the prospective accounting treatment but at the time of change in accounting policy the accounting treatment is retrospective accounting treatment i will tell you what is the meaning of retrospective accounting treatment for example uh till now for valuation of closing stock i mean you started your business uh 5 years back till now you followed the method of valuation of closing stock on the basis of fifo now at the end of the fifth year you are converted to weighted average basis maybe due to any reason due to the statutory requirement or maybe the due to standard requirement or for better presentation of the financial statements now what i should need to do you know if i follow if i would follow the weighted average method from the day one onwards what is the value of the closing stock if i follow the weighted average method from day one onwards what is the valuation of closing stock let us assume the valuation of the closing stock is 1 cr but actually i followed the fifo method right then the closing stock value is 1.2 cr that means if i adopt the weighted average method from day one onwards the closing stock will be 20000 less than the actual closing stock on the basis of fifo method the 20 lakhs i need to be adjusted in the current year first by passing the entry profit and loss account data to inventory account profit and loss account data to inventory account do you understand the change in accounting policy will provide the retrospective accounting treatment the same point here i given if you can able to quantify such a change due to such change how much profit or loss do you derive it should be identified in the current year financial statement it should be adjusted in the current year financial statement itself no 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 sir it may not quantify the current year financial statement but it may impact the future financial statements then the fact should be disclosed because it may not impact the current year financial statements but it may impact the future financial statement then the same fact should be disclosed what is that fact sir there is a change in accounting policy is going to take place in the current year but due to which the current year financial statement doesn't impact but due to which the future financial statements are going to impact the same fact you should need to be disclosed this is with respect to the accounting treatment of change in accounting policy then one important issue in two different circumstances we may not treat that there is no change in accounting policy people may feel that it is a change in accounting policy but the standard will provide a pure guidance here in these circumstances it is not treated as a change in accounting policy what are such circumstances sir an accounting policy related to related policy related to transactions or events transactions or events that differ in substance that differ in substance from previously occurred transactions or events 
a policy which is related to transactions or events which differ in substance from previously occurred transactions or events an example given then you can easily appreciate sir you know uh, at the time of retirement of the employees employer will provide gratuity right employer will provide gratuity let us assume till now till now in my organization gratuity will be payable on ad hoc basis ad hoc basis means sir there is no proper formula there is uh, no particular procedure if employer feels that yes he is very good person you can give offer at 5 lakhs okay uh, he served for very lengthy time you can offer for 10 lakhs so that person is not working properly just we can provide 3 lakhs so just like that at the discretionary powers of the management they will provide the gratuity that is nothing but ad hoc basis ad hoc basis means there is no criteria simply just like that they are just providing but now for the purpose of providing the gratuity a formal plan was make it ready a formal plan is make it ready formal plan formal plan means maybe they take the certain criteria based on the last drawn salary based on the last drawn salary or maybe based on the uh, long life they take the certain criteria clearly based on that they designed a formula so they are all figures they are putting in that formula then they will derive the gratuity now is it change in is that such change is treated as change in accounting policy that is the question now if you apply the provision policy related to transactions or events differ in substance differ in substance or previously there is no formula at all right now formula based in substance which are differ then how you can treat it as a change in accounting policy in substance such transactions or events are differ from previously occurring nature to the currently occurring nature for example if previously is also one formula is there right now we are changing to another formula then we can treat it as a change in accounting policy but previously there is no formula at all which is an ad hoc basis but currently there is a formal gratuity plan is there so formal gratuity plan on behalf of ex gratia gratuity payment to the retired employees ex gratia gratuity payment to the retired employees is a classic example for not change in accounting policy next another one introduction of policy for a transaction or event which was not occurred previously sir till now the transaction or event was not at all occurred just now we started by adopting a policy then which is an introduction of an accounting policy but not a change in accounting policy introduction of pension policy to retired employees which is not exist previously sir till now in our organization there is no pension policy at all but from this era onwards we decided to pay pension to the retiring employees now which is treated as an introduction of policy for a transaction or event which was not occurred previously but not a change in accounting policy sir so this provisions are also much important previously they tested certain uh, questions out of this concept sir now to put it simply what we learned from a accounting standard 5 sir the base object of as5 is presentation and disclosure of certain items in the statement of profit and loss account that is with respect to, to ordinary extraordinary prior period item change in accounting estimate change in accounting policy ordinary activities are normal business activities and which are further into and incidental to the business activities no separate disclosure should be required with respect to, to ordinary activities but certain ordinary activities are exceptional items due to such a size nature or incidence disclosure should be required the classic examples are written down value of inventory and reversal and a provision for restructuring expenses and reversal of such provisions all reversal of provisions are also examples for exceptional items disposal of property plant and equipment and the long term investments are also examples for exceptional items litigation settlements and legislative amendments having retrospective impact all such are examples for the exceptional items extraordinary items are not at all ordinary activities which are clearly distinct from ordinary activities and the occurrence of which is completely irregular sir why you should need to provide a separate disclosure for extraordinary activities because the users of the financial statement should need to identify should need to differ the profit or loss arisen from ordinary and the profit or loss arisen from ordinary extraordinary for better decision making 
the examples are attachment of the property refund of the government grant receipt of government grant in compensation of expenses sir earthquakes are the natural calamities losses or what are the thing we may incur such all things we may put under extraordinary activities now coming to the special issues that is prior period items and change in accounting estimates and change in accounting policy prior period item is recorded into the current year expense or income arised due to error or omission occurred in one or more preceding previous financial years where it should need to be disclosed a separate disclosure should be given after presenting the current year financial statements in the respective head if the ma main expenditure is related to ordinary prior period item is also shown under ordinary if the main item is extraordinary then prior period item is also shown under extraordinary but after representing the current year information we need to represent the prior period items then what about change in accounting estimate sir certain items which we are going to provide in the financial statements is based on estimate which is not the actual amount sir for an accounting estimate lot of judgment should be required certain items for the uh, certain examples for the accounting estimates are provisions inventory obsolescence estimated useful life of the ppe residual value of the ppe if at the time of change in accounting estimate the accounting treatment should be provided prospectively we may not think about the past we should not disturb already past recorded expenses or income coming to the change in accounting policy accounting policy is nothing but accounting principle or method adopted to follow such accounting principles in the preparation and presentation of the financial statements in general as per the concept of consistency we may not change one accounting policy to another accounting policy except in certain circumstances if statute prescribes if any accounting standard prescribes for better presentation of the financial statements at the time of change in accounting policy the accounting treatment we need to adopt that is retrospective accounting treatment if it have impact in the current year financial statement it should be quantified and the current year financial statement need to be adjusted sir it doesn't have any impact in the current year financial statement but it impacts the future financial statements the same fact should need to be disclosed sir certain circumstances may not treat it as a change in accounting policy what are such circumstances a policy related to transactions or events that differ in substance from the previously occurred transactions or event the classic example i already given a formal gratuity plan on behalf of ex gratia payments are the ad hoc basis introduction of a policy for a transaction or event which was not occurred previously which is introduction of a pension policy in our organization which is not there in past these two are not change in accounting policy one is change in in substance another one is introduction of an accounting policy that's it guys sir i'll close this standard with a small two problems but which which provides a lot of confidence on your minds because till now you we discussed a lot of provisions with respect to as5 which is the one of the previous examination question just let us check and confirm state whether the following items are examples of change in accounting policy or change in accounting estimate or extraordinary items or prior period items or ordinary activity so please all of you change the uh, identify one by one so then uh, you can easily appreciate the concept of as5 and your confidence will also enhance like anything actual bad debts turning out to be more than provisions sir pbd i created 5 lakhs but actual bad debts occurred in the current year was 8 lakhs then i need to change the provision provision is an estimate which is change in accounting estimate which is change in accounting estimate change from cost to model to revaluation model for measurement of carrying amount of the pp one method to another method which is change in accounting policy government grant receivable as compensation for expenses incurred in previous year accounting period which is an which is an extraordinary activity tell me guys for extraordinary activity i already given certain examples na here one of the example is receipt of government grant in compensation of expenses okay which is an extraordinary activity treating operating leases as finance lease which was error made which was error made which related to a prior period item if this was made in the last year if this error is related to the last year which we are going to adjust in the current year treated as prior period item capitalization of borrowing cost on working capital so as per accounting standard 16 when you can capitalize the borrowing cost if you incurred such borrowing cost on the qualifying asset working capital is not a qualifying asset working capital is not a qualifying asset then how you can capitalize error made error occurred in the previous year which need to be adjusted in the current year under the head prior period item again legislative changes having long term retrospective application which is ordinary activity but exceptional tell me guys ordinary but exceptional change in method of depreciation from straight line to wdv 
which is change in accounting estimate not change in accounting policy guys which is very much important because the the measurement of depreciation itself is an estimate from one method of one method of estimate to another method of estimate if you change which is known as change in accounting estimate but not change in accounting policy that is very much important government grant becoming refundable which is an extraordinary activity applying 10 percentage depreciation instead of 15 percentage depreciation prior period item change in useful life of the fixed asset change in accounting estimate so 10 questions 10 multiply with 0.5 5 marks which was asked in january 2021 question paper under 1b question number one is compulsory now where it was tested next one more important question just i will show you this was also previously tested explain whether the following will constitute a change in accounting policy or not as per as5 introduction of your formal retirement gratuity scheme by an employer in place of ad hoc ex gratia payments to employees and retirement sir if policy related to transactions or event which substantially differs from the transactions or event occurred previously which is not a change in accounting policy management decided to pay pension to those employees who have retired after completing five years of service in the organization such employees will get pension of rupees 20000 per month earlier there was no such scheme of pension in the organization which is introduction of an accounting policy but not a change in accounting policy this question number of times tested in the examination that's it guys this is with respect to as 5 and the next standard is as 9 guys revenue recognition actually uh, as per our discussion there are uh, two more standards are pending one is as 9 revenue recognition another one is as 7 construction contracts both the couple of standards are with respect to revenue recognition only both the standards are related to revenue recognition only as 9 as well as as 7 except that one more standard also we are going to see in the marathon that is as 14 i'm going to discuss along with the chapter amalgamation i already informed at the time of introductory itself now without wasting much time let me uh, directly entering into the topic as 9 revenue recognition sir in this standard what you are going to discuss only one thing guys timing of recognition when we can recognize revenue when we can recognize revenue into books of accounts that is also revenue related to ordinary activities with respect to sale of goods rendering of services used by others of enterprise resources like interest royalty dividend only these aspects only we are going to discuss in as9 the objective of as9 is timing of recognition with respect to ordinary activities of business related to sale of goods rendering of services used by others of enterprise resources like interest royalty and dividend for example if the business person is a trader then his ordinary course of business activity is sale of goods like me a practicing chartered accountant i am not into trading i will provide the services to my clients which is rendering of services and certain resources of the enterprise is used by the others then the enterprise will get interest the resource of the enterprise means if enterprise will provide investments in debentures or if the enterprise is offering loans to particular people then the enterprise will get interest as a revenue then when interest should need to be recognized into the books of accounts we will discuss if enterprise will use the resource like patent or the formula or the trademark by another enterprise then we will get royalty on such patents then when you should recognize such royalty and if your enterprise is make investment in equity shares of other enterprise then dividend you may receive when the dividend is in general recognized into books of accounts only related to the ordinary activities with respect to sale of goods and rendering of services and this interest royalty and dividend only as9 is going to discuss sir then what about other types of revenue sir as9 doesn't discuss as9 doesn't deal other type of revenues for example in case of construction of contracts a contractor will construct a building 
for their customers then for contractor key will receive the contract revenue when such contract revenue is going to be recognized sir for such as7 is there as9 is not applicable to the below type of revenues construction contract revenues as9 doesn't applicable as7 is applicable in case of lease transactions for example a building is there that building is given to the other party now the owner of the building is known as lessor and the other party is known as lessee from lessee lessor will get lease rentals these lease rentals are income to the lessor then how the lessor is going to recognize such lease rental which is as19 actually is going to deal which is again group to standard but in marathon i'm not taking to discussion next sir for the enterprise government release certain grants then our enterprise received the government grant which is actually a group 2 standard as 12 government grant when it should new pdp recognize what is the accounting treatment for such all things as 12 is there government grant is also one type of revenue it may be the capital type of revenue i, I mean if if it, it may be the capital type of receipt or maybe the revenue type of the receipt that is different story next for insurance companies if any revenue is raised how it should going to be recognized that is depending upon the irda regulations are applicable any accounting standard is not applicable sir realized or unrealized against due to the disposal or holding of non current assets i mean a ppe is sold out you derive certain profit then how it should need to be recognized when it should need to be recognized as10 is applicable that is nothing but realized again unrealized again means revaluation profits revaluation losses for that also accounting standard 10 only applicable realized or unrealized gains due to discharge of obligation at less than the carrying amount or holding the liability simply liability is there certain liability is there for example creditors are there at 10 lakhs but as a full and final settlement we are paying only 9 lakhs by taking the 1 lakh amount of the discount which is discount received for such thing accounting standard 9 is not applicable for exchange gains accounting standard 11 is applicable again accounting standard 9 is not applicable that means even though the standard title is revenue recognition as9 will not discuss about the certain revenues like government grants and uh, 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 realized or unrealized gains at the time of disposal of fixed assets and uh, the lease rentals in case of the lessor point of view construction contract revenues in point of view of the contractors or the exchange gains for all such things various accounting standards are the respect to industry regulations like irda regulations are exist do you understand okay fine sir now before discussing about the revenue recognition provisions with respect to, to sale of goods or rendering of services and interest and royalty dividend first let me know what exactly the meaning of revenue what is the meaning of revenue revenue is the gross inflow revenue is the gross inflow of cash or receivables or any other consideration in the ordinary course of their business activities with respect to sale of goods rendering of services are used by others of enterprise resources yielding interest royalty and dividend first let me explain the meaning of gross inflow what is the meaning of gross inflow sir sir gross inflow means the total amount receivable are received from the other party but it doesn't include trade discount it doesn't include trade discount even though the word they are using as a gross inflow it doesn't include trade discount it doesn't include volume rebate i mean if any trade discount and volume rebate is there we need to reduce the reduced amount itself is only we can call it as a gross inflow and one more question coming into my mind at this stage sir is it gross inflow means is it inclusive of gst or exclusive of gst you know in case of gst at the time of sale of goods gst is applicable and at the time of rendering of services also gst we are charging now my question is the gross inflow means whenever we are selling the goods we are collecting the output gst from the other party right now is it that output gst that is maybe output cgst or output sgst or output igst is it inclusive of that revenue no whatever the amount of the gst you are collected from your customers is ultimately payable by your entity to the government then how you can treat it as your revenue it is actually your liability so that's why gst on output whether it is sale or service is a liability gross inflow is the revenue without considering that output of gst and one more important case just i want to tell you here uh, maybe most of the times you may come across this situation at the time of booking tickets 
at the time of booking tickets either for bus or either for train or either for uh, air what will happen you may interact with a particular agent for example if it is related to the train most of the times you may interact with irctc right now irctc will provide the train booking service to you but the train fare whatever they are getting is it belongs to irctc no absolutely not the train fare which was collected from the customer is ultimately payable by irctc to the government which is the central government indian railways but irctc is getting certain commission irctc is getting certain commission now the gross inflow in case of irctc means that is not the amount collected from the customer that is the amount they are getting as a commission amount they are getting as a commission from the government is only treated as the gross inflow so that's why agency or brokers gross inflow means which is a commission not the entire amount do you understand this point so gross inflow means after reduction of rebate after uh, reduction of volume uh, after reduction of trade discount which is exclusive of the output gst in case of brokers or agencies gross inflow means only the commission but not the total amount what they receive next such a gross inflow they may receive in the form of cash if it is a cash sales if it is a cash service or maybe if it is credit sales they are getting the debtors or maybe for any other consideration other than cash and receivables maybe they may sell certain goods and the other party may issue the equity shares is still it is considered as a revenue only but the revenue will covers with the standard with respect to ordinary activities so what is the meaning of ordinary activities just now we completed as per ordinary activities ordinary activities which are incurred in day to day life of your business practice sir in which goods you are dealing on day to day business sir i am in the steel manufacturer i will ultimately sell that's a steel utensils sir i am in the petroleum products i will regularly make it trade in the petroleum products then such a ordinary activity is with respect to to sale of such goods are you are not a trader you are in the providing of services you may an architect you may chartered accountant or you may financial advisor then you may provide a services which is happen in the ordinary course of your business are apart from that you may get certain interest when such interest is need to be recognized as a revenue you may get certain royalty at that point of time when it should need to be recognized you may invested in investments in equity shares then when the dividend should need to be recognized you may also going to discuss in this standard that is the definition of the revenue given in as 9 then next question is when revenue is recognized at the time of sale of goods when revenue is recognized at the time of sale of goods please concentrate all of you uh, come to my mt1 note guys all of you when revenue is recognized in case of sale of goods just a moment yeah fine concentrate sir in sale of goods what happen you know in sale of goods seller will be there buyer will be there now the question is in point of view of the seller when he can recognize revenue from such sale of goods revenue from such sale of goods to recognize revenue from such sale of goods they should need to complete two conditions condition number 1 is performance should be achieved performance should be achieved and there is no uncertainty regarding the collection of amount there is no uncertainty uncertainty regarding collection of amount collection of amount if these two conditions satisfied then seller can recognize the revenue in his books of accounts what is the meaning of performance achieved when the performance is said to be achieved sir the sale should occur at a consideration that means at a certain price it is not offered it is not offered at free of cost it should be offered at certain consideration and the risks and rewards risks and rewards incidental to ownership are transferred from 
incidental to ownership or transfer from seller to the buyer. And the last one is there is certainty regarding measurement of revenue. Measurement of revenue. I mean, there is no ambiguity in measurement of such price. Such price. If these three conditions are satisfied, then the performance is said to be achieved. Along with the performance achievement, there is no uncertainty regarding the collection of MO, then we can recognize the revenue. The same fact here I given through my power notes. If you observe, sir, in case of sale of goods, to recognize the revenue, two simultaneous conditions need to be satisfied by the seller. One is performance should need to be achieved and it is not unreasonable to collect that amount from the customer. That is, there is no uncertainty regarding the collection of amount. There is no uncertainty regarding the collection of amount. When the performance is said to be achieved, the sale is occurred at a consideration, not occurred at free of cost. They occurred at a price. Risks and rewards incidental to the ownership are transferred from seller to the buyer. And there is no uncertainty regarding the determination of the revenue. If all these three conditions are satisfied, then performance is said to be achieved. Along with that, there is uncertainty. There is no uncertainty regarding the collection of MO, then revenue can be recognized. So various cases I need to explain here. The basic provisions only first time discussing. Once the basic provisions is over, we are going to see the various cases based on the, these provisions. Next, coming to the rendering of services. Sir, in case of services, when revenue can be recognized? In generally, when the service performance is completed. If the performance of the services is completed and there is no uncertainty regarding the collection of amount, then you can recognize the revenue. Same fact here also when the performance is achieved. Here also when the performance is completed and there is no uncertainty regarding the collection, you can recognize the revenue. But the thing is how you are offering that service. That is important. That is depending upon the type of service. If the type of service is offering in proportionate completion method or is it in complete service contract method? I will tell you what is the meaning of proportionate completion method. For example, uh, a person, a client came to my office, let us assume, he required total four services. One is consultancy. One is consultancy services, that is advisory services. He needs certain advisors. Another one is he required audit services. One is internal audit, let us assume. And another one is statutory audit, that is external audit services. He required just, but both the audits actually we, we should not conduct just for the time being. I told you, or, or let me put one is stat audit, another one is taxation services, taxation services, and another one is project finance, that is loan related services. He total required. Uh, four different services guys. He total required four different services. Now the question is, is it proportionate completion method or is it completed service contract method? How we can recognize? Let us assume for each and every service, we are provided a separate quotation. Sir, for this, we provided a quotation of one lakh. Uh, for the taxation services, uh, we provided the quotation of uh, of uh, 50,000, let us assume. Then for stat audit, I provided the quotation of 2 lakhs. And for the project finance, I provided a quotation of 1 lakh. Am I right? That means if I provided the advisory services, then I can recognize the revenue with respect to the advisory services. And if I completed the taxation services, even though the remaining two services are pending as on the reporting date, then I can recognize the taxation services revenue. That means in case of proportionate completion method, having multiple acts proportionately with the degree of completion, proportionately with the degree of completion, I can recognize the revenue. I can recognize the revenue. Or if I will tell the consolidated amount, let us assume the consolidated amount, I told you 2 plus 1, 3, 3.5 plus 1, 4.5. I told the consolidated amount of 4.5 lakhs. Out of this, these two activities are completed. Now, how I need to recognize report depending upon the degree of completion, depending upon the degree of completion, I can recognize the revenue for that advisory services, consultancy and the taxation services. That is the meaning of proportionate completion method. That means you need not wait for to complete the entire activities. If you complete a particular activity regarding that particular activity, you can recognize the revenue. But in case of the complete service contract method, I mean complete service contract method means Unless otherwise, if you fulfill all the activities, the other party will not release the amount. 
even though if you complete the consultancy services and the taxation services the other party will not release the other party will release if you complete all the activities then you cannot put that it is a multiple activities at that point of time then which you can treat it as a single act at that particular point of time if it is completed or if it is substantially completed substantially means almost all are completed 90% is completed 95% is completed only formality activities are there at that particular point of time you can recognize the revenue that is the only difference in between sale of goods and rendering of services in case of rendering of services if it is under proportionate completion method based on the degree of completion you can recognize the revenue if it is complete service contract method uh, you cannot recognize the revenue unless otherwise the service is completed or substantially completed sir one ved mantra i am telling you for the entire revenue recognition standards whether it is as7 whether it is as9 this is a ved mantra for entire revenue recognition what is that ved mantra sir uncertainty regarding collection of amount uncertainty regarding collection of amount arised before recognition of the revenue the revenue recognition is postponed to the extent of uncertainty sir we are in the process of rendering of service rendering of services are in the process of sale of goods whatever the case may be before recognizing such revenue into the books of accounts regarding collection of amount if there is uncertainty exist then to the extent of uncertainty regarding the collection of amount the revenue recognition should be postponed then when you can recognize sir when you get a confidence to recover such amount from the other party then at that particular reporting period you can recognize the revenue no 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 not like that sir i already recognized the revenue i already recognized the revenue then there is a uncertainty regarding collection of amount then what i can do sir you can create a provision guys sir for example you sold the goods right then at the time of sales what is the entry debtor account debtor to sales you already recognized the revenue debtor to sales sales was already closed and transfer to pnl now uncertainty exist you are unable to collect amount from the debtor then what you can create you can create a bad debt or you can create a provision for bad debts that is profit and loss account debtor to pbd account you will create right but already recognized revenue we are not at all disturbing so if you already recognize the revenue create a provision to the extent of uncertainty involved rather than adjusting rather than reversing or adjusting already recognized revenue rather than disturbing already recognized revenue you can create a provision if you already recognized the revenue this is the ved mantra for the entire revenue recognition standards as like as9 or as7 this provision is applicable in both the standards that's why i may not repeat the same provisions in as7 one more time i may not repeat because this is the marathon you know we need to save some time now uncertainty exist before recognition of the revenue then the revenue recognition should be postponed after recognition of the revenue if uncertainty exist regarding the collection of amount then we need to create a provision rather than adjusting already recognized revenue that's it now different cases we are going to see in guys now you can enjoy the as9 like anything please all of you follow along with me just now we completed the provisions sorry except that one more provision is there right i'm so sorry related to uh, use of resources by others use of enterprise resources by others interest right when interest should need to be recognized guys you know that is depending upon the time proportion basis time proportion basis on the outstanding balance if you provide the loan to the others outstanding loan multiplied with the number of years and in multiplied with rate of interest you know that you call i equal to pnr by 100 or ptr by 100 you are learning the same thing from the ch your childhood onwards which is depending upon the time proportion basis that is not a new provision coming to the royalty sir how the royalty cases are in generally occurring first let me explain here uh, i'll explain through uh, book sellers actually for example um, i am the author of a book let us assume i published accounting standards book which is an accounting standard book by c s sacharazu let us assume i published this book okay now i may not known to the larger public and the public also may not have a confidence on me if i am the new author even though if the public have a confidence on me my duty is my duty is not to sell the books my duty is writing the books or gaining the knowledge and providing the knowledge to my students that is my objective i am not in the i am not an expert in the field of sales then what i will do 
i will approach i will approach a book publisher i will approach a book publisher then publisher what he will do he will connect for the he will connect to the larger audience his duty is only printing the books publishing the books and selling such books to the larger audience now the agreement in between me and my publisher is like this let us assume whatever the books you published whatever the books you published you need to pay on such published books at the rate of 100 rupees per book which is the royalty which is the royalty 100 rupees per book if you published that book you need to pay whether it is sold out or not i don't mind if i for example if i am very good author i already have a very good market in the society then i will demand like that that is one type of provisions that is one type of agreement may entered with the publisher and another type of agreement how it look, look look like this if i am completely a new author all timely new author then the publisher will also may not entering into such type such agreement because if i publish all the books if ultimately not sold out by me if i already pay the royalty to the author of such book if author of such book then publisher may lose then if the author is the new author how the publisher will agree the terms and conditions with the author you know if i sold out such particular book in the outside public then i will pay the royalty otherwise i will not pay any royalty that means when the author should need to recognize the royalty as the revenue is depending upon the terms and conditions agreed in between the publisher and the author that is completely depending upon the agreement along with accrual basis why i used the word accrual basis if publisher published then i will get the royalty one type of agreement if publisher sold then i will get the royalty that is another type of accrual that means depending upon the terms and conditions of the agreement along with accrual basis author should need to recognize the royalty income that is one type of example just i given the same example you can extend it to any type of royalty income hope you understand that means when the royalty income should need to be recognized in the books of the author or in the books of the owner that is on terms and conditions agreed entered in between the author and the publisher along with the accrual basis next coming to the dividend sir most of the times we already discussed the concept of dividend i think so in group 1 marathon i discussed maybe this is completely new to you but you know you know such fact already when dividend is need to be recognized sir ante you know dividend is in generally declared in general meetings by the shareholders even though the dividend is proposed by the board of directors in the board of directors meeting if the shareholders declared zero dividend in the general meeting there is no obligation to pay any dividend to the shareholders by the company that's why as a shareholder or as, as an investor when you can recognize dividend as a revenue into your books of accounts when the other company declares the dividend if the other company declares the dividend then you have a right to receive is established if the other company declares the dividend then the right to receive is established that's why when the dividend is recognized into your books of accounts that is when the right to receive established when the right to receive established if the other company declares such dividend that's it guys but guys these three are also very much important they are regularly testing in the examination things related to interest royalty and dividend interest is on time proportion basis royalty is on accrual and agreement terms and conditions entered in between the uh, persons and the dividend is when right to receive is established that is at the time of declaration of the dividend now this is the time to discuss about various cases once if we'll uh, able to finish is the case says as soon as possible then standard is over so this is your turn please all of you participate you should need to think from your point of view this is the application of the provisions what we learned it till now case number 1 sir in 2020 21 as on march 31st itself goods are sold by seller to the buyer the buyer is x our customer is x our customer made a small request the request made by the customer is delivery delayed up to the april so maybe customer godown is not in vacant position and customer requested me that sir you can provide the delivery in the month of april sir now my question is when i can recognize the revenue because sales happened in the month of march but the delivery is delayed at the request of the buyer in the month of april can i recognize the revenue in 
or can i recognize the revenue in 2122 because delivery was made in the year 2122 that is the question now what is your answer first you need to check two things to recognize the revenue two conditions satisfied one is performance should be achieved and another one is there is no uncertainty regarding collection of amount if these two conditions are achieved then seller can recognize the revenue with respect to such sale of goods when the performance is said to be achieved it should occur at a consideration yes absolutely it was occurred at a consideration and risks and rewards incidental to ownership risks and rewards incidental to ownership are transferred from seller to the buyer sir is it risk and reward transferred sir why not already sale made sir when risks and rewards incidental to ownership is said to be transferred invoice is generated by the seller and the price is already agreed if there is any increase or decrease in the prices in further it may not impact for such transaction then the risks and rewards incidental to ownership are said to be transferred from seller to the buyer am i right and there is no ambiguity with respect to, to the determination of the price as well then performance is said to be achieved as on march 31st itself and there is let us assume there is no uncertainty regarding the collection of amount then in the year 2021 itself the seller can recognize the revenue but one thing you should need to be careful here seller should identify such goods the goods are in identifiable condition i mean such goods should not be sold to any other party such goods should already in the packed mode in the proper mode once the buyer is made a call we can make it sell which are there in identifiable condition which are there on hand on hand with the seller which are identified which are in deliverable condition if these conditions are satisfied properly by the seller then seller can recognize the revenue sir but if seller does not having such goods in his good on first of all those are not in identifiable condition then he may not recognize the revenue hope you understand like this you need to present the answer so march 31st consideration is there ownership regarding the uh, risks and rewards already transferred and there is no ambiguity in determination of the price so that's why performance is achieved and the common assumption is there is no uncertainty regarding collection of amount that's why ras limited can recognize the revenue in his books of accounts in the year 2021 itself come to the second case sir ras limited is in the process of manufacturing of the goods and after completion of manufacturing he will sell such goods to the outside parties what is the good here electronic equipments like refrigerators washing machine and heaters he is in the process of manufacturing of electronic equipments like acs okay washing machines heaters refrigerators like that so the sale is inclusive of installation the sale is inclusive of installation then when i can recognize the revenue then when i can recognize the revenue after completion of installation only maybe uh in these days most of the times the customers are making orders through amazons and their websites you know what they will do certain persons certain persons they itself offer sale as well as installation certain persons they offer itself sale as well as installation once the sale is completed then the party cannot recognize the revenue after completion of installation only the party can recognize the revenue in certain circumstances what will happen you know sale will be made by one person installation will be made by another person you may come across this situation recently actually uh, i installed an ac in my office room okay what happened i ordered that product in the amazon so in amazon the party who sold such ac is different and the party who installed such ac is different now the question is at that particular circumstance once the sale is made the party can recognize the revenue because installation is not his headache but the other party coming to the other party who made the installation when he can recognize the revenue with respect to the installation after completion of installation only so th that point also i covered here which is covered in, in case of service so here i gave i gave this clearly amazon sold ac to the customers okay so after that after that in amazon one company sold that ac to us and another company provided the installation services which is let us assume lakshmi ac services installed that ac into uh, my premises let us assume the same thing actually happened recently to me so that is the reason why i am telling then when we can recognize the revenue 
the revenue that is installation revenue in the books of Lakshmi AC services, which is a pure service. Once installation completed and AC is accepted by the customer, then only Lakshmi AC services can recognize the revenue with respect to the service. But with respect to the sale by the other company, that is the party who actually sold the Amazon to the customer. Once the sale is over, that is performance achieved and there is no certainty regarding collection of MO, he can recognize. But if it is both inclusive of both inclusive of sale and installation, which is both inclusive of sale and installation after completion of installation only they can recognize total three different scenarios i told you sale plus installation after completion of installation sale is different installation is different for seller once the sale is completed performance achievement and there is no uncertainty regarding collection of amount you can recognize the revenue for the person who offered the installation once the installation is completed once the service is performed and the customer accepted that ac then only he can recognize the revenue okay fine next issue <laughs> Concentrate. This is with respect to uh, sale of goods on approval basis. I'll directly explain the provisions. No need to take up the uh, case, which is very easy. You know, sold goods on approval basis means when you can recognize the revenue date as on which approval received or last date of approval elapsed, whichever is earlier, whichever is earlier. I mean, approval already came, which treated as a sale or the last date of approval is elapsed. Also, you can treat it as a sale, but out of the two dates, whichever is earlier date, you can recognize for the purpose of revenue. But here I will tell you one different issue, guys. Okay. What is that issue? Please concentrate. What happened in the current year, seller sold goods to the buyer on sale of goods to approval basis, sold sale of goods on approval basis. Now the issue is with the buyer as on the reporting date. As on the reporting date, with the buyer, one lakh worth of goods are there. Still, the still the last date of, the last date to approve is not at elapsed. Let us assume in the month of February the sale was happened, and the terms and conditions for approval basis sales were the buyer should need to accept within three months because as on 31st March the three months was not elapsed. The goods are still lying with the customer. Now the question is. Can I treat such goods lying with the customer as a sales? Then can I treat such goods lying with the customer as a sales? The answer is no. The answer is no. Because when you can recognize the revenue in case of sale of goods on approval basis, that is date as on which approval received. Date as on which approval received. Or the last date of approval is elapsed, whichever is earlier. Sir, here the date as on which approval received, approval not yet received, and the last date of approval is not yet elapsed. Then at that particular point of time, how you can recognize the revenue? Then what is the accounting treatment I can make, sir? On behalf of uh, treating it as a revenue, what you can treat, you know, in if it is a trading account, goods lying with customers, you should need to write like this, goods lying with customers apart from the closing stock, because which is not form part of the closing stock, which is not there in your good on goods lying with the customers you should need to represent at the rate of cost to price if these one lakh at the selling price out of this 20 percentage is the margin then 80 000 you need to represent under goods lying with the customer at cost to price but you should not be added into the sales just that point i want to emphasize here nothing else next come down to the another case in case of consignment sales what happened the owner of the goods which is consignor will sending such goods to the consigning Consignee is the agent of the owner. Ultimately, consignee will sold goods to the customers. Then the question is, when revenue should be recognized? Is it at the time of delivery of goods by consignor to the consignee? No, I made a cross mark. When revenue can be recognized in the books of consignor? When consignee ultimately sold goods to the customers? Because there is no difference between consignee and the consignor. If consignor send goods to the consignee means which is not treated as a sale, which is principal agency relationship, just the goods are transferred from consignor to the consignee. If consignee gold, uh, sold goods to the customers means as an agency relationship, consignor will think that it is ultimately sold out by the consignor only. So then only consignor will treat it as a revenue. So that's why at the time of sale of goods by consignee to the customer, only consignor will recognize the revenue. For consignee, which is commission, guys, which is an agency commission, once when consignee will recognize such agency commission, sir, and day, once the consignee will send goods to the customers, at the same time, consignee also will recognize the commission. 
But consign are well recognized, sir. And when consign is send goods to the customers, I mean, to put it simply, consignor and the consignee both will recognize the revenue at the time of sale of goods by consigning to the customer. But for consignor, the revenue is the profit. But for consignee, the revenue is the commission. That's it. Next, come here. Uh, so, which is uh, quite interesting. Please allow me to check here. What is this? I will first let me explain the case. Sir, which is a garment trading entity. Garment trading entity means uh, the shirts, pants, okay, clothes, maybe dresses. All those are just sold out in a shop outlet. The name is the Ross Garments. The condition are the terms and conditions at the time of making the sale is, if customer satisfied with such goods, they can use. Otherwise, they can return. Maybe most of the times in case of garments, what happen? Maybe they might uh, liking the products at the time of making at the time of uh, uh, making the general wearing in their trial rooms, but whenever it comes to the their premises, they may not uh, feel it's good. Maybe the fitting issues may will come. So within that some many number of days, they can be returnable. They can be returnable. Yes, that condition is generally levied by each and every shopkeeper. These are not the uh, type of the ordinary type of goods. This, this is one of the uh, decorative item for the human being. I can put like this way, or which which can be uh, a prestigious issue as well. Because a lot of times in case of females, what they will happen if somebody is telling that, sir, this dress is not good, then, then they may feel like anything. So that is the reason why to push up their sales, just they are uh, simply putting one of the time that if you are not satisfied, not an issue within so and so number of days in the same condition, in the same condition, you can return back to us. This is the condition. Now the question is when we can recognize the revenue. Most of the persons, they may thought that after expiry of the time period only we can recognize the revenue sir that is not the correct answer because if 100 customers buy such product how many number of customers they may return such goods very few very few customers that's why at the time of sale itself 100 percentage sales we can be recognized as a revenue but based on our past experience for what of the goods which we may return in the future for such things you can create a provision because if 100 sales are occurred, only one or two will come written back. Maybe due to the size issue, maybe the fitting issue, or if they are not interested, then they may will come written. But more than 90% or 95% goods are, are sold out like anything. That's why based on our past experience, we may create a provision, but at the time of sale itself, we can create, we can recognize the revenue itself, which is a peculiar case and the special case. Next. Sir, this is very much important, guys. Please allow me to concentrate. Already number of time tested in the examination. What is this, sir? A party A sold certain goods to the B. As on which date, sir? As on 1-1-2021. A is the seller. B is the buyer. Is it okay, guys? Now, exactly after six months, B again resells such goods to the A. B again resells such same goods to the A after six months at the rate of 11,000. Now, when revenue can be recognized in the books? When revenue can be recognized in the books? By seeing this transaction, you may thought that, sir, yeah, if performance is achieved and uncertainty regarding collection of amount, there is no uncertainty regarding collection of amount, then A can recognize, sir. Then B also, when he can recognize, sir, when the same performance is achieved and there is no certainty regarding collection of amount, B can recognize the revenue from sale of goods. You may thought like this, but the thing is, which is not related to sale of goods at all, which is not related to sale of goods at all. Just he may bluffing you. He may bluffing you because this transaction is a pure finance based agreement, which is a pure finance based transaction. Simply speaking, A required a certain amount. The required amount is 10,000. Now, A given the security as such goods to the B. Now, after six months, after six months, A is repaying such amount to the B along with interest. That is nothing but 11,000. Then B should release such goods to the A. But the terms is looking like that. This is sale and resale transaction, but it, which is not at all a sale of, trans, sale of goods transaction, which is a pure finance agreement of the transaction. Now, the excess of 1,000 is there. Nah? 1,000 is interest amount. How the interest should need to be recognized on time proportion basis, on time proportion basis. 
such time proportion basis that is use of resource by others how such time proportion basis out of such 1000 relate total 6 months na 1000 is related to 6 months interest na the 3 months interest is related to 21 22 the 3 months interest is related to 2021 sorry 3 months interest is related to 2021 that is 500 and the remaining other 3 months interest that is 142021 to uh 17 2021 that is that should need to be recognized in the year 2122 that is another three months interest which is 500 so in 2021 500 2122 500 i need to be recognized which is on time proportion basis so this is most important issue guys most of the times already tested they may bluff you but don't think that it is a sale and resale agreement it is a pure finance agreement the interest should need to be recognized uh in the books of b on time proportion basis that's it Next, coming to some small issues, guys, which is related to uh, subscription of journals. Subscription of journals. The classic example is our CA students, our CA members itself. They might paying fees to the ICAA. The students are may fee may paying the fees along with their registration, and members are paying fees on an annual basis. That is the only difference for the purpose of getting the journals. Now, how the ICAA will recognize the revenue on that amount, sir? They will recognize on strike line basis. If they offer the service for the first year, if they provide such journals in the first year, out of the 12,000, 1200, they will recognize the 100. If they offer the service for the second month, they will recognize the uh, revenue for another 100. That is on strike line basis, simply they will recognize that uh, periodicals revenue. Next, mm, this is nothing but related to higher purchase sales, guys. You know, in case of higher purchase sales, when the higher vendor will recognize the revenue, initially he will recognize the revenue of cash price. Then the excess of cash price over, sorry, excess of higher purchase price over cash price, he will recognize in the form of interest on time proportion basis. Only the initial cash price only recognized as a revenue. The excess of higher purchase price over the cash price, he is going to recognize in the form of interest. Sir, and the second one is related to pure services. This first related installation services I already explained. So this one out of the services, this is another important area. This was already previously tested once upon a time. Once again, I'm repeating the same. Please all of you concentrate, which is related to advertising commission. Uh, how in generally advertising agency commission will going to occur? Let me explain through uh, my empty one note. Please concentrate, guys. <laughs> Just a moment. Right. Sir, let us assume it's not a uh, assumption. It is a real realistic only IPL. You may see IPL, right? I don't know this time who sponsored the IPL, but uh, in the previous IPL, who sponsored the IPL, sir? The IPL is sponsored by Dream Liven actually. Dream Liven. Dream Liven is a company actually. What it will do, Dream Liven will buy time space, will buy time space from BCCI. Who will conduct the IPL in India only, which is BCCI. Now, Dream Liven will buy time space from BCCI for the entire IPL matches. The time space is, let us assume, uh, the time frame charges are, let us assume, 100 CR. Now, what Dream Living will do, you know, Dream Living will can advertise their own company products or Dream Living can sell such time space to different companies. Let us assume Dream Living is a advertising agency right now. Just for the time being, we can assume Dream Living is an advertising agency. So out of the time space, that is 10 percentage, it is allocated for their own. Let us assume the remaining 90 percentage is there now. Remaining 90 percentage, it is allocated to different companies. Uh, maybe Cred, Cred is one of the companies there, uh, which offering the credit services. Uh, or maybe different companies are there, maybe Stand Chartered Bank, SCB, certain foreign companies. Uh, okay, maybe Barclays, certain companies, they are utilizing this advertising space. Now, the question is, this advertising agency is there, right? Dream live in. They will offer the time space, different time space for them, different time space or the area space where they can advertise all such terms and conditions entered it with the advertising agency as well as customers. Now, the advertising agency can offer two different types of services. One is they can design the advertisements on their own. 
customers they can design or on behalf of the customers just that work is also allocated to dream live in maybe uh, sachin tendlikar they may take the brand ambassador depending upon the expenses or maybe dhoni they can take the brand ambassador maybe boost another uh, one product another uh, person may will come virat kohli may will come so like that depending upon the persons and uh, that what is that expenses or maybe the cosmetics what they are using products for all such things they may incur certain design expenses apart from the designs they will also allocate time space now the question is they are charging the amount for the design separately they are charging amount for the offering the time space separately as an advertising agency dream living now when dream living can recognize revenue in his books of accounts the question is for example if credit is there they already designed a particular advertisement but such advertisement is not appearing into the public maybe suddenly ipl cancel due to the pandemic situation let us assume then do you feel that cred will offer mo to the dream living no not at all not at all because you designed the advertisement i do agree sachin tendulkar came he made a uh, beautiful a uh, scene uh, he made a beautiful scene yes it will definitely go into the public then cred will make a benefit out of that but if the ipl is not at all occurred then how the advertisement will appear before the public that means even the design is completed even the time space is offered unless otherwise the advertisement is appeared before the public advertising agency cannot recognize the revenue the same fact here i given that is production plus broadcasting charges broadcasting charges is nothing but uh that is broadcasting at the time of occurring that event production means for the purpose of design then when revenue can be recognized when such advertisement is appears before the public then only such advertising agency can recognize the advertising commission which which can be recovered from the customer that's why irrespective of the fact whether the design completed whether the time space is allocated or not if the advertisement is appears before the public then they can recognize otherwise they can simply postpone next non trading concerns in case of clubs okay recreation clubs all such times entrance fee is a capital receipt membership fee membership fee uh, that is they can recognize at the time of receipt at the beginning or on slm basis that is depends if membership fee is different and the remaining services all are extra features then at the time of receipt of membership fee itself they can recognize the revenue no after in the membership fee if they provide then they will provide the facilities itself then that is the case then they will recognize the revenue on slm basis that is not that much important simply just at the time being i discussed so the remaining all the cases what i discussed in case of sale of goods and in case of rendering of services are much more important in as9 the speciality itself is rather than provisions the cases itself is quite interesting but if you understand the provisions you can apply the provisions to the cases itself that's it guys then in accounting standards one more accounting standard is there which is as7 we are going to start as7 in the next slot the final standard in the marathon is as7 construction contracts except as14 anyway we are going to discuss as14 along with the chapter amalgamation you know as7 is a little bit technical standard this standard is also relevant in terms of revenue recognition concept I already explained the same fact in the last standard as9 revenue recognition itself so then why already as9 is there what is the reason for introduction of as7 construction contracts it told that both as9 and as7 both are relevant in terms of revenue recognition now my question is if already as9 is there what is the use of introduction of as7 you know one peculiar thing occurred in case of construction contracts so first of all before explaining things related to construction contracts and objectives and such all things first let me explain only one thing what exactly the meaning of construction contract in very layman way i'm not defining the construction contract as well we will see the definition of construction contract after progressing certain contents in the standard first let me explain in very basic layman approach what exactly the meaning of construction contract sir if a customer or a person or a company wants a building or a bridge or a canal or a road then it will definitely approach a contractor what the contractor will do 
contractor will provide a quotation price to the customer. If customer and the contractor, in terms of uh, construction contract, the customer is known as contractee. The customer is known as contractee. Now, the contractor and the contractee agreed for a contract price and they will enter into an agreement which is known as construction of contract agreement. Depending upon the terms and conditions in such agreement, contractor will provide the service as per the requirements of the contractee. Then contractee will pay the amount to the contractor. That is the thing in generally happened in case of construction of contracts, in case of construction contract. Now, let me explain the peculiar thing in case of construction contracts. It's not as like in the case of normal trading of the goods or normal uh, service providing facilities. It is the combination of sale as service. It is a combination of sale as well as service, which is known as works contract. That is one peculiar thing. Another peculiar thing is construction contracts will not end within a particular reporting period, within an year. It will take more number of years to complete the construction contract itself. For example, let me explain why there is a necessity to introduce a separate accounting standard for construction contracts. After watching this uh, example, or after uh, seeing this example, you can easily appreciate why even though AS9 is there, the reason for introduction of AS7, you can easily know. Sir, LNT, you know, right, which is Lastron and Turbo, which took actually the metro project in uh, Telangana in Hyderabad, actually. Okay. So, LNT is a contractor. The TZ, Telangana government is a contractee or the customer. Now, the first phase of the metro project itself, it took in and around five years. This is only one of the phase, actually. Uh, this is not the entire part of the pro metro project. Metro project was divided into number of phases. And that first phase, it's run from 2015 to 2020 approximately, if I'm not wrong. It will take approximately five years. This was already done. So uh, it took five years to complete the first phase of the metro project itself. So construction is continued for greater than an year in case of construction contracts. Now the question is, Sir, if the construction is continued for greater than an year, now in the given case, it took five years. That means LNT will not recognize any profit or loss till the end of the fifth year. That is my question. That is the peculiar thing. No, nobody will do like that. Because once you are progress with your work, then you are going to recognize your profit or loss over the period of construction as well. Up to the completion of the construction, nobody will wait for recognition of the revenue. But in case of sale of goods or rendering of services, it will complete within an year. But here, the peculiar thing, I already told you, the construction activity is completed for more than an year. That's why nobody will uh, wait for recognition of the revenue till the end of the construction. Now, the next question is, how you can recognize the contract profit or loss with respect to, to the particular accounting period is the matter of discussion. How contractor, how contractor should need to recognize profit or loss with respect to, to that accounting period, even though the construction of the contract is not yet completed is the matter of discussion. For that purpose, the total contract revenue, sir, contract profit, profit is nothing but Profit is nothing but income minus expense. Here, income is known as revenue. Expenses is known as contract cost. Contract revenue, contract cost. The contract revenue should be allocated to different accounting periods. And the total contract cost incurred on the total construction activity is also allocated to different accounting period. With respect to, to a particular accounting period, you need to identify contract revenue as well as contract cost with respect to, to a specific accounting period you need to you need to identify then in that accounting period if you compare the contract revenue of that accounting period with contract cost of that accounting period then you can get the contract profit or loss that is the reason why construction contracts are not clubbing with the general standard of revenue recognition here also what you are doing sir here also the provisions are with respect to, to recognition of the contract profit or loss only. 
that is with respect to, to the revenue recognition only do you understand with respect to, to the contract revenue recognition only but the nature of conducting business itself is quite, quite different that's why we are in, we are discussing with a separate standard okay fine sir one more thing under the scope or the applicability paragraph it is clearly mentioned that construction contract is only applicable to contractor but not to the contractee because for contractor only when the revenue should need to be recognized how much revenue it should need to be recognized we are going to discuss in the standard but coming to contractee or the customers the relevant standard that is accounting standard 10 pp is applicable because it is a property plant and equipment to us then at which value they need to measure such all things as 10 is going to be applicable hope you understand that's why it is only applicable in the books of contractor next coming to construction contract sir what is the meaning of construction contract now we are seeing the real definition of the construction contract earlier i already discussed the meaning of construction contract in very layman approach now we are going to discuss in technical way construction contract is a contract or is an agreement related to construction is related to construction of a single asset or maybe construction of group of assets but such group of assets interrelated or interdependent in terms of either design either uses function or technology construction contract is a contract entered between two parties one party is contractor another party is contractee and that contract is related to construction of either single asset or group of assets which are interrelated or interdependent in terms of design uses function technology let me give one example for group of assets for example we are entering into a construction contract to construct factory to construct factory factory is inclusive of buildings factory is inclusive of roads factory is inclusive of installation of machineries factory is inclusive of uh, what i mean structures maybe boilers okay different different structures all these are form part of construction now these are different assets these are group of assets which are interrelated interrelated to one another either in terms of design uses function or technology are interdependent in terms of design uses function or technology now the construction of single asset or group of asset is said to be construction contract so basically construction contract is inclusive of construction of buildings construction of dams construction of canals construction of roads construction of factories even the development of the software for a specific customer which is also inclusive of construction contract yes the development of software will also coming to take picture in case of construction of contract but there are certain deviations in between accounting standard because one more standard is the as26 which discuss about intangible assets that's why i don't want to discuss anything about software so the major issues is with respect to construction of buildings canals dams roads etc okay fine next come below sir types of contract types of contract the contract may be fixed price contract or the contract may be cost plus contract what is the difference between fixed price contract or cost plus contract in case of fixed price contract the contract price itself is fixed at the inception of the contract contract price will be decided at the inception of the contract in case of cost plus contract contract price is nothing but contract cost incurred by the contractor after adding certain agreed percentage of profit then contract price will come in generally when contractor will uh, entering into fixed price contract if contractor don't want to reveal the profit how much he is deriving uh, in front of the contractee then they will enter for the fixed price contract no that is not an issue we will enter for a, a certain percentage of profit then the we are in generally entering into the cost plus contract but you might listen the escalation clause in your uh, costing subject where the escalation clause is going to be applicable in case of fixed price contract or cost plus contract in case of fixed price contract contract is fixed if rates are increased like anything due to the due to the inflationary situation then contractor may end up with losses to compensate that the contractor may entered by adding an escalation clause so if the, in, due to inflation if prices are increased then contract price are also will going to be increased according to the inflationary situation that is nothing but escalation clause
But in case of cost plus contract, the type of problem not arise to the contractor. The reason is he will get the percentage of profit irrespective of the contract cost. He will get his decided profit. Am I right? This is with respect to the types of contract. Next, what is the objective? We discussed here in the objective what we discussed, how much contract revenue we need to be recognized, how much contract cost need to be recognized in a particular accounting period is the major discussion here, right? For that purpose, contract revenue recognized in a particular accounting period, contract, the total contract revenue, we know. But out of that contract revenue, how much we are going to recognize in the particular accounting period is by applying the percentage of completion method by applying the percentage of completion method you mean if you know the total contract revenue on the total contract revenue if you apply the percentage of completion then you know the contract revenue to be recognized in a specific accounting period yes but when you can apply the percentage of completion method but when you cannot apply the percentage of completion method, let us have a discussion. When we can apply the percentage of completion method, if the outcome of the contract, we estimate reasonably, if the outcome of the contract, outcome of the contract means profit or loss from such contract. If the total profit or loss from such contract, if you can estimate reasonably, the total outcome of the contract, if you estimate reasonably, then we can apply the percentage of completion method. But if the outcome of the contract is unable to estimate, then percentage of completion method we cannot apply. We cannot apply the percentage of completion method. We will recognize the contract revenue in that accounting period in different manner. First, let me discuss when an outcome of the contract is said to be reasonably estimate. When an outcome of the contract is said to be reasonably estimate, the total contract revenue, if you can measure reliably, if the total contract cost occurred, you can measure reliably. And the percentage of completion, how much work was completed also, if you can measure reliably, there is a probability of inflows related to the contract will coming to the entity. Then you can set to be the contract outcome is estimatable in reliable, estimatable in reliable manner. One more time repeating. So simply when the outcome of the contract is said to be reliable, total contract revenue can be measured reliably. Total contract cost is estimated reliably. And the percentage of completion, that is how much work is completed, if you can able to estimate reliably. And there is a probability to come inflows to the entity. I mean, we done work. You can uh, measure the contract revenue reliably if you can measure the contract cost reliably. But if there is no certainty regarding the collection of amount, then we can't apply the percentage of completion method. That is the reason why he is telling that there is a probability of inflows related to the contract will coming to the entity. There is a probability, there is a certainty regarding collection of amount. Then you can apply the percentage of completion method. But if you are unable to estimate the outcome of the contract reliably, if you can unable to estimate the outcome of the contract reliably, we cannot apply the percentage of completion method. Then, you know, if percentage of completion method is applicable, then how much contract revenue we can recognize in the current year, total contract revenue into percentage of completion. Then, you know, the contract revenue recognized in a specific accounting period. But if percentage of completion method we are unable to apply, then how to recognize, how to recognize or how to measure contract revenue related to a specific accounting period. If we unable to estimate the outcome of the contract, then contract revenue to be related to a specific accounting period is equal to contract cost incurred in that period. Contract cost incurred in that period provided there is a probability to recover contract cost from the contractee. So to put it simply, I'll provide through a conclusion. Please concentrate all of you here. This is very much important. Please all of you concentrate. How you can measure contract profit or loss with respect to, to an accounting period in the statement of PNL? If the total contract revenue to be recognized in that period, total contract revenue to be recognized in that period minus actual contract cost incurred in that accounting period, the difference is nothing but contract profit or loss with respect to, to an accounting period. 
Am I right? What is what is the meaning of profit or loss, guys? Profit or loss is nothing but contract revenue minus contract cost with respect to, to that accounting period. Now, for this, there is no discussion at all. Actual contract cost incurred, you know. Now, how you can recognize the contract revenue is the matter of discussion. If you can able to estimate the outcome of the contract reliably, then contract revenue related to your specific accounting period, we can measure by applying the percentage of completion method. That is total contract revenue into percentage of completion. No, if you are unable to estimate the outcome of the contract reliably, then which method you need to adopt to the extent of contract cost incurred in that particular accounting period, you can measure it as a contract revenue provided there is a probability to recover amount from the contract to the extent of contract cost. To the extent of contract cost incurred in that period, you can recognize it as a contract revenue. I mean, what is the uh, objective of the drafter here? You know, the objective is if you can able to estimate the outcome of the contract, then you can recognize profit or loss. Then you can recognize profit or loss if you know the outcome. If you know the, if you can able to estimate the outcome. But if you are unable to estimate the outcome, then profit or loss is equal to nil. Because in that case, he is telling that contract revenue to be recognized in that accounting period is nothing but actual contract cost incurred. Actual contract cost incurred minus actual contract cost incurred. Then profit or loss is zero. Am I right? So if the, there is no outcome of the contract, I mean, if the outcome of the contract is reliably not estimatable, then profit or loss is equal to nil. If outcome of the contract is reliably estimatable, then contract revenue into percentage of completion, you know, the contract revenue to be recognized, it should be compared with the actual contract cost to be incurred, then you will get profit or loss to be recognized. Next, the next question coming into my mind is how to calculate the percentage of completion. AS7, AS7 provided three different methods for evaluation of percentage of completion, which is a popular method throughout all the problems we are using method number one only. That is contract cost incurred till the reporting day divided by total estimated contract cost to complete the contract. For example, up to the current year, the contract cost incurred was 300 lakhs. But the total estimated contract cost to complete the entire contract will be 1000 lakhs. Now, the percentage of completion is said to be 30 percentage, which is the formula for percentage of completion. Next, that is one method. In another method, survey method. Survey method means a surveyors will be there. Those are the official surveyors. They will come. They, have, they are the experts in that field. They are using certain instruments by using their knowledge they will calculate, they will evaluate how much percentage was completed depending upon if it is canal, how much percentage, if it is road, how much percentage is over, if it is building, how much percentage is over, because those are the civil engineers, they are having the proper knowledge in that field. So based upon their knowledge, they will simply give certain percentage of completion, which is based on report given by the surveyor. In case of physical proportion method, physical proportion method means just I want to I give a small example here. So let us assume the building is for a five storied building, one, two, two stores was completed. Out of five stores, two stores was completed means the percentage of completion is two by five, two by five into 100. That is how much percentage guys? The percentage is 40 percentage completion. That is nothing but physical proportion method. But most of the times to evaluate the percentage of completion, we will use only method number one, unless otherwise specifically mentioned the survey method and physical proportion method in the problem. Do you understand? Because nothing is there to calculate here, but here certain calculations are involved. That's why in the examination as well as problems, most of the times they are providing the information based on method number one only. Now, you will have a clear cut picture. Just let me go to my MT one note here. The objective is, the objective is contract profit or loss to be recognized or to be measured with respect to a particular accounting period. That is the objective of AS7. That is nothing but revenue recognition. Now, the question is, oh, sorry. Now, the answer is how to get that profit or loss. Profit or loss is the difference between contract revenue and contract cost. 
with respect to a specific accounting period with respect to a specific accounting period now how to evaluate contract revenue with respect to a specific accounting period that is if outcome of the contract is reliably estimatable then contract revenue with respect to a specific accounting period is nothing but total contract revenue into percentage of completion fine sir if the outcome of the contract is not estimated reliably then contract revenue related to a specific accounting period is equal to actual contract cost incurred in that accounting period accounting period provided there is a probability to recover such amount from the contract fine once if you know the contract revenue with respect to a specific accounting period then you can able to estimate contract cost with respect to a specific accounting period that is nothing but actual contract cost incurred in that specific accounting period then you can easily know the profit or loss now if the outcome of the contract is reliably estimatable then to know the contract revenue of a specific accounting period you should multiply with percentage of completion right then how to evaluate the percentage of completion total three methods are available one method is contract cost incurred till date or till reporting period divided by total estimated contract cost total estimated contract cost to complete the contract and another method is survey method and another method is physical proportion method that is the major essence of as7 now with this background let us see some more provisions in deeper manner out of that first and foremost thing is what exactly we can include the components the components under contract revenue what are the different components we can include under the contract cost now first let us evaluate the meaning of contract revenue after that we will evaluate the meaning of contract cost as well now come to my power notes what is the meaning of contract revenue contract revenue is nothing but initially agreed contract price initially contractor and contract agreed one price right which is initially agreed contract price plus or minus variations in the contract maybe there is a change in design maybe there is a change in structure maybe there is change in number of floors maybe there is change in length anything may cause variations that may be excess or that may be reduction that's why plus or minus variations in the contract claims recovered from the customers what is the meaning of claims recovered from the customers for example it is the responsibility of the customer to provide the raw material as per the uh, terms and conditions entered into the agreement but the raw material was not available as on that date but the labor and the contractor are ready to construct the building but due to which contractor foregone certain amount due to which contractor incurred a certain amount because labor is available now irrespective of the fact whether they can use such labor or not they need to pay to their labor so that's why the contractor is asking claim claim some amount from the customer maybe due to any reason guys maybe due to any reason those are the claims recovered from customers incentives what is the meaning of incentives if the contractee is satisfied like anything then we'll provide certain excess amount over the contract price which is nothing but incentives or maybe the contractor make it ready that entire contract at less than the targeted time period then they may provide the incentive as per the agreement itself which is nothing but incentive incentives are also form part of contract revenue in the same way penalties are also available because if it is not completed within the time period then penalties may also imposed whenever incentives are there penalties are also form part but incentive should be added penalty should need to be reduced then you will get the contract revenue so contract revenue is form part of contract price variations in the contract claims recovered from the customers incentives and a reduction of penalties but here certain important practical illustrations they may ask that means when you can add variations into the contract revenue to add variations into the contract revenue we should satisfy two conditions it is probable that customer should approve such variation and that amount of variation simply you cannot directly add the variation amount to the contract revenue there is a high probability that 
customer should approve that variation and that amount as well then only you can add it into contract price and the variation related amount also you can able to measure reliably if such two conditions satisfied then you can include the variation related amount to the contract revenue then when a contractor can add claims into the contract revenue claims is nothing but you are making certain dispute with the contractor sorry you are making certain dispute with the contractee then only claim concept will come now so due to certain terms and conditions maybe the contractee may not provide the raw material or maybe some other aspect is happening then you are fighting for certain things which are nothing but claims when you can add claims to the contract price the negotiations the negotiations you and your customer will sit and you are talking something the negotiations should reach the advanced stage and it is probable that customer will agree and the amount should be measured reliably then only you can add claims into the contract price otherwise simply you cannot include the claims into the contract price next which is very much important when incentives you can include it into the contract price there is sufficiently advanced that performance standards will met or exceeded for example guys uh, sir i entered into a construction of a bridge let us assume sir for bridge construction it will take 3 years now after completion of 6 months after completion of 6 months simply based on my past experience based on my past experience in the past for all my contracts i completed the entire contract before the targeted time period based on my past experience after 6 months just i decided to recognize the incentives into the contract revenue is this is valid as per the as7 construction contract no it's not valid your past experience doesn't matter because is that construction contract is sufficiently advanced sufficiently advanced means out of 3 years just 6 months completed how you know it will be completed within the targeted time period or less than the targeted time period if pandemic came what you what you can do your past experience doesn't use so that's why is that project is sufficiently advanced that performance standards will met or exceeded sir so almost uh, i 2.5 years exceeded sir 2.5 years is over within one or two months the contract is set to be completed then at that point of time you can recognize that is the contract should be sufficiently advanced that performance standards will met or will be exceeded then at that particular point of case you can add the incentives into the contract revenue so maybe these issues they might ask in the practical questions okay fine next come to the components in case of contract cost what are the different co components we can include into the contract cost number one is direct expenses specific to the contract direct expenses means direct raw material that is simply direct material just a moment direct material direct labor direct expenses which are total direct expenses specific to the contract allocable cost which are overheads allocable cost may be certain overheads may be directly identifiable certain overheads may be allocable which are nothing but overheads are indirect material specific expenses as per the agreement to the specific customers maybe specific expenses means if you are using certain jigs or certain molds with respect to that specific customer as per the agreement you may add it you already informed that fact to the contractor or the customer and the contractor agree for that then you can include such specific expenses but exclusions you should not add the following expenses administration expenses selling and distribution expenses research and development expenses depreciation on idle plant to any of the contract these are specifically related to the organization as a whole these are not related to uh, any specific contract and one more important issue i am going to explain here this is very much important number of time already tested this adjustment into the examination please concentrate what is this certain contract expenses already incurred by the contractor but which are not related to the current year which are related to the future activity can i include such contract expenses into the contract cost of the current year if i tell like this you may not appreciate in the exact manner let me give a small example sir raw material purchased for the purpose of construction of building in the current year is let us assume 10000 units maybe this is uh, 10000 bags of uh, cement or whatever the case may be let us assume which is 10000 units but out of such 10000 units i utilized only 9000 units 
Now I already incurred the excess of thousand units as a contract expenditure, which is related to the future activity. These thousand units are derived as a closing stock for the current year, but such thousand units I may use in the next year. Now, such a thousand units raw material, I should not include it into the contract cost of the current year. I should be excluded. It should be treated as asset in the balance sheet. Example, stock of materials at the end of the reporting period, advances to subcontractors. Because I am the contractor, maybe I have some other workman force, maybe certain portion of the contract I may provide to the subcontract. For, subcontract, for such subcontractor, I may provide certain advances, but which is not form part of the contract expenditure related to the current year, which is related to the future activity, which should be excluded from the current year contract cost. So closing stock of raw material and advances to subcontractors are not form part of the current year contract cost. You should please all of you remember, based on this actually, uh, the last examination, one question also asked. Okay, we will derive. What is that? We will derive after... Uh, end of this accounting standard. Okay. We will see certain questions for this accounting standard. Okay, fine. So, right, come back, come back to my uh, empty one note. Sir, here I already told you the objective and we've seen the components of the contract revenue and the components of the contract cost. What are the different components of the contract revenue we've seen guys? Can you please just list out quickly? What are the different components of contract revenue we've seen? Contract revenue components are initial contract price. Maybe, tell me guys, variations in the work, maybe uh, claims, incentives, penalties. Penalties should be reduced and the variation is also plus or minus. And the contract cost is inclusive of direct expenses, that is direct expenses. That is, it, it is inclusive of direct material and direct labor as well as direct other expenses and allocable cost and the special cost, but which is exclusive of selling and distribution, administrative expenses. And one more thing, contract cost incurred for the future activities like uh, closing stock of raw material and advances to subcontractors. Am I right? Fine. Now, let me explain one important and special provision of AS7 here. Important and special provision. If total estimated contract cost exceed the total contract revenue, if the total estimated contract cost exceed the total contract revenue, which is known as expected loss, for such expected loss, we should create a provision as a separate expenditure in the statement of profit and loss account immediately, immediately, irrespective of work has commenced or not, percentage of completion, even though we will get profits from other contracts. What it is all about, sir? What it is all about? Let me explain this provision through a small illustration. This is the example. We are in the year 2021. As at 31st March 2021, this is the information. The total contract revenue is 10 lakhs and the estimated total contract cost is 10 lakh 80,000. And the contract cost incurred in the current year is 5 lakh 40,000. Now, please all of you concentrate here first. Sir, in generally by applying the provision of AS7, how much contract revenue to be recognized in the specific accounting period? That is the total contract revenue into percentage of completion. Total contract revenue into percentage of completion. Percentage of completion is how much, sir, here? Percentage of completion is nothing but contract cost incurred till date, which is 5 lakh 40,000 divided by total estimated contract cost to complete the contract, which is 10 lakh 80,000, which is 50 percentage, which is 50 percentage. So 10 lakhs into 50 percentage, which is nothing but 5 lakhs. Now, all of you please concentrate. If this is the statement of PNL, if this is the statement of PNL, Contract revenue to be recognized in that accounting period is 5 lakhs. Actual contract cost incurred that accounting period is 5 lakh 40,000. We know only that fact, right? We, if, if you ignore this provision, this is the information you need to present in the statement of PNL. Now, what is the current year loss? Current year loss itself is 40,000. Current year loss is 40,000. Now, if you check the above provisions, if total estimated contract cost exceeds the contract revenue, 
if the total estimated contract cost 10 lakh 80 thousand exceeds the contract revenue of 10 lakhs the excess loss that is expected loss the total expected loss is 80 thousand the total expected loss is 80 thousand okay it should be recognized it should be recognized by providing a separate expenditure in the statement of profit and loss account immediately irrespective of work has commenced or not sir whether you started the work or not irrelevant you can recognize such loss immediately irrespective of percentage of completion sir 20 percent completed sir 30 percent is completed sir still you can recognize the entire expected loss even though we will get profits from other contracts, still you need to recognize this expected loss immediately. Now, if you check here, the total loss will be 80,000. Out of the total loss, 40,000 is related to current year now already. Remaining 40,000, you need to be recognized as an expected loss because the total loss is 80,000. Out of the total loss of 80,000, 40,000 is already there, which is a loss. Remaining 40,000 is an expected loss for which you need to create a provision. That is PL data to provision for expected loss, which is 40,000, and the total loss will be net loss 80,000. The same I represented here. Please allow me to consider it here. The foreseen loss is 10 lakh 80,000 minus 10 lakhs. The total loss is 80,000. Out of this foreseen loss of 80,000, current year loss is 40,000. Therefore, expected loss is 40,000 for which we need to create a provision. Therefore, expected loss is equal to foreseeable loss minus current year actual loss. If I present the same thing in the statement of profit and loss account, contract cost should be debited, contract revenue should be created. The same thing I already presented here. Now, now you should need to create a provision for expected loss, which is of 40,000. Then the net loss total will be 80,000. The net loss total will be 80,000. Out of this 80,000, 40,000 is actual loss. Remaining 40,000 is the expected loss. That is the presentation of statement of PNL by applying this provision. This is very much important, guys. You should always check that if the total contract cost, if the total estimated contract cost exceeds the contract revenue for the expected loss out of the total loss, if you remove the current year loss, then you will know the expected loss. For such expected loss, you should need to create a provision in the statement of profit and loss account by providing a separate line item. Is it okay, guys? Next. Come down. Combining and segmenting of construction contracts. Combining and segmenting of construction contracts. When you can treat the group of contract as a single contract, when you can treat each and every contract as a separate contract. One more time, I'm repeating. When you can treat group of contract as a single contract, when you can treat the group of contract as a, each and every individual contract. When we can combine and treat it as a single contract, if this satisfy these three conditions, group of assets negotiated as a single package, sir, for construction of building, for construction of roads, and for construction of uh, the boilers, all we are negotiated as a single package, sir. Okay. Which are interrelated, completely completed either concurrently or in the continuous sequence manner concurrently or in continuous sequence manner means at the same time we can construct or one another also we can construct then we can combine and treat it as a single contract when we cannot combine treat it as a single contract when we can see each and every uh, individual asset as a separate contract separate proposals we can given for each asset separate negotiation we can made for each asset contract cost and revenue can be measured reliably for each and every individual assets and we can accept or reject any of the individual asset that point also missed out actually we can accept or reject any of the individual asset maybe one asset we may accept and another asset you want if you want you can reject if that type of flexibility is there, then we can make it as a individual based contract actually. Sir, based on this uh, one question also asked in the examination, if time permits, I will see that question as well. This is the combining and segmenting the contracts and which are the final disclosures guys, what you should need to disclose, revenue to be recognized in that particular current year, 
you should that is contract revenue you recognized in the particular accounting year you need to disclose method used for revenue recognition that is are you using percentage of completion method are you, are you using any other method because if the contract revenue is not estimated reliably then to the extent of contract cost incurred you can recognize as the contract revenue na so for that purpose is asking which method you are using then method used for calculation of degree of completion for percentage of completion method are you using method number 1 or are you using survey method or are you using physical proportion method which method you are using also you need to provide a disclosure apart from that the contracts under progress that means the contracts are still under progress certain percentage is completed the following things you need to provide a disclosure contract cost incurred till date and a contract profit or loss till the reporting period is how much any advances we are received from our contractee that is customers retentions what is the meaning of retention okay retentions retention spelling is r e t e n t a o n s this is the retention what is the meaning of retention sir maybe we work done but certain portion of the amount related to us is holded by the customer that is nothing but retention why sir why he hold it as a security or maybe they need to be uh, clarify certain things so if i clarify such all things then he will release such retention amount that is nothing but retention amount if any retention amount is there i need to clearly represent that next amount due from our customers or amount due to customers also you need to represent how it should need to be represent sir contract cost incurred till date sir the total contract cost how much we incurred till the accounting period plus recognized profit or loss this is nothing but amount to be recovered from the customer total out of which already how much billing we made which is nothing but progress billing the remaining amount either we can recover from the customer or we can able to pay to the customers because if progress billing is more than contract cost incurred till date plus profit recognized then we are pending to our customers that's why here it is clearly represented as due from customers or due to customers if the figure is positive which is due from customer if the figure is negative which is due to customers these are the additional disclosures for those contracts which are under progress you need to represent now uh, let us see in few questions guys we are in the marathon i am able to cover each and every question very few important question let me try to cover uh, out of this let us check the question number 1 first please consider all of you problem number 1 which will completely reveals the method of providing accounting treatment with respect to a construction contract that's why i am taking this question for discussion a construction contractor has a fixed price contract for 9000 lakhs to build a bridge in 3 years time frame a summary of some of the financial data is as under year number 1 initial amount of the contract revenue agreed variation in revenue in first year there are no variations in the second year 200 lakhs is there in third year 300 lakhs is there contract cost incurred up to the reporting date year 1 2093 year 2 6168 year 3 8100 certain star marks are there we will read and reveal such star marks information in further estimated profit for whole contract here 950 lakhs here 1000 lakhs here 1000 lakhs first star mark information it includes 100 lakhs for standard material stored at the site to be used in year 3 to complete the work that means out of such 6168 100 lakhs was included as a closing stock we already read certain provisions under contract cost which related to the future activity should not be included that is like closing stock of raw material and advances to subcontractors that's why in year 2 we should only consider 6068 only next is revealing the second star mark under this it excludes 100 lakhs for standard material brought forward from year 2 the actual contract cost incurred in year 3 is not 8400 here it is 8200 because unnecessarily 100 they actually included in year 2 that's why they excluded in year 3 but it need to be excluded in year 3 that's why which is 8200 okay fine the variation in cost and revenue in year 2 has been approved by the customer we told you na to include the variations of the revenue it should be ultimately approved by the customer the amount and the change should be approved by the customer and the amount should be reliably measurable then only you can include into the contract revenue indirectly he is telling that you can take it into the consideration of such variation into the contract revenue compute year wise contract revenue expenses that is contract cost and a contract cost to complete 
and profit or loss to be recognized in the statement of profit and loss as per AS7. It's quite simple. The ultimate objective is for year one profit or loss, how much? For year two profit or loss, how much? For year three profit or loss, how much? For which first you need to identify contract revenue to be recognized in the particular accounting period. After that, you should need to work out the contract cost incurred in particular accounting period. If you compare the contract revenue and contract cost in the particular accounting period, then you will get profit or loss. Am I right? Fine. Now, con to know the contract revenue to be recognized in the particular accounting period on the assumption that if you can reliably estimate the outcome of the contract, the total contract revenue into percentage of completion is nothing but contract revenue to be recognized in the particular accounting period. That means to know the contract revenue to be recognized in the particular accounting year, you should work out on the percentage of completion. First, let us start the entire problem with percentage of calculation. Percentage of calculation working. Now, how to evaluate the percentage of completion is a matter of discussion. Percentage of completion method number one formula is cost incurred till date by total cost incurred to complete the contract. Sir, cost incurred till date was clearly given in everywhere. But do you know the total contract cost incurred, the total estimated contract cost to complete the contract? No. You may, you may ask that, sir, the total estimated contract cost to complete the contract is 8,200. Nah? I too agree. But is when I know, at the end of third year, I know. But based on the year number one information, what is the total estimated contract cost to complete the contract? Based on the year two information, what is the total estimated contract cost to complete the contract? Based on year three information, the total estimated contract cost to complete the contract is 8,200. But I required the estimated contract cost to complete the contract at the end of each and every year. Then how do I work out, sir? I know the profit, right? Profit minus revenue is nothing but contract, total contract cost. Revenue is 9,000. 9,000 minus 950 is nothing but 8,050. So total contract cost to complete the contract as per the year number one information is 8,050. And the actual contract cost incurred is 950. 950 by 8,050 into 100 is nothing but percentage of completion. The same thing I explained in my power notes. Please come below. First, I am working about the percentage of completion. Year number one contract revenue is 9,000. Profit is 950 then estimated contract cost to complete the contract is 8050. Now percentage of completion is nothing but 2093 divided by 8050. Mm, so which is percentage of completion here is 26 percentage, one by two. In the same manner, if I work out, I will get the percentage of completion for year 274. For year three, I got 100 percentage. Once you know the percentage of completion, once you know the percentage of completion, at the end of the year number one, how much contract revenue you need to be reported? 9,000 into 26 percentage, which is 2340, which is 2340. At the end of the year two, the total contract revenue is 9,200, 9,200. You consider 9,200 into up to the second year, the total percentage of completion is 74 percentage. So that's why up to the second year, the total contract revenue recognized is 6808. Up to the three, third year, the total contract revenue to be recognized is 100 percentage. Sir, now in a particular period, how much contract revenue need to be recognized? First year, 2340. Second year, 6808 minus 2340. Already 2340 recognized in the first year. Nah? That's why I reduced 2340. Then I got second year recognized amount. Now in the third year, how much I need to be recognized? Out of the total 9200, up to the second year, I recognize the 6808. Now I am reduced that 6808. Then I need to know the third year contract revenue need to be recognized. Now this contract revenue related to a specific accounting period, I can compare with the actual contract cost. Then I will get the profit or loss. Now here I am working with profit or loss. These are the contract revenue related to a specific accounting period. Now the actual contract cost here 2093. Here, how much contract cost guys? The total was 6068 out of 6068 minus 2093, which is 3975, which is 6068 total minus 2093, which is 3975. Next, here 8200 is the total. 8200 minus 6068. So here, how much we will get? 2132. Then you will get contract profit or loss to be recognized in a particular accounting period.
like this you need to work out this is the major area you need to focus from as7 sir one more question just i want to reveal here uh, what is that question you know just a moment yeah so which is the uh, last I, th I think so our last before examination question whether you can able to work out this question or not let us check the following data is provided for Mrs. Raj construction company contract price is given at 85 lakhs materials issued 21 lakh out of which materials costing 4 lakhs is still lying unused at the end of the period out of this 21 lakhs if 4 lakhs is still lying unused remains which is the closing stock at the end of the accounting period labor expenses for workers engaged at the site is 16 lakhs out of which 1 lakh is still unpaid this 16 lakhs 15 lakhs was paid 1 lakh is outstanding expenses specific contract cost is 5 lakhs subcontract cost for work executed was 7 lakhs advances paid to the subcontractors was 4 lakhs further cost estimated to be incurred to complete the contract is 35 lakhs you are required to compute the percentage of completion contract revenue and contract cost to be recognized as per as7 first please all of you concentrate here to know the percentage of completion i required contract cost incurred till date divided by contract cost incurred till date plus further contract cost incurred to complete the contract that you know further cost you know which is 35 lakhs further cost you know 35 lakhs first i need to work out contract cost incurred till date sir contract cost is inclusive of raw material 21 lakhs but out of the 4 lakhs is closing stock if you remember the provisions of as7 contract cost which related to the future activity like closing stock of raw material and advances paid to the subcontractors are not form part of contract cost that's why 21 minus 4 lakhs only you should need to consider so let me explain the contract cost till date with my power nodes please concentrate here so materials are 21 lakhs minus 4 lakhs which is 21 lakhs minus 4 lakhs which is 17 lakhs labor expenses total 16 lakhs even though 1 lakh is outstanding still we need to consider as per the accrual concept that's why which is 16 lakhs only then specified specific contract cost is also inclusive of contract cost subcontractor expenses you can consider but advances paid to subcontractor is not form part of contract cost we already discussed so that's why it was included if you are not believe me i'll open i'll open that contract cost is an exclusive of we already discussed that where it is just give a moment yeah contract cost is excluded exclusive of stock of raw material advances to subcontractors based on that they actually developed that question okay fine uh, come below 7 lakhs that is a specific contract cost the, therefore the total contract cost in cut till date we are getting as 40 lakhs now the percentage of completion is 40 lakhs divided by 40 lakhs plus 30 lakhs now percentage of completion came to 56.25 percentage once you know the percentage of completion then you know the contract revenue to be recognized in that particular year the total contract revenue is 85 lakhs 85 lakhs into the percentage of completion which is the contract revenue to be recognized in the particular accounting period which is 47 lakh 81250 one more question contract cost to be recognized contract cost how much you can recognize in the current year how much you incurred in the current year i incurred 45 lakhs the same 45 lakhs you can recognize in the current year which i already work out uh, that is the question actually they tested for one year which is for five marks which is first and foremost question in your examination question paper guys hope you are in detail to explain things related to construction contract uh, still if i ignore certain questions you can complete from your end okay so with this we completed the entire stuff with respect to accounting standards still lot more are there like uh, five to six accounting standards are there but we are not covering in our marathon so the next chapter we can take up is amalgamation followed by internal reconstruction followed by liquidation of companies so this setup is very much important these three group of standards are in generally inserted as a reconstruction and liquidation of companies chapter as per the blueprint of icaa we are also dealing in the same manner first amalgamation then internal reconstruction then liquidation of companies in all our further lectures
now we are in the chapter amalgamation of companies as i discussed at the inception of our marathon we are going to dis discuss this chapter along with as 14 so before directly entering into the chapter first let me discuss the concept of reconstruction in very layman approach the meaning of reconstruction is rebuilding of existing financial structure to speak technically which is known as restructuring of the existing financial statements but before directly going to discuss in technical mode first let me explain in very layman approach let me take a building so whenever the word we are listening a reconstruction we we always start that which is a reconstruction of buildings construction activities sir if there are certain problems exist to use a particular building then we have two choices or two options one is we can demolish the existing building and rebuild a new building that is one option another option is without demolishing the existing building we can go renovation if it is possible am i right there are two options one is demolishing a new construction and another one is without demolishing we can go for renovation sir for each option they having their own pros and cons what is the advantage in case of option number 1 sir due to construction of new building it is all together new brand image by seeing the building nobody can remember the old building because the new building is attracts like anything the disadvantage is huge expenditure need to incur to construct the new building now coming to option number 2 the advantage is so if you go for renovation while compared with option number 1 the expenditure is very much less but the disadvantage is whatever the renovation takes place people can easily identify that still it is a old building only just you renovated that's why there is no brand loyalty they can easily identify that which is the old building this is in a pure layman approach if we can talk about the concept of reconstruction of buildings all together in our society now if i apply the same concept to a particular financial statements if i implement the same concept to a particular financial statements that concept is known as reconstruction of existing financial statements now let me take balance sheet of a company the company name is rani limited as at 31st march 2020 now what is the problem those financial statements are not depicting the true picture those financial statements are not in true and fair view i mean we are facing certain problems with existing building in the same manner we are facing certain problems with the existing financial statements first let us have a look into such financial statements then we can easily understand uh, what problems are faced by the rani limited due to these financial statements sir share capital given at uh, 10 lakhs equity and a preference it is given at 5 lakhs total 15 lakhs non current liability is 10% debentures bank loan 2.5 lakh current liability 2.5 lakh and the total of the liabilities and equity is nothing but 27 lakh 50 thousand given in the same way coming to asset side ppe is given at 10 lakhs intangible assets given at 4 lakhs current assets are at 5 lakh profit and loss account debit balance is given at 6 lakhs miscellaneous expenditure not written off is given at 2.5 lakh and total of assets is at 27 lakh 50 thousand do we think that the total of the real assets value in such company is at 27 lakh 50 thousand that's not correct because out of that huge pnl account debit balance and miscellaneous expenditure not written off is there and one more thing intangible assets are there it is clearly unrepresented intangible assets because the company is a loss making company maybe uh, earlier goodwill is there but right now there is no value for the goodwill because the company is a loss making company it is clearly given that the intangible assets are unrepresented now due to which what happened there is a over valuation of assets occurred the valuation of asset was showed at 27 lakh 50 thousand in financial statements but is it true that's not true due to the over valuation of assets there is a over valuation of net worth occurred that is assets minus outside liabilities 
is nothing but net worth so in the books of the in the books of that company the assets were overvalued and the net worth is overvalued that's where the financial statements are not depicting the true picture then we can go for reconstruction how we can go for reconstruction reconstruction is nothing but restructuring of the existing financial statements it is a simple restructuring of your financials then we have two options as like discussed in above in option number 1 we can go for external that is external reconstruction in option number 2 we can go for internal reconstruction in case of external reconstruction what happened the existing building need to be demolished the existing company need to be liquidated and a new company is incorporated to take over the existing company a new building is constructed in place of the old building the same thing is happened in case of external reconstruction a new company is incorporated to take over the rani limited raju limited a new company is incorporated to take over the rani limited that is nothing but external reconstruction sir so then in case of internal reconstruction what will happen the same building we are going to continue the same company we are going to continue but we will make lot of internal changes as like renovation what are such internal changes are going to occur what is our objective our objective is showing the financial statements in true and fair view am i right for that purpose what we will do in the process of internal reconstruction we will revalue assets and reassess the liabilities for each and every asset and liability we will adopt the process of revaluation to depict the true picture in the outside market do you understand all of you so after revaluation what will happen sir we may get certain revaluation profits or we may get certain revaluation losses the profits or losses whatever you are getting you may net it off the entire net profit or net loss occurred due to such reconstruction is going to make it set off with huge profit and loss account debit balance huge profit and loss account debit balance that is our objective now we need to vanish this profit and loss account debit balance from the balance sheet for that purpose we will do certain activities in the process of internal reconstruction out of that one activity is a revaluation of assets and reassessment of liabilities apart from that we will make so many compounding or negotiation activities with different shareholders and different liability holders i mean equity shareholders are there let us assume equity shareholders are there for the amount of 10 lakhs that is 1 lakh equity shares at the rate of 10 rupees now we are making negotiation with equity shareholders that we are able to accept we are uh, we are ask sorry we are asking the equity shareholders or we are making a negotiation with the equity shareholders that you can accept each and every equity shareholder at the rate of 5 rupees only the remaining 5 rupees you can foregone in the same way preference shareholders also we will make certain negotiation maybe the preference shareholders are let us assume 10% is preference shareholder but during the process of internal reconstruction we are changing the 10% is preference shareholders into the 6% is preference shareholders the reason why if they are changing into the 6% is preference shareholders then the burden of the company with respect to payment of preference dividend is decreased in the future what is our objective during the process of internal reconstruction now we want to reduce our burden as well as if any profits we are getting during the process of internal reconstruction we can make it set off with the debit balance existing under the statement of profit and loss account to depict the true picture of the financial statements i am not going into the deeper mode because we have a separate chapter so called as internal reconstruction we are going to take up such chapter after completion of the chapter amalgamation so that's why in case of internal reconstruction we will set off p and l account debit balance and miscellaneous expenditure not written off with profits derived from change in paid up value of shares shareholders or maybe due to reduction in capital or maybe due to compounding or negotiation made with the different liability holders now the profits which is derived from the internal reconstruction is ultimately used to make set off with profit and loss account debit balance and miscellaneous expenditure not written off that is fixed asset that is not a real asset we will set off with that balances 
after that if you prepare your financials after completion of restructuring of the financial statements if you prepare your financial statements then such financial statements may depicting the true picture that is the objective of doing the internal reconstruction actually sir internal reconstruction is in generally done as per the various sections of the companies act 2013 out of that here two sections was mentioned one is section 61 and section 66 external reconstruction is conducted as per section 232 of the companies act 2013 sir so then can you please elaborate the differences between external reconstruction and internal reconstruction why not uh, if you go to my my main material there i clearly established the difference between external reconstruction and internal reconstruction please all of you concentrate here yeah sir in case of internal reconstruction in case of internal reconstruction there is no liquidation of company there is no liquidation of company happened but in case of external reconstruction i already told you the existing company is going to be liquidated and another company is incorporated to take over the existing company tell me guys we already seen in case of external reconstruction the rani limited is liquidated to take over by the Razu Limited, which is newly incorporated company. So that's why liquidation of existing company is going to occur in case of external reconstruction, but there is no liquidation occurred in case of internal reconstruction. And reduction of capital and varying rights. Sir, reduction of capital happened in case of internal reconstruction, but not in case of external reconstruction, because we are making so many negotiations with various parties of the company. So that happened in case of internal, but not in external reconstruction. Legal position. So the legal position of internal reconstruction is dealt by section 61 and section 66. External reconstruction is section 232. And one more thing, sir, for the purpose of conducting the internal reconstruction, court approval should be mandatory. Sir, it is not the legal power directly given in the Companies Act 2013 to a company. No, it, it, it is not a legal power. It is the power given by the court to conduct the internal reconstruction process. If any company want to adopt the process of internal reconstruction to restructure their existing financial statement, first it should need to make a petition to the National Company Law Tribunal, NCLT, as per the Companies Act 2013. NCLT will check each and every provision of the internal reconstruction. If the scheme is uh, very much, I mean, if the scheme is well established and which considers the interest of each and every party of the company, then ultimately NCLT will accept that scheme. Then the company can initiate the process of internal reconstruction. But to conduct the external reconstruction, nobody can take the court's approval. So that's why it is clearly given that court approval is mandatory in case of the internal reconstruction, but external reconstruction is affected without the approval of the court. That is the difference between internal reconstruction and external reconstruction. Now, sir, what are the advantages and disadvantages due to external and internal reconstruction, sir? You know, in case of external reconstruction, the advantage is high brand loyalty. I mean, the new company, Razu Limited, takes place on behalf of the Rani Limited, which altogether is a new company. People is feel like which is a separate and a different company from the Rani Limited. That's why high brand loyalty is there. But the disadvantage is, incorporate a new company it took a lot of expenses huge incorporation expenses maybe if the company shares are listed in the stock exchange then again the Razu limited share should be uh, quoted in the stock exchange to quote such shares in the stock exchange we need to pay a lot of listing features as well such all are additional expenditure we need to incur in case of external reconstruction but coming to internal reconstruction the expenses are less while compared to the external reconstruction but the disadvantage is at the time of preparation of financial statements after completion of internal reconstruction procedure, we need to adopt the word and reduce it while preparing the balance sheet. While preparing the balance sheet in bracket after completion of internal reconstruction, we will add the word and reduced. I already told you. So a lot of issues need to be discussed with respect to the internal reconstruction, but we are going to discuss in the next chapter. That's why only very few issues I'm going to discuss in comparison with external reconstruction. Okay, fine. So end reduced reward we are adding after completion of internal reconstruction. That's why people can easily find that, find that sir, which is a loss making company previously to depict the true and fair picture. Just we are 
just we completed the internal deconstruction process so that's why the brand loyalty is is not that much of good while compared with external deconstruction that means both internal deconstruction and external deconstruction having their own pros and cons whichever is best it is the management call accordingly they will adopt the reconstruction procedure now sir we are in the chapter amalgamation we are in the chapter amalgamation but why you are talking about the concept of reconstruction one of the type of amalgamation is a classic example for external deconstruction one of the type of amalgamation is a classic example for external deconstruction so as per accounting standard 14 amalgamation in the nature of merger but at this point of time you may not appreciate what exactly the meaning of amalgamation in the nature of merger but if you allow some time after discussing the concept of amalgamation you can easily appreciate what exactly the meaning of amalgamation in the nature of merger so one particular type of amalgamation is a classic example for external deconstruction that is the reason why actually i discussed the concept of external deconstruction and one more thing guys first let me open uh, an empty just a moment and an empty note i'll open yeah right now come here what is that what i want to discuss here uh in the chapter amalgamation in the chapter amalgamation so sorry totally we will discuss three different issues totally we are going to discuss three different issues what are such three different issues one is absorption another one is amalgamation another one is external reconstruction another one is external reconstruction please concentrate in the chapter amalgamation totally we are going to discuss three different concept one is absorption another one is pure amalgamation another one is external reconstruction you know first already things related to external reconstruction sir in case of external reconstruction what happen now the rani limited is a company uh, which incurring huge losses since past few years now it adopted the process of external reconstruction during the process of external reconstruction a new company raju limited is incorporated which is an existing company which is a loss making company which is a loss making company so now raju limited is all together a new company is incorporated to take over the business of rani limited now the objective of external reconstruction is showing the financial statements at true and fair view am i right fine now coming to the concept of absorption what will happen two companies they will take one is x limited another one is y limited let us consider two companies are there one is x limited another one is y limited X Limited is existing company, and Y Limited is also as an existing company. Now Y Limited want to absorb the X Limited. Y Limited want to absorb the X Limited. Simply Y Limited wants to take over the business of X Limited. Y Limited wants to take over the business of X Limited. Both the companies are existing companies. In case of amalgamation, what will happen? You know. two companies are there x limited and y limited both the companies will liquidate and a new company so called as xy limited is going to incorporate now here x limited is an existing company y limited is an existing company xy limited is a newly incorporated company now what is this all about sir the objective of external deconstruction is i told you to show the financial statements at true and fair view but the objective of either absorption or the amalgamation may be quite different maybe the objective of amalgamation or absorption is to avoid the competition to avoid the competition because just they want to avoid the competition on behalf of the two companies only one company will be there 
Now to avoid the competition, Y Limited is going to take over the business of X Limited. Maybe to get the synergy benefit, synergy benefits. What is the meaning of synergy benefits? Synergy benefits means one plus one is greater than two is nothing but synergy benefits. Do you understand? So that means if the both the companies are clubbed together, then it may become the super, super economic company, super economic company or super resourceable company. So that synergy benefits will be there. Maybe to get the economies of the scale, they may get amalgamated. They may get absorbed by one another. Do you understand? That means the objective of external reconstruction is quite different from objective of absorption and amalgamation. Do you understand all of you? Then why you are discussing all these three concepts in the chapter amalgamation, you may ask. The reason is whether it is about absorption or amalgamation or external reconstruction, there is no change in the accounting treatment because here there are only two different companies are there. X Limited is a selling company. Y Limited is a purchasing company because Y Limited is going to purchase X Limited. Y Limited is a purchasing company. X Limited is a selling company. In the same way, the newly incorporated company XY Limited is a purchasing company here. Both the existing companies X Limited and Y Limited is a selling companies. Am I right, guys? Next, in case of external reconstruction, the newly incorporated company is a Rajdu Limited, which is a purchasing company and Rani Limited is a selling company. That means whatever the topic you can consider, whether it is absorption or amalgamation or external reconstruction, only two different types of companies exist. One is selling company, another one is purchasing company. The company who wants to take over another company is purchasing company. The company who wants to blend into the other company is known as selling company. Now, in the same way, in case of amalgamation, X Limited and Y Limited are the selling companies. XY Limited is a purchasing company. Now, coming to the external reconstruction, Raju Limited is a purchasing company. Rani Limited is a selling company. That means we will only see in the accounting treatment in two different companies. One is accounting treatment in the books of selling company, accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company. That's why in examination or in the syllabus, all the concepts are clubbed, whether it is absorption or amalgamation or external reconstruction, the method of accounting treatment we need to adopt it is same. But the objective of conducting such things may quite different from external reconstruction to absorption and amalgamation. Do you understand all of you this? So then what is the difference between absorption, amalgamation and external reconstruction? In case of absorption, only two companies are involved and are more than two companies may also involve, but all the companies are existing companies. One company is take over one or more companies, then which is known as absorption, but all the companies are existing companies. In case of amalgamation, a new company is incorporated to take over two or more companies, minimum two or more companies. That is nothing but amalgamation. In case of external reconstruction, a new company is incorporated to take over the existing company to show such financial statements by depicting the true and fair picture. The selling company is a loss making company in case of the external reconstruction. That is the basic difference in between absorption, amalgamation and external reconstruction. And but for the purpose of providing the accounting treatment, there is no difference. Only two different types of companies are there. One is purchasing company, another one is selling company. If you observe the same, the same I explained in my material as well. Just come below. Uh, come below here. Now I given totally three examples. Company A and company B amalgamate to form a company C. Company A and company B are called transferor companies or you can also call it as selling companies. Transferor companies or selling companies, both the terminology is same. The company C is called the transfer company or you, all, you can also call it as purchasing company. This strategy is called as amalgamation. Company A is taken over by the company B. Company A is taken over by the company B. Company B is a purchasing company. Company A is a selling company. Here, company A is called as transferor company and company B is called the transferor company, transfer company. This strategy is called absorption. An existing company will take over the business of another existing company. Company A has been suffering from losses for the past five years. A new company B is floated to take over the existing company A. Here, company A is the transferor and company B is the transfer company. The strategy is known as external reconstruction. Hope you understand guys.
okay and one more thing i already told you external deconstruction is a classic example for one of the type of amalgamation as well which is nothing but amalgamation in the nature of merger because in case of external deconstruction what happened all the assets and liabilities of existing company who suffering losses is all together taken over by the purchasing company am i right so you you can understand why external deconstruction is so called as uh, amalgamation in the nature of merger at later point of time okay just leave it come back come back guys right so now here i explain the process of external deconstruction absorption as well as amalgamation the same thing i established in my uh, power notes as well if you you can check the external deconstruction a new company raju limited incorporated to equal, to take over the rani limited rani limited is a loss making company in case of absorption both the companies are the existing companies but in case of amalgamation a new company is incorporated to take over the two or more existing companies okay which company is known as selling company which company is known as purchasing company i already discussed another name for the selling company is the transferor company or the amalgamating company another name for the purchasing company is the transferee company or amalgamated company whatever the name they are calling you can easily appreciate by this diagrammatic representation and i told you the objectives as well the objective of amalgamation may be uh, to avoid the competition or maybe to get the uh, synergy benefits or maybe for the purpose of expansion or maybe for the purpose of getting economies of the scale or maybe for the purpose of getting the taxation benefits or maybe any other objective as well okay sir do you know the recent uh, amalgamation occurred in which industry in the banking industry lot of amalgamations are occurred okay that andhra bank is merged into the union bank maybe the corporation bank is also merged into the union bank so like that uh, certain uh, 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 certain banking mergers are actually occurred in the recent times okay fine let it be I'll put it all aside now please all of you concentrate with respect to the chapter amalgamation now we are in the actual amalgamation chapter amalgamation is broadly categorized into two types guys whenever i am using the word amalgamation it includes absorption as well as external reconstruction with respect to, to amalgamation in the nature of merger so that's why for the time being whenever i am using the word amalgamation it includes amalgamation as well as absorption you know the reason because the accounting treatment doesn't change and the objective is also doesn't change both from amalgamation and absorption but what is the difference in case of amalgamation a new company is incorporated to take over two or more existing companies but in case of absorption an existing company will take over another existing company that is the difference am i right fine now amalgamation is broadly categorized into two different types one is amalgamation in the nature of merger another one is amalgamation in the nature of purchase first apart from method of accounting such all things such all things before discussing about all such things when an amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger when an amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase let us have a look if all the below conditions satisfied as per accounting standard 14 then the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger we are discussing the chapter amalgamation along with the standard as 14 i will not differentiate as 14 and amalgamation just i will club together whenever the as 14 provisions necessary just i will discuss okay if all the below conditions satisfied as per as 14 then the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger what are such conditions sir you know two companies are there one is selling company another one is purchasing company now i am discussing with respect to these two companies only to set an amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of merger all these below conditions need to be satisfied all assets and all outside liabilities taken over by the purchasing company from the selling company purchasing company should need to take over all the assets and outside liabilities all the assets and outside liabilities of the selling company by the purchasing company all assets and liabilities taken over at book values only purchasing company should need to take over all assets as well as all liabilities at book values only next purchase consideration what is this purchase consideration sir all about purchasing company 
he is purchasing the business of selling company as a result purchasing company should need to pay certain amount to the selling company which is technically known as purchase consideration purchase consideration payable by purchasing company to the selling company in the form of fully paid up equity shares only the pc due to take over of business by purchasing company from selling company purchasing company should need to make certain amount to the selling company that amount should not be paid in the form of cash that amount should not be paid in the form of preference shares that amount should only be pay in the form of equity shares only so the purchase consideration should be paid in the form of fully paid up equity shares only next concentrate the next issue is shareholders holding not less than 90 percentage of share capital of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company what it is all about sir sir selling company having certain shareholders once the purchasing company is issuing the pc in the form of equity shares such equity shares are ultimately belongs to whom equity shareholders of the selling company once the equity shareholders of the selling company will get the equity shares of the purchasing company automatically equity shareholders of the selling company will become the equity shareholders of the purchasing company like that he is telling shareholders holding not less than 90 percentage share capital of the selling company out of 90 percentage share capital of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company after amalgamation then only that amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger and the last condition purchasing company or the transfer company will continue the same business of the selling company after takeover that means purchasing company will not conduct a different business purchasing company will continue the same line of business as like the selling company if all these conditions if all the below conditions satisfied then the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger if any one of the condition is not satisfied then the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase this is the basic issue first you should need to know before directly knowing the accounting treatment sir as per accounting standard 14 amalgamation is broadly categorized into two types yes this types of amalgamation is as per accounting standard of 14 only as per as 14 amalgamation is broadly categorized into two types one is amalgamation in the nature of merger another one is amalgamation in the nature of purchase when an amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger if all the five conditions satisfied then the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger sir sometimes they already tested in the examination like this what are the different conditions need to be satisfied the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger as per as 14 for five marks this question came from the as 14 actually the first and foremost condition all the assets and liabilities of the selling company should be taken over by the purchasing company all such assets and liabilities should be taken over at the book values and the purchase consideration should be payable only in the form of fully paid up equity shares only shareholders holding not less than 90 percentage of the share capital of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company after amalgamation and the purchasing company should need to continue the same line of business as like the selling company which done previously now i will tell you here certain exceptional issues what are certain exceptional issues please concentrate sir in the third point what they said to satisfy amalgamation as amalgamation in the nature of merger the purchase consideration should be paid in the form of fully paid up equity shares only right let us assume pc is 1,5074. just certain figure given the amount payable by purchasing company to the selling company was 1,5074. each and every equity share i am going to issue at the rate of 100 rupees then how many shares i need to issue 1050.74 shares can i issue 0 0.74 share to the selling company no i cannot issue 0 0.7 i unable to issue 0 0.74 fraction of the share i unable to issue to the selling company then what i can do that fraction of the share i can pay in the form of cash sir for fraction of the shares you paid in the form of cash due to that reason you cannot tell that amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of purchase you are violating the condition sir no this is not a violation of condition if any fraction of the shares are there 
we can able to pay in the form of cash still it is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger only that is one exception next one more exception i am telling you uh, that is not exception that is a uh, clarification sorry that is clarification what is point number 4 shareholders holding not less than 90 percentage of the share capital of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company i take an example there are two companies exist one is a limited another one is b limited let us assume b limited is a purchasing company and a limited is a selling company now before amalgamation itself before amalgamation itself b limited hold 10000 equity shares as investments in a limited before occurring of amalgamation itself b limited hold 10000 equity shares in a limited as investment now in the b limited under asset side investments in a limited is 10000 shares now the share capital of a limited is let us assume 10 lakh 1 lakh equity shares are there now what is the condition here shareholders holding not less than 90 percentage share capital of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company out of this 10 lakhs to the extent of 10,000 shares, that is, I mean, to the extent of 1 lakh worth of share capital is already held by purchasing company. First, you should need to reduce such 10,000 shares. From the remaining 90,000 shares, now during the process of amalgamation, 90,000 into 90 percentage means minimum 81,000 equity shareholders of A Limited should become the shareholders of the B Limited. 81,000 shareholders of the selling company should become the shareholders of the B Limited. I mean, this 90 percentage share capital is after reduction of shares already held by purchasing company and selling company before amalgamation that is the clarification given do you understand all of you okay sir this is a basic issue we discussed when an amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger when amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase you may ask one question at this particular point of time why actually you are differentiating two different types of amalgamation sir the reason is to know the accounting treatment the reason is to know the accounting treatment that is also to know the accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company to provide accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company amalgamation is broadly categorized into two types in the nature of merger in the nature of purchase if the amalgamation is in the nature of merger then the accounting treatment need to be adopted in the books of purchasing company is pooling of interest method pooling of interest method if the amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of purchase then the method of accounting to be adopted in the books of purchasing company is purchase method hope you understand now why you are differentiating the amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of merger amalgamation in the nature of purchase if amalgamation is said to be in the nature of merger then in the books of purchasing company the method of accounting need to be adopted is pooling of interest method if the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase if any one of the condition is not satisfied then which is amalgamation in the nature of purchase now then in the books of purchasing company the method of accounting is purchase method sir then what about accounting treatment in the books of selling company sir accounting treatment in the books of selling company as 14 doesn't applicable at all that means you no need to check about the type of amalgamation now if you come below if you check the problematic areas first then i can easily differentiate for which topics as 14 is applicable for which topics as 14 doesn't applicable here two companies are given one is a limited another one is b limited a limited is a selling company b limited is a purchasing company b limited is acquiring the business of a limited as a result, B Limited is paying the purchase consideration to the A Limited. Now, totally problematic issues, we are going to discuss three main concepts. One is accounting treatment in the books of selling company. That is accounting treatment in the books of A Limited. And another one, you know, accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company. That is in B Limited. And another one is calculation of this purchase consideration. This also plays the crucial role, which is calculation of purchase consideration. Totally three issues we are going to discuss. Out of such three issues, for calculation of purchase consideration and accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company, AS14 is applicable. But for providing accounting treatment in the books of selling company, AS14 doesn't applicable. Generally accepted accounting principles are applicable. Gap is applicable. AS14 doesn't applicable in the books of the selling company. 
that is the reason why at the time of providing the accounting treatment in the books of selling company no need to think about whether the amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of merger or amalgamation in the nature of purchase but to provide the accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company as per as 14 first you need to check the amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of merger or amalgamation in the nature of purchase you know when an amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of merger when an amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase if the amalgamation is in the nature of merger in the books of purchasing company to provide the accounting treatment we need to adopt pooling of interest method if the amalgamation is said to be amalgamation in the nature of purchase then the method of accounting we need to adopt is purchase method hope you understand okay just leave it all such thing guys first let me give my entire concentration on calculation of pc sir first out of these things first which topics you are going to take up sir first i am going to take up calculation of pc i am not going to take up accounting treatment in the books of selling company i'm not going to discuss accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company first we are going to discuss calculation of purchase consideration sir which plays the crucial and vital role in the entire chapter please all of you concentrate here to understand the things related to purchase consideration i already told you purchase consideration as 14 is applicable now i'm applying the provisions of as 14 concentrate as per accounting standard 14 what exactly the meaning of pc sir as per as 14 pc is nothing but amount to payable by purchasing company to the shareholders of the selling company alone treated as purchase consideration alone treated as purchase consideration as per accounting standard 14 amount to payable by purchasing company to the shareholders of the selling company such shareholders may be equity shareholders or such shareholders may be preference shareholders whatever the case may be it doesn't create any difference but the amount payable to the shareholders of the selling company alone treated as a purchase consideration sir to explain this sentence i will give certain examples please concentrate one by one guys all of you what are such examples let us have a look sir case number one i'm taking the case number one this is there just ignore the same lines are pasted here purchasing company yeah this is the first line sorry this is the first line purchasing company issued two equity shares for every equity share in the selling company purchasing company issued two equity share for every equity share in the selling company amount to payable to amount to payable by purchasing company to shareholders of the selling company equity shareholders of the selling company is it form part of pc yes absolutely it is form part of pc next one purchasing company issue one preference share for every preference share in the selling company amount payable by purchasing company to preference shares in the selling company is also form part of pc purchasing company issued three debentures for every four debentures in the selling company amount to payable to debentures in the selling company is it form part of pc no amount to payable by purchasing company to shareholders of the selling company debenture holders of the selling company is not the shareholders of the selling company that's why which is not form part of pc now hope you getting the meaning of purchase consideration as per as 14 what exactly purchase consideration is purchase consideration is nothing but amount payable by purchasing company to the shareholders of the selling company alone only we can treat it as a purchase consideration now let me check another case guys please allow you concentrate this is very much important to differentiate the or uh, to identify the amount of pc concentrate purchase co purchasing company issued two debentures for every equity share in the selling company is it form part of pc guys sir whether you are issuing the debentures whether you are issuing the cash whether you are issuing the equity shares whether you are issuing the preference shares i don't mind but if such things are issued to either equity shares or preference shares which is form part of pc now the debentures are issued to equity shares of the selling company that's why which is form part of pc 
and in the second one purchasing company also issued one preference share for every preference shares in the selling company amount payable to preference share in the selling company is form part of pc purchasing company also issued three debentures for every four debentures in the selling company amount payable to debentures in the selling company is not form part of pc then what you can made a conclusion here sir what you can made a conclusion here sir the amount payable by purchasing company is either in the form of equity shares or in the form of debentures or in the form of preference shares or in the form of cash or in the form of any other assets but that amount should ultimately payable to whom shareholders of the selling company then we can call it as a purchase consideration the same conclusion i made here amount payable to debenture holders of the selling company should not be considered as pc calculation what the purchasing company paying is irrelevant what we are paying is irrelevant you can pay in the form of cash in the form of equity shares in the form of preference shares in the form of debentures that is irrelevant but to whom we are paying is relevant whom if it is payable to shareholders then only it is treated as purchase consideration i hope you understand the real meaning of the pc as per as 14 amount payable by the shareholders of the purchasing company sorry amount payable by purchasing company to the shareholders of the selling company a loan treated as purchase consideration as per accounting standard 14 what we are paying is completely irrelevant to whom we are paying is only the relevant factor so you may issue equity shares you may issue debentures you may issue preference shares you may issue cash or you may issue any other asset but if such things are issued to the shareholders of the selling company either it is equity shareholder or preference shareholder which is form part of pc as per accounting standard 14 okay come down guys still the pc uh, issues is not at over lot more issues need to discuss methods different methods are available for calculation of pc different methods are available for calculation of pc one of that method is lump sum method another method is net payments method net asset value method intrinsic value method so let us have a look into one by one method guys lump sum method sir what is the meaning of lump sum method sir in the problem they'll directly mention how much amount is payable by purchasing company to the shareholders of the selling company directly that is nothing but lump sum method means ad hoc consideration that is fixed amount how that fixed amount is mentioned uh, that how that fixed amount is fixed they will not mention in the problems that is simply nothing but lump sum method but most of the times not most of the times okay nowhere they are following the lump sum method for all our problems the reason i will tell you if they directly reveal the purchase consideration amount then most of the burden of the student got reduced so that's why they'll never given the purchase consideration under lump sum method when they will given the purchase consideration under lump sum method if they want to test some other accounting treatments in the deeper manner then they will simply give the pc amount they will directly reveal the pc amount under lump sum method now coming to the net payments method coming to the net payments method sir how to calculate purchase consideration under net payments method sir that's very quite simple amount payable to equity shareholders of the selling company and amount payable to preference shareholders of the selling company if you can make it total then which you will get the purchase consideration sir why it is so called as net payments method sir now amount payable to equity shareholders how much payment we are going to pay to equity how much amount we are going to make payment to the preference shareholders payment it is related to the payments that's why the method is so called as net payments method so the pc under net payments method is nothing but amount payable to equity amount payable to preference shareholders of the selling company put together then we will get it as pc next come here net asset value method how to calculate the pc under net asset value method again the method itself contains the calculation mechanism net asset net asset means assets minus outside liabilities assets taken over out of the different assets had by the selling company which assets are taken over by the purchasing company at agreed values not at the book value of the selling company maybe a building 
in the books of the selling company is shown at 50 lakhs. It is taken over at the rate of 1 CR. Then you should need to adopt here 1 CR, which is nothing but agreed value. So assets are taken over at the rate of agreed value, less liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value, which is known as net asset value of the business, which is equal to the purchase consideration in case of the net asset value method. Do you understand all of you? Sir, any person at the time of making purchase, then they will think that how much amount need to pay means how much value we assign to those assets and liabilities. The, those values assigned by the selling company are completely irrelevant in calculation of the purchase consideration payable by me to you. Because how much value assigned from my point of view is important. How much value assigned from your point of view is completely irrelevant for me. That's why the assets taken over at the rate of agreed value you should need to consider and liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value you should need to consider for the purpose of making payment of PC by the purchasing company to the selling company. That's why book values in the books of selling company is completely irrelevant in calculation of PC here. Hope you understand. Next, come to the last method, guys, which is intrinsic value method. Sir, what is the meaning of intrinsic value, sir? The total intrinsic value is nothing but NAV of the selling company. There is no difference between NAV method and intrinsic value method, basically. Basically, there is no difference between NAV method and intrinsic value method. But the intrinsic value method is another form of NAV method. Another form of NAV method. I will tell you how they are giving. The purchase consideration in case of intrinsic value method is nothing but intrinsic value of the selling company. What is the meaning of intrinsic value? Intrinsic value means the meaning of intrinsic value is the real value, the fair value, the fair value of the selling company. What is the fair value of the selling company? The fair value of the selling company is nothing but NAV. Because why you are adopted the agreed values here? Because that asset market value is how much? Which is nothing but agreed value. The liability market value is how much? Which is nothing but agreed value. Now the assets minus liabilities, which is nothing but NAV, right? That's where the intrinsic value of the selling company, the fair value of the selling company as equal to the NAV of the selling company. Most of the times, most of the times, the agreed value assigned by the purchasing company are based on the market price. Sir, nobody is willing to buy at more than the market price or at less than the market price. Because if you want to buy more than at market price, then the other party willing to sell, but you are not ready, right? But if you are buying at less than the market price, uh, then the other party will not agree for that. Maybe you are ready to buy at less than the market price. That's why always in generally the agreed values are occurred at market values only. That's why the intrinsic value of the selling company as equal to NAV of the selling company. But how we are calculating the intrinsic value of the selling company, sir? In the problems, they are given that intrinsic value per equity share in the selling company directly they will give. Intrinsic value per equity share in the selling company into number of equity shares in the selling company, then automatically we will get the intrinsic value of the selling company. What is the meaning of intrinsic value per equity share in the selling company, which is as equal to NAV per equity share? One more time repeating intrinsic value of the selling company is nothing but number of equity shares in the selling company multiplied with each intrinsic value per share in the selling company. That is number of equity shares in the selling company multiplied with intrinsic value per equity share in the selling company. Intrinsic value per equity share in the selling company is nothing but NAV per equity share. So ultimately, what do you want to tell, sir? In, under intrinsic value method, PC is nothing but PC is nothing but number of equity shares in the selling company into intrinsic value per share in the selling company is nothing but the PC, which is nothing but the intrinsic value of the selling company, which is nothing but total NAV of the selling company as well. Okay, fine. All of you come here. Therefore, the PC is equal to intrinsic value per share in selling company into number of equity shares of the selling company. For example, for example, if you want to know how many number of shares we can issue? How many number of shares issued as PC by the purchasing company to the selling company in case of intrinsic value method? 
one more time i'm repeating to know the number of shares issued as pc by purchasing company to the selling company now till now you work out how much amount of pc payable by purchasing company to the selling company now the question is different how many number of shares issued as pc by the purchasing company to the selling company it's quite easy pc divided by issue price pc divided by issue price so number of shares issued as pc is equal to pc divided by what is the meaning of pc pc is equal to intrinsic value per share in the selling company into number of equity shares in the selling company divided by issue price pc divided by issue price is nothing but number of shares na number of shares issued as pc na issue price issue price of whom purchasing company purchasing company at which price it is going to issue you know if nothing is mentioned purchasing company is going to issue at their own intrinsic value per share that is nothing but intrinsic value per share in the purchasing company now just i am opening the mt one note just a second mm. yeah please come here all of you <laughs> sir whatever the method you are following whether it is a lump sum method just a moment whatever the method you are following whether it is lump sum method or whether it is net payments method or whether it is net asset value method or whether it is intrinsic value method the method of pc may be different the method of pc may be different i mean the quantum of amount you are assigning for that pc may be different from method to method from method to method definitely but number of shares issued as pc number of shares number of shares issued as pc how we need to calculate in any other any method in any method that is pc amount divided by issue price by purchasing company am i right or wrong guys how many number of shares issued as pc by purchasing company means amount of pc divided by issue price per share in the purchasing company issue price per share simply issue price per share in purchasing company now like that under lump sum method how many number of shares issued as pc sir pc divided by issue price per share in the purchasing company under net payments method pc under net payments method divided by issue price per share in the purchasing company in case of nav method that is pc is nothing but nav in case of nav that is nav divided by issue price per share in the purchasing company like that in case of intrinsic value method pc divided by issue price per share in the purchasing company in case of intrinsic value method issue price is nothing but intrinsic value per share in the purchasing company because purchasing company is also going to issue each and every equity share at their intrinsic value now under lump sum method pc is fixed amount i am talking about now the numerator factor under lump sum method pc is fixed amount under net payments method pc is nothing but amount payable to equity shareholders amount payable to preference shareholders if you make it total then you will get the pc in case of the nav method pc is nothing but assets taken over at the rate of agreed value minus liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value then you will get the nav which is equal to the pc in case of nav method now in case of the intrinsic value method pc is nothing but number of equity shares in selling company into intrinsic value per share in the selling company intrinsic value per each equity share in the selling company is nothing but nav per share in the selling company itself hope you understand i love you okay come back <laughs> now my next question is uh next question coming into my mind is how you can identify after reading the problem whether the method of pc is lump sum method or net payments method or net asset value method or intrinsic value method sir if it is the lump sum method no need to bother about identification of method because they are directly revealing the pc that's why i don't want to discuss anything about lump sum method put aside if it is the intrinsic value method again they will directly mention that we are discharging the pc at intrinsic value per share of the purchasing company 
like that they will mention that's why to provide or to calculate the pc under intrinsic value method also there is no hesitation but the only problem is identification of method of pc in between net payments method and net asset value method only identification of method of pc in between net payments and net asset value method is quite confusing then how i can identify the method of pc is net payments or net asset value method now there is a trick the trick is while reading the information that is while reading the problem while reading the problem if we are able to ascertain amount payable to the shareholders of the selling company by reading the information given in the problem if you can able to ascertain amount payable to the shareholders of the selling company that is equity shareholders and the preference shareholders in the straight away the method of pc you can be adopted as net payments method no 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 sir i unable to calculate amount payable to either equity shareholders or preference shareholders then method of pc is not net payments method then straight away you can go to the net asset value method so to understand or to appreciate in the better manner let me take one example guys just a second so let me give an example here yeah what is that example one case guys the case is all of you please uh, follow me and you can tell from your mind whether the method of pc is net payments method or net asset value method purchasing company issued two equity shares for every one equity share in the selling company for every one equity share in the selling company that means if selling company one equity shares is one equity share is there then purchasing company is going to issue two equity shares purchasing company issued three equity shares for every four preference shares in the selling company i mean for every four preference shareholders purchasing company is going to issue three equity shares remaining amount will be issued in the form of cash to the equity shareholders still apart from the apart from the equity shares it is also going to issue cash to the equity shareholders now equity shareholders of the selling company is getting two components one is equity shares of purchasing company as well as cash he is revealing how many number of equity shares of purchasing company is going to issue to each and every equity shareholder of the selling company through point number 1 but how much cash is going to issue to the equity shareholder of the selling company is it revealed no remaining amount just they told that simply remaining amount will be issued in the form of cash to the equity shareholders then while reading the information in the problem if we are able to ascertain amount payable to the shareholders of the selling company then method of pc is net payments method but right now we are unable to ascertain amount payable to the equity shareholders of the selling company due to non knowing of the component of the cash due to not knowing the component of the cash we are unable to ascertain amount payable to the equity shareholder of the selling company then method of pc is nav method method of pc is not net payments method method of pc is straight away you can tell which is nav method then sir under nav method how i can able to ascertain the amount of cash payable to the equity shareholders first you will calculate the net asset value under pc method which is nothing but assets taken over at the rate of agreed value less liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value then you will get the nav out of such nav equity shares you know already because one equity share in the selling company will get two equity shares of the purchasing company you will get how many number of how much amount of preference shares they are going to issue because for every four preference shares in the selling company purchasing company is going to issue three equity shares then preference shareholders of the selling company also how much they will get they know in the form of equity shares how much they are getting no to the preference shareholders how many number of equity shares they are getting they don't know the remaining amount in the form of cash out of the nav we are issuing to the equity shareholders part payment in the form of equity shares to the preference shareholders part, the entire payment in the form of equity shares and the remaining balance is in the form of cash so nav minus in the form of equity shares in the form of preference shares and the remaining sorry nav out of the nav part payment to the equity shareholders and full payment to the preference shareholders and the remaining balance is nothing but cash like this we need to reveal 
how much cash component to be make it payable to the equity shareholders of the selling company so it's very thin line guys people may feel that our students may in generally may feel that after seeing these sentences in the problem just like that this is method of pc is net payments method but you need to check whether we can able to ascertain the amount payable to all the shareholders of the selling company or not if we can able to ascertain then the method of pc is net payments method otherwise method of pc is net asset value method okay that's it come below so total uh, so much of discussion we made since past 10 to 15 minutes things related to the method of pc so pc can be calculated under lump sum method or either under net payments method or either under net asset value method or under intrinsic value method if it is lump sum method pc amount is directly given in the problem if it is net payments method we need to able to accept an amount payable to equity shareholders of selling company how much amount payable to preference shareholders of selling company how much if you make it consolidate then you will get the pc amount under net payments method in case of net asset value method assets taken over at the rate of agreed value less liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value which is nothing but nav which is equal to pc in case of nav method in case of intrinsic value method pc is equal to number of equity shares in the selling company into intrinsic value per equity share in the selling company then if you want to able to ascertain number of shares issued as pc then amount of pc divided by issue price but in case of the intrinsic value method issue price by the purchasing company is nothing but intrinsic value per share in the purchasing company that's it guys next sir which method of pc i need to adopt for this problem how to identify if it is lump sum method or intrinsic value method they will directly given if you have any confusion in between net payments method and net asset value method by reading the problem information if you can able to ascertain amount payable to equity as well as preference shareholders then straight away you can adopt the net payments method otherwise you can directly adopt net asset value method that's it guys come below uh, they are talking about certain special circumstances what is this special circumstances sir the special circumstance is uh, i'll explain here the purchase consideration may be recorded at either issue price or at par value what is this sir pc is always recorded at issue price only na why you are talking about par value what you are talking we can't understand please come to my empty note guys all of you please concentrate here uh, let me take one example for better understanding what is that example yeah the example is so let us consider the pc method is net payments method we are in the method of pc is net payments method number of equity shares in the selling company is 1 lakh as per the terms and conditions of the pc is each equity shareholders of the selling company will get two equity shares every i mean sorry for every two equity shares we are going to issue one equity share now this is the selling company this is the selling company the term is in selling company we have 1 lakh equity shares now purchasing company is clearly telling that for every two equity shares in selling company we are going to issue one equity share now can you please tell me purchasing company how many number of equity shares going to issue as a pc for 1 lakh equity shares for every two one means 50000 equity shares they are going to issue as pc so number of shares issued as pc as 50000 now the question is what is the issue price in the purchasing company to know the total amount of the pc number of shares issued as pc into issue price by the purchasing company we will multiply right let us assume issue price in the purchasing company is 20 rupees the face value may be the 10 rupees but the issue price is 20 rupees let us assume therefore then the pc is equal to 50000 into 20 is equal to 10 lakhs so the pc amount is 10 lakhs now in the problem it is clearly given that pc should not be recorded at issue price pc should not be recorded at issue price pc should be recorded at par value what is the meaning of par value at face value if you want to record pc at par value first you should find out the number of shares issued as pc number of shares issued as pc is 50000 and each equity share face value how much 10 rupees 50000 into 10 how much 5 lakhs that means that means whenever in the problem it is specifically mentioned that you can record the pc at par value you can record the pc at par value then how to calculate the pc sir if the pc is going to record at par value first you need to work out 
number of shares issued as PC. Number of shares issued as PC. It should be multiplied with the face value per share. Then you will get PC recorded at par value. But if the PC is recorded at issue price, then how you can directly work out? In the normal course, simply if you can calculate PC, then which is nothing but PC is recorded at issue price. The PC method may be lump sum or maybe net payments or maybe net asset value or maybe the intrinsic value. If you calculate in the as usual manner, which is nothing but PC recorded at issue price, but PC is recorded at par value, you should first work out number of shares issued as PC, then multiplied with the face value. Don't buy hard it anything guys, just apply your logical mindset. Sir, PC is at issue price means in lump sum method directly amount is given under net payments method, that is number of shares issued to equity shareholders multiplied with issue price, number of shares issued to the preference shareholders of the selling company multiplied with issue price. If you make it the total, you will get the PC under net payments method, which is at issue price only. Net asset value method, you already calculated assets taken over, my assets taken over at the rate of agreed value minus liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value. Intrinsic value of the business is nothing but number of equity shares in the selling company into intrinsic value per each equity share, which is nothing but PC is recorded at issue price only. Now, whenever you want to record the PC at par value, first you need to work out number of shares issued as PC. Then it should be multiplied with face value. Now the next question coming into my mind is how I can calculate number of shares issued as PC. We already discussed now how to calculate number of shares issued as PC. Number of shares issued as PC is nothing but total amount of PC divided by issue price. Total amount of PC divided by issue price per share in the purchasing company. Tell me guys, we already work out now. So first what you should need to work out, number of shares issued as PC is nothing but PC divided by PC divided by issue price in purchasing company. Then you will get number of shares issued as PC. Sir, PC, how to calculate PC? You know already you know how to calculate PC. Then issue price in the purchasing company, if you divide the total amount of the PC, then you will get number of shares issued as PC. But if the PC is under intrinsic value method, in calculation of number of shares issued as PC, on behalf of issue price, what you can use? You can use intrinsic value per share. Intrinsic value per share in purchasing company on behalf of issue price at which price the purchasing company is going to issue in case of intrinsic value method, their own intrinsic value per share of the purchasing company. So that's the PC divided by intrinsic value per share in the purchasing company, you will get number of shares issued as PC. We already explained that fact as well. Number of shares issued as PC in case of intrinsic value method is intrinsic value per share in the purchasing company. That means, can you please tell me PC amount if it is recorded at par value under a different method, sir, absolutely. Please concentrate. How we need to work out PC at par value under a different methods. If it is lump sum method, PC lump sum amount divided by issue price in purchasing company. If it is under net payments method, PC amount under net payments method, you know how to calculate the PC amount divided by issue price in purchasing company. First, you will get number of shares issued as PC into face value here, here also into face value. Then you will get PC is recorded at a par value. PC is recorded at a par value. Next, coming to the NAV method. First, you should work out the PC amount, which is NAV divided by issue price on purchasing company. Then you will get number of shares issued as PC multiplied with face value. You will get PC is recorded under NAV at par value. Next, come to the intrinsic value method. How to calculate PC, which is going to be recorded par value. First, calculate the PC. PC is nothing but intrinsic value per share in selling company into number of equity shares in selling company, which is PC amount. Number of equity shares in selling company, which is PC amount divided by issue price in the purchasing company, which is intrinsic value per share in purchasing company. Then you will get number of shares issued as PC multiplied with face value. Then you will get PC is recorded par value. To put it simply, 
if pc is required at par value the formula for calculation of pc is number of shares issued as pc into face value sir why actually pc is recording at issue price why you are differentiating pc is recorded at par value is it will create difference to be frankly speaking there is no difference i don't want to confuse you i will reveal whether you are going to record pc at issue price or whether you are going to record pc at par value there is no difference at all i will prove such thing after completion of the accounting treatment in the books of selling company as well as accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company till now or not it started accounting treatment in the books of selling as well as accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company come back come back to my power notes we are at we are at discussion of method of calculation of pc sir can you please draw the conclusion with respect to, to the pc amount out of the three problematic areas the first problematic area we are touching the calculation of pc right what exactly the meaning of pc as per accounting standard 14 amount payable by purchasing company to the shareholders of the selling company alone treated as pc to whom we are paying is relevant what we are paying is irrelevant you may issue equity shares you may issue preference shares you may issue debentures you may issue cash or you may issue any other asset but if it is going to issue to either equity or preference shareholders of the selling company then i consider into the purchase consideration otherwise i will simply ignore that is the essence of as 14 with respect to, to the calculation of pc there are four different methods exist one is lump sum method another one is net payments method another one is net asset value method another one is intrinsic value method in case of lump sum method pc is directly revealed in the problem in case of net payments method amount payable to equity shareholders of the selling company amount payable to preference shareholders of the selling company put together is known as a pc in case of the net asset value method assets taken over at the rate of agreed value less liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value is nothing but pc in case of intrinsic value method pc is nothing but number of equity shares in the selling company into intrinsic value per each equity share in the selling company in generally if you are calculating pc like this means pc is recorded at issue price but whenever the problem clearly mentioned that you can record the pc at par value then how to calculate the pc is the different task first you should need to work out number of shares issued as pc if it should multiplied with the face value then you will get pc is recorded at par value the same thing i explained here pc is recorded at issue price in the as usual normal way we already seen if pc is re recorded at par value then the formula is number of shares issued as pc into face value in the purchasing company face value per share in the purchasing company then how to calculate number of shares issued as pc you know pc divided by issue price in the purchasing company is nothing but number of shares issued as pc but in case of intrinsic value method pc divided by intrinsic value per share in the purchasing company that point only i told you and one more important point i explained whether you are recording pc at issue price or whether you are recording at pc at par value it doesn't create any difference i'm going to prove such thing with after completion of accounting treatment in the books of selling company and accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company that's it guys next come down so same things i everything i explained no worries okay come down now please come to the second problematic issue what is the second problematic issue we seen here so the first problematic issue is calculation of pc over right second problematic issue is accounting treatment in the books of selling company now we are going to discuss accounting treatment in the books of selling company or transfer or company is it accounting standard 14 applicable in the books of selling company not at all generally accepted accounting principles are only applicable generally accepted accounting principles are only applicable now i am going to explain the accounting treatment in the books of selling company through a small illustration please allow me concentrate what is that illustration now i am revealing first this is the balance sheet of a selling company as at 31st march 2021 under asset side two different assets sorry under asset side ppe is there under pp plant and machinery is there land land given intangible assets goodwill is given and a miscellaneous expenditure not written off is there which is a fixed as asset remaining all assets are current assets inventory cash trade receivables okay so total of the assets is given at 100 lakhs that is which is 1 crore i think so which is at 1 crore next coming to liabilities equity share capital given preference share capital under reserves and surplus securities premium is there general reserve is there pnl account is there under non current liabilities 10% debentures and trade payables given which is 
the existing balance sheet of a selling company. Now the terms were accept cash. Cash is there, na? Accept this cash. Purchasing company want to take over all assets and liabilities. Accept this cash. Purchasing company want to take over all assets. Liabilities means always outside liabilities. And the purchase consideration given under lump sum method directly seventy lakhs. PC directly given because I don't want to uh, test the calculation of PC at this stage because we already done uh, with the calculation of PC under different methods. Now our focus is towards knowing the accounting treatment in the books of selling company. That's why PC was directly given at seventy lakhs, which is under lump sum method. And one more important issue is given, which is liquidation expenses, because selling company is going to liquidate now. Once if it is taken over by purchasing company, for that the liquidation expenditure incurred were two lakhs is given. Next, preference shareholders of the selling company. Here, preference shareholders of the selling company is there now. Preference shareholders of the selling company, just given by the purchasing company, their own preference shares. I mean, preference shareholders of the selling company will get. Preference shares of the purchasing company. That is the information. And one more important information I will reveal here uh, in the problem itself. What is that? You know, uh, the information is one second, sir. How this seventy lakhs PC is given, sir? How this seventy lakhs PC is given? Out of this seventy lakhs PC, fifteen lakhs is in the form of cash. Twenty-five lakhs is in the form of uh equity shares right that is sorry preference shares let me put 25 lakhs in the form of preference shares remaining how much 40 lakhs right 40 or 30 uh, 30 lakhs in the form of equity shares so this 70 lakhs uh, just it is there just a moment 25 cash equity 30 preference 50 So just a small change. Uh, this fifteen lakhs is in the form of preference, and this twenty five lakhs is in the form of cash, and thirty lakhs in the form of equity shares. That point also I revealed. One more time, I'm repeating the information given in the illustration balance sheet of the selling company given, except the cash of the selling company. Each and every asset and liability of the selling company is ultimately taken over by the purchasing company. PC is decided under lump sum method seventy lakhs, and it is clearly given in the problem itself. Out of this seventeen lakhs, in the form of preference shares, we are issuing fifteen lakhs. In the form of cash, we are issuing twenty five lakhs. In the form of equity shares, we are issuing thirty lakhs. And liquidation expenses is two lakhs. Preference shares of the selling company will get preference shares of the purchasing company. Okay, fine. Now, my duty is in the books of the selling company. As fourteen anyway doesn't applicable. That's why I no need to think about method of amalgamation. Whether it is amalgamation in the nature of merger or amalgamation in the nature of purchase, na no need to think. I can simply adopt a five step approach. Sir, what what is the accounting treatment generally we need to adopt in the books of selling company, sir, to close the books of selling company? Closure of books of accounts is the method of accounting. Closure of books of accounts, sir. Closure of books of accounts means simply what the selling company need need to do. the assets and the liabilities simply transferred to the purchasing company it will receive some amount from the purchasing company that amount should need to be distributed among the liability which is not taken over by the selling company the liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company and to the shareholders of the selling company one more time i am repeating to put in very simple manner the objective of the selling company is make it transfer the liab the assets and the liabilities which decided to take over by the purchasing company maybe all assets may not be take over all liabilities may not be take over whatever the assets or liabilities decided to taken over by the purchasing company just to make it transfer such assets and liabilities to the purchasing company Okay, sir. I transfer such assets and liabilities. As a result, purchasing company will pay certain purchase consideration, right? You can receive that purchase consideration. Now, in your company, you may distribute such purchase consideration to the remaining liability holders, which are not taken over by the purchasing company, as well as preference shareholders and equity shareholders. Automatically, your all accounts will going to be closed. 
for that closure of books of accounts in selling company i am going to adopt five step approach what is that approach five step approach under step number 1 the assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book values why you are transferring to realization account at book values sir you may have it out now please all of you follow me so this is little bit tedious job but once if you understand you can able to create wonders please concentrate sir let me take one asset plant and machinery so i am considering the plant and machinery in your books of accounts that is in selling company books of accounts plant and machinery is there at 20 lakhs right that is two balance brought down 20 lakhs is there in the same way you can consider another liability one liability just one liability 10% debenture one liability is there which is at 20 lakhs that is by balance brought down 20 lakhs what is your objective your objective is simply selling these assets and liabilities to the purchasing company but you are not selling the individual asset and you are not selling the individual liability the group of assets put together and group of liabilities put together you are selling to the purchasing company now first and foremost objective is i also want to club all those assets into a single account i want to make it club all those different assets account into a single account that's why this individual account should be closed and transferred to one single account which is realization account this individual liability is also going to be closed and transferred to a single individual account which is realization account that's why what are all the assets or what are all the liabilities taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to a single temporary account which is a realization account at which value book value because once if you make it transfer such account balance to the realization at book value then only that account got closed am i right or wrong that's why those assets and those liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book values now can you please tell me as per the information given in the problem except cash all the assets and all the outside liabilities is taken over by the purchasing company or not that's why all the assets one by one one by one two sundry assets simply i make it transfer to the realization account at book values all are at book values all the liabilities under liabilities 10% debentures is there trade payables is there such two liabilities 10% debentures trade payables just make it transfer to the realization account step number 1 not at over step number 1 is dismantling of balance sheet guys now i am revealing at this particular point of time step number 1 is dismantling of balance sheet after seeing the balance sheet first assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book values next if any particular asset or liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company let us assume in the given case cash is not taken over right it should be separately opened cash account is separately opened by me cash account is separately opened by me two balance brought down which is 5 lakhs let us assume any other particular asset is not taken over then what i can do sir let us assume plant and machinery is not taken over by the purchasing company open plant and machinery also separately two balance brought down sir if any particular liability is not taken over let us assume 10% debentures is not taken over open 10% as debentures account separately don't make it transfer to the realization okay so assets are liabilities taken over by the purchasing company close and make it transfer to realization at book value any asset or liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company open it separately that's it now preference share capital should be closed and transfer to preference shareholders equity share capital and the entire reserves and surplus if any miscellaneous expenditure not written off which is fixed as asset which also belongs to equity shareholders not only the profits but also losses also belongs to equity shareholders so equity share capital reserves and surplus any miscellaneous expenditure not written off should be closed and transfer to equity shareholders account you can open the equity shareholders account transfer equity share capital transfer reserves and surplus and miscellaneous expenditure not written off also you can transfer to equity shareholders preference share capital transfer to preference shareholders account this is the step one dismantling of balance sheet if you see the entire balance sheet items got dismantled step number one is the dismantling of balance sheet 
assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book values. I already transferred assets. I already transferred liabilities. Fine. Any asset or liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company separately open. Cash is not taken by the purchasing company. That's why cash was not transferred to realization. Cash account is separately open. You can check any other asset or liability which is not taken over. You can open it separately. Next, preference share capital transfer to preference shareholders account. Open preference shareholders by preference share capital. Open equity shareholders account and you can transfer equity share capital, reserves and surplus and miscellaneous expenditure not written off to the equity shareholders account. I transfer to the equity shareholders account. That is dismantling of balance sheet. Next, what is my next objective, sir? What you are doing, what you are doing, those assets and the liabilities which you transfer to realization, right? Now, such assets and liabilities, you are selling to whom? Purchasing company. You are selling to whom? Purchasing company. Can you please, all of you, tell me at the time of selling off any product in general course, what is the entry you may pass? Data to sales. Tell me, guys. Data to sales. Data to sales. Now, in this case, who is your data? Purchasing company is my data. I need to recover amount from the purchasing company. Nah? That's why you need to pass one general entry. What is that entry? Purchasing company account data. Please, all of you concentrate here. Purchasing company account data. For example, if you sell an individual asset, entry is uh, the party account data to asset account. If it is a good, then we can put two sales. If it is an asset, we can put two assets account. But already assets are got closed by making transfer to realization. Nah, asset was closed. Nah. Asset was already closed by making to transfer to realization. Now on behalf of assets, I can write realization. I can write realization. That's why the entry is purchasing company account data to realization account at the rate of PC amount due. How much amount is PC due? How much amount of PC you can recover from the purchasing company? The entry is purchasing company account data to realization account, not only assets. Now, by crediting this realization means it is inclusive of both taken over of assets and as well as liabilities because the other party is paying the purchase consideration not only for the purpose of taking over of assets, both for the purpose of taking over of assets and as well as liabilities. So which is known as PC due entry, entry is purchasing company account data to realization account at the rate of purchase consideration. Now, purchasing company to realization means in realization by purchasing company at the rate of PC. PC amount we already decided now, how much PC amount? PC amount is 70 lakhs. That's why in realization account by purchasing company account. If in realization by purchasing company, you need to open the purchasing company account as well. So I opened the purchasing company account here. That is two realization. That is two realization. This is step number two. Step number two is for PC due. PC due. Next. Step number three is for PC received. I'll show you each and every step. There clearly I already given in my material, but I don't uh, wrote in my power notes, which is there in my material. I'll show you. Don't worry. Once after completion of all the steps, I'll go to the, my material. I will show the steps as well. Step number three is PC receipt. Now you wrote the entry purchasing company to realization. Nah? Now you need to recover amount of PC from the purchasing company. Nah? Now what you are recovering, I already told you the PC amount is in the form of preference shares in the form of cash, in the form of equity shares. Let us assume if you recover cash from the purchasing company, what is the entry? Cash account data to purchasing company account. If you receive amount from the data, what is the entry? Cash to data. But right now on behalf of cash, you are receiving cash, preference shares of purchasing company, equity shares of purchasing company. That's where the entry will become like this. That is preference shares of, just a moment, change the color. The entry will be <laughs> preference shares of purchasing company, equity shares of purchasing company, cash, no need to write cash of purchasing company, simply you can write cash because to differentiate your preference shares and equity shares, just you wrote pre preference shares of purchasing company, equity shares of purchasing company, cash to purchasing company account. This you are canceling with at the rate of PC, you know, preference shares of purchasing company, you are getting 15 lakhs. 
equity shares of purchasing company you are getting 30 lakhs cash you are getting 25 lakhs am i right total is equal to the 70 lakhs now the same entry you can give the posting in purchasing company account buy cash buy equity shares of purchasing company buy preference shares of purchasing company already cash account is there in cash to purchasing company 25 lakhs you can open these two accounts as well equity shares of purchasing company preference shares of purchasing company the other posting you can give to purchasing company to purchasing company 30 lakhs 15 lakhs this is the entry for this is the entry for pc receipt step number one we discussed about we discussed about dismantling of balance sheet dismantling of balance sheet step number two pc due step number three pc receipt then what you can do sir once you are getting purchase consideration from the purchasing company what you can do sir in your balance sheet in your balance sheet you should need to make payment to the liability holders in a particular order once you are getting the purchase consideration you should distribute to the remaining parties in the particular order for example all of you please consider it here after getting pc first what you should need to check once you are getting the pc from the purchasing company if any of the asset is not taken over by the purchasing company is there or not you can check in the given case cash is there we may not sell the cash in the outside market cash was already in the realized form let us assume plant and machinery is not taken over by the purchasing company then at this particular circumstance you can sell such plant and machinery as well because what is your objective closure of the books of accounts now you can sell your plant and machinery in the outside market for example plant and machinery is there at book value 20 lakhs but you sold out at 23 lakhs you are getting a profit of 3 lakhs right now that is the reason why i told you in the step number one if any asset is not taken over by the purchasing company you can open separately you already opened separately 20 lakhs two balance brought down right now you are selling this plant and machinery by cash at 23 lakhs now due to which you are getting a profit of 3 lakhs now such a 3 lakhs profit also you can make it transfer to realization that means after getting the purchase consideration from the purchasing company if any of the assets not taken over by the purchasing company are exist you can realize it in the outside market due to which if any cash balance is received that cash balance also you can be added to the purchase consideration now due to selling of such particular asset if you derive any profit or loss such profit or loss you can make it transfer to the realization account because there is no profit and loss account right now already pnl account itself is got transferred to the equity shareholders account that's why any profit or loss occurred during the process of uh, closure of the business you can simply make it transfer to one temporary account which is nothing but realization account do you understand now for selling company on their hand purchase consideration amount is there plus if any cash is realized from assets not taken over by the purchasing company such cash balance is also available will you agree all of you now totally how much cash balance is there how we know sir the total cash balance is 5 lakhs plus 25 lakhs total 30 lakhs cash balance is there plus preference shares of the purchasing company 15 lakhs is there equity shares of the purchasing company 30 lakhs is there which is available for a distribution now at the time of distribution of pce plus existing resources existing resources means existing cash or plus cash realized through assets which are not taken over by the purchasing company should be paid in the particular order number one first you should need to make payment for liquidation expenses or the realization expenses the same order in general we are following in the chapter liquidation of companies as well at the time of closure of the company which order you need to follow to make payment to the different stakeholders of the company first you need to make payment for liquidation expenses or the realization expenses then secured creditors then secured creditors after that unsecured creditors after that preference shareholders after that equity shareholders finally now during this process of making payment if again any profit or loss is derived then such profit or loss also you can also make it transfer to realization account tell me guys at the time of realization of any particular asset which is not taken over by the purchasing company sold it in the outside market any profit or loss is derived you are make it transfer to realization in the same way 
during the process of making discharge of amount to the different stakeholders, if you derive any profit or loss, such profit or loss also you can make it transfer to realization account. Now, first, let me explain one by one thing. For example, you are incurring the liquidation expenses. What is the normal entry for incurring the liquidation expenses? Expenses to cash. Expenses account data to cash account is the entry. In generally, expenditure where you can generally transfer PL account, but there is no PL. PL was already transferred to equity shareholders account. What are the expense or income? What are the profit or loss you will derive? It should make it transfer to realization, right? That's why this expenditure should also be make it transfer to realization. Entry realization account data to liquidation expenses. If liquidation expenses, liquidation expenses, and crossover, the net entry is realization account data to cash account. That is simply P and L to cash. That is realization to cash. That means for incurrence of liquidation expenses, the entry is realization account data to cash account. If anything is there, for example, sir, 10% debentures is there now here. Where it is? Balance sheet. Let us assume 10% debentures is not taken over by the purchasing company. Next, in order, what should I need to make payment? Secured credit R. Let us assume debentures is a secured credit R. Now, if such 10% debenture is not taken over by the purchasing company. What I should need to do? I should open separately. Na? I should open separately. 10% debentures, I should open separately if it is not taken over. But in this problem, it is taken over. That is a different story. If it is not taken over, I will open separately. Let us assume for this 10% debentures as a full and final settlement, we are paying 18 lakhs. Now, for this 18 lakhs, let us assume you are paying cash, then 10% debentures to cash. In cash also, you should need to give posting. Then the profit or loss is how much? Profit is 2 lakhs. Such 2 lakhs profit also, you should need to make it transfer to realization. That point earlier, actually, I told you. But in this problem, no worries. All the liabilities are taken over by the purchasing company. That's why after making payment of, after making payment of, just a moment. After making a payment of liquidation expenses, then secured creditors, then unsecured creditors. Here, there are no liquidation expenses. There are no secured creditors. There are no unsecured creditors, which are not taken over by the purchasing company. That's why you can directly make it payment to the preference shareholders. It is clearly given in the problem that the preference shares of the preference shares, which you getting as a PC from the purchasing company is ultimately make it payment to the preference shareholders of the selling company, right? How much amount of preference shares you are getting from the purchasing company? 15 lakhs worth of preference shares of the selling company. Sorry, 15 lakhs worth of preference shares of the purchasing company you are getting as a PC. Now such 15 lakhs, you can make it distribute to whom? Preference shareholders of the selling company. Where are the preference shareholders of the selling company? I opened separately. Then you can make a payment. Preference shareholders account data are, at the time of making payment, what is the general entry? Preference shares of purchasing company account data to preference shareholders account. That's why in preference shareholders buy preference shares of purchasing company, which is how much guys? One second. So sorry. At the time of making payment, what is the general entry guys? We are already having, we are already having preference shares of purchasing company for 15 lakhs. Now you can give such preference shares of purchasing company to the preference shareholders. What is the entry? Preference shareholders account data to preference shares of purchasing company. That's why in preference shareholders, two preference shares of purchasing company, in preference shares of purchasing company, by preference shareholders, then automatically preference shares of purchasing company account got closed. Now, if you observe the preference shareholders account, the liability is there at 20 lakhs, but you made full and final settlement at 15 lakhs. Now you derived the profit of 5 lakhs. Such 5 lakh profit also you can make it transfer to realization. That's why in realization, in realization, you are clearly given that uh by preference shareholders 5 lakhs in preference shareholders to realization in realization which is by preference shareholders do you understand and just i assumed that liquidation expenses are there for 2 lakhs now realization to cash account that's why i wrote the entry realization account data to cash account as well just if liquidation expenses are there if i assume okay now in the order of settlement the full and final settlement belongs to equity shareholders now the full and final settlement belongs to equity shareholders now, which is final step, which is step number five. Before making full and final settlement to equity shareholders, first, what should you need to do? You should close the realization account. You should close the realization account. 
whatever the profit or loss derived from such realization account it ultimately belongs to equity shareholders because equity shareholders are the real owners of the company just to make it close the realization account after closing the realization account i got the balancing figure of 13 lakhs which is realization profit such a realization profit you can make it transfer to equity shareholders such balancing figure under realization to equity shareholders then equity shareholders by realization till not final settlement made just you found the realization profit make it transfer to the equity shareholders now final settlement to the equity shareholders now you can make whatever the things whatever the things are available in your company just to make it pay such resources to the equity shareholders whatever the sources are available you know equity shares of purchasing company you have to the extent of 30 lakhs do you agree guys in the form of pc you are getting preference shares you are getting equity shares out of that preference shares already you make it transfer to preference shareholders now the equity shares of purchasing company with you to the extent 30 lakhs apart from that cash is there with you 28 lakhs how you know sir cash is there 28 lakhs opening we have 5 lakhs in the form of pci i am getting 25 lakhs for incurring realization expenses 2 lakhs is over 25 plus 5 30 30 minus 2 28 lakhs i have this 28 lakhs plus this 30 lakhs total 58 lakh of resource with me to make payment to the equity shareholders just to make it pay that resources to the equity shareholders cash 28 lakhs equity shares of purchasing company also 30 lakhs automatically equity shareholders account got closed equity shareholders account we, if it is closed then only the problem is correct because as per the double aspect concept or as per the dual aspect concept there is a uh, opposite aspect for each and every transaction both debit and credit aspect once if you are making the transferring the available resources to the equity shareholders equity shareholders is the liability account those are assets account assets account should be nullified with the liability account then there is no balance in the equity shareholders account once if you are making settlement the cash then there is no balance in cash account as well once if you settle the equity shares of purchasing company to the equity shareholders then there is no balance in equity shares of purchasing company account this is closure of the company friends you know i am in the session of marathon I can't tell each and every item by putting here some figures. I already taken certain figures. I am giving my best effort to explain with the available figures. Sir, can you please consolidate? You told through the five-step approach, right? Can you please consolidate such five-step approach? Definitely, guys. I am going to consolidate such five-step approach with my uh, material. Please, all of you concentrate here. Just now, I am going to explain the five-step approach here. Five-step approach. Number one, in the books of accounting treatment, you should not adopt, you should not adopt AS 14. You are providing the accounting treatment based on generally accepted accounting principles. Now in the problem, they are directly giving the balance sheet of the selling company. After seeing the balance sheet of the selling company, first you should need to start with dismantling of balance sheet. In case of dismantling of balance sheet, assets and liabilities, which are taken over by the purchasing company, will be closed and transferred to realization account at book values i already told the reason because you are not selling the individual asset and liability you are selling group of assets and group of liabilities put together you are selling to the purchasing company for temporarily i want to i want to club all such individual assets into a single account that is nothing but realization account i want to club all the liabilities taken over into a single account which is realization account Hope you got it. Next, if any particular asset or liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company opened separately for the purpose of realization in the outside market, because such asset or liability is not taken over by the purchasing company, na, we will make it realize in the outside market, but not realize right now, just to open it separately. Next, preference share capital will be transferred to preference shareholders account. Equity share capital, reserves and surplus, fixed CCS assets should be transferred to equity shareholders account. Now, the dismantling of balance sheet of the existing selling company is over. Is over. Just now we've seen that the entire components of the balance sheet were dismantled into realization and a separate asset account and equity shareholders account and a preference shareholders account. That is step number one, dismantling of balance sheet, guys. Next, come to the step number two, purchase consideration due. Now you are selling your assets and liabilities to the purchasing company by passing the entry purchasing company account data to realization account at the rate of PC. 
first in the working note you need to calculate the purchase consideration how to calculate the pc what is the meaning of pc different methods available for pc pc is required at par value pc is required at issue price all things are i already discussed that is the reason why i discussed the components of the pc and the methods of the pc first hope you got it so purchasing company account at r2 realization account is the entry for purchase consideration due calculate purchase consideration by providing separate working note with the amount of purchase consideration debit the purchasing company account and credit the realization account next step number 3 PC received. In the form of PC, you may receive cash, you may receive preference shares of purchasing company, you may receive debentures of purchasing company, you may receive equity shares of purchasing company, anything you may receive. Okay, I already told you what you receiving is irrelevant, whom it is receiving is only relevant to decide whether it is PC or not. That's why purchasing company account will be closed. That is, uh, purchasing account should be credited. By debiting equity shares of purchasing company, preference shares of purchasing company, debentures of purchasing company, cash. The entry is equity shares of purchasing company, preference shares of purchasing company, debentures of purchasing company, cash account at R2 purchasing company. Then automatically purchasing company account got closed. If you see in here, we opened the purchasing company here. First, in the second entry, PC to realize purchasing company to realization, I wrote. The third entry is PC received cash, equity shares, preference shares to purchasing company. Automatically purchasing company account got closed. Fine. Next, distribution of purchase consideration. Now, dispose those assets which are not taken over by the purchasing company in the outside market first. Before distribution of the PC among the various stakeholders, first dispose those assets which are not taken over by the purchasing company in the outside market and any profit or loss derived transfer to realization account. I already told you. Now, with the available cash and a PC received by the transfer company after realization, you are getting certain cash that cash plus PC cash, PC amount total received by the selling company will be distributed among the various parties in a particular order decided by the liquidation provisions. What is that particular order? First, you should need to incur realization or liquidation expenses, then secured creditor, then unsecured creditor, then preference shareholders, then finally equity shareholders. During this process of distribution, any profit or loss is derived will be transferred to realization account. In our problem, we already seen at the time of making payment to the preferent shareholders, we got a profit of 5 lakhs, which is transferred to the realization account. So the same fact I mentioned here as well. Then final settlement to the equity shareholders. Before making the settlement to the equity shareholders, First, close the realization account. You can close the realization account. Find the profit or loss of the realization account. If it is profit, realization to equity shareholders. If it is loss, equity shareholders to realization. Then find realization profit or loss. Such profit or loss will be transferred to equity shareholders account. Then after closing the realization account, all the remaining resources in the selling company. What are the remaining resources in the selling company? Cash and equity shares of the purchasing company as per our illustration, just to distribute among the equity shareholders, then all accounts in the selling company will be closed with this final step. That's it, guys. This is the five step approach. Now to put it simply in the five step, step number one, disbanding of balance sheet, assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book value. Asset and liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company separately opened, ready for realization in the outside market. Sir, preference share capital transferred to preference shareholders. Equity share capital, reserves and surplus, miscellaneous expenditure not written off like any fixes as I said, make it transfer to equity shareholders account. Disbanding of balance sheet is over. Step number two, PC due. Purchasing company account at R2, realization account at the rate of PC. Before that, make a working note, calculate the PC, which method is available. Depending upon that method, you can calculate the PC. If PC is required at issue price, you can continue. PC is required at par value according to adjust. Then the entry is purchasing company to realization, make it posting. Then PC received, you may receive cash, you may receive equity shares, you may receive preference shares, you may receive debentures. What is the entry? Cash account at R, equity shares of purchasing company account at R, preference shares of purchasing company account at R, debentures of purchasing company account at R, to purchasing company. You should need to close the purchasing company at that particular circumstance. Once you receive the PC, purchasing company account got closed. Then step number four, distribution of the PC. Before distribution of the PC, if any asset available, which is not taken over by the purchasing company, realize it in the outside market. Any profit or loss occur due to such realization, make it transfer to the realization account. Then PC amount plus cash realized due to the outside disposal of particular assets. 
the total amount you can make it distribute in the particular order. What is that order? We already discussed. First, liquidation expenses, then secured greater, then unsecured greater, then preference shareholders, then equity shareholders. During this process of making settlement to various liability holders, if you derive any profit or loss, again make it transfer to the realization account. Then final settlement to the equity shareholders, which is step number five. Before making final settlement to the equity shareholders, find out the realization profit or loss. If it is profit realization to equity shareholders, if it is loss equity shareholders to realization, then with the available resources, as per the given problem, cash and equity shares of purchasing company, just to make it distribute among the equity shareholders, then all accounts automatically got closed. This is the five-step approach followed based on the generally accepted accounting principles in the books of selling company. That's it, guys. Sir, still only one is pending for problematic issues. Sir, but for this chapter, we try to do two problems for understanding after completion of the entire theoretical issues, I will try to do two problems. Then only you can satisfy with this marathon lecture. Otherwise, the provisions you may know how to apply the provisions once the particular problem will come, you may not appreciate. Okay. So the only one issue is pending, guys. What is that you know? Which is lengthy chapter. You should bear with me. The another issue is accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company. Except this, everything is over. Now we are in the books of purchasing company. Let us start with accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company. Tell me all of you, in the books of purchasing company, AS14 is applicable. And the two accounting treatment is based on type of amalgamation. If the amalgamation is in the nature of purchase, then method of accounting to be adopted is purchase method. If method of I mean, if type of amalgamation is in the nature of merger, the method of accounting need to be adopted is pooling of interest method. Am I right? We already seen. First, what exactly the meaning of purchase method? What exactly the meaning of pooling of interest method? Let us have a look through journal entries, guys. What is the difference between purchase method and pooling of interest method? But you know one thing, when amalgamation is said to be in the nature of merger, when an amalgamation is said to be in the nature of merger, out of the five conditions, that is assets and liabilities, I mean, all the assets and liabilities should be transferred to the purchasing company. All the assets and liabilities should be transferred at book values. And the PC should be paid in the form of fully paid up equity shares only, except for a fraction of the shares, we can pay it in the form of cash. And shareholders holding not less than 90% of share capital of the shareholders of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company after amalgamation. And the same business should be continued by the purchasing company after takeover. If all such five conditions are satisfied, then the amalgamation is said to be in the nature of merger. Any of the condition is violated, then the amalgamation is said to be in the nature of purchase. Am I right? We know that. If any of such condition is violated, then once if it is decided as a purchase, then we need to adopt this purchase method. How the purchase method will be, let us have a look through journal entries, guys. Now, all of you, please come to purchase method. The first and foremost entry in case of purchase method is at the time of purchase of the business, what is the general entry we need to be passed? Not the business. If you purchase any goods, what is the entry, guys? In case of purchase of goods, what is the entry? Purchases account it are to credit or account. Purchases account it are to credit or account. Now you are not purchasing goods, you are purchasing the business. That's where the entry is business purchase account it are to liquidator of the selling company. The creditor itself is not the selling company because selling company already got liquidated. In the place of the selling company, liquidator will be appointed as per the rules of the company act 2013. That's why we need to make it hand over that amount to the liquidator of the selling company. How much amount do we need to hand over at the rate of purchase consideration? That's where the entry is business purchase account it are to liquidator of the selling company at the rate of purchase consideration. Now, all of you, please concentrate. If you are purchasing the business means what really you purchased assets and liabilities. That's where the second entry is with respect to incorporation of assets and liabilities of the selling company you are incorporating the assets and liabilities of the selling company into the purchasing company books by canceling the business purchase. 
first you should need to incorporate all the assets taken over at the rate of agreed value two liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed values which is nothing but which is nothing but assets at the rate of agreed value minus liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value which is nothing but nav as well as you should also need to cancel business purchase because business purchase is debit in the first entry now you should need to cancel by making credit at the rate of pc now what is the meaning of this sir by passing assets taken over account debtor to liabilities taken over to business purchase if you pass this entry what is the meaning of this you know assets taken over minus liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value is known as nav is known as nav business purchase is nothing but pc business purchase is nothing but pc you are comparing purchase consideration with nav you are comparing purchase consideration with nav sir pc can be calculated in multiple methods if the pc is going to be calculated under nav method then pc is also equal to nav tell me guys in case of nav method pc is equal to nav if pc is equal to nav then there is no profit or loss due to acquisition of the business why sir sir the value of the business we are getting in point of view of purchasing company is let us assume uh, one cr at the same time the purchase consideration we are paying to the liquidator of selling company is also one cr then the benefit we are getting in the form of nav is one cr the payment we are getting the payment we are paying to get that benefit is also one cr that is nothing but pc is equal to nav if purchase consideration is equal to nav no profit or no loss in purchasing company point of view okay in any other method if you calculated the pc i mean if you calculated pc in case of lump sum method or in case of net payments method or maybe in case of intrinsic value method then there may be a chance of getting pc greater than nav or there may be a chance of getting pc less than nav what is the meaning of pc greater than nav purchase consideration we are paying is 1 cr Are are the NAV? Let me fix the NAV. NAV the benefit we are getting is one CR, but the amount we are paying is one point five CR. Excess of amount we are paying, excess of amount we are paying over the benefit we are getting is known as loss. Is known as loss in point of view of purchasing company. Why you are paying the excess of PC even though you know the value of the business is one CR? The excess you are paying for the purpose of goodwill of the other business the loss you can treat it as a goodwill then if the nav is 1 cr but the purchase consideration you are paying is 80 lakhs only that is pc is less than nav you are getting the benefit of 1 crore but simply you are just paying the 80 lakhs 20 lakhs you are getting the benefit which is a capital benefit which is a capital which should need should be transferred to capital reserve so the overall conclusion is at the time of incorporation of assets and liabilities of the selling company in the books of purchasing company you need to incorporate assets at the rate of agreed value as well as to liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value assets taken over at the rate of agreed value minus liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value is nothing but nav of the business it should be compared with business purchase by cancelling the business purchase that is pc if the pc is under nav method then pc is equal to nav then there is no chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve that is the reason why i made it cross but if you are calculated pc by applying any other method then there may be a chance of pc greater than nav or there may be a chance of pc less than nav if pc is greater than nav then excess of pc paid to get the benefit which is transferred to the capital loss which is nothing but goodwill sir if the pc is less than nav then we are getting the more benefit by paying the less amount now the difference is the capital profit which should need to be transferred to the capital reserve i mean if the purchase consideration is under nav method then there is no chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve but if the same purchase consideration is calculated under other than nav method then there is a chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve if goodwill is occurred then you should need to debit if capital reserve is occurred then you should need to credit only one account is appeared either goodwill or capital reserve 
if pc is greater than nav goodwill if pc is less than nav capital reserve but if the pc is calculated under nav method there is no chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve but one more special thing i want to clarify here guys pc even though calculated under nav method if the same PC is recorded at par value, then there may be a chance of occurring difference between PC and NAV. Do we appreciate all of you? If PC is calculated under NAV, if such PC is recorded at issue price, then there is no difference between PC and NAV. Both are same. But if PC is calculated under NAV method, but recorded at par value, what is the meaning of recorded at par value? shares issued as pc multiplied with face value sir pc in case of pc recorded at par value means the total nav divided by the total nav divided by issue price then you will get number of shares issued as pc then if it is multiplied with face value then the pc amount is quite different from nav amount the pc amount is quite different from nav amount because nav is at issue price but pc is at par value now, how these both will match at that particular point of time, PC is not equal to NAV. So then there may be a chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve. That means the catchy points are, if PC is issued at, I mean, if PC is recorded at issue price, then if the PC is under NAV method, there is no chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve. But if the same PC is calculated under different methods, even though PC is recorded at issue price, there is a chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve PC more than NAV, goodwill PC less than NAV, capital reserve. But if the same PC is recorded at par value, even though the PC method is under NAV method, there is a chance of occurring difference between PC and NAV because the NAV is at issue price, but the PC is at par value, then at that scenario, there may be a chance of occurring goodwill or capital reserve. Sir, all these items you can appreciate once if you can understand the normal procedure then the different issues you can easily appreciate uh, otherwise it's might confusing but don't buy hard anything just simply follow the my flow then automatically you will get everything okay fine guys sir first entry at the time of purchase of business i write sir then after that i cancel the business purchase and I incorporated assets and liabilities. If there is capital profit, then credited the capital reserve. If it is capital loss, then I debited the goodwill. That's okay, sir. Fine. Then where you made the payment, sir. Now you can settle the payment to the liquidator. For a liquidator, you may issue equity shares. You may issue preference shares. You may issue debentures or you may issue cash. Then what is the entry, sir? Liquidator of selling company account data at the rate of purchase consideration right because we are making this entry at the rate of pc so now you should make it debit at the time of making payment to a creditor the entry is creditor account at R. that is liquidator of selling company account at R. if you issue equity shares to equity share capital if you issue preference shares to preference share capital those equity and preference shares are issued with premium then the premium amount you should need to make it great to securities premium account if you are paying the cash they can you can issue cash sir if you issue the debentures then you can write to debentures do you understand all of you next please all of you concentrate guys these are three entries are normal entries to be passed in case of the purchase method in case of the purchase method apart from that you should need to pass certain other entries as well depending upon the information given in the problem what are such other entries sir sir at the time of incorporation of assets and liabilities here one of the liability is debenture of the selling company exist if at all purchasing company is taken over debentures of the selling company as well then out of these liabilities one of the liability is debentures of the selling company now the selling company itself is going to be liquidated means there is no value for debentures of the selling company now you should need to cancel the debentures of the selling company you should issue your own company debentures or depending on the terms and conditions agreed in the amalgamation how you are making settled to the debentures of the selling company depending upon that you should need to pass the general entry that is under the liabilities if debentures of selling company exist then debentures of selling company should need to be debited that means this liability is there now that liability is debited one of the liabilities debentures of selling company account at R. at which value at the rate of agreed value because all the liabilities are at the rate of agreed value now you are issuing your own debentures that is two ten percentage debentures if your debentures are issued with premium 
then two premium on debentures account. If your debentures are issued at discount, then discount on issue of debentures account. Only one will come, either discount or premium. No, sir, the as it is value we are issuing, then there is no premium, then there is no discount. That is simply, we are acquiring the debentures of selling company as well. Then you need to cancel the debentures of selling company and you can issue your company debentures. Okay. <laughs> That's it, guys. These are the normal entries you need to be follow in case of purchase method. And one more special entry is there. One more special entry is there. What is that? I will tell you. Please come down, all of you. Here. Special issue. What is the special issue, sir? Sir, in case of purchase method, reserves and surplus of the selling company will not transfer to the purchasing company. Am I right? Tell me, guys. In case of purchase method, amalgamation in the nature of purchase means we are incorporating, we are incorporating assets as well as liabilities taken over by the purchasing company. But we are not incorporated reserves and surplus of the selling company here, right? That means reserves and surplus of the selling company will not be transferred to the purchasing company. No doubt about it. But if selling company reserves and surplus but in selling company reserves and surplus if it have certain statutory reserves then such a statutory reserves also need to be maintained by purchasing company as well as per the statutory requirement for example guys there is a foreign exchange fluctuation reserve is there which is a statutory reserve it should be maintained as per the fema act for five years for five years let us assume Already selling company maintained two years. As per the FEMA Act, the purchasing company should need to be maintained for three more years. But no reserves and surplus of selling company is transferred to the purchasing company. Then to follow the statute, I need to maintain such statutory reserve by passing an entry, amalgamation adjustment account data to statutory reserve account. This is a simple adjustment to need to be made to maintain the statutory reserve account. Reserve is the balance of credit. Then we should need to give the debit to the amalgamation adjustment account. Sir, for how many years it should need to be maintained? For remaining three years. For remaining three more years. Now, once such three years elapsed, once the time period elapsed, the entry should need to be reversed. What is the entry? Statutory reserve account data to amalgamation adjustment account. So up to the three years, that statutory reserve is shown under reserves and surplus of the purchasing company as well as amalgamation adjustment account is also shown under reserves and surplus as a negative figure. This is the beauty of amalgamation adjustment account. Amalgamation adjustment account is shown under negative figure under reserves and surplus. And anyway, statutory reserve shown under positive figure under, under reserves and surplus. Then positive is nullified with negative. There is no impact in the reserves and surplus. But still, we are maintaining the statutory reserve to comply the provisions of that particular statute. Do you understand? Fine. One more time repeating. In case of purchase method, the reserves and surplus of the selling company will not be transferred to the purchasing company. But to comply a statutory reserve of that particular statute, it is necessary to be maintained such statutory reserve by the purchasing company by passing an entry amalgamation adjustment account data to statutory reserve account. Statutory reserve will be shown as a positive figure under reserves and surplus of the purchasing company. Amalgamation adjustment account is also shown under reserves and surplus as a negative figure. Once the time period elapsed, the entry should need to be reversed then statutory reserves should need to be removed from reserves and surplus as well as amalgamation adjustment account also need to be reversed from the reserves and surplus by passing the reversal entry statutory reserve account data to amalgamation adjustment account. Is it okay, guys? Fine. This is all about, this is all about purchase method. This is all about purchase method. Now, all of you, please come to pooling of interest method. Sir, what is the meaning of pooling of interest? Sir, in case of merger, what happened? All the assets and liabilities of the selling company would become the assets and liabilities of the purchasing company. And all the assets and liabilities should be transferred at book values of the selling company to the purchasing company. That means purchasing company is feeling that there is no difference between selling company and purchasing company. 
both are sister concerns almost the shareholders of the selling company would become the shareholders of the purchasing company as well because we are paying pc in the form of fully paid up equity shares only do you understand so in case of pooling of interest method how the accounting treatment will be will look now please all of you concentrate come to pooling of interest method purchasing company will take over all the assets and liabilities along with reserves and surplus of the selling company why sir just now i told you there is no difference between shareholders of the selling company as well as shareholders of the purchasing company the reserves and surplus belongs to the shareholders of the selling company is also belongs to the reserves and surplus is also belongs to the shareholders of the purchasing company as well because there is no difference between shareholders of selling company and shareholders of the purchasing company in case of amalgamation in the nature of merger that is the meaning of pooling of interest pooling means you can add simply the total interest of the shareholders simply that is the meaning of pooling of interest method so purchasing company will take over all assets and liabilities along with reserves and surplus of the selling company that too those assets and liabilities should be taken over at book values only now all of you please concentrate if this is the balance sheet of the selling company assets are there assets are at the rate of book value and the outside liabilities are also at the rate of book value reserves and surplus are also at the rate of book value now please concentrate purchasing company is ready to take over all the assets at book value and all the liabilities along with reserves and surplus now purchasing company is purchasing company is taken over assets and liabilities along with reserves and surplus means at the time of comparison of pc with nav nav is nothing but nav is nothing but share capital of the selling company do you agree what is the meaning of nav nav means assets minus outside liabilities minus reserves and surplus assets minus outside liabilities minus reserves and surplus here which is nothing but share capital of the selling company here if you check nav is nothing but sorry this is not the case here nav is nothing but assets taken over at the rate of agreed value minus liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value which is nothing but nav in case of purchase method agreed value is quite different from book value of the selling company but in case of pooling of interest method the book value and agreed values of assets and liabilities and reserves and surplus both are same that's why nav is nothing but assets taken over at the rate of book value minus liabilities taken over at the rate of book value minus reserves and surplus at the rate of book value then which is nothing but share capital of the selling company only that's why to no profit or loss arised due to the takeover of the selling company we should need to compare purchase consideration with share capital of the selling company directly the pc may be we calculated in the in nav method or under net payments method or under lump sum method or under intrinsic value method that doesn't change method of calculation of pc doesn't change whether you are in whether you are in amalgamation in the nature of purchase or amalgamation in the nature of merger there is no relationship at all the method of calculation of pc is all together different it may be lump sum method it may be nav method it may be net payments method it may be intrinsic value method then the question is if purchase consideration is greater than the nav you are paying the more pc but what you are getting the benefit that is nothing but nav if pc is greater than nav which is nothing but pc is greater than share capital of the selling company which is loss right which is loss right that loss you should not transfer to goodwill as like in case of purchase method that loss should be set off with free reserves and surplus of transferee company after takeover of reserves and surplus of the transferor company oh my god for example you are in the pooling of interest method you know in the books of purchasing company you will take over all assets and all liabilities along with the reserves and surplus of the selling company out of the reserves and surplus free reserves of the purchasing company first you can take free reserves means profit and loss account and general reserve those reserves which are freely available for distribution of dividend is nothing but free reserves 
you can also consider the resource and surplus of the selling company but just you can add only free resource of the selling company you cannot add statutory resource to set off the loss because it is clearly given that loss should be set off with free resource of the transferee company free resource of the purchasing company after takeover of free resource of the transferor company that is free resource of the purchasing company plus free resource of the selling company from where you can set off the loss from where you can set off the loss due to pc greater than share capital then the remaining resources and surplus only you can shown in the purchasing company balance sheet then you may ask one question sir if the free resources of purchasing company and free resources of the selling company is not sufficient to set off such loss then what i can do to the extent you can set off that loss still if it is not enough to cover then the remaining amount you can make it debit the profit and loss account simply okay sir if pc is less than the share capital of the selling company you know you are paying the less amount but you are getting the more benefit which is the capital profit in the same way how in case of purchase method you are transferring to capital reserve in the same way you can make it transfer to the capital reserve one more time repeating this is a crucial part of the pooling of interest method the first and foremost important point you need to remember in case of pooling of interest method is purchasing company will take over all assets and liabilities along with reserves and surplus of the selling company in comparison of pc with nav to know profit or loss on business takeover you can directly compare pc with share capital of the selling company if pc is greater than the share capital of the selling company which is the loss situation that loss you can set off with free reserves of purchasing company after taking free reserves of the selling company that will be work out like this first you can consider free reserves of the purchasing company add free reserves of the selling company from where you can reduce the loss the remaining free reserves you can be shown under the balance sheet during the process of amalgamation okay fine next if the pc is less than the share capital of the selling company which is a pure profit situation such profit you can make it transfer to the capital reserve sir what about the remaining general entries sir the first and foremost entry there is no difference for the first and foremost entry business purchase to liquidator of selling company at the rate of pc same business purchase account debtor to liquidator of selling company at the rate of purchase consideration there is no difference the same entry you can pass so here also i passed the entries just a moment yeah general entry is the first and foremost entry business purchase account debtor to liquidator of selling company at the rate of pc you know the pc amount depending upon nav net payment intrinsic value or the lump sum all assets taken over all the assets of the selling company taken over at the rate of book value to all the liabilities of the selling company taken over at book value along with that Please allow me to concentrate. Along with that, we are considering the reserves and surplus of the selling company as well. In the reserves and surplus of the selling company, statutory reserves are there. First, you can directly incorporate the statutory reserve at the rate of book value. Then, two free reserves, sir. Which free reserves I can only incorporate after set off of losses arised due to PC greater than share capital of the selling company? Still, if any free reserves are there, such free reserves I need to incorporate. that means the entire free reserves of the selling company you cannot incorporate just as like that the free reserves of the selling company you can add with the free reserves of the purchasing company after that you can make it set off with the loss arised due to pc greater than share capital of the selling company still if there is any free reserves of the selling company exist such free reserves you can be incorporate this is very much important then in the as usual you should need to cancel the business purchase if it is the loss that is the situation no sir if it is the profit then you can straight away incorporate all the statutory reserves all the free reserves and the pc is less than the share capital of the selling company that is pc is less than nav then you can incorporate the capital reserve but you should never incorporate the goodwill in situation of pooling of interest method the remaining all are easy guys at the time of making payment liquidator of selling company account are to equity share capital preference share capital securities premium and cash and out of this liabilities if debentures of selling company exist debentures of selling company account debtor to your company debentures if you are issued with premium to premium on debentures if you are issued with the discount to discount on issue discount on issue of debentures account debtor you may pass am i right fine this is the difference between pooling of interest method and purchase method now sir if you ask 
what is the difference between purchase method and pooling of interest method can you please elaborate sir one thing only one is the difference in case of purchase method all the assets and maybe the assets not all certain assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company taken over at the rate of taken over at the rate of agreed value but here all the assets and liabilities are taken over at the rate of book value that is the one difference another difference is reserves and surplus of the selling company should not be taken over by the purchasing company but here reserves and surplus of the selling company will be taken over by the purchasing company now at the time of comparison of pc with nav if pc is greater than the nav then you may treat it as a goodwill if pc is less than the nav you may treat it as a capital reserve but here at the time of comparison you should compare pc with share capital of selling company because nav of the selling company is nothing but share capital of the selling company here if the pc is greater than the share capital of the selling company the loss should be nullified with free reserves of the purchasing company after considering the free reserves of the selling company the loss should be nullified with free reserves of the purchasing company after considering the free reserves of selling company if the pc is less than the share capital of the selling company which is profit such profit should need to be transferred to the capital reserve and one more important difference just i want to tell you here in case of the purchase method we need to maintain the statute reserve to comply the provisions of the particular statute by passing the entry amalgamation adjustment account data to statute reserve account that special entry we already seen here amalgamation adjustment account data to statute reserve such special entry no need to pass in case of amalgamation in the nature of merger because in case of pooling of interest method all the reserves including the statute reserve we are going to incorporate in the books of the purchasing company that's why without passing the adjustment entry itself uh, in the second entry at the time of incorporation of assets and liabilities we already incorporated the statute reserve that's why no need to maintain the amalgamation adjustment account amalgamation adjustment account is only going to appear in case of purchase method but not in case of pooling of interest method that's it guys still the discussion is not at over guys please concentrate all of you sir in examination problems or in the classroom problems most of the times they will mention the type of amalgamation most of the times they will mention the type of amalgamation if at all not mentioned if at all they not mentioned then in generally we will treat it as amalgamation in the nature of purchase but certain times you need to check those five points if such five points are satisfied then we can treat it as amalgamation in the nature of merger otherwise we may treat it as amalgamation in the nature of purchase but most of the times they will directly mention the type of amalgamation if they are not mentioned then you can apply such five points if the applicability of such five point itself is difficult for you by reading the problem then you can simply treat it as amalgamation in the nature of purchase so that information is given in the study material itself clearly so that's why you can follow as like that fine next certain certain special accounting issues just i want to going to discuss please concentrate what are such special accounting issues first let us have a look <laughs> sir two companies are there one is selling company another one is purchasing company before amalgamate before before amalgamation there is a relationship in between purchasing company and selling company what is that relationship sir purchasing company sold goods to the selling company that means both selling company and purchasing company known to each other so before proceeding with amalgamation itself they they entered into certain transactions with one another purchasing company will sell goods to the selling company then in the books of the selling company purchasing company will be treated as a creditor which is a trade payable then in the books of the purchasing company selling company will be treated as a debtor which is a trade receivable so goods sold for 1 lakh now the question is after occurring of this transaction now the amalgamation is going to takes place as a process of amalgamation you know purchasing company will take over assets and liabilities of the selling company including this trade payable now this trade payable after taken over after incorporation of assets and liabilities of selling company in the books of purchasing company in purchasing company balance sheet one of the liabilities trade payable na 
now if you observe in purchasing company trade payable is nothing but purchasing company it is indirectly telling that we need to make payment to whom ourselves is it possible it is meaningless and one more we are telling that we need to receive amount from selling company where is the selling company selling company is already liquidated that means to be frankly speaking there is no me there is no meaning to get amount from the selling company and there is no meaning to pay ourselves that's why we should need to cancel the asset with liability by passing the entry liability account data to asset account if you make the debit the liability account it should be cancelled if you make the credit the asset account it would also cancel that's why the entry is trade payable account data to trade receivable account that is debtors account data to creditors account which is the adjustment entry in case of intercompany owings intercompany owings means whenever one company need to make payable to the other company then the adjustment should need to occur not only for trade payable and trade receivable maybe at the time of loan receivable loan payable maybe at the time of bills receivable bills payable maybe at the time of debtors and creditors the adjustment entry need to be passed next coming to the second situation the same situation i am going to continue what is that situation purchasing company sold goods to the selling company at the rate of 1 lakh how the purchasing company sold you know by adding cost plus 10 percent is profit let us assume if the purchasing company cost is 100 rupees and the profit will be 10 rupees then the selling price will be 110 now what happen at the end of the particular financial year in the selling company books the stock is there at 25000 such stock which is purchased from the purchasing company the stock which is purchased from the purchasing company now <laughs> they decided to amalgamate each other now purchasing company will take over all the assets and liabilities of the selling company along with this stock now purchasing company already having their own stock at 1 lakh this is their own stock let us assume in purchasing company their stock at the rate of 100 rupees that is their original cost price na now purchasing company will take over the stock of selling company as well now stock from selling company is at 25000 rupees which is for purchasing company selling price what is the purchasing company selling price if 100 is the cost 10 rupees is the profit then selling price will be 110 rupees oh can you please tell me anyone for the purpose of evaluation of the stock in their books of accounts they will apply the provisions of as2 right as per accounting standard 2 inventory should be valued at cost or nrv whichever is lower the cost is at 100 rupees but the nrv is at 110 rupees at which price i need to record this is cost or nrv 100 or 110 whichever is lower means that is 1 lakh at cost that's okay good but coming to this 25000 rupees cost is at 100 rupees but the nrv is at 110 rupees we recorded at 110 rupees but that is not correct right we need to reduce the value of the stock by representing it at nrv value that means i need to reduce 10 rupees out of this 110 now 25000 is coding at 110 then for 10 rupees is how much which is double to 73 in the form of stock reserve i need to reduce then what is the entry i need to pass you know i need to reduce the stock right to stock account i need to reduce stock that's why to stock account because to show that stock at nrv i need to reduce double to 73 means stock should need to be reduced remains stock should need to be created then to which component i need to make the debit you know which is a loss sir reduction of stock means which is a loss you can debit the profit and loss account in the normal course but which is a capital loss you can make the debit to goodwill account here you can make the debit to goodwill account here because in the books of purchasing company whatever the loss is occurred sir pc is more than nav which account you are debiting goodwill account that's why you should always debit the goodwill account then the entry is goodwill to on behalf of crediting you can add the word reserve as well that's why the entry is goodwill account data to stock reserve account is the entry which is elimination of unrealized profit lying in the closing stock of the selling company which is elimination of unrealized profit lying in the stock of the selling company by passing the entry goodwill account data to stock reserve account do you understand next sir can i directly debit the capital reserve on behalf of making debit the goodwill account yes if at all in the second entry at the time of incorporation of assets and liabilities 
if pc is less than nav then you may derive the capital reserve na for example if you derive the capital reserve you can directly debit that capital reserve account do you know the reason is sir in the second entry at the time of incorporation of assets and liabilities pc is less than nav if you derive the capital reserve if you wrote the goodwill right now you can set off capital reserve with goodwill you know capital loss you can set off with capital profit so that's why capital reserve is set off with goodwill means again you will pass one more entry that is capital reserve to goodwill account why you are recording the goodwill why you are cancelling again on behalf of doing that double time you can directly make it debit the capital reserve what my point is here if the pc is less than nav situation is there capital reserve already exist then on behalf of making debit the goodwill account you can directly debit the capital reserve itself no 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 sir in the second entry you are deriving the goodwill account then you can again debit the goodwill account that is the point i am mentioning so ultimately if unrealized profit lying in the closing stock exist then the entry is goodwill or capital reserve account that are to stock reserve account sir when i should need to debit the goodwill when i should need to debit the capital reserve i already explained if you are already having certain capital reserve balance you can directly debit the capital reserve if you are not having the capital reserve balance then you can debit with goodwill account then how you should need to calculate the stock reserve also i explained through the illustration next which is the last situation which is with respect to the liquidation expenses adjustment please all of you concentrate this also might included in the problems uh you know guys this chapter is very much lengthy chapter i'm giving my best efforts to explain each and everything you should also listen uh by with with lot of patience and by paying lot of attention as well okay concentrate liquidation expenses selling company incurred sir in generally actually which company is going to be liquidated selling company right selling company incurred their own expenses nobody is reimbursed selling company the liquidation expenses are belongs to the selling company selling company incurred their own expenses then what is the general entry sir then in the books of the purchasing company there is no entry guys you know because such liquidation expenditure is not at all relevant for purchasing company such liquidation expenses are belongs to the selling company we already done if you really remember the entry is liquidation expenses to cash and liquidation expenditure should be closed and transfer to realization then the entry is realization to cash do you remember tell me guys we already done with that where it is there just a moment so for realization expenses the entry liquidation to cash and realization to liquidation expenses then liquidation liquidation cross with another then the entry is realization account it are to cash account then the same entry we are passing here then the same entry we are passing here what is that realization account it are to cash account is it okay all of you fine sir if the liquidation expenses incurred by the selling company but such expenditure will be reimbursed by the purchasing company at later point of time that means first those are incurred by selling company at later point of time those are reimbursed by purchasing company then in the books of the selling company what is the general entry sir first incurred by selling company first right so to cash anyway the credit component is cash it need to recover such amount from the purchasing company that's why purchasing company is the data entry purchasing company account data to cash account this is at the time of incurring expenses by selling company at later point of time selling company will be received from the purchasing company as a reimbursement now at later point of time at the time of getting the reimbursement the entry is cash account data to purchasing company to be frankly speaking there is no impact because one entry is purchasing company to cash another entry is cash account data to purchasing company but you should need to write both the entries because both are happened at different intervals different point of time you need to record purchasing company to cash as well as cash to purchasing company sir in the books of purchasing company what is the general entry sir whatever the amount you are paying in excess of pc sorry in excess of nav you are getting this is also you can treat like as a pc if pc is more than nav which is nothing but goodwill which is a capital loss you are paying the cash for the purpose of liquidation expenses of the selling company which is a capital loss to you you can debit the goodwill here also to reduce the stock we are making the debit the goodwill right because which is a loss to you the loss you are making the debit to the goodwill by paying the liquidation expenses which related to the selling company which is lost to you again you are making the debit the goodwill account therefore goodwill account data to cash account is the general entry next directly incurred by the purchasing company 
on behalf of the selling company. Now, purchasing company is not at all interfering. That's sorry. Selling company is not at all interfering. These expenditure are directly incurred by the purchasing company. That's why in the books of selling company, no entry. But in the books of purchasing company, the same entry they will pass. That is goodwill account at R2 cash account. If entry will come in the books of purchasing company, the entry is same guys. Goodwill to cash or goodwill to cash. But if it is in the books of the selling company, if those are incurred by the selling company, entry is realization to cash. But if those are reimbursed by the purchasing company, it will pass the entry purchasing company to cash and cash to purchasing company. Those points you need to remember. This is with respect to liquidation companies as well. So hope I discussed all things. Sir, what are the different issues you discussed from the initial stage, sir? Through mind map, let us check quickly, guys. In marathon, again, I am telling the mind map quickly. Sir, reconstruction in the process of reconstruction of financial statements, Internal reconstruction is possible. External reconstruction is possible. In case of internal reconstruction, there is no liquidation of company. But in case of external reconstruction, liquidation of company is possible. Sir, in case of internal reconstruction, reduction of capital is there. Section 61 and 66 of Companies Act 2013 is going to deal with internal reconstruction. Section 232, along with accounting standard 14, we are dealing the external reconstruction. One of the classic example for external reconstruction, I given it as amalgamation in the nature of merger. In the chapter amalgamation, we are going to deal totally three concepts. One is amalgamation. One new company is incorporated, two or more companies are liquidated. In case of absorption, an existing company will take over another existing company. And one more thing I discussed, which is external reconstruction. In case of external reconstruction, a new company is incorporated to take over the existing company. The existing company is suffering from the losses. That is the reason why the external reconstruction I told you, which is the classic example for amalgamation in the nature of merger. In case of merger, what happened? The new company incorporated is to take over all the assets and all the liabilities. All the assets and liabilities should be taken over at book value. All the shareholders of the selling company would become the shareholders of the purchasing company. And the PC should be paid in the form of fully paid up equity shares only. All such things are happened in case of external reconstruction also. That's why external reconstruction I told you, which is a classic example for amalgamation in the nature of merger. Okay, just leave it. Then next, coming to types of amalgamation in the nature of merger, in the nature of purchase. In the nature of merger, the method of accounting is pooling of interest method. In the case of merger, which is the method of accounting is purchase method. When which is known as pooling of interest, all assets and liabilities should be taken over by the purchasing company. All are taken over at book value. PC should be in the form of fully paid up equity shares. Shareholders holding 90% share capital of the selling company should become the shareholders of the purchasing company after amalgamation. The same business should be continued by the purchasing company after takeover. If any one of the condition violated, then which is the purchase method. Then coming to the PC calculation, what exactly the meaning of purchase consideration as per accounting standard 14 amount payable to the shareholders of the selling company alone treated as the purchase consideration. So the method of PC either under lump sum method, either under net payments method, either under NAV method, either in case of intrinsic value method, lump sum is nothing but ad hoc consideration, which is fixed amount. In case of net payments method, method of PC is amount payable to equity shareholders, amount payable to preference shareholders. If you make the consolidated amount, which is nothing but PC under rent payments method. In case of NAV method, assets taken over at the rate of agreed value, less liabilities taken over at the rate of agreed value. Value, the difference itself is NAV, which is equal to the PC. In case of intrinsic value method, number of equity shares in the selling company multiplied with intrinsic value per share in the selling company. But we told you two different issues. If PC is recorded at issue price, this is the method of calculation of the PC. But the, if the same PC is recorded at par value, then first you need to calculate number of shares issued as PC. It should be multiplied with face value. You will get PC recorded at par value. Am I right? Next, accounting treatment in the books of selling company, AS14 doesn't applicable, gap is applicable. Five-step approach. What are the different five-step approach, guys? Step number one, dismantling of balance sheet. Step number two, PC due. Step number three, PC received. Step number four, PC distribute among the various parties. Step number five, final settlement among the equity shareholders. In case of dismantling of balance sheet, all the assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book values, which are not taken over separately open. Equity share capital, reserves and surplus, Fixed CSS asset should be closed and transferred to equity shareholders account. Preference share capital should be closed and transferred to preference shareholders account. Dispanding over. Step number two, PC due. In working note, first you should need to calculate the PC. Then you should pass the entry purchasing company account data to realization account. Then coming to the PC due. What is the entry for, sorry, coming for the uh, entry for PC receipt. What is the entry for PC receipt? You may receive cash. You may receive preference shares of purchasing company. You may receive equity shares of purchasing company. You may receive debentures of purchasing company to purchasing company account. Step number four. Then if any of the assets which are not taken over by the purchasing company exist first realize in the outside market, any profit or loss you are deriving, you can make it transfer to the realization account. Now the PC amount along with the existing resources of the cash, you can distribute in the particular order. First liquidation expenses, next security creators, next unsecured creators. Then 
preference shareholders and finally equity shareholders during this process if you derive any profit or loss again transfer to the realization account now after making all these settlements and before making settlement to the equity shareholders first close the realization account find the realization profit or loss make it transfer to equity shareholders account with the available resources just to make it transfer to the equity shareholders if you are having cash if you are having equity shares of purchasing company just to make it transfer to the equity shareholders by passing the entry equity shareholders account it are to cash to equity shares of the purchasing company then automatically all accounts got closed in the books of selling company sir one point here i want to reveal whether the amalgamation in the nature of purchase whether the amalgamation in the nature of merger the accounting treatment doesn't change in the books of selling company but coming to the accounting treatment in the books of purchasing company it may be purchase method or it may be pooling of interest method the difference in, bet in between purchase and pooling of interest method is while comparing pc with nav pc is more than nav goodwill if pc is less than nav capital reserve and one more thing in case of purchase method reserves and surplus of the selling company would not be taken over by the purchasing company we need to maintain the statute reserves of the selling company to comply the statute by passing the entry amalgamation adjustment account it after statute reserve account but coming to the pooling of interest method directly you can compare pc with share capital of the selling company if pc is greater than the share capital of the selling company the loss you can set off with res free reserves and surplus of the transfer company after take over of free reserves and surplus of the transfer company sorry transfer of company if pc is less than the share capital of the selling company which is a profit situation the profit you can make it transfer to the capital reserve special adjustment i told you inter company owing trade payables to trade receivables stock reserve goodwill or capital reserve to stock reserve liquidation expenses just now we discussed it through a special chart uh, which is sir if such liquidation expenditure incurred only by the selling company then realization to cash then in the books of purchasing company no entry initially incurred by selling company later reimbursed by the purchasing company purchasing company to cash and cash to purchasing company in the books of purchasing company goodwill to cash if those are directly incurred by the purchasing company itself there is no entry in the selling company in the books of purchasing company the same entry goodwill to cash that's it guys okay i'll do one thing uh, we can consider one problem for better discussion guys total total we, we may try to consider the two problems one we will complete it based on amalgamation in the nature of purchase and another one is amalgamation in the nature of merger then we can uh, liquidate the topic or liquidate the chapter amalgamation now all of you please come to the problems guys mm. let me consider problem number one for the discussion please all of you concentrate so little bit speedy manner i want to discuss the problems we already spent much time okay just a moment yeah right guys as i told you we are going to see total two problems one problem is based on amalgamation in the nature of purchase another problem is based on amalgamation in the nature of merger please all of you concentrate things related to problem number one in very quick manner we are going to discuss i don't want to spend much time on calculation part i only focus on the conceptual issues why limited acquires the business of jet limited which is a purchasing company which is a selling company whose balance sheet as at 31st march 2011 is as under selling company balance sheet information is given under shareholders funds share capital note number 1 equity share capital is given at 8 lakhs 6 percent is preference share capital is given at 4 lakhs the total amount is 12 lakhs next coming to reserves and surplus under note number 2 capital reserve is there pnl is there workman compensation reserve is given at 8000 but in bracket clearly mentioned that expected liability is 5000 what is the meaning of that workman compensation reserve right now they are treating reserve as only 3000 reserve as 3000 what about remaining 5000 just now they are treating it as liability provision expected liability means reserve they are they are treating it as a provision right now so 5000 now it is categorized as a liability it is not treated as a reserve and one more thing i want to tell here workman compensation reserve is a statutory reserve but the statute reserve balance is now 3000 but not 8000 remaining 5000 is a liability that is the meaning of that next come above under long term borrowings i think so debentures are there 6% debentures are given next what about the remaining li current liabilities trade payable given other current liabilities given which is interest payable on debentures here debentures are there not 2 lakh out of the 2 lakh 12000 is the outstanding interest on debentures okay under assets ppe is there intangible assets are there pp land and building plant and machinery intangible assets goodwill and patents are given coming to current liabilities 
what are the different current sorry coming to current assets what are the different current assets are given inventory trade receivable cash and cash equivalent let me read the further information why limited was to take over all assets except cash by seeing this item we can easily identify that amalgamation is in the nature of purchase and the liabilities except for interest due on debentures except for outstanding interest remaining all liabilities also taken over by purchasing company and to pay the following amounts rupees 2 lakhs face value 7 percent debentures 100 rupees each in purchasing company for the existing debentures in selling company for the purpose each debenture of y limited is to be treated as worth rupees 105 this is amount payable to the debenture holders of the selling company which is not form part of pc amount payable to the debenture holders of the selling company is not form part of pc okay this is amount payable to debenture holders of the selling company for each preference share in the selling company rupees 10 in cash and one nine percent preference share of 100 rupees each in purchasing company we are going to pay now in selling company how many number of preference shares are there let us have a look 4 lakhs divided by 100 means 4000 preference shares are there that is in the form of cash 4000 into 10 that is in the form of cash in the form of preference share for each preference shareholder of selling company will get one nine percent preference share of the purchasing company that we are issuing 4000 preference shares each preference share is at 100 okay 4000 into 10 which is 40000 4000 into 100 which is 4 lakhs so total amount payable to preference shareholders is 4 lakh 40000 okay next come to point number c for each equity share in selling company 20 rupees in cash and one equity share in purchasing company of rupees 100 each having the market value of 140 now let us have a look how many number of existing equity shares are there in the books of selling company? 8 lakhs, face value 100 means 8,000 equity shares are there. 8,000 into 20 rupees in the form of cash, 8,000 into 20, which is equal to 1,60,000. Am I right, guys? Next, we are issuing one equity share for every equity share in the selling company. That is 8,000 equity shares we are going to issue. But each equity share market value is at 140. Now, in the form of equity shares, we are going to issue is 11,20,000. Now, this is in the form of equity shares. The total 1,60 plus 11,20, how much it is? The total is 12,80,000. The total is 12,80,000. Now, if you observe, Amount payable to preference shareholders of the selling company is 4,40,000. Amount payable to equity shareholders of the selling company is 12,80,000. Total amount of the PC in the form of net payments method. By reading the information given in the problem, if you are able to ascertain amount payable to the equity shareholders and amount payable to the preference shareholders, then the method of PC is net payments method. What is the total amount of PC? 12,80 plus 4,40,000 which is 17,20,000 is the amount of PC. Next, fine. Expense of liquidation of the selling company are to be reimbursed by the purchasing company to the extent of 10,000, but the actual expense amounted to 12,500. Out of this 12,500, 2,500 incurred and paid by the selling company, but 10,000 are reimbursed by the purchasing company. If 2,500 incurred and paid by the selling company, then what is the general entry? Realization to cash. That is the entry. Regarding the 10,000, what is the general entry? Purchasing company. That is purchasing company is Y limited. Y limited to cash and cash to Y limited. Tell me guys, two entries we need to pass. Purchasing company to cash and cash account data to purchasing company, which is at 10,000, which is at 2.5,000. That is 2.5K. Next. Y limited, that is purchasing company valued land and buildings at 5,50,000, plant and machinery at 6,50,000, and patents at 20,000 of Z limited for the purpose of amalgamation. These are agreed values. Except these figures, remaining all assets and liabilities are taken over at book values only. That is the meaning, that is the meaning of the given sentence. Now, first let me look, about, look into requirements. Calculate PC. PC already over. 
net payments 17 lakh 20 thousand just i calculated am i right but you should need to present in uh, you you need to make it present in the proper manner uh, how it should need to be presented i will show through my power notes next provide journal entries in the books of vendor company that is selling company and also provide the closing ledgers okay we will directly work out the ledgers you can automatically know the entries provide journal entries in the books of purchasing company as well we will look both of these through our power notes guides concentrate all of you so total three requirements one is pc another one is journal entries in the books of selling company another one is journal entries in the books of purchasing company and type of amalgamation is only relevant in the books of purchasing company that is type of amalgamation is amalgamation in the nature of purchase method am i right we already work out the pc but how it should need to be presented we can see through our power notes calculation of pc net payments method net payments method how it should need to be presented particular amounts amount payable to equity shareholders in the form of cash how much in the form of equity shares how much amount payable to preference shareholders in the form of cash how much in the form of preference shares is how much then the total amount of pc is 17 lakh 20 thousand now coming to the books of z limited in the books of z limited in the books of selling company five step approach we need to follow five step approach we need to follow step number one dismantling of balance sheet after seeing the balance sheet information what you should need to do assets and liabilities which are taken over by the purchasing company should be closed and transferred to realization account at book values all assets are taken over except cash all liabilities are taken over except interest payable on debentures it is clearly given in the problem information so all assets except cash all liabilities except outstanding interest you can simply make it transfer to realization land and building transfer plant and machinery transfer 6% debentures transferred, trade payables transferred. But cash not taken over, separately opened. Outstanding interest on debentures not taken over, separately opened. Next issue is, come here. Open, preference shareholder separately, equity shareholder separately. Equity share capital, reserves and surplus. You can make it transfer to the equity shareholder's account. Preference share capital, you can make it transfer to preference shareholder's account. So under preference shareholder by preference share capital under equity shareholder equity share capital reserves and surplus these all are reserves and surplus but one thing you should need to focus here we already decided that out of the reserves and surplus workman compensation reserve is only 3000 remaining 5000 is liability this liability is also taken over by purchasing company because except outstanding interest every liability is taken over that's why workman compensation liability to the extent of 5000 transfer to the realization that is under realization account by workman compensation liability here actually uh, under the joining the things actually we missed out just a second i'll open this then you will get the full picture just a moment yeah now you are getting the full picture please concentrate so these all are these all are assets and the liabilities is 6% debenture trade payable and workman compensation liability of 5,000 also taken over. Cash opened by putting a opening balance and preference shareholders transferred, equity shareholder, equity share capital, capital reserve, PNL, workman compensation reserve only for 3,000. It's not 8,000, only 3,000 is reserve. Remaining 5,000 liability taken over by the purchasing company, that's why transfer to realization. Now come back, I love you. Still, we are in step number one share capital transfer to the respective shareholders reserves and surplus transfer to equity shareholders long-term borrowings trade payable except interest payable on debentures transfer to realization but out of the reserves and surplus workman compensation reserve of 5000 transfer to realization as a liability under assets ppe intangible asset inventory trade receivables except cash and cash equivalent transfer to realization cash account open separately outstanding interest on debentures open separately dismantling of balance sheet is over coming to step number two PC due. What is the entry? Purchasing company accounted to realization. In realization by purchasing company, that is by Y Limited at the rate of purchase consideration. We already calculated the PC, which is 17,20,000. In realization by Y Limited, then Y Limited to realization. Coming to step number three, PC received. In the form of PC, what you are total receiving? Cash of 2 lakhs. Equity shares of purchasing company, you are getting 11,20,000. 
preference shares of the purchasing company you are getting 4 lakhs what is the entry cash account debit or equity shares of purchasing company account debit or preference shares of purchasing company account debit or two purchasing company that is two y limited now you can go to the y limited account first in y limited by cash 2 lakhs by equity shares of y limited by 6% preference shares of y limited 4 lakhs is it okay all of you now in the respect to account simultaneous posting also you should need to give if under y limited by cash then in cash account in cash account to y limited as well as simultaneously you can also open equity shares of y limited and 6% preference shares of y limited in the respect to accounts equity shares of y limited to y limited 6% preference shares of y limited to y limited is it okay next pc receipt is over now you can come to step number 4 pc distribution but before distribution of pc you can check that any of the particular asset is not taken over by the purchasing company is available the only one of the asset is not taken over by the purchasing company is cash which is already in realized form that's why no worries now along with the pc amount and the available resources you can make it pay in the particular order the first order is liquidation expenses it is clearly given a point with respect to, to the liquidation expenses out of the 12500 2500 incurred on their own 10000 is reimbursed by the purchasing company entry realization account debit or to cash account and another entry is y limited to cash account and a, and a cash account debit or to y limited now realization to cash 2500 whether it is posted or not let us have a look realization account debit or to cash liquidation expenses over then y limited to cash and cash to y limited y limited to cash y limited to cash and in cash by limit by y limited and another one uh, cash account debit to y limited another entry that's why in y limited by cash one is inflow another one is outflow this is outflow this is inflow this is the impact of reimbursement do you agree next in the order of making payment the next entry will be i should need to make payment to the secured creditors is there any secured creditor which is not taken over by the purchasing company no there is only one liability which is not taken over by the purchasing company which is interest payable on debentures now you can pay interest payable on debentures go to outstanding interest on debentures to cash 12000 simultaneous posting also you can give in the cash account that is in cash account by outstanding interest is it okay to all of you next next in the order of making payment you should need to make payment to the preference shareholders how much amount you are going to pay to the preference shareholders cash 40000 in the form of preference shares 4 lakhs that's why go to the preference shareholders give the cash of 40000 give 6% as preference shares of y limited also 4 lakhs in the respect to other accounts also you can give the simultaneous posting in cash by preference shareholders and in 6% as preference shares of y limited by preference shareholders now if you observe here preference shareholder liability is at preference shareholders liability is at 4 lakh but you paid 4 lakh 40000 which is the last situation if any profit or loss arises during the discharging of liabilities of the preference shareholders the profit or loss you can make it transfer to realization then in preference shareholders by realization then in realization to preference shareholders that is the distribution of pc among the various parties then go to the last step step number 5 final settlement to the equity shareholders before making final settlement to the equity shareholders close the realization account i am getting a profit of 382500 then pass the entry realization to equity shareholders then in equity shareholders by realization now to pay make payment to the equity shareholders as a final settlement what you are having out of the pc i am having the equity shares of y limited at the rate of 1120000 and the remaining cash availability was remaining cash availability was 215500 this 215500 i should need to make payment to equity shareholders as well as equity shares of y limited should also need to make payment to the equity shareholders then in equity shareholders account the entry is to cash to equity shareholders of y limited then cash account closed equity shares of y limited account closed then equity shareholders account also got closed if you check all the ledger accounts what you opened are automatically closed this is the closure of books of accounts of selling company sir in very quick manner i discussed i am not focusing anything on the computation issues next coming to the last one what is that general entries in the books of purchasing company under purchase method first and foremost entry business purchase to the liquidator of selling company at the rate of pc which is 17 lakh 20000 second entry incorporation of assets and liabilities what are the different assets and liabilities you are taken over here those are exist clearly land and building plant and machinery goodwill patents inventory trade receivables all are taken over 
all are clearly incorporated but not at book value at the rate of agreed value if you observe in the problem it is clearly given that agreed value are different for certain assets if you take the land and building 5.5 plant and machinery at 6.5 and patents are 20000 so 5.5 6.5 and 20000 remaining assets are same as like the book values if you check inventory and trade receivables those are considered at book values only inventory and trade receivable 1.5 1.8 i considered at 1.5 1.8 only do we agree next sir along with that goodwill also i am taken over intangible asset one of the asset is goodwill that goodwill is 240000 sir but why you wrote the goodwill at 55000 sir that is different story please concentrate all of you if goodwill of the selling company is also taken over by the purchasing company no need to incorporate goodwill directly because you can derive the goodwill the total goodwill while comparing with pc with nav na in that goodwill the goodwill which is taken over from the purchasing company was already included what my conclusion is if purchasing company is taken over goodwill of the selling company then no need to incorporate separately it will got incorporated automatically at the time of comparison of pc with nav that is the reason why now i am not incorporating that is the reason why i am not incorporating right now at the time of comparison of pc with nav it got incorporated that means out of this 5 lakh 5000 this goodwill of 2 lakh 40000 is also there for example if you are incorporating 2 lakh 40000 then at the time of comparing pc with nav one more time you need to incorporate the excess pc over nav double time we may not right now huh? That is the reason why the goodwill of the selling company I not incorporated at the primary stage. At the time of comparing the PC with NAV, the goodwill what you are getting, which is inclusive of the goodwill you are taken from the selling company. Hope you get it. Just this is a procedural issue, not a special issue. In the same way, you are incorporating the liabilities. Provision for workman compensation liability, 6% debentures of Jet Limited and the trade payables. Sir, 6% debentures of the selling company you are incorporating at agreed value not at book value because in point number one it is clearly given that we are taken over the debentures of the selling company two lakh seven percent debentures of our company debentures we are making payment to the debentures of the selling company for that purpose each debenture is treated as 105 that means two lakhs into 105 percentage that is two lakh ten thousand at the rate of two lakh ten thousand we are acquiring the debentures of the selling company that's why six percent debentures of the selling company we are acquired at the acquisition price you should not consider at the book value of the two lakhs you should consider at the rate of agreed value of the two lakh ten thousand remaining all our book value now assets incorporated agreed value to liabilities incorporated at agreed value then you need to cancel business purchase to business purchase now you can compare pc with nav purchase consideration we already know 17 lakh 20 thousand total of the assets excluding goodwill minus the total of the liabilities then you are getting nav is at 12 lakh 15 thousand if you want you can make it calculate you will get 12 lakh 15 thousand here pc is greater than nav the difference is the goodwill now you are incorporated the goodwill note if selling company having goodwill which is taken over by the purchasing company, then no need to incorporate separately in the purchasing company books. It will be incorporated automatically at the time of comparing PC with NAV. The same fact I already told you, if it may come across in the examination, you can apply the same technique. Then the final settlement to the liquidator, liquidator of Z Limited account that are 17 lakh 20 thousand. Cash you are paying in the form of 2 lakhs, equity shares 8 lakhs, preference shares 4 lakhs, securities premium is 3 lakh 20 thousand. What is the securities premium, sir? If you observe the PC calculation here, you are paying in the form of equity shares at the rate of 140. Sir, face value is 100, but you are paying excess at 40, right? That 40 is the securities premium, that is 8,000 into 40, which is 3 lakh 20 thousand is the securities premium. You need to check face value is how much premium is how much. Then this six percentage debentures of Jet Limited, you are issuing your own company debentures at the rate of face value, na? Now, 6% debentures of Jet Limited, you need to cancel 2 lakh 10,000. You are issuing your own company debentures at 2 7 percentage debentures. That is the meaning of the point number one. You are issuing your own company debentures of 7 percent debentures, that is 2 7 percentage debentures, 2 lakhs. Excess amount you are paying, you can make it transfer to the premium, which is 10,000. Am I right, guys? Next. What is this goodwill to cash share? This is 
liquidation expenses reimbursed liquidation expenses reimbursed to the selling company in the books of purchasing company what is the entry goodwill accounted or to cash account tell me guys here itself is there liquidation expenses chart liquidation expenses if those are reimbursed by the purchasing company to the selling company in the books of the purchasing company entry goodwill to cash out of 12500 only 10000 only we are going to reimburse for that i passed the entry goodwill accounted or to cash account such a simple accounting treatment once if you have a good command on the content you can easily write the answer uh, next one more problem i just i want to take up only the outline only i will tell you not uh, in depth just to outline that is amalgamation in the nature of merger this problem we seen amalgamation in the nature of purchase na we are going to see uh, in point of view of amalgamation in the nature of merger please all of you come to problem number 9 uh, right come to problem number 9 what is the issue consider the following summarized balance sheets of x limited and y limited land and building plant and machinery furniture and fittings investments inventory trade receivables and cash at bank is given next here equity share capital preference share capital general reserve export profit reserve is a statutory reserve investment allowance reserve is a statutory reserve sir how you can identify a reserve is a statutory reserve or other than statutory reserve simply if you know a particular reserve already in multiple chapters which is not a statutory reserve which is unknown reserves or statutory reserves like this you can conclude because we don't know all the statutes right at that particular point of time so which reserve need to be maintained as per which statute we, we don't know that's why all the unknown reserves you can simply put it as a statutory reserve profit and loss account given debentures given trade payables given other current liabilities given x limited take over the y limited x limited is a purchasing company y limited is a selling company okay on 1st april 2011 x limited discharged the purchase consideration as below issued 3 lakh 50000 equity shares of rupees 10 each at par to the equity shareholders of y limited amount payable in the form of equity shares is 3 lakh 50000 into 10 which is 35 lakhs issued 15 percentage preference shares of rupees 100 each to discharge the preference shareholders of y limited at 10 percentage premium if you consider the preference share capital in the books of y limited which is at 17 lakhs actually am i right rupees in rupees in thousands which is 17 lakhs for this 17 lakhs we are discharging at 10 percentage premium means 17 lakhs into 110 percentage which is nothing but 18 lakhs 70000 amount to payable to preference shareholders is 18 lakhs 70000 amount to payable to equity shareholders is 35 lakhs what is the total amount of pc pc is under net payments method the total amount of pc is 35 plus 18.7 which is equal to 53 lakhs 70000 this is the amount of pc under net payments method fine what they require the debentures of y limited will be converted into equivalent number of debentures of the purchasing company the statutory reserves of y limited are to be maintained for two more years show the balance sheet of x limited after amalgamation on the assumption that the amalgamation is in the nature of merger i have only discussed this amalgamation in the nature of merger sir first if like this the problem is asked then you need to work out everything in the working notes sir if the amalgamation is in the nature of merger then what is the requirement you should need to do in the second entry the that is the only difference in the nature of purchase and in the nature of merger in the nature of merger in the second entry you should need to compare pc with the share capital of selling company what is the share capital of the selling company here come here all of you share capital of the selling company y limited is a share capital y limited is a selling company y limited share capital is 30 lakhs plus 17 lakhs which is 47 lakhs share capital of the selling company is 47 lakhs if pc which is nothing but nav which is nothing but nav if pc is greater than the share capital of the selling company which is the loss loss of how much 6 lakh 70000 that loss of 6 lakh 70000 you should need to be make it set off with free reserves free reserves of the purchasing company after take over free reserves of the selling company am i right now how it should need to be adjusted let us have a look through my power notes please all of you come to problem number Nine, I think so. Problem is problem number nine. Correct? Fine. PC I work out first, which is coming as fifty three lakh seventy thousand. Now comparison of between PC and share capital of the selling company. PC is fifty three lakh seventy thousand. Share capital of the selling company is forty seven lakhs. PC is greater than share capital of Y Limited. Loss of six lakh seventy thousand should be set off with free reserves. Am I right? That is the only difference. Now directly I go with balance sheet. simple line by line addition of assets and liabilities why which is amalgamation in the nature of merger is it all assets taken over sir why not which is a merger is it all liabilities taken over sir 
Why not? It is a merger. Is it all assets and liabilities taken over at book values or agreed values? At book values only. That's why simple line by line addition of assets as well as liabilities. Okay, fine, sir. Then what about share capital, sir? That's quite easy. The share capital of the purchasing company existing is 50 plus 20 to 72 lakhs. We already know. That is coming to the share capital. Existing equity share capital is 50 lakhs. In the form of PC, we are paying equity shares 35 lakhs. If you want, you can check here. In the form of equity shares, we are paying 35 lakhs. In the form of preference shares, we are paying 18 lakhs 70,000. Existing preference shares 22 lakhs, we are paying 18 lakhs 70,000 in the form of PC. Now the total share capital is 125 lakhs 70,000. You can make it represent that 125 lakhs 70,000. Next, come to reserves and surplus, which is the crucial role. Which, which plays the crucial role in case of merger. Please allow you come to reserves and surplus, guys. One by one. First, statutory reserve. Because in case of merger, both the reserves and surplus of selling company and purchasing company, all together, we can make it present in the books of purchasing company. But if it is in the case of purchase, we can only consider the reserves and surplus of the selling company, the reserves and surplus of the purchasing company, along with statutory reserves of the selling company by passing the amalgamation adjustment account. But here, no need to pass the amalgamation adjustment account. The reserves and surplus of the selling company should automatically become the reserves and surplus of the purchasing company in case of merger. So that's why first consider the statutory reserves, 3 lakhs plus 2 lakhs, 5 lakhs, and 1 lakh is the investment elements reserve. Here, 5 lakhs, is the export profit reserve and one lakh is the investment elements reserve. Next, come to the general reserve. Existing general reserve five lakhs plus two lakh fifty thousand is the selling company. So total will be the seven lakh fifty thousand. Five lakhs plus two lakh fifty thousand total will be the here the same thing is given, which is total will be the seven lakh fifty thousand. Now we got last now. Loss due to comparison of PC with share capital of the selling company. The last we may set off with free reserves of the purchasing company after taking over free reserves of the selling company. Now we have the enough 7,50,000 balance. You can set off the 6,70,000. Still, you are getting the general reserve of 80,000. Then the remaining balance is profit and loss account. You can simply add it 7,50 plus 5 lakhs, which is 12,50,000. This is the impact of merger, guys. Here, the impact of merger is there. You can set off the loss occurred due to comparison of PC with share capital of the selling company. Make set off with free reserves of the purchasing company after taking over of free reserves of selling company. Now you can make it total of the free reserves, which got the 19 lakh 30,000. You can just simply make it present here. Remaining all are no need to think simple line by line addition. There is nothing line by line addition, line by line addition, line by line addition. That's it. So if the question asked in the examination for merger, then your work burden is very much less. The only point you should need to do is you should compare PC with share capital of the selling company. Last, you may set off with free reserves of the purchasing company after taking over of free reserves of the selling company. If it is a profit, you can directly transfer to the capital reserve. Simple line by line addition of assets, liabilities, including the reserves and surplus. You know how much share capital you should need to work out. Existing share capital of the purchasing company plus shares issued in the form of PC, either in the form of equity shares, in the form of preference shares, you should need to add to the respective accounts. Then automatically balance sheet of the merger is over. That's it, guys. With this, the chapter amalgamation, I'm officially liquidating. Now we are in the chapter internal reconstruction. At the time of discussing the chapter amalgamation, we already gave a formal introduction to internal reconstruction as well. But here we are going to discuss the internal reconstruction in detailed manner. You know, when a company is going to conduct the internal reconstruction process, if the company is suffering from huge losses since past few years, the company financial statements are not depicting true fixture due to overvaluation of assets, due to overvaluation of assets, and due to occurrence of certain unrepresented assets like intangible assets, there may be a chance of overvaluation of net worth. To show such financial statements, in true and fair view, the company can go for or the company can opt for internal reconstruction procedure. During the process of internal reconstruction, what activities conducted by such company? There may be revaluation of assets because our objective is depicting true picture of the existing assets and liabilities and a reassessment of liabilities. 
reduction in paid up value because our objective is we need to nullify the existing debit balance under the profit and loss account through profit derived from the process of internal reconstruction that is the a major objective of conducting the internal reconstruction proceedings by a company so that's why if any of the equity shares or the preference shares are exist under the shareholders fund then we need to make negotiation with such shareholders to decrease their paid up value maybe the decrease in paid up value may occur in different ways that is certain point of times they may sacrifice to the extent of certain portion of their paid up value then the company may derive profits or maybe without making the sacrifice also the company can decrease the paid up value of the shareholder that is by making payment to the extent of the decrease made in the paid up value do you understand or maybe sometimes if any partly paid up shares are there they can decrease the paid up value by conversion of partly paid up shares into fully paid up shares do you understand in detail manner i am going to discuss below the reduction in paid up value may occur in generally in three ways number 1 through sacrifice made by the shareholder then which creates profit to the company that profit is ultimately useful or used by the company to knock off the pnl account debit balance or in another way to make payment to the existing shareholders to the extent of decrease in the paid up value that is another option one more option is if partly paid up equity shares are there then the company is decided to decrease the paid up value by converting the partly paid up shares into fully paid up shares okay so if you can't appreciate don't bother in below just we are try to explain each and everything in detailed manner next and one of the major important activity of internal reconstruction is making compounding activities or making negotiation activities with various parties of the company like creditors debenture holders bankers of the company due to making such negotiations with such parties if the parties are ready to sacrifice to the extent of the sacrifice made by such parties will create profits to the company again such profits are useful to set off the profit and loss account debit balance and the unrepresented assets like intangible assets and any other asset if, if at all exist i hope you understand uh, why in generally company is going for the internal reconstruction process now the entire restructuring of the financial statements is going to occur without liquidation of the existing company sir practically can you please elaborate how the internal reconstruction procedure is going to be occur as per company act 2013 how it is going to occur before a company start the proceedings of internal reconstruction first the company management or the board of directors will discuss about a scheme scheme means what are all the different activities we are going to conduct during this internal reconstruction process what are the various compounding activities we can made up to which value we can decrease the existing paid up value of the shareholders each and every issue they will going to discuss then after large and a huge discussion among the board of directors then they may derive certain scheme and such a scheme should be available in front of the various parties like equity shareholders preference shareholders creditors debentures and all other loan parties they should need to take the approval of each and every party after taking approval from all such stakeholders then the company should sent such a scheme the final scheme to the national company law tribunal so in the chapter amalgamation itself we clearly discussed that for the purpose of conducting the external reconstruction no court approval is mandatory but for the purpose of conducting the procedure of internal reconstruction court approval is mandatory so that's why the scheme is ultimately sent to the nclt once the nclt provided approval for the scheme nclt will visualize each and every provision of that scheme 
and if it is bet best interest of each and every stakeholder then nclt will approve such scheme after approval of such scheme then the company will start conducting the reconstruction procedures or the reconstruction activities so in the as per the provisions specified in the ters scheme then after completion of internal reconstruction procedure then the company will prepare the financial statements by adding the word and a reduced if court make an order if the nclt make an order that after completion of internal reconstruction procedure you should need to add the word and reduced then the company should need to add the word and reduced at the time of preparation of their balance sheet after completion of internal reconstruction procedure this is the practical way of conducting the internal reconstruction procedure as per the companies act 2013 sir then what are the different procedural issues we need to adopt during the process of internal reconstruction sir or i can put it as methods of internal reconstruction what are the different methods available for the process of internal reconstruction total in our syllabus total five different methods were covered apart from these so many other methods are av also available but according to our syllabus we will only try to cover these many methods alteration of share capital variation of shareholders rights reduction of share capital compromise or arrangement and the surrender of shares if these five methods if you will try to cover then you can able to complete any problem uh, which is based on the internal reconstruction chapter let us have a look one by one method through our power notes now all of you please come to alteration of share capital as per the section 61 of companies act 2013 a company can alter their capital class if you know in memorandum of association of a company you may seen in the paper company line group 1 there are various classes name class registered office class liability class one of the class is capital class as well sir can you alter the memorandum of association why not we can alter the memorandum of association but there is a particular procedure you need to be adopted to alter the memorandum of association the same procedure also we need to adopt in case of alteration of share capital as well that is the power we have in the articles of association to alter such capital class the alteration of memorandum of association power should be there in the articles of association and the company will conduct a general meeting and in such general meeting the shareholder should pass a ordinary resolution i mean more than 50 percentage of the existing shareholder in that meeting should accept for such alteration then only the company can go for alteration of share capital sir in case of alteration of share capital during the process of internal reconstruction what will what will be going sir there may be increase in authorized capital there is no change in the paid up capital but during the process of internal reconstruction if there is any chance of issuing further equity shares to the various parties in settlement then there is a chance of increase then there is a chance of increase in the total paid up capital in the future that's why before issue of such equity shares further first you are increasing your authorized share capital that is also one of the process of alteration of share capital but there is no change with respect to the accounting treatment at the time of presentation of financials just you are uh, putting the authorized share capital with increased figures that is the only change next subdivision or consolidation and vice versa what is the meaning of subdivision or consolidation if existing share is subdivided into numerous shares then which is known as subdivision of shares and if the existing shares are shrinked by making a consolidation then which is known as a consolidation of shares let me take one example for better understanding sir let us assume 10000 shares are in exist in existing mode each and every equity share face value is 100 and the total paid up value is 10000 into 100 which is 10 lakhs each equity share is subdivided into 10 shares so once the each equity share is subdivided into 10 shares then the total number of shares will become 1 lakh and the face value will become 10 rupees there is no change in the total paid up value 
the total paid up value will be again 10 lakhs only again 10 lakhs only but what is the change now the change is 1 lakh equity shares at the rate of 10 rupees each then what is the accounting treatment we need to be adopted at the time of subdivision now first you should need to cancel 100 rupees face value because now the face value is 10 rupees now you should need to credit 10 rupees face value without changing the total paid up capital that is equity share capital account at our 100 rupees face value to equity share capital account 10 rupees face value without changing the total paid up capital just you can simply make the presentation like this next in case of consolidation the same procedure you need to adopt in case of conversion of shares into the stock which is also form part of alteration of share capital alteration of share capital means not only a change in authorized share capital not only subdivision and consolidation alteration of share capital includes conversion of shares into stock as well first what is the meaning of stock sir you know share have a particular denomination share have a lowest denomination in the share capital lowest denomination in the share capital i mean below that we cannot we cannot denominate a particular share in the share capital that is nothing but share share is nothing but share in the share capital that is the lowest denomination in the share capital but stock doesn't have any denomination stock doesn't have any denomination i mean if you want you can issue 1 lakh worth of stock if you want you can issue 55000 worth of stock any of the denomination can be possible through the stock that is the major difference between share and stock and one more thing stock cannot be directly issued by the company to the shareholders in the primary market as like shares after issue of the shares if company wants they can convert the shares into the stock do you understand the company cannot directly issue stock to the stock into the primary market next sir is it rights uh, attached to the stockholders is it different from the shareholders no there is no difference there is no change in the voting rights there is no change in the dividend rights as like how the shareholders will get the dividend and voting rights in the same proportion stockholders will also get next sir can i convert partly paid up shares into the stock it is not possible if an existing share is fully paid up then only you can convert into the stock so till now i am not discussing anything with respect to the alteration of share capital just now i discussed what exactly the meaning of stock as per companies act 2013 now if the company want to decide to convert the shares into the stock then what is the general entry you should need to debit the share capital you should need to credit the stock if again company want to convert stock into the share you should need to debit the stock you should need to credit the share capital where i should need to represent such stock under the balance sheet you should need to represent such stock under still under shareholders funds only shareholders funds only it is shown under form part of shareholders fund only because for such shareholder they will get still they will get dividend as like equity shareholders only that's it guys <laughs> sir this is with respect to alteration of share capital first method now coming to the method number 2 variation of shareholders rights what is the meaning of variation of shareholders right you know shareholders in generally will get either a dividend rights or voting rights or any other as per the uh, companies act 2013 now if there is a change in the dividend right if there may be change in the dividend right during the process of internal reconstruction then what is the adjustment we need to give let us assume 10 percentage preference shares are converted into the 5 percentage preference shares which is a change in the dividend right then you should need to cancel the 10 percentage preference share capital then you should need to credit the 5 percentage preference share capital without impacting the total paid up capital then the entry is 10 percentage preference share capital accounted up to 5 percentage preference share capital and a cumulative to non-cumulative preference shares then you can debit the cumulative preference share capital and you can credit the non-cumulative preference share capital participative to non-participative preference share capital like this there may be a chance of 
change in variation of shareholders right with respect to, to dividend or with respect to, to voting or with respect to, to any other right like this you need to provide the accounting treatment in case of the method you followed that is in case of variation of shareholders right mechanism next come to the next method which is reduction of share capital as per section 66 of the companies act 2013 a company can opt for reduction of share capital but the company should take the approval from the national company law tribunal and it should pass the special resolution in the general meeting by the shareholders hope you know the special resolution special resolution means minimum three fourth of the existing members in the meeting should need to accept for such reduction sir what is the difference between alteration of share capital and reduction of share capital if you really observe in case of alteration of share capital there is no decrease in the paid up value there is increase in the authorized capital there is either subdivision or consolidation without impacting the total paid up value conversion of shares into the stock without touching the total paid up value but in case of the reduction of the share capital there may be a chance of decrease in the paid up value hope you understand that is the reason why here a national company law tribunal approval and special resolution is mandatory but here ordinary resolution and the power given in the articles of association is more than enough because there is no decrease in the paid up value come down sir the reduction of share capital may occur in three ways this one i already given a hint at the time of intro of this chapter in three ways first and foremost one conversion of partly paid up shares into fully paid up shares through reduction of unpaid capital let me give an example for better understanding sir number of existing shares are 1000 face value is 10 rupees paid up value is 7.5 rupees now what the company want to decide company want to convert partly paid up shares into fully paid up and the face value will also become right now 7.5 now there is a decrease in paid up value you know how maybe the paid up value is still 7.5 in future company is losing a right to ask excess of 2.5 from the shareholder then automatically the paid up value is going to be decreased in the future the paid up value may be in the future it will become 10 rupees but that right is sacrificed by the company during the process of internal reconstruction which is nothing but reduction of paid up value only company may not make any call in the future now conversion of partly paid up shares into fully paid up shares through reduction of unpaid capital through reduction of unpaid capital there is a reduction in unpaid capital there is no reduction in existing paid up value there is reduction in unpaid value now what is the general entry i need to follow sir here first you need to cancel the old face value equity share capital account at our old face value 10 rupees 1000 into 7.5 7500 to equity share capital you should need to credit the new paid up value which is 7.5 rupees that is 7.5 into 1000 7500 if you check there is no change in the total paid up capital but there is a change in the face value hope you understand next come to the second one reduction through payment made to the shareholders the, this is a pure reduction in the existing paid up value let me take one example number of existing shares are 1000 face value is 10 rupees paid up value is 10 rupees by making a payment of 2 rupees the paid up value is decreased to 8 rupees now equity share capital account at are 10 rupees face value first you should need to debit that is 1000 into 10 rupees total 10000 you can make payment of cash to the extent of 2 rupees 1000 into 2 which is 2000 now the paid up value of each equity share is converted to 8 rupees that is 2 equity share capital 8000 this is reduction through payment of cash next please all of you come to the last situation which is important situation number of times we will come across this situation while resolving the problems reduction through cancellation of existing paid up capital cancellation means the existing equity shareholder is ready to sacrifice to the extent of certain portion of existing paid up value such a reduction may happen in paid up value but not in face value that is one case the reduction may be in paid up value as well as face value as well as face value reduction in paid up value but not in face value 
reduction in paid up value as well as face value. What is the difference between the two different situations, sir? I'm going to explain through a small example. Please concentrate. Number of existing shares are 1000. Face value is 10 rupees. Paid up value is 10 rupees. Now what the situation is? Reduction in paid up value, but not in face value. The shareholder is ready to sacrifice to the extent of 2 rupees per share. Let us assume. Now, you, you are no need to reduce the fade up face value because there is no reduction in face value. Still, the face value is continued at 10 rupees. There is only reduction in paid up value to the extent of 2 rupees. That's why you can simply debit the equity share capital. If any sacrifice made by the shareholder, which creates profits to the company, to know the entire profits through inter internal reconstruction, any profit or any loss occurred during the process of internal reconstruction, we may make it transfer to reconstruction account or capital reduction account. The account is a temporary account. So to know the overall profit or losses occurred during the process of internal reconstruction, we are making transfer to a certain temporary account, which is either capital reduction account or reconstruction account, which is simply capital profit account. That's it. So equity share capital account data, you should need to debit. That is 1000 into 2 rupees sacrifice, 2000 and 2 reconstruction account, which is 2000. There is no change in the face value. Still, the face value is 10 rupees, but there is change in the paid up value, which is the paid up value is changed to 8 rupees. That is the meaning of that. Now, there is a reduction in paid up value as well as face value. Then what I should need to do? First of all, you should need to cancel the entire existing equity share capital of 10 rupees face value. That is equity share capital 10 rupees face value 1000 into 10 rupees, which is 10,000. Now, 2 rupees is sacrificed, right? That is 1000 into 2000. You can make it transfer to capital reduction account or reconstruction account. Now, the new equity share face value is 8 rupees as well as paid up value also 8 rupees. There, now, you can make it credit to the new equity share capital 8 rupees, which is 8000. Sir, now what is the difference between option number 1 and option number 2? In option number 1, you should only need to make it debit to the extent of sacrifice made by the other shareholder. That is only 2 rupees per share. But in option number two, first you should need to cancel the entire existing equity share capital. Then you are going to issue the new face value of the equity share. That is the difference between option number one and option number two. Reduction in paid up value, but not in face value means you should only need to reduce the to the extent of sacrifice made by the shareholder. Reduction in paid up value as well as face value means entire face value you should need to cancel and the new face value you should need to issue. Sir, then in problems, unless otherwise specifically mentioned, always we can assume that if the shareholder is sacrificed something, then always we can presume that company is going to reduce a paid up value as well as face value no need to provide a specific information regarding this unless otherwise specifically mentioned there is a reduction in paid up value but not in face value simply you can presume that simply you can presume that whenever a sacrifice made by the shareholder there is a reduction in paid up value as well as face value that means we need to cancel the entire existing face value of the equity shares and we need to issue the new face value of the equity shares by making transfer to the extent of the sacrifice to the reconstruction account hope you understand guys this plays the crucial role okay so that means the reduction of share capital in happened total in three ways number one through conversion of partly paid up shares into fully paid up shares through reduction of unpaid capital, reduction through payment of the cash, you know directly the paid up value is decreased by payment of cash, reduction through cancellation of the paid up value, that is nothing but sacrifice made by the shareholders in two ways, reduction in paid up value, but not in face value, reduction in face value as well as paid up value. Sir, if nothing is mentioned, we can presume that reduction in face, paid up value as well as face value, that is option number two. That's it, guys. Now come to the next mechanism of internal reconstruction or next methodology of internal reconstruction, which is compromise and arrangement. You are going to discuss or you, you sorry, you are going to learn the concept of compromise and arrangement uh, in the paper companies act 2013 in CA final paper three in deeper manner. 
but here with respect to, to our accounting perspective only we are going to learn section 240 to section 250 of the companies act 2013 dealing with compromise and arrangement but most of our problems covers this method only most of our problems covers this method only what exactly the meaning of compromise and arrangement sir compromise and arrangement is an agreement it is an agreement made or entered in between company and the other party company and the other party the other party may be outsider or insider of the company insider means the shareholder outsiders means any other liability holder regarding sacrifice out of the amount outstanding from the company compromise and arrangement is an agreement entered between company and the other party the other party may be the shareholder or the other liability holder regarding sacrifice regarding sacrifice made by the other party out of outstanding amount payable by the company to the other party do you understand all of you that means either shareholder or the liability holder is making certain sacrifice during the process of internal reconstruction such agreement is known as compromise and arrangement you may ask certain questions at this point of time sir why shareholders or the other liability holders will ready for sacrifice sir why they are decreasing uh, the amount which is need to be receivable from the company because the company is a loss making company if the company will going to continue in the same situation then there may be a possibility of liquidate the such company if the company is going to liquidate then these liability holders or the shareholders may not fetch the amount payable by company to them because you know in case of the company the limited liability concept is applicable if the company that is when the company goes for liquidation on the hands of the liquidator he will may discharge amount to the liability holders in the particular order up to the time up to the time when such a liquidator will have a cash on their hands if the liquidator doesn't have any resource or cash to repayable or discharge the amount to the liability holders then such liability holders or shareholders may not get any amount from the company so rather than going to the that situation it is better to sacrifice certain amount and moreover once if they will sacrifice if the company may be turn up into the profits mode anyway those are the stakeholders of the company at that point of time company will travel with such stakeholders only with that objective the other parties are ready to sacrifice certain portion of the amount payable by company to them hope you understand so then what is the difference between compromise and arrangement sir compromise means there is a small dispute occurred in between company and the other party what is the dispute means company is asking for sacrificing of 20 percentage and the other party is only agreeing for 10 percentage then after making so many negotiations after making the arbitrates they will come to certain conclusion that is nothing but compromise so that's why the word itself is drafted as compromise after occurring of the dispute they are under uh, the, both the parties are under a one roof through that agreement then that agreement is known as compromise arrangement means straight away both the parties are agreed for terms and conditions of one another that is nothing but arrangement but in both the cases sacrifice is mandatory so let us take up certain examples for better understanding of compromise and arrangement and what is the accounting treatment we need to follow at this compromise and arrangement also i am going to discuss through these examples let us assume creditors balance is there at 10 lakhs how much is the creditors balance 10 lakhs creditors clearly told that they are ready to sacrifice 50 percentage of their claim they are ready to sacrifice 50 percentage of the claim and the remaining 50 percentage they are expecting the equity shares for the remaining 50 percentage they are expecting the equity shares now once the creditors ready to sacrifice that out of 10 lakhs 5 lakh amount we need to make it transfer to capital reduction or reconstruction account for the remaining 5 lakhs i need to issue to i need to issue as equity shares then what is the entry i need to pass first you need to cancel the entire creditors 10 lakhs 
creditors is in generally having credit balance to cancel the creditors you should need to make the debit creditors account debt are 10 lakhs now to the extent of sacrifice made by the creditors you can simply make it transfer to the reconstruction account which is profit to the entity that is to reconstruction 5 lakhs and for the remaining 5 lakhs portion you are going to issue the equity shares that's why you can make it create the equity share capital that is to equity share capital then the entry is creditors account debt are 10 lakh to equity share capital 5 lakh to reconstruction account 5 lakhs so passing of general entries is pretty much easy here provided you should need to understand the transaction properly next come to the second example again the creditors were 10 lakhs creditors ready to sacrifice 50 percentage of the claim provided company will issue 2 lakhs worth of equity shares what their demand you know we will sacrifice 50 percentage we are ready to foregone 5 lakh worth of mo provided company immediately should need to issue 2 lakhs worth of equity shares to us then how you can call it as the net sacrifice is 5 lakhs the net sacrifice is not the 5 lakhs what they are telling we will ready to sacrifice 5 lakhs provided provided if company issue the 2 lakh equity shares then the net sacrifice is only 3 lakhs now how it is 5 lakhs i am ready to foregone 5 lakhs provided if you give 2 lakhs worth of equity shares to me means the net sacrifice is only 3 lakhs that net sacrifice amount only you can make it transfer to the reconstruction account then what about remaining 50 percentage sir this time the remaining 50 percentage they are expecting the cash immediately for the remaining 50 percentage they are expecting the cash immediately then what is the general entry you should need to pass here first the entire creditors account you should need to cancel that is creditors account that are 10 lakhs what is the real sacrifice are the net sacrifice or the real sacrifice only 3 lakhs such 3 lakhs you can make it transfer to the reconstruction account only 3 lakhs then they are expecting 2 lakhs for worth of equity shares right then you can make it credit of 2 lakhs worth of equity shares then for the remaining 5 lakhs they are expecting the cash to cash and the general entry is creditors account that are to reconstruction 3 lakhs to equity share capital 2 lakhs to cash 5 lakhs what is the difference between example number one and example number two in example number one for the remaining 50 percentage creditors accepting the equity shares but in example number two to sacrifice the 50 percentage of the claim they are expecting the two lakhs worth of equity shares this point creates difference guys whenever you are reading the problem whenever you are resolving the problem with respect to the internal reconstruction if a particular loan party or the creditors or the debentures are ready to made any sacrifice then you should need to check due to sacrifice made by them are they expecting anything then you should need to transfer amount with respect to the reconstruction only for the amount of real sacrifice or the net sacrifice not for the gross sacrifice they are sacrificing something sir but as a result they are not expecting anything but as a result they are not expecting anything then at that particular point of time you can make it transfer amount to the reconstruction to the extent of gross sacrifice because at that circumstances gross sacrifice and net sacrifice both are same in example number one gross sacrifice is 50 percentage the net sacrifice is also 50 percentage that is 5 lakhs but in example number two gross sacrifice is 50 percentage that is 5 lakhs but out of that again they are expecting 2 lakhs worth of equity shares that's why the net sacrifice is 3 lakhs do you understand this place difference guys in between the accounting treatment with respect to, to example number one and example number two next come to the concept of unrecorded liability and unrecorded asset in your books of accounts till now till now means up to the adopting the internal reconstruction process if any unrecorded liabilities or assets are exist but during the process of internal reconstruction, you should need to record such unrecorded assets and unrecorded liabilities and you should need to discharge such unrecorded liabilities and you should need to make it realize such unrecorded assets. Then what is the accounting treatment we need to follow? This is important concept. If any problem came from internal reconstruction in the examination, they will definitely add one or two adjustment from this concept. Concentrate. First, please allow me to come to unrecorded liability most of the times unrecorded liability is with respect to, to areas of cumulative preference dividend 
you know as per the provisions of schedule 3 unless otherwise unless otherwise there is a obligation to pay occurs no need to record the liability i mean present obligation arises due to the past event is not exist then no need to recognize any liability coming to arrears of cumulative preference dividend in any particular year company profits are insufficient to to make payment to the preference shareholders then if the existing preference shares are the cumulative preference shares then along with the current year dividend i mean the year in which the company is unable to pay make the dividend is going to make pay in the future dates in the future years to put it simply if company is suffering losses in a particular year then that year dividend and the future year dividend both combinedly they are going to pay in the year in which the company is earning the sufficient profits am i right or wrong that is the concept of cumulative preference dividend now like this the company is a loss making company which is suffering losses like anything that's why the company may have a certain arrears of cumulative preference dividend but which no need to record it in the books of accounts because unless otherwise the company have an obligation to pay it doesn't record it as a liability but during the process of internal reconstruction we decided we decided to pay such arrears of cumulative preference dividend to the preference shareholders now now which i treat it as a liability now during the process of internal reconstruction i treat it as a liability previously which is unrecorded liability now now which should need to be recorded which should need to be recorded previously it is not an unrecorded liability sorry previously no need to record it all but now we decided to record it as a liability that's why we are converting or treating it as an unrecorded liability during the process of internal reconstruction now if such unrecorded liability settled what is the general entry sir what is the general entry i need to pass let me take one example what is that example the creditors is 1 lakh which is an unrecorded liability so we are going to make payment of cash for such such unrecorded liability first which is an unrecorded liability right first you need to record into books of accounts sir to record any liability what is the general entry sir p and del to liability in the normal course i am telling p and del to liability there is increase in liability it should be created due to which there is decrease in profit that's why profit and loss account it are to liability account is the general entry but we are in the process of internal reconstruction any profit or loss is arised such profit or loss we should make it transferred to the reconstruction account itself that's why the entry is reconstruction account it are to unrecorded creditors 1 lakh that is the entry which is the recording of the liability now you can make payment to such unrecorded creditors at the time of making payment to the creditors what is the general entry creditors to bank or creditors to cash that is unrecorded creditors to cash now what is the effect of these two entries unrecorded creditors credit unrecorded creditors debit if it cancel with each other then the entry is reconstruction account it are to cash account that means through settlement to unrecorded liability the entry is reconstruction account it are to cash account i'll tell you another example sir unrecorded liability is for 1 lakh but we are only settling at 80000 but the settlement is happened at 80000 as a full and final settlement the other party is ready to sacrifice to the extent of 20000 now what is the accounting treatment sir anyway in the same way you can follow first for the recording of the unrecorded liability entry reconstruction to unrecorded liability 1 lakh now for an unrecorded creditors you are paying cash of 80000 remaining 20000 is sacrifice made by the such creditors which should need to be transferred to reconstruction account now what is the impact of passing these two entries unrecorded creditors unrecorded creditors cancelled reconstruction 1 lakh is debit reconstruction 20000 is credit so you should need to debit the reconstruction only to the extent of 80000 1 lakh minus 20 which is 80000 to cash 80000 sir no need to pass these two entries on behalf of passing these two entries you can pass a single entry like this you can pass a single entry like this then how our thought process should be the conclusion is if unrecorded liability is settled at book value that is settled at one lakh or greater than or less than book value that is less than book value or greater than book value that is at eighty thousand. 
entry doesn't change entry is reconstruction to cash only and the amount is at the rate of settlement value here the settlement value is 1 lakh that's why 1 lakh here the settlement value is 80000 that's why 80000 so for making settlement of unrecorded liability the net entry is reconstruction account at to cash account at the rate of settlement value do you agree fine for example the entire unrecorded liability is sacrificed by the other party then what is the entry sir then what is the entry sir no entry you know why if you want first record it reconstruction to unrecorded liability then unrecorded liability to reconstruction this is for the purpose of recording this is for the purpose of sacrificing then nullify with each other then the impact is nil that's why if the unrecorded liability is sacrificed by the other party then the impact is nil that's why no entry in the same manner an unrecorded asset is realized the entry is cash to reconstruction at the rate of realizable value what is the conclusion you can draw from this concept of unrecorded liability and assets sir if the unrecorded liability is settled then the entry is reconstruction to cash at the rate of settlement value if such unrecorded liability is sacrificed by the other party then there is no entry if unrecorded asset is realized in the outside market then cash to the reconstruction account those are the conclusions we are drawing from the concept of unrecorded liability important points guys please all of you come sir i will try to resolve one problem in this chapter as well uh, out of all the methods of internal reconstruction if you observe all these four we completed till now except surrender of shares except surrender of shares am i right so we will see the surrender of shares at the end of the chapter because which is altogether a different concept still based on these issues first let us check certain important issues after that i will explain one problem then we'll check the concept of surrender of shares then liquidate the chapter internal reconstruction you know we are in the marathon okay i am not telling each and every point in detailed manner the outlines of the conclusions i am drawing even though I'm drawing the conclusions or the outlines, the important and the link up points I'm going to take care at the time of discussing each and every concept, you should also follow the same flow for better understanding. So please uh, come to the important points. Sir, reconstruction account, out of the methods we've seen, reconstruction account is going to made only in two methods under reduction of capital under compromise and arrangements if you really observe uh, in case of alteration of share capital alteration of share capital we are not using any reconstruction account in case of variation in shareholders rights we are not using any reconstruction account in case of reduction of share capital also if sacrifice made by the shareholder if there is a reduction in paid up capital at that particular scenario only we are using the reconstruction account and in case of compromise and arrangement at each and every transaction we are using the reconstruction account that is the point just is the observation in alteration and variation of shareholders rights we are not using the reconstruction account in the problem also whenever alteration and variation of shareholders rights takes place then no need to use the reconstruction account there is a reduction in capital and compromise and arrangement takes place then only you can use the reduction of capital a reconstruction account and one more thing guys in reduction of capital through sacrifice made by the shareholders exist we can presume that there is a reduction in paid up value as well as face value that point also you can remember unless otherwise specifically mentioned that reduction in paid up value but not in face value is it okay to all of you fine next come here sir after completion of entire reconstruction proceedings the balance in reconstruction account should be applied to set off the profit and loss account debit balance whether it is clearly mentioned or not in the problem whether it is mentioned or not the objective itself is the objective itself is the balance in reconstruction account should make it to set off the profit and loss account debit balance after make it knock off reconstruction account with profit and loss account debit balance if any balance exists in reconstruction account it should need to be transferred to capital reserve account because the profit or loss under reconstruction account itself is capital profits i told you so the capital profits if anything is there after making knock off the profit and loss account debit balance with reconstruction the amount you should need to transfer to 
capital reserve so the entry is also given please concentrate let us take certain examples sir reconstruction account balance is at 5 lakhs and pnl account debit balance is at 3 lakh 50 thousand now reconstruction account that are 5 lakhs you are knocking the balance in reconstruction with pnl now reconstruction account is having the credit balance at the time of utilization of reconstruction it should need to be debited pnl account having the debit balance now you are cancelling the pnl account that's why it should need to be created still how much balance is there under the reconstruction after making knock off the pnl account debit balance which is 150000 it should need to be transferred to the capital reserve no no sir if the reconstruction account balance is not sufficient to knock off the pnl account debit balance then what can i do to the extent of balance of reconstruction you anyway you are set off with pnl Still, if there is any PNL account debit balance, is there you can knock off with other reserves and surplus if at all exist in the company. If there are not exist, then to the extent of reconstruction only you can make it set off. The same example I given here: balance in reconstruction is three lakhs. PNL account debit balance is three lakh fifty thousand. PNL account debit balance is more than the balance in reconstruction account. Now, to the extent of balance in reconstruction account, first knock off. Then you may utilize the other reserves and surplus to knock off the remaining profit and loss account debit balance. If the other reserves and surplus is not at all exist, then to the extent of balance with reconstruction only, you can knock off. Do you understand all of you? Fine. Next, come to the third important point. Sir, any intangible assets and other unrepresented assets, if specifically mentioned in the problem to cancel with to cancel with reconstruction then only we should need to cancel i mean to say whether mentioned or not the balance of pnl account debit i mean the debit balance of pnl account you should knock off with reconstruction account if it is specifically mentioned that you should need to knock off or you should need to cancel the intangible assets and other unrepresented assets during the process of internal reconstruction then only you should need to cancel with the reconstruction otherwise no need to cancel irrespective of the fact whether mentioned or not you can set off the pnl account debit balance but with respect to tangible assets and unrepresented asset if it is mentioned then only you should need to cancel please all of you remember that fact but at the time of cancellation what is the entry you know reconstruction account should be debited intangible asset is in generally having debit balance while cancelling it should need to be created and other unrepresented assets which also be need to be created it is a, if specifically mentioned it is given if it is specifically mentioned then only you should cancel next at the time of preparation of balance sheet after internal reconstruction you should add the word and reduced don't ignore that at the time of preparation of balance sheet you should add the word and reduced so this one you know already but as a process of internal reconstruction i'm explaining this one as well which is revaluation of assets revaluation of liabilities if there is a upward revaluation of asset is occurred which is a profit then asset should be debited reconstruction account should be created if it is a downward revaluation of asset then which is a loss reconstruction account should be debited and asset should be created if it is a upward revaluation of a liability which is a loss reconstruction should be debited and liability should be created if it is a downward revaluation of the liability which is a profit reconstruction should be created and liability should be debited hope you understand these all important point you should need to be remember at the time of conducting the problem based on internal reconstruction except the concept of surrender of shares everything i explained based on this concept let us take one big problem guys let let me take one big problem uh, so let me take problem number three for discussion please allow me concentrate here the balance sheet of a and company limited as on 31st december 2011 is as follows under fixed assets freehold property given plant patent goodwill trade investments under current assets trade receivables given inventory given and a profit and loss account is there under asset side means which is a debit balance which is a debit balance next coming to the liabilities 6% is 4006% cumulative preference shares at the rate of 100 each 75000 equity shares at the rate of 10 rupees each are there 6% is debentures secured on the freehold property these six percentage debentures have the secured on the freehold property it is clearly given accrued interest is there on such debentures under current liabilities bank od given trade payables given directors loan given this is the existing balance sheet information 
the court approved court means here nclt approved a scheme of reorganization to take effect on 11 2012 whereby the preference shares to be written down to 75 each and the equity shares are written down to 2 rupees each if it is written down to 75 means sacrifice made by the preference shareholder 25 rupees here written down to 2 rupees means sacrifice made by the equity shareholder is 8 rupees each do you agree because the existing face value of preference share is 100 and existing face value of equity share is 10 rupees i already clearly mentioned a fact that whenever there is a sacrifice made by the shareholder unless otherwise specifically mentioned we can presume that there is a reduction in paid up value as well as face value now what are the general entries sir the general entry is 6 percentage cumulative preference share capital account data in bracket 100 face value total 4 lakhs Two six percentage cumulative preference share capital in bracket seventy five, that is three lakhs. Two reconstruction account one lakh, that is nothing but seventy five rupees. That is twenty five rupees is the sacrifice. So let us check the same entry with my power notes guides. Let me come to the answer. Yeah. So with respect to the share capital written down to seventy five, written down to two rupees each. Now the entire existing face value was debited. so new face value credited the balance reconstruction transferred in the same way equity share capital entire existing face value debited the 8 rupees is transferred 8 rupees 8 rupees means 80 percentage 7 lakh 50000 into 80 percentage is 6 lakhs remaining transfer to the equity share capital if you observe the new preference share capital face value is 75 and the new equity share capital face value is 2 rupees do you agree next come to the point number 2 of the preference share dividends which are in arrears for 4 years 3/4 to be waived and equity shares of rupees 2 rupees each to be allotted for the remaining quarter that means that is for the remaining year now first if you come to the preference dividend which are cumulative preference shares arrears of cumulative preference dividend is there which is unrecorded liability now 4 lakhs into 6 percentage means 24000 per annum so the total is for 4 years which is 4 into 24000 which is cumulative preference dividend out of which 3/4 is waived and remaining 1/4 equity shares are going to be issued if any unrecorded liability is waived or sacrificed then there is no entry just now i explained here the, through the concept of unrecorded liability if any unrecorded liability arrears of cumulative preference dividend sacrificed then there is no entry here also we mentioned the same fact which is no entry now coming to the remaining 14 we are settling such unrecorded liability at the time of making settlement what is the general entry reconstruction to if it is cash to cash if it is equity share capital to equity share capital so reconstruction account data to equity share capital that is for the 14 at the time of settlement at the rate of settlement amount which is 24000 do we agree all of you next come to the next issue guys accrued interest on debentures to be paid in cash accrued interest on debentures to be paid in cash here it is accrued interest is there 22500 you can simply payment make it payment in the form of cash that is accrued interest account data to cash account 22500 rupees next come to the next point all of you debenture holders agreed to take over freehold property book value is at 1 lakh at a valuation of rupees 120000 now if you check the freehold property existing book value first the freehold property existing book value is total is 424000 out of that he is talking about 1 lakh worth of book value if such 1 lakh worth of book value is agreed to accepted by the debentures at a valuation of 1 lakh 20000 that means before acceptance by such debenture holders first of all to the extent of 1 lakh freehold property we should need to make the upward revalue now the total the total freehold property was 4 lakh 25000 book value out of that 1 lakh is making the upward revaluation at the rate of 1 lakh 20000 due to which the revaluation profit is 20000 am i right now what about the remaining free hold property remaining free hold property balance is there for 3 lakh 25000 after 4 lakh 25000 if 1 lakh is reduced remaining is 3 lakh 25000 
some other information is given if you check the below point point number 8 please all of you come to point number 8 remaining free hold property to be revalued at 387500 that means remaining free hold property 325000 is again upward revalued at 387500 then the revaluation profit is 62500 then the total revaluation profit through upward revaluation of free hold property is here 20 here 62500 total is 82500 first you should need to pass entry for such upward revaluation of freehold property that is freehold property account data to reconstruction account just now we seen upward revaluation of the asset what is the accounting treatment we need to follow that is asset to reconstruction account the same entry i passed here freehold property to reconstruction account 82500 sir now what about things related to debenture sir debenture holders agreed first the existing debenture holders, how much? 6% debentures for 3,75,000, which were 3,75,000. Now, out of these 3,75,000 worth of debentures, uh, 1,20,000 we are settling through giving the freehold property. So, 6% debentures account that are you can debit to debenture holders, then debenture holders to freehold property, or you can pass the direct entry 6% debentures to the freehold property, 1,20,000. Nobody will object. Now, out of this 3,75,000, if I already settled by giving the free cold property for 1,20,000, what about the remaining balance? Remaining balance is 2,55,000. Sir, what I should need to do with this 2,55,000, sir? If nothing is mentioned, then I need to make it represent as a liability after completion of internal reconstruction. Or, but in further information, if something is provided, we are settling that liability by paying cash or by issuing the equity share something, then we will do accordingly. But till now, we don't know what happened to the remaining liability. Just wait for some time. Next, come below. This is point number four and point number eight. Both are over. Now come to point number five. Patents and goodwill to be written off. It is clearly given. We will written off at final stage. Just wait. Point number five. Just wait for point number five. Next, inventory to be written off by 65,000. We are going to written off. In a single entry, we are going to make a written off entry. Please wait for some time. Amount of 68,500 to be provided for bad debts. Provided for bad debts. That is also written off of the existing debtors only. Okay. It will make it present 5, 6, 7 at a single transaction. Just wait. Trade investments be sold for 1,40,000. If you observe, trade investments are there under the asset side at the rate of 55,000. 55,000 worth sold for 140000 means huge profit we are deriving that is 140 minus 55000 the difference is 85000 entry bank account at our 140000 to investment 55000 remaining to reconstruction 85000 the same entry we passed here cash 140 trade investment 55000 reconstruction 85000 next uh, come below to the point number 10 directors to accept settlement of their loans as to 90 percentage thereof by allotment of equity shares of rupees 2 each and as to 5 percent in cash and the balance 5 percent is being waived first director's loan is how much if you observe in the liability side director's loan is there for 1 lakh now such 1 lakh they are accepting allotment of equity shares for 90,000 in the form of equity shares from the remaining 5 percentage in the form of cash 5,000 in the form of cash remaining 5,000 they are waived transferred to reconstruction account the same thing is mentioned here if you observe Director's loan account at our 1 lakh, equity share capital 90, cash 5,000 to reconstruction 5,000. Next, come to the point number 11. There were a capital commitments totaling 2,50,000. Capital commitment means we already entered into certain contracts to discharge such contract. We incurred 2,50,000. These contracts are to be cancelled on payment of 5% of the contract price as a penalty because we are in the restructuring of the existing financial statements of all existing contracts are also we are cancelling because we all together entered into the new type of conducting the business activity but to cancel such contract we need to pay the five percentage as a penalty now which is an expenditure at the time of making penalty what is the general entry penalty to cash now during the process of internal reconstruction any expenditure or income is come it should need to transfer to reconstruction that is reconstruction to penalty then penalty penalty is crossed with another then the entry is reconstruction to cash that is 250000 into 5 percentage uh, which might be 12500 that is reconstruction to cash account 12500 sir except these three 
five, six, seven remaining all over, right? To return of patents, goodwill, inventory, and bad debts, the entry is reconstruction account debt are two patents, two goodwill, two inventory, two PBD. So that entry is here. Patents thirty seven thousand five hundred created. Goodwill total one lakh thirty thousand created. Out of the inventory, sorry, inventory is sixty five thousand only we created. PBD is nothing but trade receivables. Trade receivables directly reduced to the extent of sixty eight thousand five hundred. To the extent of sixty eight thousand five hundred. Whether they mentioned or not, we should need to cancel the debit balance of P and L account, right? How much is the debit balance of P and L account? Five lakh thirty five thousand. You can debit the profit and loss account five lakh thirty five thousand. Sir, before passing this entry, first what you should need to check, you know, what is the balance under reconstruction account? Now, I I developed a reconstruction account where if I check the balance under that reconstruction account before passing this entry, before passing this entry, the balance under reconstruction account I have eight lakh thirty six thousand because I already passed the various entries, right? In entry number one, reconstruction profit one lakh. In entry number two, reconstruction profit six lakhs. So by making with all such entries, if I prepare a reconstruction account, I have the balance of reconstruction account to the extent of eight lakh thirty six thousand. Out of this eight lakh thirty six thousand, thirty seven thousand five hundred is knock off with patents. One lakh thirty thousand knock off for goodwill. Sixty five thousand knock off for inventory. Sixty eight thousand five hundred knock off for trade receivable. Remaining knock off with five lakh thirty five thousand. Now there is no balance in reconstruction. Reconstruction account debit also eight lakh thirty six thousand. If after knock off all these things, if there is any balance in reconstruction account, <coughs> excuse me, you may would transfer to capital reserve. But here there is no balance in reconstruction account, so simply no need to transfer any amount to capital reserve. And one more thing, if you observe in this problem, the requirement is actually. You are requested to show the general entries reflecting the above transactions, including the cash transactions, and prepare the balance sheet of the company after completion of the scheme. You need to prepare the balance sheet as well, sir. In very quick manner, just I want to check the balance sheet. Please, all of you, concentrate because presentation of the balance sheet in case of internal reconstruction is the different art. Okay, how you need to follow uh, to draft the entire balance sheet in the proper manner. Uh, please, all of you, follow the mechanism which I followed during the marathon. Now. Sir, first share capital, right? Please, all of you, come here. Start with your calculator. First, equity share capital is how much? Entry number two, entry number two, which is one lakh fifty thousand, right? Plus in entry number three, twenty four thousand. Plus uh, entry number four, nothing. Entry number five is also nothing. Entry number six is also nothing. Uh, next, come to. Seven nothing, eight nothing, nine. In nine, ninety thousand is there. Add you can ninety thousand. So total I got two lakh sixty four thousand. Nothing, nothing else further. So two lakh sixty four thousand is the equity share capital. That is one lakh thirty two thousand equity shares at the rate of two rupees each. Preference shares only one time issued. That is in the first entry. That is three lakhs only. Out of four lakhs, one lakh sacrifice, na. So total is five lakh sixty four thousand, which I shown under equity share capital. Reserves and surplus straight away you can show under nil because P and L account debit balance is there that itself is nullified with the reconstruction account there is no P and L account balance. Next come to non-current liabilities here debentures are there guys uh, out of one lakh three lakh seventy five thousand one lakh twenty thousand already over remaining is two lakh fifty five thousand one more actually I forgot to tell you uh, further debentures also you issued for eight percent is debentures which is for one lakh thirty thousand so total two lakh fifty five plus one lakh thirty thousand. Two lakh fifty-five thousand plus one lakh thirty thousand worth of debentures, which are three lakh eighty-five thousand. Do you agree? Next, if you see the existing balance sheet, so what are the remaining all liabilities we have? Accrued interest was paid. Do you agree? Under current liabilities, bank OD for the time being you can ignore because we know whether we have a positive balance of bank or negative balance of bank after completion of all the transactions. For the time being, you can ignore trade payable. Trade payables is there for three lakhs. The same trade payable I represented here. Director's loan we already discharged. Except bank OD, every liability is over. Okay, fine. Next, come to asset side. Under assets, come to PPE. Freehold property. So many adjustments made. What are the adjustment happened for freehold property? Please come to the freehold property. Now, uh, out of the existing freehold property, the four lakh twenty five thousand plus. 
after completion of upward uh, sacrifice so only only you can talk about this because this one already given to the uh, debenture only let us talk about this so after making the upward revaluation the balance become 387500 na so freehold property we can consider it as a 387500 yes next one more ppe is there which is planned there is no adjustment directly you can add 50000 the total is 437500 that's why ppe is represented the same intangible assets the total intangible assets patent and goodwill is knock off with the reconstruction that's why there is no balance in patents and goodwill as well next come to current assets trade receivables sir trade receivables there is a decrease how much decrease with the pro pbd is pbd is there na uh, how much decrease 68500 that's why you can reduce 68500 inventory 65000 decrease is there so these are the figures now if you work out the cash and cash equivalents if you work out the cash and cash equivalents there are various entries are there right from first entry onwards if there is cash inflow minus if there is cash sorry if there is cash inflow plus and cash outflow there is a minus first entry there is no inflow outflow third entry no inflow outflow fourth entry outflow minus 22500 uh come to the fifth entry no inflow outflow Sixth entry, no out in seventh inflow is there plus one lakh thirty thousand. Eighth inflow plus one lakh forty thousand. Ninth minus five thousand. Tenth minus twelve thousand five hundred. Eleventh nothing. Now I have two lakh thirty thousand cash with me. There is a bank OD exist right, which is one lakh ninety five thousand. So two lakh thirty minus one lakh ninety five thousand. You are ending with a positive cash balance. So that's why in the balance sheet it is clearly mentioned two lakh thirty minus one lakh ninety five thousand, which is a positive gas bank balance. That's why no need to show the bank OD under the current liabilities when the total of balance sheet is matching. Then how we should need to present the balance sheet by taking the effect of each and every transaction in the calculator. You should need to make it the totals and the respective heads along by seeing the opening balance sheet. You should need to adjust accordingly. We should take care each and every line item. at the time of presenting such item in the balance sheet guys fine only one last concept is pending from my side which is surrender of shares please all of you come to the concept of surrender of shares then with this we can liquidate this chapter internal reconstruction right all of you come to the concept of surrender of shares which is the last method or mechanism of internal reconstruction this is one of the method of internal reconstruction am i right <laughs> sir you know the concept of forfeiture of shares right sir we are in the concept of surrender of shares why you are talking about the forfeiture of the shares just i will uh, tell you the reason uh, later i will tell you the reason later why we are discussing about uh, forfeiture of shares can you please tell me when forfeiture of shares concept is applicable if any existing partly paid up equity shares are there company make a call if such shareholder is unable to repay such call then it is the right given by the company act 2013 to such company to forfeit such shares if partly paid up shares are there and shareholder unable to pay the call money at the time of making call by the company then it is the right given by company act 2013 to such company to forfeit such shares later the company may cancel the forfeited shares or may can reissue such forfeited shares you know such things already okay in your graduation level or in your foundation level you already learned such things am i right why i mentioned this concept you know forfeiture of the shares concept is a right given by the company act 2013 to a company that surrender of the shares surrender of the shares there is regarding i mean regarding surrender of shares there is no provision in the company act 2013 there is even a single provision was not established in the company act 2013 but if shareholders voluntarily surrender their shares as per the decision of the court then 
company may issue, company can accept such shares was given in the companies act 2013 one more time i'm repeating as per the companies act 2013 no company can make a no company can pressurize their shareholders to surrender their shares as per the companies act 2013 no company should pressurize their shareholders to surrender their shares to be frankly speaking company does not have any right to ask such shares from the shareholder in the concept of surrender of shares but if shareholders voluntarily surrender their shares to the company as per the decision of the court i mean the scheme was already approved by the nclt then company can accept such shares that privilege is given to the company that fact was mentioned in the company act 2013 so if shareholders voluntarily surrender shares to the company then the company can accept as like in the process of internal reconstruction if the shareholders voluntarily surrender their shares then the company can accept such shares now the next question coming into my mind is what is the difference between sacrifice made by the shareholder and surrender of their shares to the company literally speaking there is no difference in company point of view if sacrifice is made by the shareholder then we are decreasing the paid up value and the remaining amount we are automatically transferring to the reconstruction account if the entire amount is sacrificed by the shareholder then the entire paid up value is going to be cancel entire amount is going to transfer to reconstruction due to which what happen existing equity shares are cancelling existing equity shares are cancelling now due to surrender of shares what happen once the shareholders decided to surrender his shares to the company which is also a profitable situation to the company but the only one difference is company is not cancelling such share company is not cancelling such share company may utilize such shares which are surrendered by the shareholders for the purpose of making settlement to the various parties like debenture holders loan providers or the creditors but in case of in case of sacrifice made by the shareholder through the reduction of entire paid up value company will immediately cancel such shares but if at any point of time if it required further shares then they can issue such further shares then only they can settle such equity shares to the debenture holders or the loan providers or the creditors that is the only difference in between surrender of shares and sacrifice made by the shareholder in both the cases company is getting the same profit but without cancellation of such share happened in case of surrender of shares by cancellation of share through sacrifice made by the shareholder happened in case of the normal course till now what we seen hope you are understand now company may use surrender of shares for the purpose of reissue as payment to creditors debenture holders or any other liability holders during the process of internal reconstruction that means surrender of shares happen without cancellation of existing share company is getting profit then coming to the accounting treatment hope you understand the concept of surrender of share how it differs from the normal uh, reduction in the paid up value through sacrifice made by the shareholder now come to the accounting treatment let me explain the entire accounting treatment through this illustration sir i can't take up a specific problem because the same accounting adjustment what you are going to learn are going to repeat in the problems as well i don't want to duplicate and our time is very much precious we are in the marathon that's why please all of you concentrate uh, for this adjustment itself if you able to appreciate this adjustment then you can able to write answer for any problem because the problems will like uh, as discussed previously in the same mode the problem will be there after adding the uh, certain sentences with respect to surrender of shares is it okay guys concentrate <laughs> number of equity shares are 1 lakh face value is at 10 rupees paid up value is at 10 rupees out of 1 lakh shares 80000 shares are ready to surrender their shares to the company once the shareholders voluntarily surrender their shares to the company then the entry should be the existing equity share capital should be debited to the extent of surrender of shares 
face value is 10 rupees and the total amount is 80,000 into 10 rupees, which is 8 lakhs. Two, share surrender account, 8 lakhs. One more thing, actually, I forgot to tell you. When a company can accept the share surrendered by the shareholder, if such shares are fully paid up equity shares, if such shares are fully paid up equity shares, I mean fully paid up shares, partly paid up shares cannot accept in the form of share surrender concept. So that's why I mentioned that fact as well, I think so. Oh, where? Okay, just leave it. Maybe I forgot to add. So uh, yeah, here it is there now. All the shares should be fully paid up. All the shares should be fully paid up before uh, entering into the surrender of shares concept itself. Okay, come down. So now the entry is equity share capital account data to share surrender account. Now the entire 80,000 shares are there under this share surrender account, this share surrender account without canceling such 80,000 shares. But you may ask one doubt, sir, you are telling that you are telling that once the shares are surrendered by such shareholders to once such shares are surrendered by shareholders to the company, which leads to the profit to the company now, because whenever sacrifice made by the shareholder, we are recognizing it under reconstruction account, but where you recognize that profit, sir, this is the beauty of a concept, we are not recognizing the profit through share surrender at the time of share surrender. We are one more time repeating. We are not recognizing profit due to share surrender, not at the time of surrender of shares made by the shareholders. We are recognizing the profit occurred due to share surrender at the time of utilization of such share surrender to the various parties that will prove in the next step. Let me check one case, guys. Case number one. Credit hours were 5 lakhs. Credit hours how much? 5 lakhs. This entire credit hours we are settling in the form of equity shares by using the share surrender account. By using share surrender, we are discharging these credit hours. Then what is the general entry, sir? At the time of utilization of share surrender, the entry should be share surrender to equity share capital. Just you can simply reverse the entry. To the extent of 5 lakhs, the entry is share surrender account data to equity share capital account. I told you, right, sir, till now, we are not recognizing the profit for the purpose of share surrender. Now you should cancel the credit hours. You can recognize the profit. That is credit hours account data to reconstruction account is the 5 lakhs. Sir, what is happening? We can't appreciate, sir. It's quite easy. First, you should learn two things. What is that? At the time of surrender of shares, or at the time of shares surrendered by the shareholder, the entry is share capital to share surrender account. There is no doubt about it. But we are not recognizing the profit. We are not recognizing the profit at this time. When we are recognizing the profit due to share surrendered by the shareholder, at the time of utilization of such share surrender. Now, this is the time for utilization of share surrender. We are having a credit hours of 5 lakhs. We are issuing equity shares to such credit hours by utilization of share surrender. Whenever you are utilizing the share surrender, the entry should be reversed. That is share surrender account data to equity share capital account. Now you can recognize the profit. I already told you, right? Now you are utilizing the share surrender. You can recognize the profit. You are recognizing the profit means you are transferring such amount to the reconstruction. Even though shares surrendered were 8 lakhs, but out of such share surrender, we are only utilizing 5 lakhs. That's why I'm only recognizing the profits to the extent of 5 lakhs only by debiting the credit hours. That is credit hours account data to reconstruction account. Still under share surrender, how much balance is there? 3 lakhs. When such 3 lakhs I am recognizing as a profit, if such 3 lakhs also I am utilizing for any other party payments, then again I will recognize. For example, such 3 lakhs are issuing to the debenture holders. Then what is the entry? First, at the time of utilization of share surrender, share surrender to equity share capital and the debentures to reconstruction account. Do you understand? Okay. Conclusion, at the time of utilization of share surrender, share surrender should cancel and a share capital should be created. That is the first entry. The real profit due to share surrender will be recognized at the time of settlement to the other party that is at the time of utilization of share surrender at the time of utilization of share surrender that is at the time of settlement to the other party okay 
come to the next case guys so please all of you apply with mind once if you understand then everything is easy otherwise it might confusing next come down creditors is at 5 lakhs creditors ready to forego 2 lakhs 2 lakhs is the real sacrifice guys real sacrifice and for the remaining remaining means 3 lakhs company is going to issue equity shares out of share surrender i mean one entry you know one entry is creditors to reconstruction which is the real sacrifice 2 lakhs 2 lakhs 2 lakhs is over there is no confusion regarding this this is not related to share surrender concept this is related to a compromise and arrangement agreement in between creditors and a company that is creditors to reconstruction 2 lakhs and the remaining issue is only for 3 lakhs for the remaining 3 lakhs worth of creditors we are issuing in the form of equity shares by utilizing share surrender whenever you are utilizing the share surrender entry is share surrender to equity share capital that is 3 lakhs now to the extent of utilization of share surrender you should need to recognize as a profit na for that entry is creditors to reconstruction for that entry is creditors to reconstruction 3 lakhs now on behalf of passing this entry and creditors to reconstruction 3 lakhs i can combine this 2 lakhs here itself na that is that's why creditors 2 lakhs debit 2 lakhs reconstruction credit 2 lakhs here also creditors debit 3 lakhs reconstruction credit 3 lakhs now you can add 3 lakhs plus 2 lakhs those therefore creditors to reconstruction action 5 lakhs then no need to pass this entry once again that means for utilization of share surrender this is the entry and to recognize the share surrender profit 3 lakhs and the real sacrifice made by the creditors profit is 3 2 lakhs total 3 lakhs plus 2 lakhs is 5 lakhs you can debit the creditors 5 lakhs then the entry is share surrender to reconstruction sorry share surrender to equity share capital 3 lakhs for utilization of share surrender creditors to reconstruction real sacrifice is 2 lakhs share surrender profit recognition is 3 lakhs total 5 lakhs debit the creditors next come to case number 3 all of you please concentrate this is uh, quite i'm not telling it as a difficult uh, i mean lot of things are involving here but once if you appreciate it is that much easy concentrate guys <laughs> creditors are given at 5 lakhs creditors ready to forego 2 lakhs provided if company issue 50000 worth of equity shares what creditors is telling to the company we will ready to sacrifice 2 lakhs sir but we required 50000 worth of equity shares sir then what is the real sacrifice 1.5 lakh is the real sacrifice and for the remaining 3 lakhs we are issuing the equity shares so total 5 lakhs are there for the remaining 3 lakhs we are issuing the equity shares out of share surrender this is straight away told then out of this 2 lakhs real sacrifice is 1 lakh 50000 and they are expecting 50000 in the form of equity shares we are going to issue out of share surrender now my question is my my first question is how much amount you are utilizing for share surrender sir for the settlement of remaining 3 lakhs i am utilizing the share surrender and in sacrifice of 2 lakhs they are expecting 50000 worth of equity shares we are issuing such 50000 worth of equity shares are also out of share surrender the total amount required for the purpose of issue of equity shares out of share surrender was 3 lakh 50000 at the time of utilization of share surrender share surrender account data to equity share capital 3 lakh 50000 now real sacrifice made by the creditors 1 lakh 50000 you can transfer to the reconstruction account plus for utilization of share surrender how much amount you are utilizing for the share surrender 3 lakh 50000 3 lakh 50000 plus 1 lakh 50000 you can make it create the reconstruction account you can debit the creditors 5 lakhs that means if the sacrifice is the real sacrifice or if the payment made to creditors by utilization of share surrender there is no difference for me because the real sacrifice i make it create to the reconstruction and for utilization of share surrender i am discharging the creditors that amount also i make it create to the reconstruction account i doesn't differentiate if even though real sacrifice made by the creditors or the liability holder or if i am making settlement to such party by utilizing the share surrender there is no difference for me both the things i ultimately transfer to the reconstruction account 
even though even though such a shares are issued to the loan party for the remaining portion or as a result of sacrifice made by such loan party even though i am issuing there is no difference sir we can't appreciate all such things sir you can simply think like this utilization of share surrender share surrender to equity share capital to the extent of share surrender you can recognize the profit and the real sacrifice also you can transfer to the reconstruction debit that liability account over that's it guys next one more point i forgot to tell you sir after utilization of share surrender if there is any balance in share surrender what i should need to do sir because here in this case share surrender is 8 lakhs i utilized it for 5 lakhs still if there is share surrender account 3 lakhs balance is there what can i do sir now the balance in share surrender now you can recognize it as a profit the balance in share surrender you can simply make it transfer to the reconstruction account because we are not utilizing na that's why the unutilized amount of share surrender you can make it transfer to the reconstruction account after utilization of share surrender if any balance exists it should be transferred to the reconstruction account then from reconstruction you know the balance of pnl should need to be knock off if still there is balance in reconstruction account you can make it transfer to the capital reserve that is normal things only so like this whenever the share surrender concept exist you should need to think like that so problems based on share surrender also in the same manner if you want you can complete from your end guys this is the end of internal reconstruction chapter